Lunar Life in Another World, Novel 4, written by Shoji Goji, read by Lerminora. Prologue <sighs> From what I recalled, it had been a long night. Wait, it was still night right now! And I was pulling an all-nighter. The story of how I got here was even longer. Stalker girls fussing over a pimple, and the orc lord. This fantasy world was a strange place. The story was only as long as the road we traversed. I suppose that since time immemorial people had always regarded annoying problems as something that someone else would deal with, but that orc lord was especially annoying. If they get this far, we may as well send them over the edge. Waste their energy. They come here. Send them down, Miss Armoreb haltingly suggested. Rose brought riches and knowledge, but also disaster. That's what people had always prayed to the god of the cardinal directions, told fortunes, and went far out of their way to avoid traveling unlucky paths. I say we add another pitfall. What if we subtly increase the slope of this hallway to send them tumbling over the embankment, you know, like this? Then you need bigger gap. That was why people built roads, and that was why they feared them. A road could change someone's destiny, even change the course of civilizations. Hmm... We can take inspiration from the Setsubun custom of throwing beans to repel evil on the last day of winter, I said. Pelt them with rocks and send them scurrying right into the pit. I didn't know yet what this road would bring, but at the very least, it would bring the future. If the future could somehow manage to pass through here safely. <clears throat> day 49, midnight. Freelancing in my own sweatshop is self-abuse. The white loser in. Saga girl and the poster girl fell asleep while hugging and crying, but I was still working on my side hustle. No one could deny that I was the hardest working neat the world had ever seen. At the moment, I was reinforcing shield girl's armor with mithril. Instead of going on fantastic adventures in this swords and sorcery world, I'm stuck upgrading equipment for my entire class. What the hell is a battle dress? Oh, this was the tiny animal's request, so there was no reason to even consider it. She was too minuscule for anything to look alluring on her. Besides, was it really a good idea to leave so much skin exposed in a battle? <sighs> Did she not care at all about defense? Eh, <clears throat> request denied. Otherwise, I worked on my spellstone batteries, making them both rechargeable and non-rechargeable variants. Eureka! A new product. This will be the best seller, no doubt! <laughs> These beauties were designed to store extra reserves of magic power. They would be perfect for the rear guard, as they were all magic users. They were the ideal demographic for spellstone batteries. <laughs> They'll eat them up, I whispered to myself. Because my classmates ran out of MP so quickly, they couldn't make good progress in any of the various dungeons. With the extra power, they would be able to fight longer. They needed this equipment as soon as possible. When I showed the batteries to my classmates, they all said, Huh, so that's why you never run out of MP! Batteries were simple in principle, according to how to magic item. I just needed to arrange a group of spellstones in a circuit in order to let magic power flow through them. By fusing such a circuit together, I could make a portable spellstone battery. Since the people in this world had never even heard of batteries or electrical circuits, uh, the theory was never put into practice. In short, spellstone batteries acted as MP reservoirs. Not only were they a countermeasure for running out of MP in the middle of battle, they would also allow a magic user to cast more expensive spells too. Everyone would want them. Everyone would need them. And the profits would be all mine! <clears throat> Normally, no one could test the theory outright, I muttered to myself. After all, who in the world would have the massive collection of each individual class of spellstone? <laughs> Me, obviously. The monsters on each floor of the dungeon yielded spellstones of the same level, so when I cleared a floor, I collected them all. I had more than enough material for experiments. <sighs> the only difficulty I ran into was that the effects depended on the type of spellstones used and what kind of circuits I made with them. In the end, I had to iterate through every possible combination. I couldn't move on to mass production before I understood the principles of spellstone circuitry. I wonder if a sequel to How to Magic Item ever came out. Hmm. It probably also got banned for having a nonsense name like No How to Magic Items! <clears throat> Nonetheless, this has to be the first of a series written by an ancient scholar, right? For now, I would make enough batteries for everyone. It turned out that I didn't need to make one for myself, 
because my item bag had accidentally become an extremely powerful MP battery. Since I carried so many top tier spells in there, they naturally formed circuits and provided me with a torrent of free MP. Come to think of it, it was pretty weird that I never seemed to run out of MP. Turns out I was leeching off my own spell stones the whole time. That probably explains why my MP regeneration leveled up so fast too. Hmm. Whenever I ran out of MP, my item bag battery filled me back up. I finally understood why MP regeneration evolved into MP absorption. I would have never known had I not read How to Magic Item. Reading really was fundamental. Since I now had MP absorption, I suspected that I absorbed ambient magic power from my surroundings and channeled it back into the spellstone battery. After all, I renovated an entire mountain ridge without running out. That should have required a staggering amount of MP, yet I didn't notice at all. It worked without a hitch. There I was grinding away at my side gig in the small hours of the night. Miss Armored was totally zonked out. Her long legs stuck out from the under the blanket. Their divine beauty drawing my gaze to her alluring, flawless thighs. It was a trap! Without a doubt, a trap! I had fallen for it so many times, and every single time, I got no sleep in a bucket load of scoldings! <sighs> hmm, I want to start manufacturing sauce in my cave, but I haven't even gone around to establishing a poultry plant. And I haven't done anything with the garden since I cleared it out. Besides, I really wanted to have hot tub fun times. Despite owning my own home, I don't have the time to be a proper shut-in. I'm supposed to be a shut-in. I need an owner, damn it! Hmm, first things first. I have to sort out this chicken and egg situation. There are essential ingredients for omu rice and oyakudon. I'm also desperate for some seaweed and dried bonito flakes. There's literally no seafood around here, you know? Where's the sea? I muttered to myself. I thought I could reach the sea anytime soon, but corn could do the trick. Perfect. Omu rice goes great with corn soup, doesn't it? Hmm. That meant I needed to source some corn. At least I already had onions and scallions. What else do I need? Hmm. Butter? Oh, and cheese! This was an emergency. The agriculture sector needed to innovate. I wasn't even a citizen, so why did I have to implement agricultural reforms? How was that a side job in any way? Grumbling, I went back to the nightly grind. Did loner shut in and neat make it easy for me to pull on nighters? Though, I still wanted sleep. This was like freelancing in a sweatshop. During our meeting today, I understood what each group struggled with, so I wanted to make equipment to mitigate their issues. Besides, I could charge outrageous prices. I'm gonna be rich, sleeping, but rich. Those damn nerds will have to pay an extra special nerd tax too. They're snoozing so contently right now and it's pissing me off. I'll rip them off like crazy. As a start, I made 60 disposable magic batteries, plus 90 rechargeable ones, especially for the rear guard. I'll be back to millionaire status by tomorrow morning. Uh, there was still one huge problem. The girls were all bankrupt from their recent clothes shopping spree. I even had to lend them money to buy rings yesterday. Ooh, if I made a spellstone battery that looked like a bracelet, it would so like hotcakes. It would look like prayer breeds, but if each bracelet used a variety of spellstone colors, it should still be a hit. <laughs> I'll plunge the girls even deeper into debt. They deserve a taste of the poverty that I have suffered. <clears throat> Despite the girls all being flat broke, I still ended up agreeing to make a bunch of bespoke clothing for them. None of their order specified sizes, only colors and designs. Was I supposed to measure them myself? They didn't even make patterns for me to use. Are they really making a teenage boy an excellent health measure, teenage girls? Really? If that's the case, I'm looking forward to working on Vice Rep A's order. Hmm, a long, tight leather skirt with a revealing slit. Oh, that sounded so good that I want to go measure her right away. I'll make one for Ms. Armor Rep, too. She'll try it on, and I'll take it right off. Yes, wear it for the sole purpose of taking it off. Not that she wouldn't look amazing keeping it on, too. Hmm, speaking of which, both Ms. Armor Reps and my equipment should get mithril upgrades, too. They're already cheat items, so I'm not sure if they can get any more OP. I said. It's probably fine to leave them for later. Although, Miss Armor Rep's cloak of holding is pretty shoddy, so I should at least upgrade that, right? At that point, I'll seriously need to take out all my equipment out and strengthen it. I'll have to unsock it all my equipment to upgrade it? Let's see. 
For my weapon, I've used the Void Staff, the Mana Cutter, the Grass Cutting Sword, which, as a legendary divine weapon, shouldn't need upgrades, and the Elder Ent Staff. My cloak is slotted with the Invisibility Cloak, the Mirror Cloak, and the Evasion Cloak. My boots contain Speed Bonus Boots, Resistant Grease, and Adhesive Boots. My gloves, the Spear Shield Gauntlets, and the Magician's Glove. Finally, my ring. Trap Ring, Demon Ring, Fairy Ring, and the Ring of Golden Crafter, and the Redundant Ring of the Dungeon Master. I saw the adamantium covering into my clothes. That might be worth buffing. Hmm, the black hat too. How the hell could I do all that in a single night? What happened to labor regulations? How did I manage to exploit my own labor? This is a criminal amount of unpaid overtime. I have somehow turned a hobby into a sweatshop. I don't even know how I managed to exploit myself. Can I blame anyone except myself? Ugh, I also had a ton of orders from the general store. I need to get that town to handle its own development, or I'll end up running the entire economy as a part-time job. Ugh, so sleepy. Ugh, the bare naked battle had gone on for so long that I couldn't even maintain my woodpecker mode. The eternal dungeon emperor is now lay in bed, a beatific smile on her sleeping face. She was drooling just a little bit, but she was still somehow adorable. Without these jobs, I would be broke. But I really had my work cut out for me. At the city's present level of economic development, exploitation was certainly inevitable. When was this going to end? And the whole damn time those plump exposed tides were tempting me to come back to bed! What's urgent about this order? The general store lady says everything is urgent. How is mushroom fried rice of for three urgent? Make your own damn dinner. I'm not a restaurant. And I still have to go to the dungeon in the morning. But at least she's making it worth my while. I can charge what I want. I sent raw materials dancing into the air, an arcane assembly line of manufacturing ending in my storage section. There was no end in sight, not even close. My stack of remaining invoices had barely shrunk. They were so numerous that they spiraled through the roof. A Joe that pierced the heavens. I felt like my sense of reason was kicked to the curb as I tried to do the impossible. Ugh, I can't. I just can't do it anymore. I'm done. Yep. It's time for round three. To bed. Activate Woodpecker Mode. The events of the third round are too lurid to display. Day 50. Morning. I thought they were my old classmates, but nah. Those are definitely different people. The white loser in. The early bird sets up a worm market and grows rich off those lazy do-nothing birds. In other words, I woke up early to set up my market stall. Today's featured products, I hawked. MP batteries and charge braces for sale. Presenting just 60 of this rare premium edition goods. Hurry up and buy them. You want to buy them, right? As soon as I finished speaking, I was presented with a tableau of depicting the glorious hellish battle of a frenzied bargain hunting Valkyries. Their boundless fury enough to destroy a thousand dungeons. Normally, the girls who fought on the front line shoved the spellcasters out of the way. But today was different. These were spellstone braces with the mysterious effects made with real spellstones. I had two types for sale. One was a high capacity power stone bracelet made by connecting several large spellstones. It provided instantaneous power of an emergency, ideal for the frontline fighters. However, I personally recommended the narrow wrap bracelet. It could efficiently provide a steady supply of MP over a long period of time. I totally plagiarized the design, but I doubted that anyone in this world would notice. If the original designer found out, I would simply apologize. <clears throat> Besides, the representatives of the Shinto Muso Kane style in this world had yet to send any complaints. Since I sealed off the frontier with the pseudo dungeon, I should be fine. It's not like any jewelry brands were about to open a branch in this town after all. OMG! You can't have that? That was mine! No, I want it! That Bracey chose me! Oh, this one too! We were meant for each other. These are for spellcaster. You don't need it. Yeah, it's not fair. Magic users deserve to upgrade their power power too. The girls, now in peak bargain frenzy, pushed and shoved each other out of the way. There was hair pulling and clothes tearing. This was a public safety hazard. Keep me out of this. I had nothing to do with it. The Vanguard needs MP too. This one's the only one of the design. I need it. It's mine. I saw it first. It's a designer knockoff, but still. These shouldn't be limited edition. They're too good. All it ended up with two. Yeah, make more already. And more rings too. <laughs> I'm rich. The millionaire reborn. So why did I still have to work? 
Even if each of you bought two bracelets, there should still be some left, I said. How many arms do you have anyway? Two bracelets are not enough for fashionable young women. You're wearing rings on every finger and bracelets up to your elbows. Are you trying to forge a jewelry gauntlet? All the extra rings sold out too. Now I wouldn't need to worry about them dealing with the status elements or something. Though, it was certainly too late to worry about my production estimates. Haruka-kun, do they come in purple? If you have a wrap bracelet with purple and red stones, give it to me. We'll take it if you have one. And if you don't, make it. Is that so hard? Isn't it a bit presumptuous to demand so much without any money? All the girls were buying on credit. On top of that, these were limited edition goods. They behave as it was a buyer's market regardless. <gasps> Could this be? Could this be due to my lack of sex appeal? It seemed that my absence of charisma was so dire that it broke the laws of economics. How else do you explain her furious demands? Was the purple, red, and blue bracelet not to your liking? Have you no sympathy for the poor color blue? I thought. Have you no sympathy for me? <laughs> I'm not kidding! Even after I sold out, I got 20 more custom orders. I was a millionaire among millionaires, but I had a brutal schedule set out for me tonight. These numbers don't even make sense. The nerds in the meetings didn't even get any. Well, that's because they were pinned against... Well, that's because they're pinned to the wall on fire. Oh well, and I made and sold 50 extra status element resistant bracelets that you guys requested. Just how many does one person need? Just how much do you intend on getting attacked by elements? Technically, I had profited, but my pockets were still empty. Production didn't cost anything, so I didn't mind letting them pay with credit. But that still meant I had no cash on hand. In that case, time to do some dungeoneering. Why do I feel like dungeons are the only place I can go and relax? What's that about? Even so, the architecture and decorating standards of the dungeons were appalling. My next destination would be the worst dungeon yet. It was crawling with bug-type monsters. Ugh. I stopped by the general store to make a delivery. After handing over three bowls of mushroom fried rice, I whacked the general store lady with a folding paper fan. I was overwhelmed with the work. So after making her dinner, I made the paper fan so I could communicate my irritation through slapstick. After we concluded our business, I headed over to the dungeon. <sighs> Woe is me. My enemies are pests and so are my allies. Let's just exterminate the bugs and get this over with. My summer rep was with another group, so I got stuck babysitting these dumbass meatheads. Okay, we got stuck with this dungeon because none of the girls wanted to go toe to TARDIS with a bunch of bugs, I said. But only a real moron would waste her time chasing after bugs and smashing them one by one, you know? They've got wings. Pfft, they'll obviously fly away. <laughs> it totally works, dude! We just gotta chase them when they flee! Kakisaki-kun said. This group had extra sets of biceps where their brains should have been. They only knew how to run up to a monster and hit it until it stopped moving. No range attacks or special abilities. They were well suited to fighting huge beasts, but insects could easily dodge their attacks. This was their worst possible matchup. So they barely made any progress in this dungeon. Since they never learned from their mistakes, they wasted days just chasing after bugs. They were outsmarted by a swarm of insects. We started on the 39th floor, facing level 39's paralyzed moths. All morning, I sold rings that countered their special attacks. Yet, apparently, they couldn't take them down because the moths just avoided their attacks. They had actually been preparing to go back to try again with their usual swords and spears. Even a little kid would try to make a butterfly net or something. Why are you trying to stab mosquitoes with swords? How does it feel to get outwitted by a moth? Do you know what tools are? Have you ever considered learning to do magic? Hmm. Whoa, we never thought of that, the meathead said. <sighs> How stupid can you be? How did none of you think of using a net to catch bugs? Are any of you even equipped with a brain? But, ain't it just faster to stab them? <sighs> You've wasted entire days just chasing moss, I cried. Back at the general store, the owner had recommended some suspicious herbs. She assured me that burning them would take care of the bugs no problem. I had bought out her entire stock. As soon as I started fumigating, the paralyzed moths dropped like, well, moss around us. I couldn't believe that an ordinary insecticide was killing level 39 dungeon moss. That meant that they were just regular old insects, right? Does this mean we can clear this dungeon in a day with some casual fumigation? Oh, bad ass, dude! I would never have come up on that on my own! 
please, get me out of here. Have you never seen an exterminator before? I asked. Did you just ignore me when I explained the plan earlier? Why would someone from the 21st century try to kill bugs with a sword? I'm the only one who should be surprised. Even cavemen would deal bugs better than you. Just how far back was it you evolved? The meatheads made no sense. They showed no signs of intelligent life. What were they? Were they really sentient? Maybe I should try scorching them to find out. <laughs> oh man, I feel like such a dupe. Until now, my best strat was running 30 feet up a wall to slice a moth in half with my flaming sword. Yeah, and I just used common high-speed slashes to prevent swarms or flies from escaping. Bro, remember when you fought those giant beetles? We just staggered them with attacks until their armor broke. Can't believe we did things like that when we could have just used bug spray. Huh, they were kind of convincing me. That sounded a lot more like action scenes in a fantasy world. Was that really the right way to do things? No, they just made it sound awesome. In other words, the meat has chased moths until they were cornered near a wall, swung their swords senselessly when engulfed by swarms of flies, and battered against hard shells of beetles until they won those battles by attrition. They thought like total barbarians. Rather, they didn't even think at all. Whew, they almost tricked me by sounding cool. The power of words is frightening. Did you guys really come from the modern world? I was pretty sure we were classmates, but maybe you were just strangers. Oh, don't be like that, bro. We were in the same class. You know us. I can't believe we came from the same era. If anyone else from the modern world heard this conversation, the sheer idiocy would surely make them weep. And the fact that I was in the same species as them? Well, this was just depressing. While making the idiots feel like idiots, I continued to burn the insecticide herbs and used wind magic to disperse the smoke. On to the next floor, I said. If they're still alive, I can fumigate more. And if that's not enough, we could just flood the dungeon and let them drown. Let's consider our options after we see what's ahead. Bruh. What were we even thinking before trying to take out bugs by fighting? Right? I can't believe I almost died crossing blades with that giant praying mantis. Don't forget the swarm of locusts, dude. We barely survived that. Oh man, and those caterpillars with the venomous spit were the worst. We had run all over the damn dungeon to survive. <laughs> Who knew that burning a few herbs could save us from fighting? Uh, I felt an inexplicable twinge of regret for changing their strategy. It was hard to believe they used to be citizens of the modern world. At least they weren't like the nerds, the worst byproducts of modern civilization. Would any modern person really use swords to fight insects? I asked. Seriously, I'm pretty sure that insecticides were used in the medieval period. Hell, they even used quicklime all the way back in antiquity. I'm pretty sure folks have been using Pythereum daisies since the dawn of civilization. What era did you guys get summoned from? The Jurassic? <sighs> Am I the only normal person around? Huh, that's awful. Day 50. Night. I run a literal clothesline. So I'm 100% in it for being concerned about ups and downs of the textile industry. Interlude. The white leaves are in. The dungeon boss presumably dropped insect shell armor. Presumably because that was what Haruka couldn't find lying on the floor besides the spell stones after fumigating the dungeon. Dude, I didn't expect insecticide to be super effective. Yeah man, damn shame is expensive though. Haruka kun kept bickering with Kakasaki kun's group over who would take the creepy bug armor. They all tried to fob the armor off each other. I don't blame them. It's gross. Haruka kun chased Kakasaki kun around the room, trying to force the armor onto him. Meanwhile, all the girls kept their distance. Everything they brought from that dungeon was equally revolting. Everything was seriously made out of bug parts? I asked. <laughs> Check out this spear! Isn't it sick? Kakasaki kun said. We practically leapt out of our skin. The spear was littered with a huge insect leg. Can you not take that out at the dinner table? The guys proceeded to report their findings. The insecticide exterminated everything except for the worms. So it's unclear what the Dungeon King even was. Despite the bug theme, we found some nasty weapons from the 40th floor onward. Yeah, there was place covered in these freaking huge spider webs. So maybe there was a spider monster there? Haruka interrupted. Oh, what a ripoff. We decided to put earthworms into a bug dungeon. Oh, but that insecticide worked like a charm, you know? Supposedly, it can wipe out everything but roaches. Though, if I saw any giant roaches, I'd run for the hills, you know? 
He did it again. He killed the dungeon boss without bothering to see what it was at first. He didn't even know what type of monster it was, adding yet another entry to our list of unsolved mysteries. Last time, he drowned the dungeon, and this time he poisoned the dungeon. Come to think of it, he's a dude with the boss of the ultimate dungeon! The nurse crowded in on Kakasaki-kun's group with uh, pickled expressions. Their faces were deadly serious. You said there were weapons dropped at the 46th floor, but did you find anything else? Was that it? Marakun asked. Yeah, did you find anything to protect the uh, um, chest? Nerd B added, blushing. Another nerd asked. And you found no armor for below the waist, right? What? What's the big deal? Kakizaki-kun asked, perplexed. You sure you didn't find any sort of leather bikini? Marakun tried to whisper. The eyes of the nerds widened, full of dismay. The eyes of the nerds widened, full of dismay. They knew more than any of us about fantasy worlds, so if something produced such an effect on them, it had to be serious. All four versed in hyperventilation. What kind of weapons did you find? Um, the usual. Swords, spears, and shields. What's your problem, bruh? Otakun cast his eyes down, his shoulders tense and shivering. They could have been arcane demons, but you massacred them without bothering to find out! The nurse started wailing and gnashing their teeth. What's special about arcane demons? Are they friendly monsters? Even Haruka consumed with his mouth agape. Realization dawning. Arcane demons? Do you mean what I think you mean? We didn't find any armor, bro. Nothing! Kakasaki-kun stammered. The nerds turned on Haruka-kun, their eyes fiery. You! What color is your blood? Hold on. Why would there be arcane demons in a bug dungeon? They're not insects, right? Uh, they didn't drop armor. They had no armor. Just a bikini. Oh, no! The boys couldn't contain their anguish. What was happening? It looked like Angelica knew what was going on. She was giving them a flat look. I should ask her. Half lady, half spider. So spiders from the waist down and women from the waist up, right? And no armor is important because... Oh. Verdict. Guilty on all accounts. Intermission. Lecture in progress. Gross! You are seriously thirsty for naked bugs? Arcane demons dropped weapons but no armor, meaning they were most likely naked and only wore a leather bikini at best. Whatever the case, they were obsessing over a sexy monster girl. Ugh. Guys, we groaned in unison. Haruka-kun alone refused to admit his guilt. He claimed that in Greek myth, Arcane was the only weaver to surpass the goddess Athena. Listen, he continued. I have so many custom orders from you. I need help. It's so much work. Since Arcane demons must be renowned weavers, they could have made everything, even the raw materials. I leaped on my feet. For real? For real, for real. An arcane demon spins her own thread, so she could make everything from scratch. Besides, with eight limbs, she'll never have her hands full. Think of the possibilities. If I had an arcane servant, I could mass-produce clothes. <gasps> no longer would I have eyes blur as I pushed myself to the brink of exhaustion. I could end the walking nightmare of a sweatshop labor. Not only that, but we could have had cheaper clothes in many more styles. Do you not see that I am blameless in all of this? Without warning, the girls, myself included, began to tremble, as if the agitation and lament were about to overflow from our hearts. We could not lecture him any longer. Our great hope for cheap, fashion, and multitude of styles perished. There were no flaws in his argument. Exploiting our weakness, he rendered all of our counter-arguments moot. His defense was impregnable. Although, he did shout, NO ARMOR! Along with the other nerds. Surely whether they wore armor or not had no bearing on their ability to produce a clothing line. This was damning evidence. Beyond any reasonable doubt, he wanted to peep our naked monster girls. Verdict, definitely guilty. The lecture has resumed. Please wait a little longer. Moving past the lecture, our meeting went well. Two of the groups reached the 49th floor, but returned because they didn't want to risk losing to the dungeon boss. Thus, we decided to all raid one of the bosses together. On top of that, Haruka couldn't have to go find all the secret treasures. So tomorrow would be a busy day for all of us, especially for Haruka-kun. Even though Haruka-kun never reported to the Duke, to the point that he bribed Sakura with some candy to report on his steed, his schedule was still packed. Haruka-kun probably needed help with the item production, 
but he was the only one of us who had any practical skill in alchemy. We couldn't help him at all, since we all had crafting skill penalties. Haruka kun also seemed to be the best tailor around, but we couldn't help either. Even if some of us could sew by hand, none of us could use magic to sew or help him mass produce anything. We couldn't find any processed ingredients for food either. Only Haruka kun could do that. Even those of us who knew how to cook without magic didn't know how obscure recipes like how to make ketchup. Not that any of us could cook with magic either. Isn't magic supposed to be for combat? I've lost all my pride as a woman. I was even a member of the school's cooking club. I don't understand how he uses magic to cook. It's not like we can recognize the ingredients either. On top of that, having to cook without access to spices or sauces is way too hard. No matter how basic the craft, Haruka kun just kind of took to it. Not only that, but he was getting commissioned for serious construction projects. Even the sorcerer who could use elemental magic didn't know the first thing about architecture. None of us could even read blueprints, so we were useless. My skills could destroy, but they couldn't create. Not to mention all his freelance work, consulting with local businesses, financing them, advising them on merchandise, producing and selling his own merch, and so on. How was he still alive? To put it mildly, Hargagun was pretty busy. Even if crossing was his true specialty, not combat, he still demolished dungeons faster than anyone. No one else could conquer a dungeon with fumigation, flooding, or dissolving the metal. And that wasn't his only advantage in combat, since he had a true combat legend, Angelica, as his servant. Right now, she was sulking a bit because she wanted to stay in the same group as Harakakun. Ah, <sighs> she's so cute. Harakakun destroyed dungeons by day and fueled the whole town's economy with crafting skills by night. I couldn't believe that he could maintain this pace every single day. He makes all of our equipment too. Yeah, and he added buffs to all of our accessories and clothing. Right? Not to mention all the dungeon loot he sells at affordable prices. He's doing everything by himself. <laughs> affordable by ass, Shimizaki-san said. If he sold everything at market rates, we couldn't afford anything. Yeah, instead he figured out exactly how much we could afford and took every last eel. Even though he drained our wallet without mercy, I was still grateful to him. Even though he talked me into spending all my wealth, he still went bankrupt the second I turned my back. Despite my criticisms, I was truly happy. Even when I tried to thank him, I ended up scolding him anyways. But stop fantasizing about arcane demons! Even Angelica was disturbed. And the mean girls looked ready to bite his head off. It looked like a storm was brewing between slaves and masters. Even if he had ended up enslaving them, at least he made sure that they had the clothes they wanted. Ah, uh, the missed opportunity of cheap clothes and a ton of styles! Day 50. Night. It would be no problem if you simply adjust the shipping strategy to match the town's planning and waterway management. Omoi City. Interlude. The Duke's Palace. To conclude my report, here are Haruka-kun's proposals. This one is about trade, finance, and economics. Below is the strategy for agricultural reforms. The document on the floor focused on regional development plans. The proposal for urban renewal is at the very bottom of the pile. The girl thanked me for my time and left the room. I was surrounded by teetering stacks of plans, with even more proposals surrounding them. A brief glance was enough to know that all these proposals were revolutionary. I looked at the defense plans first. They were completely without precedent. It proposed turning the mountain that surrounded Omoi into fortress walls and establishing a fortified city that could direct the economy of the entire duchy. He had already completed this first step, placing a pseudo-dungeon as the gatehouse to the duchy. He wanted to place one castle town at the entrance to manage trade and defense, and another in the south to address the looming threat of monsters. In the east and west, the proposal detailed plans for agricultural zones, with new Omoi lying in the center, with Omoi's army garrison at each corner of the central metropolis. We would be able to quickly address problems in all directions. Finally, there was even a detailed plan for maintaining the public roads. This, I began. This is outrageous! Yet, muttered an administrator. I only wanted to discuss the events in Nalagi, but instead I was handing a radical development plan for the entire duchy. The very idea that an entire realm could be turned into a massive fortress was a stroke of genius, and he had already completed the construction of the walls on our border with the kingdom. He even produced the map drafts and a schedule. How did he make such a detailed map? There was even a budget attached with the cost-benefit analysis, and the public works project were surprisingly affordable. On top of that, there was still room for further negotiations, 
Civil servants from every department fought over the proposals and red escorts allowed with giddy abandon. Fires kindled in their souls as they regarded the possibilities. We should implement this one next! No, this proposal is far more important! They read and reread the proposals as they were possessed, confirming plans and details with one another. There was no hiding their newfound excitement. I must be dreaming, I thought. A dream of a peaceful and prosperous realm. None dared imagine that such a dream would be realized on the frontier. He had provided us with the instructions to usher in a golden age for our humble city. I was almost afraid to believe it was possible. Despite my skepticism and my careful scrutiny, I could not deny the evidence before my eyes. These proposals formed a blueprint for a future utopia. Our tears washed over the piles of reports. The proposals read like a map to a land of dreams. These stoic bureaucrats broke into Rakakis' laughter as they imagined a bright, shining future for their children and their children's children. Indeed, the content of these reports were pure dream stuff, and to read them was to enter a walking fantasy. Yet, those same pages outlined how we could capture those idols and make them real. They blazed the path toward an impossible future. We brimmed and overflowed with hope that turned to joyous tears, for the future would become a paradise. Indeed, these were not mere flights of fantasy. The proposals told us what we needed to do to obliterate all obstacles to utopia and make it a reality, even by force. Yes, this wasn't aspirational. This was a strategy to overcome any obstacle. His plans refused to recognize any possibility other than a blissful dream. Dear friends, I said, if there are any among you who believe this plan is impossible, after having seen so much, step forward now and make yourself known. None of my attendants moved as they stared at me, tears running down their cheeks. Yes, exactly as I hoped. They wore their conviction on their face. This was a task worth any risk. There could be no higher purpose than enacting these plans. Then, we must begin. Do what can be done, and send regular reports of your progress and any issues you face. If you need anything, whether goods or people, you need but ask. The civil servants and administrators chorused, Yes, my lord! They returned to their posts, their faces as resolute as if they've marched to war. No, for civil servants, this was war. Until now, these brave officials could only try to pick up the pieces between losing battles. This was their first real chance for victory. Even the generals in the military were impressed by the defense proposal, the incorporated strategies, and the novel tactics. I refer to another proposal. How could one person have so much intelligence, knowledge, and craft? What in the world was that boy? Who were those youth? Were they just a collective dream? A hallucination haunting our desolate realm? Frontier folk did not believe in gods. How could we? So why did those youth come to this blighted, hopeless duchy? Why did they do so much for us, knowing that we couldn't hope to repay them? Before their arrival, the people of the frontier only knew doom. The mysterious youth spread happiness and destroyed monsters wherever they went. They never said where they came from or why they came. I didn't even know what their goals were. After all, I never understood a word that came out of that boy's mouth. Nonetheless, those youths with black hair and black eyes spread joy to the frontier. Worship would be insufficient repayment for these blessings they brought. Yet, though they have blessed us anew every day, I could do little more than express my thanks. The lad at the center of their group spread bliss to every corner of this region without ever remembering its name. Why won't he remember the name of this realm? Why won't he remember the name of my realm? We put up signs everywhere. Even these fantastical blueprints for our future refer to the town as Whateverburg or Somewhereville. It's named Omoy, Haruka! Omoy! Day 51. Morning. It's not time to panic yet, but there's no time to nap either. The White Loser in. Today we're splitting ourselves up into boss fight groups and regular dungeon exploration groups. Remember which group you're in. Especially you, Haruka-kun. You're obviously asleep! It's bad enough that you never listen while you're awake, but now you're just sleeping through the meetings! Hey, wake up! Ugh, how rude. I was totally listening. The plan was to clear the 50th floor of three dungeons and all in one day. See, I heard everything. I was just resting my eyes, well, also unconscious, but totally not asleep, you know? 
I was even using Blockhead to puppet my unconscious body so I could stay on my feet. So no issues there. I was just... You know. <sighs> Everything about this is wrong. I never heard any sleeping person say ZZZZZ before. Wake up, damn it! You've got to get started! Angelica, what do you do to wake him up in the morning? She told him. What? No, 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 no. He wakes up with a kiss? Why does it have to be that? You can't expect me to do that. Why are you all staring at me? I, I refuse. No way. Not in a million years. Not when everyone's looking. That doesn't mean you should all look away. Do you think I would do that? There's no way. Please, just wake up, Otto Cocoon. With focus, I could block out all external stimuli. Right when it started to feel like I could think again, I woke up. The morning sun shone through the window, and Clastra's blushing face shone nearly as bright. <sighs> What's all the hubbub? I'm trying to catch some shut eye, you know. Sleep lost means youth lost. Know what I'm saying? I don't want to face that fate. Um, why is your face so close? M my face isn't close. Your face is close. Why is everyone looking at us like that? Wake up! You slept way too much! Why did this morning have to be like this? Ah! Without warning, the class rep burst into tears. What did I miss? Tears were running down her blushing cheeks. Oh, it's okay. Did you get an upset stomach because you couldn't sleep? There, there. Are you hungry? You already had breakfast, didn't you? Hmm. Speaking of which, I need breakfast. Why would I get an upset stomach from staying up all night? Besides, you just ate breakfast. Don't be an idiot, Haragakun. How could you forget something so recent? Ugh, how lively. <sighs> Will I never have a peaceful morning? Ah, she chickened out! You traitors! Why didn't any of you help me? Why did you all just look the other way? You were expecting me to kiss him. That's too embarrassing, I couldn't! Hello? What about breakfast? Even though we were in the dining hall, there was no food in sight. Ugh, I didn't need to go on a diet. Indeed, I couldn't function without those precious breakfast nutrients. I closed my eyes for a moment, and when I next opened them, I found myself in a dungeon. Hmm, another unfamiliar dungeon. What? Why did I wake up in a dungeon? Where are we? Oh, how wonderful that you decided to open your eyes. See, walking all the way here was an impressive trick. Nothing could wake you, not even touching you, Vice Red Beast said, smiling and bouncing. Not like that. I meant bouncing on her feet. Get your mind out of the gutter. Huh? Sleepwalking? Hey, what do you mean touching? Who fucked me up? Why won't any of you look at me in my eyes? What happened? There was something fishy going on. Could it be sexual harassment? Who was the culprit? Where did their touchy hands wander? Anyway, um, since we're here, let's go conquer this dungeon, I declared, whipping out my stick. Wow, nice stick. Why did they sound so sarcastic? My suspicions were only deepening. Soon, my suspicions would go deeper than this dungeon. There's a secret room on this floor, I said. Which floor are we anyway? One of the mean girls answers, The first. We, like, just got here. There's a secret room so soon? Why aren't they supposed to be in the deeper, danker part of a dungeon or whatever? This was my first time encountering a secret room before the 20th floor. Could there really be one here? There was something strange about it. It's such an odd spot, but I'm certain it's there. I push on the wall of the dungeon's entrance. What? A secret room right at the start? Vice Rep Ace buttered. With a cascade of dust, the false wall slid open, revealing a small chamber. Instead of a treasure chest, the room contained a book. Was this a fantasy world equivalent of finding a porn mag stashed by a riverbank or hiding in some bushes at the park? Was this the real purpose of dungeons? Ooh, I'm excited! This world is full of hot girls! Know how to magic items? Hang on. It really exists? Did my midnight ramblings trigger an event flag? So begging for this plot development was enough to trigger it? But someone owns my teenage horniness an apology! I was glad that the book actually existed, but why was it hidden? Perhaps it was secreted away in the dungeon because it was banned? Because the text was so useful to the region, it was hidden rather than burned? Whatever the case, I could only speculate. Judging by the layer of dust, it had been laying untouched for a very long time. 
Living through it, know how to magic items, wasn't indeed a sequel to how to magic item. How many crimes against grammar will there be in the title of the next volume? How many more volumes will I find? This volume detailed more sophisticated magic item creation methods and expounded on the theory behind magic and skills. Besides the title, it was a pretty dense text. Reading between the lines, I felt the author's desire to give the people knowledge they needed to live in safety and comfort. The banning of this book was an incalculable loss to the world. This book would have made the lives of so many safer and easier. Not just soldiers and adventurers, but farmers and merchants too. Banning this text should have been unthinkable. If I just change the title, is that enough to get it unbanned? After a brief discussion, class rep said to me, We've decided that you should have the book, Harukakun. It's perfect for you. I stashed the book in my bag. Excellent, I thought. Now I had to find all the other secret rooms so that we can all grab our own little prize. It's a treasure hunt. The monsters on the upper floors were slaughtered before I could face them myself, leaving behind nothing but spellstones. Miss Armorberg was feeling herself today. She was in the middle of a whirlwind murder spree. I knew what was happening. I wouldn't have anything to do this time either. Exploring a new dungeon by doing nothing but walking down some stairs should have been a rare experience, but at this point, it was routine. Huh? Another room already? It's only the fifth floor. This dungeon sure is full of secrets. Could this be the bookstore dungeon? All right! Let's remodel this place of a moving! My imagination raced with the possibilities. What if it had sections for manga, video games, and even figures? You've decided all that after finding a single book? You're just looking for an excuse to do a dungeon renew. <sighs> the last time you tried to renovate a dungeon, you fell into a pit to the lowest floor. Will you never learn? Hmm. I feel like this location is a deal breaker, Vice Rep B said. It's nowhere near the town or even any villages. Hmm. Fair point. No need to rush this plan. Right. I should shop around and look at other properties before making my decision. Dungeons aren't real estate, the class rep shouted. They're obviously not on the market. For some reason, my classmates weren't into the whole dungeon makeover scheme. They must prefer new construction. I mean, I get it. But building a new dungeon would be a huge pain in the ass, you know? I need to dig deep just to see what's under there before I could lay a proper foundation. So there'll be holes everywhere. I mean, like all over the realm, you know? Ugh, you still don't get it. Glares in a dungeon just hit different. I was the only guy here, so I was getting three full groups worth of glares. The destiny of the glares was something special. My morning ritual of getting glared at by the guild receptionist was nothing like this. Huh? I had apparently gone to the adventurer's guild this morning. Class rep told me I shuffled into the guild like I was sleepwalking, mumbled complaints about the job board, and walked out after the head receptionist glowered at me. Was that even possible? Here it is. Let's see what we got. Let's go magic items. Huh? Why did they hide on a different floor? <sighs> That's so inconvenient. Besides, can't I find a different book series? These titles are just getting worse. The third volume. There was an advanced level textbook. Everything about it was more difficult. Even finding the necessary ingredients would be challenging. What the hell? Hmm. Hey, there's even a section on magic clothing. The prismatic dress. A dress which uses magic power to change color according to the wearer's preference. Hmm. Damn. This is insanely hard to make. It doesn't need any rare ingredients, but just processing this many spellstones sounds like way too much of a hassle. Why bother? Suddenly, the girls were all shouting in my ear. I'll pay any price. Just make it and make blouses and skirts too. Take all the books we find in this dungeon. Just start making stuff. Anything more exciting than these rags? It's a miracle! We're saved! They gave me the book. And they wanted dresses. <sighs> Are you kidding me? Prismatic dresses, skirts, and blouses for 21 people would mean making 63 garments! I can't handle a workload that heavy, I thought. I'll never get to sleep again. Uh, I hardly got any sleep yesterday because of all the custom orders I was working on. Though... I was wide awake when it was time to take measurements. Especially when it came to Vice Rep A's tight leather skirt and Vice Rep B's pinafore dress. My eyes widened so much I couldn't even blink. Still, I etched every detail into my memory, thanks to the all-seeing Jupiter eye. 
I remember when my measuring tape snapped to attention. Oh boy, oing. What's with the day's expression? Hello? Pay attention! Day 51, morning. If your girlfriend grabs your stomach in a fantasy world, you will explode into a ball of flames. A dungeon. After a series of tense negotiations, we came to an agreement. Assuming I successfully produced prismatic clothes, the 10 girls present today, the student council, shield girl, the sports girl, and fish girl had priority on my first orders. After all, I needed to practice with a few prototypes before moving into mass production. I can't decide between ordering a flared skirt or a dress. Can I order both so I don't have to choose? I get the sense that a top would be cheaper to make, but it feels like a shade to decide based on cost. Since it can like change color, it would suck if we only got something seasonal. So we should totally get basics that work year round, right? Something simple and versatile is probably best, but should I get a top or a bottom? I want both. Come on, can we get extra orders? The class rep said, I wear my cloak every day, so getting a prismatic cloak would be the most obvious choice, but it wouldn't be cute at all. T-shirts make sense, but that would feel like a waste. Blouses go with everything. I still want a skirt too, Vice Rep C said. Let's just make additional orders. That'll solve the problem. More orders won't solve anything, I protested. I asked you to pick one, and you all just demanded both. <sighs> this is the worst fantasy world to end up in, where I'm stuck as an overworked teenage freelancing in a sweatshop of my own design. This girl's getting more and more dead every day. Did they keep pushing me around like I owed them? Why did I get the feeling that this whole situation was backwards? Quit daydreaming and get to work, Vice Rep A said, staring daggers. Damn right, Vice Rep C squeaked. Never underestimate the importance of fashion to teenage girls. Make them now. Make them now. Make them now, Vice Rep B said, jumping up and down. They're... they're shaking. <laughs> Never mind. Anyway, wasn't there something off about a dungeon crawl where we mostly talk about fashion and battled monsters merely as an afterthought? We need the perfect amount of clothes. Shoo! Stupid monster! I think the cutest kind of top is always get out of my way, die already! And we can't just forget the accessories. Die, die, die! I wasn't going to have a chance to draw my weapon at all today. My wooden staff was just going to hang off my belt unused. I hadn't even touched it yet. There had never before been an adventure for whom a divine sword was just a glorified paperweight. <sighs> this sucks. I was so excited to try out my new dimension blade. Why did I get benched like some kind of newbie? While working on the other side projects last night, I devoted some time to upgrading my own equipment. I upgraded the mana cutter with mithril, and the description changed. Mana cutter, a magical sword with uncanny sharpness. Min level 50. Parentheses, parentheses. Adding the empty parentheses. After some experimentation, I confirmed that I could suck at spell stones with embedded spell effects in those parentheses. How to magic item described the process, but it had to be tested. As I socketed a spellstone charged with teleport, the description updated again. Dimension blade, attack power and rage controlled with magic, min level 100, dimensional slash. Though a cloak really would be pra- Perish beast! I see what you mean! These monsters don't care about fashion at all. Maybe a color changing school tracksuit. Ooh, what a good idea! Um, why won't anyone pay attention to me? I asked. <sighs> I'm sick of this. Today was supposed to be the grand debut of my sword. Yet, I barely even got to glimpse a living monster before Miss Amarep inevitably delivered its spell zone to me. That's it. I'm taking the night off. My equipment wasn't going to benefit from any more upgrades, and I was about to get flooded with new commissions. And before I slept, I had to do some serious sleeping, which made me getting to sleep earlier all the more important for my sleep. Finally, we reached a proper secret chamber on the 10th floor. If it ended up being another book... I was going to be annoyed. There wasn't nearly enough time to test everything out. They should slow down on their release schedule, make it a quarterly. It's only been five floors since the last treasure, right? What kind of pervert is hiding all these books? I mean, it makes sense that they're banned, but how many banned books are there? Besides, I'm only 16. Is this even legal? What are the age restrictions on banned books? The actual room was a little more than an alcove with another book. This literally was a bookstore dungeon. I'm definitely renovating this place. Still, it seemed like it wasn't well stocked, as they only had one copy of each book. Ha, <laughs> I was right. This is a bookstore. Hmm, let's see. This one is titled 
The complete cookie premiere. Satisfy your boyfriend with a shining finger on his stomach. Huh? Oh, run, boyfriend, run! Shining finger will blow up the poor man's guts like a G Gundam. It's guaranteed death, a technique meant for battle. How the hell did a fantasy world have something called shining finger? Was God taunting me? Was shining finger just a euphemism for a satisfied stomach? It was just a normal cookbook inside. I found nothing in there about destroying your boyfriend's GI tract with a shining finger sword. Regardless, this book definitely deserved to be banned. Its title was horrific. Any sequels would probably be even worse. A cookbook? You probably don't need that, haruka -kun. You're already a master chef! Well, I wouldn't mind skimming through it, I said. But I don't need to keep it, so if any of you girls want to learn how to cook, you can have it, you know? A pause, followed by a chorus of girls saying, Keep it, haruka -kun! Hmm, were they implying that I was the only one who should cook? That didn't feel fair. I wanted to experience the joy of a home-cooked meal prepared by a pretty girl. It was an important fantasy of every teenage boy. The only thing the girls ever cooked was fried fish back in the cave. Sure, it was delicious, but it wasn't a proper home-cooked meal. Wow, there are so many mysterious plants in here. I'll track them down. What's melting white butter? If I manage to make a bunch, it'll solve my butter shortage. I'm not sure I get the name, though. Is it so tasty it'll make me melt? Does it melt ingredients? Wouldn't that defeat the purpose of cooking, maybe? Back in Japan, so many folk walked around in their eyes glued to their phones that it was a problem. Not me, though. I didn't even have a basic cell phone. The fantasy world equivalent was reading books while dungeon crawling, and I was guilty of that without a doubt. It didn't matter, though. No one paid any attention to me, and the monsters never got anywhere near me. The girls were pretty focused and accepting when it came to securing food and clothing for the future, so they let me be. But when I started to renovate the dungeon a little bit, they got on my case. You can't live off of food and clothes alone. Shelter is a basic necessity too. Besides, what was the difference between renovating my cave and renovating a dungeon? Was this dungeon discrimination? A certain former dungeon emperor probably didn't take kindly to that kind of bias. Although, at the moment, she was too busy killing things to notice. Whoa, there's more. Mystery fruits and veggies, so many mysteries. Fruit? Uh, are we about to start a fantasy world fruit festival? Yes, all the fruits! I think this is the beginning of a new chapter in our adventure. No more dungeons, only fruit picking! Yes, let's have punch! Punch, oh hell yeah! Let's make it a date! Let's go harvest fruits in all the villages! Though we anticipated a far more exciting diet in the future, we still had to contend with the critical shortage of livestock in the frontier. With the monsters in the evil forest driving almost to extinction, the animal population had begun to recover, which provided a steady supply of meat for now. But it wasn't sustainable. Hunting was unreliable, relegating game meats to a luxury food stuff. I needed to prioritize animal husbandry, but the book didn't contain any info on how to do that. Please, let me find another volume. I wished. Please, mighty hopes, trigger a new event flag. We formed these groups to slay dungeon bosses, but we somehow gotten roped into looking for books, haven't we? Asked the class rep. A tumult of voices. Prismatic dresses are worth it! You're right. I need them. Get to work, haruka -kun. She didn't leave me with much choice. The girls were putting a lot of pressure on me to deliver. I was planning to craft a prototype dress tonight anyways, but they made it clear that I had no alternatives. That meant I had to do more measurements. It was too much for a teenage boy's constitution. It was impossible to sleep after I took measurements. Even Miss Arborev had bag under her eyes today. <sighs> when will I sleep a full night again? As we marched to the 50th floor, I kept waiting to the soundtrack of wailing monsters and bloody battle. Ms. Armor Rep was raring to go, so there was no chance of facing any monsters myself. This way's the safest, so I can't complain, right? On the 15th floor, I found On the Science of Metallurgy and Alchemy. An unexpectedly normal title, and its constants matched the cover. Treaties and Methods of Metalworking and Alchemy. Is the world telling me to start yet another side gig? I said. This has to be a trap. Another dungeon trap. This fiend, this dungeon is potent to kill me through sleep deprivation. Oh, but this book is interesting. It even describes how to upgrade equipment with mithril. The techniques were exactly the same as the ones I discovered through experimentation. The sacrifice of countless hours of sleep. Give me back that time. After a time, one of the girls ventured. Sorry for your loss. On the 20th floor, I found The Field Guide to Botany. 
This one was useful. Being able to identify plants would be a massive boon, I thought. It even stated whether a plant was edible, medicinal, or useful in any other way. I didn't need to guess anymore. Each entry was rich with detail, listing common names, distributions, and possible uses. The only information missing was how to cultivate my own. Even without that, this book was one of the best finds yet. I found the Index of Skills on the 25th floor. It contained descriptions of all known skills. It was like finding a strategy guide. I flipped through it, looking for an explanation of some of my more obscure skills. But my hopes were dashed. It didn't even have entries for general health, sensitivity, calisthenics, body manipulation, or walking mastery. It didn't even have entries on my thinking skills. Serial thinking, parallel thinking, or the combined supreme thinking. Apparently, MP absorption and revival were monster-only skills. Are you suggesting something about that humanity book? Bring it on. I'll burn you. Anyway, it also lacked entry on Dash, Arrowwalk, Jupiter's Eye, God's Eye, Clairvoyance, Spell Eye, Wisdom Eye, and Eye Mastery. And although puppetry and mesmerize were mentioned as legendary skills, it made no mention of a skill called servitude. Day 51, Morning. What's more rural than the remorest? What is more rural than the remotest of humanity's frontiers? A dungeon. The day continued. I kept reading and we descended further into the dungeon. No, really, that's all we did. Walked down some stairs, picked up a book, rinse and repeat. Our group was designed to take out the final dungeon boss, so we breezed through the dungeon. Despite our surroundings, all any of the girls could talk about was clothes. Even Ms. Armorep, having concluded her most recent bloodbath, joined on the conversation. She removed her helmet and chatted with a smile on her face. She was happy, so I couldn't complain. But there was something off about acting like this in a dungeon. On the 30th floor, I picked up a book from an altogether new series, Country Living. This is obviously meant for me. I'm living in the countryside. I'm literally living in a cave in the woods of the frontier. Nothing's more rural than that. Despite living in the countryside, nothing was slow and relaxed about it. It was a hardcore struggle for survival. You can't call where you live the countryside. It can't even be called a wilderness. You can't call where you live the countryside. It can't even be called a wilderness. That's not a bad country. It's a monster country. Vice Rip C said. There is literally nothing but monsters there. Vice Rip B agreed. I was stuck in a cave, working my ass off every single night. I needed to find a place to move where I could properly live my life as a shut-in. Yeah, that's what I'll do. I'll retire, you know? I said to myself. Not like I have to actually do anything. I could totally just retire. Even so, a book on farm management was nice to have. There were detail enough to be academic textbooks. It was the perfect guide to reforming the agriculture of this realm. Also, it seemed like talking to myself really did trigger event flags. The books were probably here before I said anything, but it seems way too convenient to be a coincidence. I'll make the nerds read this book too. They might pick up a lot of great administration cheats and I can consult with them. Then we can incorporate animal husbandry into my reforms. Meat! The girl shouted. It was, apparent at this, it was apparent at this point that no one in this world knew how to title a book. Someone should have published naming books for dummies first. I want the author of How to Magic Item to read it right away for real. The silver blade gleam in the darkness. In other words, because of Miss Armorep, I had nothing to do. We reached the 35th floor. Miss Armorep seemed a bit too into this, you know? It felt like she was giving us a guided tour of the dungeon. There was a secret room down here, precisely five floors after the last, which confirmed my hypothesis. This dungeon had a secret every five floors. Another book. The Complete Encyclopedia of Weapon Techniques. Great. Meh, who cares? I said, tossing it aside. You didn't even open it! Class Rep cried. Combat skills are for regular one-on-one -on -one combats, aren't they? I'll get killed if I try fighting like that. Oh, of course, how could I forget? She replied. You've never even come close to dying. How could you expect anyone to remember your excuses? Vice Rep A asked. Combat skills were the basis of most normal fights, which is why levels were supposed to be a big deal. They were powerful, but a fighter who used them couldn't interrupt their execution to dodge or run away. As awesome as they were, they left the user wide open. I couldn't use something like that. I couldn't use something like that. I'll die instantly. Sharing the book between ourselves will be the best. The nerds had started researching technique combos, so they would definitely benefit. I might learn any instant kill techniques if there is one in there. But it's probably pointless at my level, you know? I'm still in the teens. Miss Omarep nodded, so how was that? This dungeon was almost as long as their conversation about fashion. How many clothes do you expect me to make? 
You wear the same armor every day anyway. I was met with a chorus of protests. Girls like clothings, okay? Did I have to keep hustling until the town entered the modern age? I needed to send a new proposal to Mr. Mary Dead right away. We need to prioritize basic necessities. If the farming reforms produce a surplus of food, then we could turn our attention to livestock. The agriculture of this region would naturally grow more sophisticated from there. As for housing, I already submitted a proposal on the basics of modern architecture. That was my punishment for letting the textiles fall by the wayside. If I wanted to create a wider supply of fabrics, I had to first industrialize the textile industry. The people could develop their own designs, but production needed to be scaled up. That meant that I had to develop industrial magic-powered looms to replace hand weaving. <sighs> How did I end up in a world where I had to kickstart the industrial revolution? Starting with fabrics as a freelance gig? This isn't normal. Not at all. There was a serious imbalance of power among us. Think about it. Our class was made of 21 girls and 10 guys. Four of the guys were oblivious nerds unfit for any social situation, and another five were complete idiots. <sighs> this is hopeless. We could never get a word in edgewise. There was nothing we could do. None of us could resist helping a bunch of cute girls. 21 girls in all, and I was in an even more dire situation. 11 girls and only one guy. Me! From the outside, this must look like a harem, but I was totally powerless against them. They overwhelmed me just in terms of numbers. Not only were they always in the majority, but they were far more persuasive than any of us guys. And now that they had Miss Amarep on their side, she held so much sway with me that I couldn't avoid getting exploited. Granted, I emptied their pockets more than once, but they didn't seem to care about their debts. They had expensive taste, but I certainly wasn't going to do anything to mess up that current situation. Being surrounded by beautiful girls was a ton of fun, even if it meant working myself to death. We're gonna be rich and eat delicious food! Woohoo! It was easy for me to get swept in whatever they wanted. I like making these girls laugh and smile, so I ended up making sweets, cooking dinner, making clothes and accessories, and so on. When I first encountered them in the forest, their faces were contorted with fear, sadness and exhaustion, and their resignation and despair. They could do little but stare blankly, the last sparks of hope extinguished in their eyes. I could never forget those expressions. I never wanted to see their faces like that again. That's why I wanted to make them laugh. To smile, to have fun, to be happy. That was reason enough for my self-imposed overworked sweatshop labor. <sighs> Being a teenage boy is tough. I'll bet my frustration on those useless nerds and meatheads when I get back. I thought, I swear it. As expected, another secret chamber on the 40th floor, I said. This really is a bookstore dungeon. Will the bottom floor have a bookshelf? Oh man, let's clear this dungeon ASAP! No flooding or burning, I forbid it! No getting reckless either, we don't want to damage any books! Miss Overrep and I are the only two allowed on the final floor. By strip B, that goes double for you! Oh dear, what did I do? You keep swimming and bouncing all over the damn- <coughs> <coughs> Ooh. Um, Vice Red B was an arc stage. Her magic alone was enough to destroy countless books, but the real danger was something else in her case. She went totally berserk in fights, smashing, bashing, shattering, and wrecking everything in her path. And I wasn't just worried about how she swung her weapon either. I couldn't concentrate when other parts swung in my field of vision. Hmm, for some reason, Jupiter's eye automatically focused on her gigantic rack. Letting you two handle the fight doesn't bother me, Class Rep said. But I won't be able to stop worrying if we're not together, so we'll be right behind you just in case. Hang on. Are you thinking about something filthy right now? You're guilty, aren't you? Oh, my giddy aunt, I said convincingly. Could this be another secret room? What sort of secrets will we find here? What secret treasure will we unearth? Hmm, a book called Herbalism. How incredible, you know. Are you going to complain about the title again? No, this one's awesome. I can't believe they banned this one, I said. What sort of awful world bans a book on medicine? It went in depth on different types of herbs and how to turn them into potions, poultices, ungents, and other medicines, as well as recommended treatments for various illnesses. Since surgery wasn't a viable option in the medieval level of medicine, the book only focused on pharmacological remedies. Spells and mushrooms could recover HP, but they didn't do anything for serious wounds or illnesses. True healing mushrooms and potions were apparently incredibly rare and precious. The status quo wasn't good enough. This book needed to be copied and distributed immediately. It would, be, it would do no good if I was the only person with medical knowledge. I could only do so much. Books could transmit knowledge to many people, 
the more people gathering herbs and making salves, the more patients could be saved. Of course, I talked myself into another part-time job. This time, I was going to establish a printing press. By the way, Ms. Armor Rep, the monsters are getting stronger, so you shouldn't fight them by yourself. I know you'll be okay, but be mindful of your own safety if you know what I mean. She nodded in understanding. We had reached the 45th floor. Ms. Armor Rep was nearly level 30, but her stats remained relatively low. No one would guess from watching her, but a single hit from one of those monsters would put her in mortal danger. These monsters were getting crafty, and they fought in packs, so we couldn't drop our guard. Five monsters stood between us and the next treasure room. Mm, no, there were two more further ahead, so seven in total. There are seven levels, 45 chimeras ahead, beast type, and they're dangerous. They won't go down easily, so everyone stay safe, okay? These were probably the most dangerous monsters we would fight before the 50th floor. There were a horrifying amalgam of other beasts, multiple heads, extra hearts, and even multiple spellstones at times. They traveled in packs and were likely to survive even critical hits, so tanks were a better matchup against them than damage dealers. It was less risky. Worst of all, chimeras absorbed the ability of anything they ate. Some could potentially use magic. They could have even eaten adventurers. We had no way of knowing what skills they were hiding. Form a shield wall! Hold fast! The class repped order. On it! There weren't that many of them, and they didn't seem to have any special skills. So overall, it seemed safe. But you never knew what could happen in the chaos of battle. I don't think any of them are particularly bad, but they're all pretty bad, you know? I said. That's not helpful! Okay. Miss Armorup and I, the glass cannons of our groups, will stay in the back, provided magical support, and engage in a hit and run tactics. This was technically the safest strategy. We'll listen to you and even stay in the defensive formation as we approach. So why is our rear guard attacking with instant kills? What happened to avoiding danger? Well, you see, I was itching to try out my dimensional blade. Just a small test, you know? I was just thinking that it would be cool if I did some damage, okay? I didn't do anything dangerous on purpose. You gotta believe me. I wanted to do a quick hit and run. Just a one tack before I sit back into formation. Although, I did charge right at the chimeras. <sighs> Look what you did at the wall of the dungeon! It was my first time using Dimensional Slash, so I might have charged it with a smidge too much MP. Not only did I slash through all the chimeras, everything in a hundred foot radius in front of me was blown to bits. Teleport was apparently a type of void magic, so when it was used as an attack, it banished anything in the way to the void. It was dangerous, so dangerous it shouldn't be used near allies. <sighs> if I lost control, people could get hurt. You didn't think that was dangerous? The class rep yelled. Get in the back! Uh, well, it was just a little mistake, right? I didn't mean for that to happen, you know? It was like life or death augmented with teleport. An instantaneous attack at any range. There was no dodging it. I didn't have full control of it yet, so I burned through too much of it my MP in one go. I also might have decided to teleport at the same time as I unleashed a dimensional slash and therefore couldn't control my attack very well. So it was a little reckless, but I couldn't help myself. Every skull I got made me do reckless things. This wasn't the kind of attack I could chain into a combo. If I wanted to try that, I'll have to learn how to channel way at less MP. I need to practice it before I could use it in battle. I was hardly able to control the attack this time. Using holding magic, magic control and supreme thinking was barely enough to contain the raw power of the attack. And I still managed to cause so much devastation. Ah, oh, come to think of it. I do have a divine sword slotted in my staff. That's probably made it more dangerous. <laughs> All right. I also slotted a void staff in there. No wonder it erased everything in its path. That, of course, included the chimeras, as it seemed to completely bypass their immunities to slash and magic damage. There's no way I can sell this thing, I thought. It could cut the likes of us apart instantly. It was definitely too dangerous to use when sparring with Miss Armor Rep. There didn't seem to be any way to block it. It was so dangerous that I feel like I should see little way. Hmm. Day 51, noon. I don't add on the least slightest, most remotely tiny quantity hate it. A dungeon. The girls carried on lecturing me as we entered a secret chamber. I couldn't have guessed that it would have caused so much damage. I just had to try an attack with a name as cool as Dimensional Slash. I didn't know it would literally slide through the mentions. If I didn't contain the attack, the MP would have overloaded and who knew what would happen then. 
So I understood their complaints, but they kept lecturing me over breaking formation and intercepted the poor blown to bits chimeras. Uh, why is that dangerous? I asked, confused. I was going to rejoin the formation right after. It was supposed to be a regular life or death attack, you know? That was totally safe, even if I did kind of dive right into the fray. In what way is that safe? The dimensional blade was supposed to be a long range attack with a teleport and all. I had no idea its radius would be so big. I'll have to only use it at point blank range for now, which means I'll have to keep getting up close and personal with the monsters. Anyway, I did rejoin the group, didn't I? I figured that teleport magic would have given me some range offensive options, but it seemed like its only use was for reckless attacks. Huh, another hidden room. The book this time is True Herbalism. Huh? Did that mean everything in herbalism was bullshit? But I read it so carefully! Uh, stop bitching about the titles! At this rate, the next volume will be something like Extreme Herbalist or Secrets of Herbalism. And the one after that would be titled Ultimate Herbalism or something. Should I expect Final Herbalism too? I wouldn't mind a few of those, but I'll need to make a copy of all of them. And that would mean even more work. Oh, when will it end? Thus, we cleared the 45th floor. Soon we would face the final boss at the 50th floor. It was time to prepare ourselves for the epic battle ahead. Or not. Pants are way more functional. Sure, but skirts are simply the cutest, aren't they? I think a dress would look best, but only one prismatic garment would seem incomplete, wouldn't it? How about a p prismatic hat? Miss Amarep suggested. Accessories, of course! Harakakun, we're going to need to put in some more orders. They didn't care in the slightest. They just demanded even more clothes. Who approved this law that I had to fill more orders? Though it wasn't like I could veto it. So yes, I agreed to make them hats tonight. Especially since Miss Amarept asked for one. Besides, more clothes meant more profit. As a teenage boy, taking measurements was proving itself to be a real problem. I asked the general store lady to take care of women's underwear, but she was way behind schedule. The girls' customers were way too fancy for the level of tech this world offered. There was no way a teenage boy could make women's underwear though. It was way too distracting. Just listening to their requests would have been enough to mortally wound my charisma and reputation. That's why the town seamstress were handling those orders. If I handled those orders myself, it wouldn't just be a wound for me. It'd be game, set, hand match. I'll even ignore the end game whistle and keep scoring. If the ref looked the other way, I would never, ever stop. There was no way to know for sure, but I highly suspected that there was no one in this world that had ever raided a dungeon while focused entirely on designing clothes. Even more unusual was the fact that the dungeon held fewer hazards to my health and crafting. In that moment, I understood the true nature of sorrow, and felt close to unlocking an ultimate technique. A crafting technique, of course. They're on the ceiling! Watch out for the exploding bats! Haraka can get down before they blow you up! Huh? What? On the 48th floor, I made all of the level 48 bomb bats self-destruct. The girls made this floor sound like a lot of trouble, but the bats had a glaring obvious weak point. It was a colony of explosive bats that shrieked at us from the darkness, but they were still too easy to counter. Why are they exploding? The girls screamed. Check their status. They have the ultrasonic wave skill, get it? I might have had to steal the air with holding magic and use vibration at high enough speeds to create ultrasonic waves. Unable to navigate through all the noise, they crashed into each other and blew themselves up. The entire colony was wiped out, but picking up each and every spell stone was so tedious. <sighs> I ought to come up with some sort of magic way to collect spell stones. This sucks! Here we were, casting wind spells to blow them away, running for our lives. And that's what you have to say? Well, it was better to blow them up when they were by the ceiling than let them blow up in our faces. Ah, uh, this is just logical thinking. It took us two days to get past this floor! Who would come up with your strategy just from seeing their ultrasonic wave skill? They never even stood a chance. You forced them to self-destruct before they could even get anywhere near us! Those poor little bats. <sighs> Everyone was unhappy for some reason, but this was undisputedly the most rational approach to bomb bat disposal. Detonate from a safe distance. Freezing would be a temporary solution, and other disposal methods like disassembling or diffusing a bomb were far less safe. This was just common sense. Naturally, as I was such a pragmatic, level-headed common sense kind of guy. Two floors until the dungeon boss, but the girls simply resumed their conversation about fashion instead of preparing for battle. 
The subject of conversation had moved on from Vice Red Beast's pinafore dress to a debate about maid outfits. I had no objections. In fact, it was fair to say that I was a huge fan of this topic. Even so, getting caught in the company of a bunch of teenage girls dressed like maids would imperil my sex appeal. Did they care so little about my reputation? My sex appeal was already on life support. It was in a critical condition. Respiration had stopped. There isn't even the smallest yoda of dislike in my being for maid outfits. But those seem really hard to sew, you know? Do you realize I have to make everything by hand, right? Aw, oh, but they're so cute! Just pretend cuteness is justice and you'll make them in no problem! I truly could never hate on maids, but their patterns were a nightmare. Same objection I had to making princess gowns. Not an ounce of dislike for the final result, but it was guaranteed to be a major challenge, especially when it came down to taking measurements for aforementioned teenage boy reasons. As we stepped onto the next floor, Fish Girl said, Here on the 49th floor, I got chased around by a scary level 49 terror knights. Whenever Fish Girl fought a monster, she ended up getting chased by it while Shield Girl went tumbling through the air. Was it some sort of secret strategy? The atmosphere was foreboding. Terror Knights wore black armor and their attacks dealt phantasmal damage. Logically, they were weak to holy damage, but instead of taking advantage of that, our mighty Arxage just walloped them with her staff. She pretty much fought all ghostly monsters like that. Malevolence swirled in a thick miasma around us. Their attacks all induced status ailments, fear, panic, confusion, and paralysis. The girls had plenty of gears to resist ailments, so there shouldn't be any problem as long as they kept their distance. The only danger they had to worry about was looking into the monster's eyes at a close range. It wasn't a problem for me, as I had Jupiter Eye. Besides, I had yet to suffer a status ailment. Even in the deeper parts of the dungeons, my wooden staff question mark dealt holy damage too. With all my advantages, I decided to jump into the front lines. Ah, a massacre. No, death isn't enough for what you did. You didn't hit me with a measly status ailment. You assaulted my very soul. The Terror Knights are trembling and avoiding your gaze! Why did these so-called Terror Knights fall into a state of complete horror and confusion and paralysis when I looked at them? Uh, why are the Terror Knights the ones that are terrified? They're taking my sex appeal! No, My sweet, sweet sex appeal! Evil perished and along with it, my reputation. My heart's HP have hit zero by now. Vice Rep A spoke first. Those Dread Knights, panic-stricken and slain without mercy, before they can escape. Does this herald the coming of the Demon King of Terror? Are they screaming? Asked Vice Rick B. Uh, this is unforgivable. The Terror Knights started crying as soon as they looked the Hutter Cocoon in the eye. I think a few dropped dead when he looked at them. Oh my god, did they just give up the will to live? Or whatever they called the evil phantom equivalent of living. Damn it, how low is my appeal really? They're trembling like little scared chihuahuas. Not again, I said. No, 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 not again. Why do demons and evil phantoms always target my precious sex appeal? They score crits on my ego every single time. Ms. Armor Rat patted me gently on the back. Did I imagine it? Or did she sheath her sword even before I faced the Terror Knights? As if she knew she would have to console me? I hope it's just my imagination. Um, why wouldn't she look at me? I became so upset that I used dimensional slash. I had no regrets, except that they deserved to die more than once. Oh, and I used a ton of MP. Ugh, I'm going to have some stern word with the management around here. Time for the final boss to take responsibility for the Terror Knights. I'm going to give that jerk a piece of my mind. Oh, rude the day and mess with me. If we can't talk things out, I'll take it out. Vengeance is nigh, you know? Wow, he's so agitated that he jumped straight to murder. Haragakun wants revenge despite the dungeon boss having done nothing yet? I mean, we are here to kill it, but you don't have to make it personal. Despite being bullied only moments ago, the girls gave me flat, reproachful looks. Little did they know that eleven pairs of eyes all focusing their exasperation at me was enough to heal my wounded ego. Oh, I was addicted to girls glaring at me and suffering from withdrawal until this moment. <laughs> this condition has no known cure. Day 51, Noon from all my life and fantasy world experience, there is only one possibility I can imagine. A dungeon. The 50th floor laid ahead, alongside with the dungeon's final boss. This was our last chance to sort any pressing problems. I needed to make sure we were all on the same page. 
I needed to say something before we threw ourselves headlong into bloodshed. Hmm, um, I'm sorry, but I can't ignore this any longer. I have let something go unresolved for too long. Should we eat lunch before or after we kill the dungeon boss? What do you all think? I'm fine with either option. The timing's inconvenient either way, but I can't recommend eating lunch in the middle of a boss fight, you know? That can't be good for digestion. If we ate before, it would be too early and after would be a bit past noon. Despite this, I was convinced that eating during a fight would get messy. Why was everyone glaring at me? That's the only thing you're worried about? Class rep asked. Indigestion is absolutely the least dire consequences of eating in the midst of a boss battle, said Vice Rep B. And the feeling of tension before a fight is gone. Just like that, Vice Rep A said. They shouldn't discount the importance of a balanced diet. We were all still growing after all. You gotta eat. You are what you eat. And if you're eating nothing, that's what you'll be, you know? I said, nutrients are fuel for your body. How could you expect to function without fuel? It would be like fighting a boss with no HP. Exercising on an empty stomach sucked, but a full stomach was almost as bad. It's best to eat about 30 minutes after any serious exercise. That promotes muscle growth, you know? <laughs> I'm not kidding. This is as far more serious than the dungeon boss. I'm not wrong, okay? The class rep thought for a moment and said, Did you actually try to make a serious argument in your defense? Is maintaining a healthy lifestyle really that important? Asked a sports girl. You can't trust anything he has to say about health, snapped Miss A. He thought the only problem with eating during a boss battle was an upset stomach. Good point. Some people believed that exercising after a meal was good for digestion, but in reality, it had the exact opposite effect. Even warm-up exercises could cause heartburn, acid reflux, and indigestion. I honestly couldn't think of a single good reason to eat while fighting the dungeon boss, not to mention the risk of nausea. You can't take anything he says seriously, exclaimed the fish girl. It's all lies and trickery. It's true. Every time you think he has a point, you lose some of your common sense, said Vice Rep A. He might sound like he's right about something, but no matter how valid his arguments are, he's still wrong. Got it. It's best to take his every word with a barrel of salt. Wait, I protested feebly. How can my arguments be right if I'm always wrong? And I didn't remember any lies or trickery. Would a swindler be trapped in an endless cycle of poverty and overwork? I was just an honest, hard-working teenager. Seriously. <sighs> After a vote, we decided to have lunch first. The vote was unanimous. We're having oyakudon, chicken and egg rice bowls for lunch. Please don't debate which came first while you're eating, okay? You'll get indigestion. <sighs> Why would we debate while eating? Did you just say oyakudon? Shut up and give me the grub! I think he might actually want to eat during a fight. Vice Rep A said while shooting me an accusing look. Mmm, these eggs are still so gooey. And the chicken, mmm, so moist and juicy, gushed Vice Rep B. Oh, the onions are delicious too. They're perfectly caramelized. Ooh, the rice is so fluffy. Ah, a dungeon lunch of Oyakudon. I'm joining Harakakun's group. Traitor! You would choose lunch over your friends? On second thought, me too! I couldn't form a group if I wanted to, thanks to a loner. So I wasn't sure what they hoped to accomplish. Thanks for the meal. That was delicious, said the class rep. Oh, I'm completely stuffed. Such bliss. I said, I'm glad you all enjoyed the meal. I figured that katsudon pork cutlet bowls would be too heavy for lunch. So I decided to make something with a bunch of mystery eggs and mystery tastes like chicken meat, you know? Katsudon sounds amazing. But can you not remind us that we don't know what we're eating? Mystery eggs? Oh my. Let's not focus on the unknown origins of our ingredients, okay? It's ruining my appetite. Honestly, I didn't think the mystery eggs even came from the same species. They were a different size and color every time I bought them. They could be dinosaur eggs for all I knew. Anyway, I had planned on making the pork cutlets for dinner. I had made some tonkatsu sauce, seasoned and breaded the mystery meat, chopped up a bunch of mystery greens and mystery mushrooms for the salad, and whipped up plenty of mayo. Ugh. I sacrificed my sleep to finish all this prep. Most of my income came from selling food to the girls. Though, in this case, every meal they ate only added to their outstanding debt, so... I still wasn't making any money. Surviving in a fantasy world wasn't easy. Ever since coming to this world, none of the girls could remember how to cook. Somehow, they traded in all their real-life skills for magic and battle skills. 
It was like they completely abandoned what made them high school girls. Appetite satisfied, it was time to face a dungeon boss. We had to prepare for the worst or there'll be trouble. But they immediately resumed their conversation about fashion. I hoped they wouldn't force me to make any more clothes. In this world, it seemed like death from overwork was a far bigger danger than monsters or the level wall. <sighs> oh well. I still needed to get paid. The class rep unsheathed her weapon and yelled, Okay, let's do this! Yeah! The rest of the girls cheered. Somehow, we had a serious conventional boss battle with a dungeon king. It was like a normal fight. The dungeon king could shapeshift at will. It dashed across the field of battle with extreme agility, swinging its sword parrying with its shield, cloaking itself in lightning magic, and transforming into a raging inferno. It overwhelmed us with an endless barrage of attacks. On top of being extremely tough, it had no obvious weaknesses. This boss was as traditional as you could ask for. Though, it seemed a bit blobby. I checked its status. A level 100 slime emperor. Hmm, I've never heard of a slime that could do whatever this slime was doing. It's too strong! I can't corner it! I can't read his movements either! Stick in formation! Because of his physical immunity, neither slash nor bludgeon damage had any effects. Spells weren't any use either. The thing had magic immunity too. It could even hold its own in sword plan against Miss Armor Rep. How can we win? I literally have no clue what his weaknesses are, I said. Slimes are normally early game monsters. The slime jiggled before me. Uh, oh, uh, hello? I said in response. Aw, it's so cute. This wasn't an oozy revolting slime, nor was it a sticky and unpleasant. No, it was soft and jiggly and adorable. But it looked angry. Like, it was in a bad mood. Vice Rep A, unable to believe her eyes, asked, Is it blushing? Until now, it was yellow and enveloped in a sparkling electrical aura. It suddenly turned red and started lobbing fireballs. As if on cue, Shield Girl got blown away. No, it's fuming! It was an adorable little springy slime, but ridiculously strong. Even Miss Armor Rep and the Class Rep attacking simultaneously, while Vice Rep A flanked it with her four sword technique didn't work. The slime countered every attack. Vice Rep C's high speed whirling didn't work either. It bounced around him particularly at high speeds, so his movement were impossible to pin down. Stay on the defensive! Don't break formation! This is a strong one! Got it! The bouncy slime buddy started pulling out countless swords, spears, and shields. It must have had void magic or some sort of infinite storage skill. For some reason, it didn't seem to be using magic that seriously against us. Yet, it could resist every single one of our magic attacks. It was a complete package, strong both physically and magically, and super adorable. It was toying with us. The Sly Emperor moved without telegraphing its attacks. Not like I could have recognized it if it didn't telegraph any attacks. All it could do was jiggle cutely. Let's try a range attacks! Just keep up the defenses! We're trying, but it's too tough! This thing was so strong that Miss Armoret might actually have to let loose. But since we were doing coordinated attacks, she held back her full strength. The Sly shook off every blow of their perfectly executed combos with a charming little wiggle. As it did, I couldn't help but notice that Miss B wiggled and bounced right next to me. Um, <clears throat> without warning, I was blindsided by an extreme multi-glare combo. Do we really have time for this? Haruka-kun, stop staring and do something! What, don't you see how cute it is? With all its bouncing and jiggling, I couldn't resist! It was so perfectly round and bouncy and shiny. How could I not give it a good peep? The class rep stared daggers at me. You had better be talking about the slime. F of course I was talking about the slime! What else bes besides Slimey Slicey-ma-san? Who's Slicey-ma-san supposed to be and why were you staring at her? I didn't think that we could defeat it at this rate. Bouncing all over, it charged at us like it was angry at something. We were unlawful trespassers, so it had the right to be mad at us. Even in its cute, jelly-like manner. The wobbly little slime fought us with such earnest, even as it simply bumped into us. Drawing on all my life experiences, both before and after coming to this world, I knew that it had a weakness. There was a guaranteed path to certain victory. There is no way I can lose to this. Do you want sweets? I have it on good authority that it's delicious, you know. Stalker girl claimed it was amazing. Jiggle jiggle. Good thing I brought some candy sweet potatoes with me. Poor thing. It must have been starving. Trapped down here all alone. Were all dungeon bosses like that? Hungry and lonely? What are you doing? Please be careful. Hungry little buddy, aren't ya? 
Wiggle, wiggle. I pulled out my frying pan and started frying up some pork cutlets, tossing them to the slime when they were golden brown. Who wants some bread? Do you want a toasty loaf? Although, I don't think slimes know about the importance of a balanced and healthy diet. Wobble, wobble. Jiggling, it wrapped its slime body around the bread and cutlets, which vanished into who knows where. Lonely and hungry, huh? I know how that is. Wiggle, wiggle. Ah, oh, that was why it was grumpy enough to attack us. But it was also so ravenous that it couldn't even use magic. Jiggle, jiggle. Not that the slime was full of good food. It looked content. It even sat on top of my head and fell asleep. It was just as cute and wobbly when it slept. Apparently, it could alter its size. It shrunk down now until it could fit comfortably on my head. Did, did you just make the dungeon boss a pet? He gave us some food and now it's totally attached! Aren't you worried about the Dungeon King sitting on your head? Uh, no, of course not. It's a sweet, wibbly, wobbly little slime. Day 51, afternoon. Is a meeting necessary if the opinion is completely unanimous with no objections? A dungeon. Placing my palm against the wall, I gave a firm push, revealing the final secret chamber of the dungeon. <sighs> what do we have here? A three-volume set? Does it come with any extras? No extras, but the books were the Grimoire of Combat Skills, the Grimoire of Titles, and the Grimoire of Magic. Uh, I had the sneaking suspicion that none of these volumes would explain my skills either. Is it because I'm a loner? I looked up at the slime and asked, Can I borrow these? I mean, since you're the landlord of this dungeon and all. Jiggle jiggle. The slime seemed okay with it. Is he talking to the Dungeon King? Why did he call it a landlord? It totally loves him. There's something cute about it even though it's so powerful. I skimmed through the grimoire of magic first. As expected, none of my absurd magic skills got any mention. Not heat, movement, weight, or packing. No details on wood or vibration magic either. Naturally, it didn't cover any of the advanced version of those skills, like teleport, gravity, and holding. I didn't even need to check the grimoire of titles to know that Shudden and Loner and Neat weren't mentioned. <sighs> of course Shudden, Neat, and Loner aren't in there. How would you even translate those terms in this world's language? I knew it. All my skills are fake! The slime wobbled with concern. Flipping through the last grimoire, it made no mentions of Kane mastery. Ha <laughs> ha! You hear that, Miss B? You're also using fake skills! Naturally, that meant peerless Kane mastery wasn't listed either. Nor there was an entry for magic infusing or its upgrades, magic entanglement. I invented life or death, so at least there's a reason why it's not listed. Jiggle jiggle. Still, it was weird that the skills I used to develop my own invented skills were enlisted. Even weirder, some of the skills I had were categorized as legendary. Skills like evasion, rapid movement, bubble, and eye mastery. Hmm, it even claimed that skills like sword master and sword goddess were just myths. Myths? The sword goddess herself was standing right here. Jiggle jiggle? And there wasn't even a section on abilities. Corporate proactiveness, master of none, and blockhead would remain a mystery. Ugh, these books are useless! Unless... Does this mean my skills are so useless that they might as well not exist? Hey! All my skills are listed! Mine too! Bounce, bounce. Um, was the slime trying to become friends with everyone? Well, I was already 100 and 1,000 and 1 million percent certain those titles did not exist. I mean, Shudden, Neat, Loner... Those words don't even exist in this world's language. I exclaimed. So why were they working so well? How was language getting translated here anyway? <sighs> don't tell me, I don't want to know. Jiggle jiggle. I think the slime is trying to console him. The former dungeon emperor is patting him on the back too. Two of the most powerful beings in the world lined up to comfort him. Vice Rep A said coolly. What a waste of their strength. I doubted that I could find any more books here, so there was no point in sticking around any longer. And I didn't want to kill the dungeon king either. He was so damn cute and friendly, so fighting was right out. After eating its fill, he was much more placid. Maybe he was trying to eat the girls earlier. Well, he's cute, so whatever. Wobble wobble? The slime must have been so lonely. Hey, wanna join us? Know what I mean? Jiggle jiggle! He performed a cute little dance. Did that mean he was happy? It looked like happy wibbling anyway. Uh, let's see your status. Oh, did I really use servitude on you? Really? We all knew this would happen! This was definitely a happy dance. 
the slime and the poster girl had a lot in common. They both liked to do mystery dances. Wiggle wiggle. First, we had to get out of here. Then I could feed the slime lots of tasty food. He wouldn't be lonely anymore if he came with us and stayed at the inn too. He seemed like to he seemed to like the I he seemed to like that idea, so why not? Let's go, okay? Don't forget, we have two more properties to tour. You're talking about dungeons! Wait, are we dungeon crawling or house hunting? But the other residents sound so lonely. It must be all alone. Oh, poor thing. It's not a residence! So this turned out not to be a bookstore in the end. Definitely not worth renovating. It was in a terrible location and had a confusing floor plan. It was more like an anthill than anything else. Dungeons with nice layouts like the Ultimate Dungeon weren't exactly common after all. It was in a great location and excellent building quality, but it was way too big to be comfortable. A property with 100 floors was overkill. Hey, Slime Sun. Can I call you Slimy? This here is Miss Armor Rep. She became my servant first, so she's your senpai, okay? So you should listen to what she says. Besides, since she used to be an emperor of all dungeons, she kind of also used to be your boss before, you know? Slimy wobbled with understanding. There was a proper workplace hierarchy now. Was he trying to give her a salute? Were they acquaintances? Since they used to work in the same industry, did they go out to dungeon management conferences together or something? Now that they had both quit their jobs, would they start meeting up with other dungeon alumni? <sighs> I can't believe he enslaved another dungeon boss to take home with us. Hey, at least this time it wasn't another emperor, right? Sure, I guess in comparison this is more normal. Despite their petty complaints, the girls were off feeding the former Dungeon King bread and candy. Slimy jiggled with joy. He was so cute and tame. As we packed up to go, the girls resumed their fashion chat. After some hotly contested debate, they came to a consensus. Make us more orders! Did my objections count for nothing? We headed back with the slime wiggling contently on top of my head. It was so soothing. You get it, Slimy. We all need some respite from this cruel world. Consider the cruelty of forcing me to fulfill even more orders. Besides, what was the point of having these discussions if they unanimously agreed on everything? There was no deliberation, they just blazed through their agenda. Fashion matters, they shouted. Ugh, I needed to come up with blueprints for magic-powered weaving and sewing machines, or my life would get dramatically shorter. The girls from the sports club had previously made it all the way to the 49th floor, so we were able to instantly gate back to the entrance. Now in the company of a joyfully bouncing slimy. If we hadn't bothered checking each floor for the secret rooms, this session would have been cleared in moments. Since we investigated every floor, this trip took a while. A secret floor every five floors. The next property shouldn't take this long to inspect, but two tours in one day sounded impossible. Is the next dungeon the one the school council group checked out? Is it nearby? What do you think? Is it good? How walkable is it to the neighborhood? What about commute? Any amenities? Oh, did you manage to snag a floor plan? Dungeons aren't real estate. They're not for sale. How do you keep confusing dungeons and condos? They're not amenities in a dungeon. No amenities, huh? <sighs> I'll lower my expectations. Is the one near our town, right? <sighs> Might be too close to the forest. Using my map skill through Jupiter Eye, I confirmed the location. It was right by one of the two villages that got destroyed by the rampaging horde of monsters led by an orc king. I wasn't able to save those villages. And the people that lived there were all dead now. No wonder they didn't like the dungeon. Anything good about the area was wiped off the map. That village was destroyed because no one knew that the orcs had left the depths of the forest and moved to the outskirts. I was the only person who noticed the orcs were on the move, but I didn't realize that it foreshadowed an invasion. The people in this village just died as a result. Some people in this world claimed that I was some sort of hero, but I failed. Two whole villages worth of people lost their lives. Thirteen of my classmen had also died. Thirteen of my classmates had also died. One by my own hand. I didn't save them either. I wasn't a hero. Wiggle. That's why no one ever mentioned those villages to me. That's why we took a longer route to the dungeon. To avoid the ruins. I could have saved them. But instead, I was off killing my own classmates. Countless people died because of me. What kind of hero is that? What kind of savior is that? They shouldn't call me the savior of the town, or of the realm. I failed those two villages. Don't give me your gratitude. Sure, I built a defensive wall for one village, and I obliterated the monster's population in the forest and cleared out the land. But that was too little too late. The villages were gone, 
And there was nothing I could do. I didn't want to be treated like a hero. I wasn't worthy of praise. I didn't want to be treated like a hero. I wasn't worthy of praise just because I decided to help people now. I couldn't stop thinking about those who died. I deserved to be judged for my deeds. I didn't deserve forgiveness. But no one said anything. They were as silent as the dead. Slimy bounced and wiggled frantically on top of my head as it he meant to comfort me. Slimy bounced and wiggled frantically on top of my head as if he meant to comfort me. Day 51, afternoon. I mean, it's way more vicious and violent than a demonic ogre. So, of course, if I show them, I'll get a lecture? A dungeon. We arrived at the next dungeon. It seemed pretty deep, probably more than 50 floors. But the entryway was in total disrepair. <sighs> we finally made it. But we're way behind schedule, I said. Three in one day is totally unreasonable. This is teenage boy abuse. All you did in the last dungeon was walk around and read books. This would probably be our last dungeon for the day. Probably. It would probably take until evening to clear this one, even before I factored in secret rooms. I remember the way. Follow me, said Vice Rep A. Watch out for respawns. I was expecting this decision to be easy. After all, three parties each led by members of the student council were able to quickly were able to quickly reach the 49th floor. That meant that the likelihood of specialized or unique monsters was low. Since the girls weren't adept at fighting those kind of monsters. Yeah, they're not particularly versatile fighters, I thought. But when given the chance, they're really powerful. I'm charging in! Whoa! Speaking of which, if I didn't hurry up, I wouldn't even get a chance to fight. If we didn't finish this dungeon soon, I'd have to start doing my freelance work and then I wouldn't get any time off until morning. Oh, my expectations were low, but this is a solid no, based on the crappy entrance alone, I said. Let's get this over with. The walls are thin, the construction is crooked, and there's no sense of cohesion. Oh, I'm so sorry it's not meeting your expectations. Nothing tops the epic entrance of the ultimate dungeon, you know? It would make for a perfect bathhouse, too. Didn't you make that entrance? Yeah, you did unlicensed renovation on the first floor. Even the former ruler of the ultimate dungeon glared at me. Apparently, I wasn't supposed to just go ahead and make whatever renovations I wanted whenever I wanted. At least, I stopped before installing a hot spring. All I did was some minor alterations to the first floor, and then I fell into a pit. Besides, the former dungeon emperor deserves a grand foyer for her dungeon, right? Although, she was retired now. Hmm. We split into three groups, the student council, the sports girls, and the dungeon rulers, and killed any respawning monsters as we went. Both Miss Armorep and Slimy certainly could have handled everything solo if they felt like it, so the groups were casual. They rushed to see who could one-shot more monsters first. Miss Armorep raced about with a childlike abandon, while Slimy simply swallowed monsters whole. Slimy, you're going to get indigestion if you keep doing that. No early secret rooms in this dungeon at least, I said. So let's keep rolling. I want to go home and feed Slimy dinner. Don't eat too many monsters down here. They'll spoil your appetite. Slimy jiggled in apparent understanding. Maybe predation didn't alter his appetite? Predation wasn't a skill list, and it seemed to work similar to hijack. Slimy used cheat skills with impunity. Servitude reset your level to 1, so we need to keep you safe. But these weak monsters on the upper floor should be fine, right? I think eating makes grow faster. Miss Armor Rep, said Miss Armor Rep. Hmm, I guess that's okay then. Chico Chico! He's definitely fine. The combo of head-on attacks from Miss Armor Rep and sneak attacks from Slimy was vicious. Even if you saw them coming, you couldn't escape. Couldn't defend yourself. It was an unstoppable coordinated onslaught. You don't need to go ham on these low-level monsters, I said. Besides, I want a chance to fight too! Miss Armor Rep simply nodded. Slimy jiggled. Even the replies were coordinated! Slimy's movements were so unpredictable that I couldn't find a way to cut in. I would have been scared to practice dimensional slash here. I tried to execute a life or death attack, but Slimy bonked into me from behind and wiggled with crimson frustration. I was supposed to be the master, but all my servants ended up bossing me around. The two of them continued their gleeful rampage. They had spent what had to have felt like an eternity cooped up in their death of their dungeon. <sighs> I couldn't blame them for wanting to blow off some steam. I had so much work to do that I was the only person who wished they were bored. No matter how much I swindled the girls, I still had no money. I had already spent my rent money too. We cleared the 17th floor and had yet to find a hidden room. 
there was nothing to do besides killing respawn monsters, and that only took like a second tops. When will we get a re when will I get a turn? Not like I wasn't keeping myself busy. I was using eidetic memory and high speed thinking through my supreme thinking skill to design mechanism looms in my mind. If only I could figure out how to build a flying shuttle. I had once looked at the schematics of a flying shuttle designed by John Kay, a luminary from the Industrial Revolution. I understood the principle of the thing, but it was my first attempt at making one myself. Without experimentation, I couldn't settle on a design. Fortunately, Supreme Thinking ran through countless thought experiments for me, steadily redefining the design. Still, there were elements I couldn't predict without making a real prototype. That was what I wanted to work on tonight. Ugh, bored. Ugh, bored. I moaned, dragging my feet. Wobble, wobble? Meanwhile, the fantasy world agricultural revolution was well underway. The nerds had already implemented the Norfolk four core system of crop rotation, eliminating the need to keep any fields follow. They even memorized the process for developing ammonia based fertilizers and cultivating rice. We didn't even need to use the Norfolk four core system, though this world's biome is more like Norfolk than Japan, I guess. Those guys were way over prepared for getting summoned to a fantasy world, I exclaimed. I already explained the principles of industrial agriculture to Mr. Mary that in my proposal. But now we can use that volume of country living from your dungeon, Slimy, to improve our animal husbandry. Larger herds should lead to more arable land, and that will increase food production. The nerds even knew everything there was to know about steam engines and railroads. Their problem was they knew how to manufacture iron via foot treggle forge, but not modern blast furnaces. Ugh, why wasn't any of their knowledge geared toward modern society? Why are you already so chummy with a slime? The girl shouted. Since I, could generate power via, since I could generate power via magic, developing a spinning mule and a mechanized loom took priority. The nerds had absolutely no interest in clothes, so they hadn't bothered to learn anything about those machines. How could they ignore such foundational knowledge? During the Industrial Revolution, the textile industry was the star of the show! What were they thinking? Didn't these nerds learn anything practical? And for some unfathomable reason, the only thing they knew about architecture was how to make reinforced concrete. Uh, what kind of fantasy world did they expect to end up in? When would knowing how to build skyscrapers ever be useful? It's medieval times over here! I muttered. Jiggle jiggle. That's right, Slimy, I thought. The nerds are too cringy to be human. Were you muttering something to the slime monster? The class rep asked. Metallurgy was another field of interest to those dweebs. Serious interest. From iron smelting to sword smithing, they knew how to forge anything from modern tactical blades to legendary swords of Masamune. How the hell did they learn that? I once overheard the nurse talking to the bald weapons guy in town, and the breadth of their knowledge made that bushy beard man weep. As a smith, he really should have been doing some actual smithing instead of just polishing wooden clubs all day. Could he really be called a blacksmith? Why did he like polishing wood so much anyway? Once everything was in place, the frontier would stand a fighting chance. Only then would I be freed from some side hustles. Only then would I be freed from my side hustles. Even then, I would probably still be stuck cooking meals and making sweets forever and ever. On the 38th floor, I found this first secret room on this dungeon, but the contents of this treasure chest were garbage. Homing bow, homing arrows, attack bonus. There were a few archers among the girls, but they already had cheat skills like perfect game and trajectory prediction, so the homing bow was just redundant. I planned on selling it. I found the following on the 44th floor. Ring of safety, status element resistant, small. The girls already have a ring with a status element resistant, large, for every finger on their hand, on top of that, the girls would not approve of this design. Slimy bounced in agreement. Do you have any idea how much work I put into my designs? They kept demanding alterations, corrections, redesigns. They were demons, I tell you. They picked apart me and my work. Whether I made the accessories, clothes, or candy. They'll start lecturing me going if I even show them this ring. I can promise you that. Um, excuse me. Ah, get that hideous ring away from me. Stop pulling the poor ring of safety, I shouted. Regal! I finally got my own monster encounter at the 46th floor. The labyrinth forked into too many paths, so we split up. I finally ran into some monsters! I won't waste a moment killing them! Three knife wielding marionettes, level 46, mad puppets, pressed menacingly toward me. Is this supposed to be scary? No modern person would be frightened by something this corny. At least give me some flickering lights or spooky noises. Make it spooky! Instead, the puppets unsimorinously plunked down from the ceiling and lurched towards me. Oh, come on. You need to do better than this. As the first puppet swung its knife at me, 
I stepped through the side and whacked it. The second one came down from above, so I spun around and landed a solid thwack with my staff. Huh, so cliche. The third puppet came at me from my blind spot on my right, so I batted the first two puppets' corpses right into the third, knocking it dead. <sighs> An obvious strategy, right? I didn't even need to move! One straight ahead, one from above, and one from the blind spot. It's standard horror fare, I told Slimy. Sure, the knives were coated in a deadly poison, but that didn't add to the atmosphere. They could have at least played some creepy music to make it feel scary. Jupiter I meant I had no blind spot, so their strategy could never have worked. Their terror skill just didn't stand a chance against the iron nerves of a modern horror fan. Honestly, it was almost funny. Just about the only one who would run scared was Fish Girl. At just that moment, I heard a piercing scream. That was terrifying! The fish girl cried. I walked into this room and had some puppets lying around, right? And then they started moving. And they came to life and lurched at me and twitched at me. I could tell those puppets weren't nice. I got so freaked out I incinerated them. It was so scary. What a surprise. She got chased down. Wailing the whole time, too. So, they just surprised you and you ran away from them? I asked. I was so scared. I <sighs> can't believe you fell for that. The spooky puppet that comes to life when you're not looking. Such a cliche. You should have seen it coming and just bathed them with fire before they could even move. You've seen horror movies before, haven't you? She told me horror movies seemed like they would be way too scary, so she never watched them. Hmm. No wonder she didn't know. But is that what fish people sound like when they scream? Jiggle, jiggle, jiggle! Slimey literally bounced with joy. Until now, he had a language starving in the deep dark. He was happy to have a full stomach and a chance to move about. Did that explain why Miss Armorer hadn't settled down yet? Did that explain why Miss Armorer hadn't settled down yet? She looked like she was also having fun, so whatever. Day 51, afternoon. She's a nudist because she doesn't want to waste clothing. A dungeon. Massive monsters charge forth and smash against our shield wall with a thunderous crash. This was the power of shield bash. One move was enough to stop them in their tracks. Was that coming from the side? I could see them swinging. I guess that's it? I asked. Slimy wiggled. He couldn't even say yup, not that I needed him to confirm. The air grew still, thanks to two unstoppable tanks. I watched with growing curiosity. As one used a sword to block, the other stabbed with the edge of the shield. When the other paired with a sword, the first smashed the monster with her shield. Offense and defense freely swapped places in continuous barrage of attacks that destroyed its target. They were the ultimate duel, even in back in the original world. Their names were feared as the best in Japan. Woo! Go twin telephone poles! I cheered. A cacophony of violence, the clang of metal and thud of stone. That's not our nickname! Twin towers, not telephone poles! Huh? Since when? They totally call you the twin telephone poles on TV. You know? Ow! That hurts! You would have burned the TV station to the ground if that happened. They seemed unhappy with how they were portrayed on TV. Did the producers twist the facts? Was that why they were so mad? But I'm pretty sure even their fans at school were always shouting, Go Twin Telephone Poles! <sighs> the Shield Squad, including Shield Girl, could use different weapons depending on what they faced, switching between swords, spears, axes, and hammers. However, they lately used swords to the exclusion of all else, except occasionally these spears. I barely glimpsed a good hammer or a sharp axe on them. Maybe this was a signal that I should start making weapons? I think axes and hammers would be ideal matchup for these enemies, or maybe a long spear or a halberd so that you can fight with whatever range you want, I suggested. Uh, I guess, one said. Oh, let's get a bow too, the other said. If we were going to work together, we might as well turn our numbers into versatility. Our tactics were limited by our over-reliance on swords. I would have to seriously consider getting into weaponsmithing when we returned. Setup would take some time, so I would need to get started right away. My never-ending night truly has no end. In other words, there was no end to my unpaid overtime. So how come I'm still broke? We did it! Good work! Jiggle jiggle! The Lua 49 rhinoceros tanks were finally annihilated. The armor-plated rhinos were stopped mid-stampede thanks to the teamwork of the Shield Girl and the Pure Volleyball Aces. Their strategy was effective. The rhinos had a slashing resistance on their armor heads and backs, but they couldn't stop a certain arc sage from attacking their flanks, flipping them on their backs and exposing their soft underbellies. It should go without saying that this arc sage used only physical attacks. Something shaking. Huh. 
Then they just pummeled the helpless rhinos to death. Slimy was especially enthusiastic. The Guardians all had their shields upgraded with Mithril, giving them maxed out impact resistance and magic reflection. All they needed to do was charge in at top speeds to crush the enemy. The rhythmic gymnastics girl for Breeze Dancer, one of the few who knew the alchemy skill, jumped in and bludgeoned a rhino to death with clubs. She was using some sort of alchemy weapon that could transform the club into a hoop, a ball, and a ribbon. But lately, she's only using the hoop. How did that even work? Did spinning the hoop make the enemy dizzy or something? Was it a hypnotic attack? In the next hidden room, I found the power glove. This one would be popular, especially after a mithril upgrade. I was only using small bits of mithril, so I was fine on supply for the time being. But I'll start running low eventually. Can I find mithril anywhere outside of dungeons? I wondered. Check this out. Power glove. Power plus 30%. Defense boost. Anyone want it? Maybe? Shield Girl and T-Twin-A were playing rock, paper, scissors for it. They'd both use it plenty, but the Arc Sage would probably benefit the most. She said that she didn't need it, since she preferred equipment meant for magic users. This, despite her never having cast a single spell in combat. The 50th floor, I said. Time for a boss fight. We fight, we win, we eat pork cutlets, yeah? Sounds good, right? Cutlets! The girls shouted. We're gonna make some Aurora sauce. Sounds good? Oh dear said Vice Rip B. A thrill went down my spine just imagining that tangy ketchup and creamy mayonnaise stirred together into something as decadent as Aurora sauce. And the soy sauce was looking a little lonely, so I also sipped a little of that in. As a treat, you know? Yeah. Yay! They were psyched. Maybe they'll tenderize the floor boss until it's a cutlet. Would floor boss katsu taste good? Hmm. The answer? Definitely not. I sighed. Seriously? Paralyzed Jellyfish level 50? Mr. Jellyfish does not have the gravity of a dungeon boss. We got this! A gargantuan jellyfish floated in midair. This could have been a cool piece of decor, but ultimately, it was just annoying. Too big. Guardians to the front! Form two lines and sever his tentacles! Commanded the class rap. Roger that! The shield wall repelled the tentacles while the second line of defenders dealt slashing and bludgeoning damage. And the rear guard? Didn't exist. The Arxage was in the middle of the fray with everyone else, bashing the jellyfish with her staff. None of the attacks seemed to work, though. Beautiful girls leapt through the air as they were attacked by tentacles. If nerds were here, they would have been in tears. They would have done nothing but watch. They might have even started rooting for the jellyfish. Meanwhile, my demon side, which I definitely did not forget up until this moment, joined the tentacle hunt. I'm glad I remembered them. Wait, this isn't working. Look like it's immune to physical damage, I said. And because of magic reflection, we can't use spells. So what do we do? Wriggle? The tentacles were basically impossible to chop off, but even if we did, they regrew instantly. Bludgeoning had absolutely no effect. Well, obviously we need an attack that isn't physical or magical to defeat this jellyfish, you know? That's what we need to do, right? And how do we do that? There was only one thing we could do. Fish girl backed away, drawing the attention of the tentacles. The nudist girl jumped out, trying to unsuccessfully sever any tentacles within reach. Ah, da, 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 da! Oops, she got caught. The nerds would be delighted. It was fortunate that they weren't here. Don't worry, you can resist poison and status ailments, so just hang in there and watch out for paralysis, okay? Your weapons won't get destroyed, so don't have to worry about that either. But it does have dissolve, so you'll lose your clothes. But since you're a nudist, you don't have to worry about that, okay? So it's all good! I'm not a nudist! I don't want to be naked! No, it's not good at all! She didn't volunteer for this! Even Slimy bounced a little bouncy scold. Okay, so she wasn't into it. Why not? She was a nudist who took off her clothes at every given opportunity. Why would she care about getting her clothes melted? Oh, it's a waste of clothing, of course! She didn't want to be a burden to me with more work. Will you help me already? We need to rescue her! Don't worry, I've got the jellyfish under my control with holding magic, I said. It's under some heavy restraints, basically. I just can't get a grip on the tentacles, I shrugged. The tentacles are the problem! I closed the distance to the jellyfish and cut through the tentacles holding the nudist girl using dimensional slash and crashed into the jellyfish. It was an accident, the result of barely being able to control magic entanglement in life or death. Plus, dimensional slash adding too much chaos to the mix. I was ensnared by the jellyfish's many tentacles. It was in my grasp and vice versa. Hey, what are you planning to do to a high school boy? I cried, 
Boys aren't usually in these scenes. Save me! Why would anyone save me? Why do you look so smug? Even Slimy gave a cheeky little jiggle. I turned up the temperature with heat and used holding magic to wring out any moisture, then dehydrated it with a combo of vibration, alchemy, and water magic. To put the nail in the coffin, I stripped it from its immunities with the right spear shield gauntlet. <sighs> Dry up, wither, desiccate, now become jerky, and just fry a bit more. And it's done. Huh? exclaimed the girls. Don't hurt me! Cheers! Say something like, yeah! Why didn't nobody seem pleased? Nice, a spellstone and loot. The jellyfish was carrying something? It hadn't looked like it was, but I examined the items anyway. Infinite tentacles. Create and control tentacles. Um, This wasn't the type of ability humans should have. The nerves would like it, but that wasn't any better. I could sell it with an outrageous markup, but that's exactly why they shouldn't have it, no matter what. He just tried the jellyfish out and incinerated it, said the class rep. It makes perfect sense and no sense at the same time. Jiggle. I now have found the holy trinity of sex appeal destroying treasures. The submission choker, Prometheus chains, and infinite tentacles. This is a disaster. How did I end up with all this BDSM gear? This is an assault on my reputation. It's been at death's doors this entire time, but nothing could survive this. No, it's even worse than that. I haven't even seen it anywhere. Oh, why does this world have to go after my sex appeal with such ruthless accuracy? On top of everything else, tentacles? Miss Armor literally went into hiding. Day 51, evening. The problem is my ever diminishing time is colliding with an ever lengthening order list. A dungeon. For some reason, the girls put their heads together and decided I should not hold on to the infinite tentacles. They said that no human should ever possess such an item, much less a young woman. Hey, I'm human. I swear, just check my status. Look, I said. I'm human. Look at my status. It says, race, human. Wiggle, wiggle? Stop muttering to yourself, slime, Vicerp A said. In short, it was not a proper item for girls, but it should never fall into the hands of any of the guys, which left me as the only candidate. They wouldn't let me pawn it into the marketplace either, claiming it was too dangerous. They disregarded the real danger to my reputation. I think I see it fading far, far in the distance. It's on the brink of vanishing. Wiggle. The girls hurtled around Miss Armorip and began a girl-only meeting. First vibration, now tentacles? Good luck. Have you considered vibrating tentacles? Ah, oh, just think of all the places those tentacles can go. Vice Rep B said innocuously. It's supposed to be a tentacle control, but I don't think he'll be able to control himself, you know what I mean? Stop! The girls looked like they were having fun. What were they talking about? Why did they exclude me out of nowhere? Having a girls only meeting when there were 11 girls, one guy and one slime wasn't very nice. They were ostracizing me. I'm an outcast. Wiggle wiggle. I hung out with Slimey instead. <laughs> I wasn't lonely or anything. <laughs> jiggle jiggle. Slimey looked pleased when I patted him, so that was nice. Hello? I said. What are we doing? Heading down, going back, living here, doing renovations, a sleepover? We're not having a sleepover. You won't be taking us somewhere isolated with your vibrating tentacles. Yeah. Keep those things away from us. I won't get I won't get be I won't get taken by surprise. No. The girl started screaming. I got the point. They didn't want to camp down here. No renovations either. The girl's faces were bright red for some reason. It sounded like they wanted to go home, but something was clearly upsetting them. Some feminine mystery, I suppose. Back at the inn, there was a standoff. The poster girl and Slimy stared at each other down for a long time. Slowly, the girl reached out her hand. Slimy quivered and extended a wobbling tendril. Is this how they shake hands? Is this E.T.? Then she began to strike poses and gesture with her limbs. Was this some uncomprehensible form of communication? Was she doing a robot dance? Why would Slime know the robot? How mysterious. A Slime doing the robot was already strange enough, but then how could he move in such a mechanical fashion? Oh well, if they were having fun then whatever. <sighs> in conclusion, we defeated two bosses, so our work is two-thirds done, I said. But only one of them died, so half of it was more like Dungeon King napping. You're the one who started feeding it! 
Objection! You're the only kidnapper! The class rep said, pointing a finger my way. What's worse, you're a repeated offender. But it's so cute. Cute as justice, right? Yo. Jiggle! Adorable! Vice Rep C squealed. The culprit shows no remorse! Then our meeting began. We went through the after-action reports, shared intel and information. Just talking, you know? Discussions went pretty smoothly without the other guys around. Out of nowhere, a nerd voice piped up. Did you say something about tentacles? Give me the deeds! Nerd umwak. Where did you come from and what the f- Is that with that creepy grin? Read the room! The girls are literally backing away! No matter what cost, I couldn't let the nerds find out about the infinite tentacles. No joke. The nerds were obnoxious, so I beat them up while serving cutlets with Aurora sauce. Walking all over them as I delivered the plates, the meathead sat in silence, stomachs growling. Cutlets with Aurora sauce, I announced. If we can't have cutlets on, we'll have cutlets. Am I right? Just hand it over. Let's eat! Oh, seconds, please! The meatheads yelled. I didn't make katsudon because I was low on eggs. I used most of them to make mayonnaise. But I might have made too much cutlet. I should sell the extra and recoup some costs. It's delicious. Sweet and salty, but not too much. Slimy jiggled. Stalker girl always cleverly managed to show up right when dinner was served. And any secrets she had to sell, she charged exactly what I was charging for a meal, too. She always helped clean up, so there really wasn't a problem. She had tried to join in on a roll bed dance, but it was too difficult for her. She couldn't hardly move after eating so many cutlets. Slimy wiggled with delight after eating the pork cutlets. He ate so many during lunch, yet he still had a healthy appetite. Well, he enjoyed the meal, and that was good enough for me. We all went our separate ways after dinner, so Slimy and I decided to take a bath. He could have stopped jiggling in the bath water. Afterwards, I went into my room and got to work. The never-ending night began. It sounded cool to say it that way, but it was just my side hustle. I'm only getting a trickle of money from Spellstone, so crafting and cooking make most of my income, I said. Wiggle? I had an unexpected surprise. These tentacles were really effective. Cool. Unlike holding magic, these have actual physical presence, so they're intuitive to use. I finished copying an entire manuscript in a blink of an eye. Slimy jiggle with approval. Thanks to supreme thinking, I can control all tentacles simultaneously and finish any tech in an instant. They were damn good with a needle and thread too. What an unexpected discovery! Still, my backlog of orders kept growing without end. What? Who the hell requested that I make a school swimsuit? You can't expect a teenage boy to do that. <sighs> Nudist girl? The slime bounced near. Nudist girl wasn't only an exhibitionist, but also a member of the school swims team. Swimming was one thing, but why did she order a school swimsuit specifically? Didn't she realize that it attracted nerves like flies to honey? She was playing with fire. I can't make a school swimsuit. What the hell am I supposed to do with the measurements? She wants to solve resistance too? Is she planning to go into battle wearing this thing? Chico Chico? I had to admit. It would be hilarious to see the nurse reactions. I thought about just throwing something together through a trial and error, but that wouldn't work. Not for a swimsuit. Why did she expect the teenage boy to stay up all night prototyping swimsuits? I wouldn't do that. Never. Besides, I needed to continue researching prismatic clothing. Although... Maybe I should make a prismatic swimsuit. Wait, who would want that? Eureka! I've cracked the code of prismatic pigments. Now I won't have to make a bunch of color variants. There's so much work that if this was the fable of the crane wife, the crane would have plucked its feathers completely bald to produce all this. I even had a magical powered loom and I still couldn't keep up. A powerful loom that I had designed myself, by the way. The concept was simple. I needed to grind spellstones into a fine powder and then rub that powder into a wet thread or fabric, and then I would just charge it with a bit of magic and presto, prismatic textiles. I only had to determine which grid of spellstones to use and how many. It was going to be so worth it. Setting aside that I was giving these prototypes away for free. The main effect is the ability to change color, but I suspected that if I use high grade spellstones, it could even be useful in battle, I said. Slimy wobbled in anticipation. Successfully crushing the spellstone was my first obstacle. I didn't need to make a super fine powder, but the grains at least needed to be a consistent size. Put plainly, it was a pain in the ass. I can't make the spellstone dust change colors now, so all I have to do is apply it to some fabric and I should be good to go, right? Vibration and alchemy should allow me to produce large quantities, but it was still a horrible, tedious process. Once I had enough, 
I could start fulfilling orders from prismatic clothes. I was lucky to have more spell stones than I knew what to do with. Grinding so one by one would have taken forever. I think this is ready to go to the market. The test fabrics are naturally tear and stain resistant. The process was ridiculous, but being able to channel the magic through clothing was a huge benefit in terms of safety. These prototype jeans were nigh indestructible, so my experiments were paying off. As soon as the girls finishes their meeting, I'll take measurements for the class dress prismatic dress and try to make it. Sounds good? The slime wiggled in an affirmation. How long was their meeting anyway? Merely scheduling the next meeting probably takes them three whole days. Well, my strategy for producing the prismatic clothes was sound, but now I had a different problem. I was worried about the impact on my appearance. While I was experimenting the possible uses of infinity tentacles, I kind of slotted them into my cloak. In other words, I look like a teenager with tentacles writhing from underneath my black coat. At this rate, I'll get tossed into prison without a trial. I look like a teen Cthulhu. This is going to be hard to explain. Boing. Oh, was there any item more damaging to one's appearance? Not only would it tank my sex appeal, but it will also max out my repulsive creep score. My tentacles are really gross looking too. Practical, but disgusting. My cloak looked like something out of Cthulhu Mythos, not a fantasy world. If I saw someone else is wearing this, I'll run for the hills. It's that creepy. Even so, the tentacles were so handy to have around. I feel like we were a workplace BFFs, you know? Jiggle jiggle. No one else wanted to help after all. Not that they could have if they wanted to. They were still stuck in their internal meeting. Should I check on them? Day 51, night. I'm pretty sure it's insalubrious for a healthy teenage boy to rub a teenage girl all over. The white loser in. Interlude. Girls meeting. We finished our bath and started our girls only meeting. After the monster horde from a few weeks ago had obliterated two villages, we had started to worry about Harakakun. Now we couldn't wait any longer to discuss our concerns. We weren't sure how to help. What we could do for him. What we could say to him. Nobody knew. For once, he isn't at fault, said Fukunuki-san. He massacred the whole horde by himself, didn't he? Chika-chan asked. He insists that he only fought orcs because they were in front of him, I explained. He didn't need empty praise or encouragement. We told him plenty of times that he shouldn't blame himself. We could tell him countless times that he saved us, millions of times, billions of times, but that didn't make a difference. We have even told him that whenever we were trying to rescue him, he saved our lives instead. Yeah. I sensed that Haruka-kun was wrestling with some sort of unresolved trauma, but we couldn't figure out how to help or if help was even possible. Then, we talked about the infinite tentacles, an item that none of us wanted to be responsible for. Angelica sounded like she was about to cry, even as her face blazed crimson. Her breathing was labored and deep. What was she imagining? Not that, I thought. Please don't imagine that. Way too many tentacles, it's horrifying. You said it, Shimizaki-san added. Makes my skin crawl. We all started to imagine what those tentacles could do. A wave of awkwardness passed through the room, leaving a sea of blushing faces. Good luck, Angelica-san. Tell us about it tomorrow. Of course, we needed to hear what happened. Usually, we talked about this kind of stuff in the bath, but people kept fainting. It was best if our meetings didn't carry a risk of drowning. So, do you think he can make those tentacles vibrate? Asked Vice Rep B. Can you imagine a tentacle going brr brr brr? Stop! That's... Too much! They are his ultimate weapon! Virtuous young woman will go extinct! haruka -kun always claimed that he only had trash skills, but he fought by combining them in incredible ways. On top of that, he was like a great sorcerer of crafting. We were confident that he would use those tentacles in ways we couldn't even begin to imagine. The tentacles were almost certain meant to be used alone, but instead, he would definitely create some terrifying combo with them. I couldn't even contemplate the poor fate of Angelica. We definitely needed to call another girls' meeting tomorrow to hear about... We heard a hesitant knock on the door, accompanied by a jelly-like bouncing sound. It was haruka -kun. Only he could make a knocking sound like a question. How was that even possible? Yes, I said. You know this meeting is for girls, right? Trying to join in? We might let you if you dress up like a girl. Absolutely not! He shuddered from the other side of the door. I n Look, class rep, I need to measure you. 
It's for the prismatic dress. If your meeting doesn't end soon, I won't be able to take measurements. He says he won't wear girls' clothes, but wait. Did he say prismatic? As if on cue, all the girls shouted, Come in! Aren't you all a bit too eager to invite him? We were all wearing loungewear, and haruka was still technically kind of a guy. He was far more likely to run away from us, terrified than vice versa, but still. Uh, thanks, you know. <sighs> Look, I just need to take measurements. You had a hard time picking a color, so I was wondering if you wanted to make this dress prismatic too. Yes. I couldn't decide between white and blue. Black would be nice, too. I didn't know if I could pull off red, but if it were prismatic, that resolved my dilemma. Um, why was Haruka-kun wearing his black coat and full battle gear right after taking a bath? No, he wasn't dressed for battle, no gloves or boots, and he was wearing something more... casual. Wait, were those jeans? So selfish making jeans only for yourself! I'm adding a pair to my order! Me too! The other girl shouted. Wait a minute, this is just a prototype. Wiggle! Wiggled the slime. Eventually, he relented and added jeans to our orders. Even so, just a pair of jeans wasn't enough. I'd been pinning for a denim dress this whole time. But I figured it was impossible to dream in this fantasy world. But if he could make jeans, surely a denim dress was no problem. Make me a jean jacket too! Another girl demanded. Yes, Shimizaki-san said. I approve. Don't forget about the denim skirts. Now we're talking. Make me a pair of jean shorts. Jiko-chan added, genius. The motion is carried. No objections, I said. Even without any denim, all the girls were wearing shirts and short skirts this very moment. Haruka-kun didn't know where to look. We had him cornered. Time to get in as many orders as possible. We'll scrape together the funds for the additional orders. Girls need to feel cute. It's built on our budget. But I'm telling you, these are just prototypes, started Haruka-kun. You sly devil! I saw you wearing cargo pants the other day. I want culottes! Not fair, Haruka-kun. I want wide leg pants too! The demands of the pants party must be accepted. He had kept delaying making pants for us because skirts were easier. But he couldn't make that excuse after showing up in a pair of jeans. We'd waited for pants for such a long time. In all likelihood, Haruka-kun was just too embarrassed to measure our legs. So he kept putting it off. This was the inevitable result of our insatiable craving for pants. I deny all accusations, he said. These are still in development. I test everything out on my clothes first. It's just a sample, you know? We want an invite to the sample sale! A sample sale? Why didn't I think of that? He gasped. Slimy boinged up and down. He was making everything from scratch, so trial runs were forgivable. But tempting us with a sample sale? That was dangerous. Harukakun was surrounded by teenage girls in revealing sleepwear, with no place to run. His eyes, unable to find a safe place to rest, kept darting around. Were those shifty eyes really the same ones that caused the terror knights to cower in fear? He was making this too easy. I'm reserving my spot. Let me put in a pre-order. Me too, Vice Rep C said. Don't forget me. They crowded in, joining him in requests and demands, until his eyes lost focus and he started blankly, vacant and defeated. I'll take on more debt. I'll do anything for denim. Anything. Resistance was futile, as these new orders came flooding in. No one allowed him any reprieve. If it weren't for Haruka-kun's lifeless expression, this would have looked like a typical harem scenario. For such a massive pervert, he was actually very gentle and respectful, so we weren't worried. That was why we weren't prepared for what happened next. Ugh, fine! All right, this is never going to end. So I'm just going to take everyone's measurement at the same time, okay? Try not to squirm too much. I don't have full control yet. Well, I have perfect control, but I can't modulate their strength. Well, you know, tentacle strength. Know what I mean? Tentacles shot out from under his cloak and wrapped around all of us. It was a pandemonium. Thousands of thin tentacles squirmed around us, taking simultaneous precise measurements before we realized what was happening. He was too embarrassed to take down our sizes himself. So he let his infinite tentacles do it. Every inch of our bodies was measured by wriggling, wreathing tentacles. W wait, what? No! This looks and feels totally inappropriate! Ah, oh, a tentacle went under my clothes! Oh my, they're surprisingly soft. It feels kind of nice. Despite the chaos, Harukun simply stood in the middle of the room, nodding occasionally, cutting clothes with some help of some tentacles, which was passed on to the other tentacles for fitting. 
Once the fit was confirmed, the cloth went to yet more tentacles that handled the sewing. The tentacles would periodically stretch the garments against our bodies to confirm the measurements before returning to add more stitching. Good enough, Haruka-kun said. Is anyone listening? Oh, the tentacles are too, too distracting. Oh, oh my. Haruka-kun's tentacles showed no sign of stopping as they sewed new clothing based on our direct measurements. They were expert bespoke tailors. This is insane! Yeah, it tickles! The tentacles draped fabrics on us like we were dress forms, pinned them in place, cut them to pattern, and sewed them in completely, perfectly side pieces. By the time we collapsed from exhaustion and embarrassment, we had mountains of new clothes around us. We were drowning in debt, but none of us could stop grinning. We clutched our new clothes. This was a dream come true. The sort of dream a little girl never gives up. A closet of beautiful custom tailored outfits made by magic. That is, aside from the tentacles, their involvement turned the dream into a nightmare. Outfit just for me? I'm so happy. How do you know so much about women's clothing anyway? Oh, they're so well made. Ugh, tentacles. Despite it all, we were so happy. Scarred for life, but blissful nonetheless. Not a single one of us has stopped blushing. I think I've lost my innocence. In conclusion, tentacles were a hazard to maidens. They would exterminate every last inch of your youthful naivety. Day 51. Night. Sweet on the sweet sails. Hell no on the house sails. The white loser in. <sighs> what were those girls thinking showing me so much skin? Practically throwing themselves at me. Wiggle wiggle? As fluttered as I was, I think I made everything prismatic except the denim. <sighs> oh well, I'm charging extra for prismatic clothes so it's all good in the end. Jiggle jiggle. It was probably their attempt to cheer me up and help me forget about the destroyed villages. I wasn't actually dwelling on the ruins of those villages. They were just being worry words. What happened, what happened, and it was too late to change it. I simply didn't want to forget. People lived in that village, and it was gone because of my inaction. I don't want to forget about my responsibilities, you know. Jiggle? I wasn't bothered. I simply knew that there was no way to forgive myself for that loss of life. Anyway... The girls squirmed so much that I couldn't stop the tentacles from constricting around their wiggling bodies and touching them all over in a pervy sort of way. My senses were linked to the tentacles, so I did feel everything. That's why I told them to hold still. Their faces got flushed and their breath ragged. It was a really charged atmosphere, you know? Too much for an innocent teenage boy, don't you think? Slimy wobbled in agreement. I've done a rushed job, but the results turned out well in my opinion. It was an utmost religious experience, seeing those tentacles in action, not in a horny way. Ugh, I just panicked a bit when they started moaning and breathing hard. That's why I hurried through the work. It's just, the more they contorted and bent, the more I felt, you know, wiggle wiggle. I wasn't going to get any sleep, even though I cleared my docket of any clothing orders. I didn't want to think about all the accessories and equipment I had to deal with. Hmm, I can handle that with tentacles and holding magic too. I didn't have to worry about running out of MP either since I had that high-end P battery in my item bag. Slimy was fast asleep. I wonder if he was happy, if he had fun today. Was he having a pleasant dream? Was Slimy happy that he tagged along? I didn't have any answers. On the other hand, Miss Summer never needed to sleep, nor did she need to eat, but that didn't stop her from stuffing her face every day and snoozing with a beautiful smile on her face. I hope that Slimy could find happiness out here. I just didn't know the first thing about caring for a pet slime monster. Miss Armourette had gone swept up in the chaos of the girls' meeting, collapsed in exhaustion, and fell asleep with everyone else. In her sleep, she held her new clothes and had clothes. Even if they woke up early, they would probably be excited to try on all their new clothes. So I wasn't going to be interrupted for some time. That being the case, I went back to work, my never-ending unpaid overtime. Uh, the generals were put in a ton of orders, too, I lamented. The profiteers marked all her orders as urgent to boot. Of course, she put in another order for mushroom lunch combo. When would she realize that I'm not a restaurant? She always ordered mushrooms too. How could one woman like mushrooms so much? Well, the tentacles could probably handle it pretty fast. Plus, everything they make is a masterwork quality. I'll be able to modernize this city in no time. If I were feeling polite, I would describe the frontier as a humble and rustic realm. The reality was, it was a backwater. Why else would she order so many basic things like buckets, plates, and pots? Uh, what the hell? She ordered an ironwood burning stove? Go to the damn blacksmith for that! 
who orders all this stuff from the same person? It's all urgent. On top of all that, she expects me to make mushroom bento boxes every single day. Since when did she start selling sweets? She just decided that I'll make them for her without consultation. Not only that, but there were clearly inconsistencies between the sales and inventory. She was just eating the sweets herself. Uh, you're eating too much candy. Seven boxes for three people? Which one ate the extra box? Oh, and why did she sell all the furniture I decorated the store? Whoa, that's a huge profit margin. Never mind. Let's mass produce furniture. Even so, she sold the sales counter. Where did customers go to pay? Was she bagging groceries on the floor? <sighs> Is she an idiot? Why didn't she wait for me to make her a new one before selling her only sales counter? She really ripped people off with this. That's my kind of thinking. Let's make more furniture and swindle the world. This town was impoverished and declining before I got here. They had nothing. Wasn't it kind of absurd that a single person doing a little crafting would change everything? That made no sense. I should definitely mine some iron ore. There's an iron shortage in town, and I don't want to waste money buying it. Ugh, when would I be able to rest? I did write a schedule for myself. Well, I wrote to be determined on a piece of paper, but it was the start of a schedule. A side effect of scamming the girls every day meant that we had to go make money in dungeons whenever I had any time off too. Slimy slept deeply without so much as a jiggle in response to my ranting. Why the hell am I making buckets in a fantasy world? Though, I've already prepared my production pipeline for the task. What do I get from this bucket arrangement anyway? What's in it for me? Nothing. Surrounded by buckets in another world. What a terrible premise. Wood magic and tentacles did a great job though. Who needed this many buckets anyway? Next, she wants baskets? Does the general store lady think I'm a carpenter? If so, why is she ordering lunch? This tragic tale of interminable side gigs is never going to end. Hmm, I once read that talking to yourself was a warning sign for mental illness. If that's the case, isn't it cruel to tell a person with a mental illness to shut their mouth? No one's gonna stop me from grumbling to myself. It's not like anyone can hear me, so yeah, I'm gonna keep talking to myself. Working in silence is boring. What does she need all these baskets for anyway? Ah, damn it. If I had been making these from the start, I would have been catching fish this whole time. Before I knew it, I had become a master crafter in another world. Having developed assembly line techniques, I could now mass produce what I wanted. This is an inspiring tale of the owner and sole employee of a fantasy world sweatshop. <sighs> I should have realized that wood magic made fishing possible from day one. I can't believe I spent so much time eating mushrooms while staring hungrily at fish. It was an obvious event flag and I didn't know how I missed it. Next up, I had to fulfill a massive stack of orders for women's clothing and a smattering of orders for men's clothing. Even in the fantasy world, men's fashion was an afterthought. The men's section in the general store was tiny and shabby as could be. Men don't buy clothes, she says. It's a damn store. Sell clothes people want to buy. Don't just dedicate a tiny corner of the store to selling garbage. No matter how much work it would take, I decided to make more men's clothing. Why well, couldn't I think of anything besides jeans and cargo pants? Men really don't buy clothes. If it were up to me, I would only own a single pair of prismatic pants. Laundry would be an issue though. The other stuff is fine. I'll mass produce it and build up some extra stock. I'll keep working in my solo sweatshop until the town's economy develops a bit more. Why do I have to make lunches every day though? Go ask a restaurant! At this point, I was putting the finishing touches on the extra large mushroom bento box. Why is it always mushrooms? She's too obsessed with mushrooms. No matter how rich the town becomes, no one will ever open a mushroom-only restaurant. It's too niche. She'll be the only customer. All complaints aside, my item bag from the villager A sets preserved anything I put in it for a very long time, if not forever. I didn't know if time was stopped inside the bag or what, but the contents were always perfectly fresh. That was why I decided to mass produce her lunches. If I had any extra, I could always give some to Slimy. Thanks to the tentacles, my assembly line was faster than ever. I feel like I've been at it for ages, but in reality, very little time had passed. I think time passes slower for me now. Supreme thinking gave me high speed thinking and parallel thinking, which allowed me to use tentacles and holding magic to manufacture anything I wanted in the blink of an eye. I've become a perfect one man factory. This really was mass production. I'll get rich off of this. I built a surplus of requested furniture and a ton of new products as well. Next up was the sewing and the weaving. I was renting a four person room, but even with the extra space, it was getting cramped. I started putting the finished products into my item bag. 
Raw materials came out of the bag and finished products went in. In other words, that bag was both the start and the end point of a magical assembly line. This was an entire industrial sector compressed into one single room and one single side job. Hmm, looks like I'll be able to finish by the time his armor rep gets back. This is really speeding up. These tentacles are so useful. They worked at unimaginable speeds. I decided to upgrade the tentacle with Mithril. When I checked its status, the item now read Infinite Magic Hands. Create and control tentacles with magic hands. Alter shapes and properties. Hardening. Weaponization. Magic hands? Did the tentacles become hands? Finally! I have a helping hand! The tentacles were already a big help, so I could only imagine what infinite hands could do. Unfortunately, I was now running very low on Mithril. I better test these hands out, I thought. At that moment, my summer rep returned. Perfect timing. I'm going to test these infinite magic hands to my heart's content. Unlimited hands means unlimited pleasures. It was time to find out just how limitless unlimited really was. You see, as a teenage boy, all the time I spent pawing at my classmates with writhing tentacles had left me with a particular problem. I couldn't wait anymore. I had to try these babies out. Time to practice. To experiment. I can't help myself. It's not my fault. I swear, I swear. I double swear. Surely, you don't need me to tell you that she was incredibly exasperated with me the next morning. Day 52. Morning. I opened my eyes and without realizing it, production was complete. The white loser in. The plan for today was to resume yesterday's jellyfish dungeon. Despite this, the girls called an impromptu meeting in the middle of breakfast. They were whispering, giggling, and shrieking over God knows what. They surrounded Ms. Amareb who was trying to tell them something in a series of stilted words and gestures. The tentacles? Like fingers? Vibrating caresses? They transformed? In a sexy way? Girls just like to socialize, don't they? I figured Ms. Amarip was happy to talk so much. She had been all alone in the ultimate dungeon. I'd probably given up on dreaming altogether. I was just happy that she could smile and laugh. Slimy jiggled with glee as he devoured bread and stew. On the other side, the poster girl and stucker girl stuffed their mouths with bread, squealing and laughing with the cheeks as full of chipmunks. Ms. Amarip looked happy too. Anything was better than isolation at the bottom of the dungeon. I didn't like the idea of her having to earn money for her food expenses. I would rather her just eat to her heart's content. She only started eating for the first time recently, after all. I suppose she saved money if she made her own meals. I am ripping everyone off with these prices. Still, it's not easy to serve a varied menu with so few available ingredients. I wanted to go on a shopping trip throughout the domain, but I needed to save up some money for that. I didn't want to keep the frontier isolated forever. If trade stagnated too much, it would be a death knell for the frontier economy. As it stood, I had rejiggered the pseudo dungeon so that the members of the Stugger Girl clan could pass through with the help of high level adventurers. That way, trade in spellstones and mushrooms could continue in a limited fashion. Unfortunately, there weren't many adventurers at a high enough level, and they could only escort small groups. I could have altered the pseudo dungeon to permit merchants to pass, but I didn't want to give them a monopoly on trade. The economy depended on the domain's negotiations with the kingdom, but we couldn't just sit back and wait. After all, I was running out of rice and soy sauce. For now, I wanted to make sure that the duchy was self-sufficient in every other way. A strong economy was a powerful weapon after all. If the frontier faced iron, wheat, or cloth shortages, the kingdom would exploit that weakness. That was why self-sufficiency was essential. I had the technology to mass-produce textiles, but the region didn't have enough wool-producing livestock at the moment to provide raw materials. I already found some iron deposits, so all I need to do is excavate some mines. There isn't a lot of variety in food, but in terms of volume, we'd be self-sufficient soon. Currently, we maintain a monopoly on spellstones and mushrooms, which we could use to pressure the kingdom during negotiations. The only other option left to them would be military force, but no army could break through the pseudo-dungeon. The chest would decimate their forces. In the end, they would have to negotiate. Before that could happen, we have to establish a self-sufficient frontier. Wealth meant strength, and we needed wealth to avoid getting exploited. Right now, we lacked enough workers and livestock. Hey Haruka-kun, we're heading out, the class rep called. Why are you making so many buckets? Did your side job at night, okay? What, was I making buckets this entire time? I made buckets without even thinking. Whatever, I would just sell them and give any surplus to the inn since they treated us so well. Besides the name, it was a good inn. They never complained no matter how many monsters I brought back. They just all showed up on my bill. Hmm, they should advertise that the former dungeon empress and a dungeon king chose to stay at this inn. 
No, wait. That wouldn't work. It would only attract monsters and make this a destination for them. Earth to Haruka. Hello? Are you coming or not? I certainly am. Aren't I? Sorry, poster girl. Slime is coming with me too. Can you please put him down? Wriggle, wriggle. The poster girl looked distraught as Slimey jiggled free from her grasp. I suppose that I could have let her look after him while I was out, but I wanted the emotional support. Where are we going to get rich today? If we go back to yesterday's dungeon, there should be a dungeon king somewhere below the 50th floor, said the class rep. If there's more than 60 floors, we'll probably have to face more mid-bosses. We're going to start finding more secret rooms too, which will eat up a lot of time. Should we finish that dungeon or start a new one? Maybe we can split up and do both. What do you think, Haruka-kun? Since the student council and the athletics club were a part of our group, the other groups lacked powerful members, so they were having trouble getting through the middle levels of their own dungeons. Ms. Armorep, Slimey, and I could handle the rest of yesterday's dungeon ourselves. Let's go deal with a new dungeon, okay? And the other groups need more help and all, you know? I had some suspicion about the jellyfish dungeon. That works, but isn't that too dangerous? There shouldn't be too many floors. Besides, a small group can move faster, right? With just the three of us, we could rush through. We couldn't take a hit, so we weren't suited for normal battles anyway. A small group was much better at stealthily picking off monsters along the way. Our specialty. The floors below the 50th were unexplored, so they would have far more monsters too. Besides ambushing them, we could blitz through the weaklings, not that we had any other strategies. Trying to do something stupid dangerous again, aren't you? I'm not sure about this, why you're always throwing yourself in harm's way. Even if it's faster, it'll be way more risky. Why do you never listen? It still works out perfectly every single time, though. Even though he's only level 19, somehow I'm worried about the poor Dungeon King. They were right. My level still hadn't gone up. It had taken me a long time to get to level 10, so this level wall would take a while to scale. Fighting is the real dangerous and time-consuming part, I said. We'll just ambush monsters and one-shot them with surprise attacks. There's nothing to worry about, you know? The girls looked at each other with concerning expressions. This is definitely not safe, yet somehow you persuaded me, said the class rep. Jiggle, jiggle! The meat nerds had left earlier. On our way to the third dungeon, we made plans. While the student council reported on the conquered dungeon, I went to the bulletin board, my usual morning ritual. I even did this yesterday, though I'd been sleepwalking at the time, so I couldn't remember. I didn't even remember getting my daily helping of glares. I can tell without even looking that there's no new jobs on the board. It's eternal unchanging. Some of these notices look like they were ready to come from age. They're fossils. Why do I come here every day if it's the same? Always the same. Ah, uh, back again? You're not even a licensed adventurer. Yet you're here more than real adventurers. You still show up yesterday, even though you were asleep. You even mumbled. No new request. Z -z 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 -z. In your sleep. Your eyes were closed. Why do you keep coming here? Only adventurers can take those jobs. You're not even trying to be sneaky anymore. You're swaggering in here like you own the place. People are calling you the boss of the board. Can you please try to keep a low profile? I basked in her frigid glare while waiting for the others to return. An essential part of my morning nutrition. If I'm the boss of the board now, would I get crowned king of the board when I get promoted? A long journey to becoming emperor of the board regardless. The bigger problem was, at this rate, the board would never get updated. Why did it even exist? The girls returned. Sorry for the wait. We finished our report. We can go now. Hang on. Are you complaining about the quest board again? Even if there was anything good, you couldn't take it since we're going to a dungeon today anyway. Why are you so obsessed with it anyway? Do you want it? Do you want to take it home? You only get lectured. Oh, you're already getting lectured. If the board came with the head receptionist glaring at me, I'll take it. But otherwise, why would I want this? At this point, I felt like I had the thing memorized. It hadn't changed in a month. I delivered my goods to the general store and gave the owner a slapstick thwack with an oversized paper fan and a stern talking to while I was there. Not like my words had any effect, as there were a stack of new orders waiting for me whenever I stopped by. Despite the repeated smacks, she remained totally intent on devouring her mushroom lunch. She was a serious mushroom addict. How could you sell your sales counter? Did you spend the rest of the day doing business on a stack of crates? Wiggle wiggle. Slimy enjoyed wandering around town. He looked longingly at some jerky, so I bought some. Slimy bounced up and gulped it all down whole. If he liked it so much, then I would stock up later. 
Be careful out there! The gatekeeper called as I left. These so-called gatekeepers did nothing to stop dungeon emperors and bosses from passing. What exactly would they keep out? Finally, we made our way to the dungeon. All the girls looked exhausted this morning. Had they become nocturnal or something? Their eyes were completely closed, but they had seemed to have no problem navigating with presence sensing. Leveling up your presence sensing this much might not be a great idea at night. Vice Rep A groaned. We know. At least we can use it to walk. The path is straight, so it's fine. From what I overheard this morning, the girl's presence detection had upgraded to presence sensing. Their vibration skill reached maximum level, too. Their enemy tracking wasn't leveling up as quickly for some reason. What were they trying to detect and vibrate? Were they trying to work out the knots in their shoulders? So what were the guys wearing anyway? Was it some kind of uniform? Did you make it matching on purpose? Oh, that? I asked the guys if they wanted me to make them anything, I said. And they told me they wanted something durable, easy to move in, and that didn't show dirt. And had a ton of pockets. It looks kind of military, doesn't it? I made imitation camel M65 field jackets, dark cargo pants and black boots for them. They looked like modern day mercenaries in a world of swords and sorcery. It was totally inappropriate. Ooh, camel could be cute. Yeah, and some exciting colors. I kind of wanted to. The girls glanced at each other. We need to make money today. Are you serious? I just figured out prismatic clothes and now they wanted patterns? They did enjoy trying on all their new clothes this morning. And there was nothing wrong with a bit of glamour. Not like they could have eaten breakfast in full armor anyway. Here we are, the third residence, I pointed out. It's a dungeon, not a condo. The monsters here are mostly beast type, right? And they are lots of them, so keep an eye on your MP use. Boing? The best strategy for dealing with beast type monsters hmm, was probably to set up poison food. But Slimy might eat it by accident, so that wouldn't do. Besides, the girls needed to level up a bit more and get some more real battle experience before their next boss battle. All that sparring with Ms. Amara have ought to have taught them some of the nuances of combat by now. They've been getting by on cheat skills, but they need to learn how to fight properly. I still can't believe they tried to fight that jellyfish like it was a regular monster. Day 52, morning. Apparently, the source of the trauma is the same thing that caused their sleep deficiency. Something dangerous to maidens? A dungeon. The girls were horrified. Color drained from their faces. Terrified not by the monsters, but by me. Why did they look so creeped out while I was fighting over here? Ah, those tentacles! He's like the Vlad the Impaler reborn! The tentacles are terrifying in a whole new way. They're slithering and wriggling without mercy. Why were my tentacles so unpopular? Well, they were magic hands now... Were they traumatized by yesterday's events? Miss Amaret seemed especially traumatized. She cowered behind the other girls. This is just the result of my extreme care and caution. I have to always protect everyone perfectly, you know? Jiggle, jiggle! We were ambushed by level 18 ground hungers on the 18th floor, but my tentacle strategy wasn't getting the best reviews for some reason. How else was I supposed to deal with creepy sixth-armed gorilla beasts that jumped out of the ground and tried to hug me? Not a fan. Skewering them like that is just merciless and cruel. Slimy, Miss Armor up and I tagged along, but it was supposed to be training for the girls. But the stone flesh gorillas went for me first. I ended up snatching them in all my tentacles and stabbed them to death with my new little technique I picked up. We fought hedgehog monsters on the earlier floor, remember? So I tried the weaponization property of magic hands to see if I could cover myself in quills like a hedgehog. The ground hunger shouldn't have tried to hug me, okay? They didn't even ask for permission. Rude. The way you killed them was appalling. It was painful to watch. Now they were bullying my tentacles. My sweet wriggly babies. Don't call my cute widow tentacles scary. They're good, hard-working buddies. All the made-to-order clothes from yesterday wouldn't have happened if it's not for them. They measured you on in such care. Every millimeter of your bodies, you know. That's most of the reason why we hate them. Shield girl shouted. I couldn't sleep last night because of them. They are a threat to our innocence. They turned to glare at me, eyes wet with tears. Another day, another dollar. You all had so much fun with your prismatic fashion show this morning, right? These sweet tentacuties made that possible, so stop harassing them. And since I control them, it's like you're bullying me by proxy. 
Don't you feel bad for me at all? For real? You're gonna make me cry, you know? That's exactly what you deserve! Since the girls now had present sensing, they were able to pinpoint and exterminate monsters. Besides some monsters that hid on the ground, they had handled it. Is this the meaning of girl power? I didn't see any hidden rooms, so we simply killed the monsters in our path as we descended the dungeon. No serious battles? The girls just slaughtered their foes with one-sided shows of force. They were unstoppable when they were in the zone, but easily overwhelmed when they weren't. The girls were all incredibly specialized in either offense or defense, so they didn't adapt well to unexpected circumstances. If they could execute a strategy, they did fine, but they couldn't improvise. The guys were the exact opposite, just doing whatever they felt like in the moment. I think you might all be a little too overprepared. Your strategies and formations are kind of stiff, you know? Ms. Armor Rep nodded. Slimy jiggled. Strong, but n not safe, Ms. Armor Rep added. Wiggle, wiggle. The nerds were almost lazy. How they cheesed their way through battles, and the meat has improvised. Their minds too limited to conceive of tactics. The girls, on the other hand, were a force to be reckoned with when things went according to plan, and hopelessly weak when something unpredictable happened. They didn't know how to adapt to changing circumstances. Their power was incredible, but fragile. They needed to learn from Miss Armor Rep. The way she fought monsters was by deflecting their strengths and slipping through to strike their weaknesses. If she couldn't overwhelm them, she could use their power against them. Whether she was defending or attacking, she always landed her blows. That was why she was a master of battle. I learned this the hard way, as she beat the tar out of me every morning. I tried using magic hands to fight with eight swords at once, but she held her own with just one blade. She didn't just block my attacks, she parried and reposted cutting the hands to ribbons. How is any of that possible? You need to teach them more than just your techniques. They need to learn how you think about fighting, you know? Ms. Armor Rep nodded, slimy jiggled. On second thought, I didn't think it was possible for them to learn her techniques, so they would need to focus on learning her strategies. We're having a great run, the glass rep said. Let's keep at it. Yeah! They were full of energy. The book club group had previously reached the 49th floor, so we weren't encountering too many monsters. I didn't expect any trouble. Ah! Uh, help! Ugh, oh, so much for that. The girls couldn't push through with a strong offense, but when they tried to switch to defense, their formation broke. It was a pandemonium. They should have just started attacking the monsters on their own, but they were trying and failing to repair their formation instead. Did Miss Armor Rep just facepalm? Um, did Miss Armor Rep just facepalm? The least you can do is help them out, right? You too, Slimy. Go bounce around, okay? Jiggle! The girls excelled in tactical warfare and totally fell apart in a melee. Without the class rep's leadership, they couldn't coordinate. Fortify the defenses! But which ones? What do we do? The infinite magic hands might have been as infinite as the name implied, but I could only control so many at once. The enemies were birds, level 35 vanish eagles. Eagles would have been cool, but these had featherless bald heads like vultures. They periodically vanished as they flew around, often escaping death by winking out. The girls, unable to finish the monsters off, kept getting surprised by counterattacks. Maybe they vanished their head feathers by accident? An ability like vanish made formation worthless. A normal battle against them was impossible. If I didn't need to chase the eagles in the air, I wouldn't need such tight control over the tentacles. So I wouldn't be limited how many I could command at once. At that realization, I sent out countless tentacles, reshaped into razor-sharp threads crisscrossing over our heads. The eagles that flew in a single strand stopped beating their wings as they were sliced in two, while others flew into viciously sharp lattices of thread and became mints. What is happening? The class shrimp shouted. Even if these were flightless birds, the girls would have had problems because of their Vanish ability. It was good that Vanish only caused them to blink out of existence for a few seconds at most. If it was indefinite, my trap wouldn't have worked. They can't stop mid-flight, so they can't help but dice themselves flying through my trap, you know? I said. Their weakness is traps. Chasing after them is a meathead level stupid strategy. Don't you dare lump us with them! We couldn't have possibly built a trap like that on our own! Well, thanks I guess, the tiny animal said. It's not my fault I can't fly, complained Shield Girl. Huh, their speed is bad enough, but being able to vanish like that was a nightmare. They kept pecking me, it hurt. Yeah, they kept diving straight at my eyes. How dare they, Vice Rep A said, shaking her fist. To target the pretty eyes of the young maidens is unforgivable. You ugly bastards. If the old man from the weapon shop heard what they were saying, he'd whip bitter tears. He was bald as the vanished eagles. 
You shouldn't rely entirely on your formations. You have to use magic skills and exploit weaknesses, you know? There is a lot of monsters you can't beat by just wailing on them. Miss Umberbeck can do that just because she's insanely good. But none of you are on her level. That's why you have so much trouble when your formation breaks. It's true, the class rep conceded. We had trouble with those exploding bats too. You gotta learn how to adapt to your enemies. Their main magic wielder, a certain soft-spoken arc sage, chose to smash everything with her giant hammer instead of casting spells. Was it possible that the arc sage was a melee class? Hmm. I know it's a problem. It's just, I can only focus on one thing at a time, the class rep said. Vice rep A agreed. Indeed, when I fight with my sword, I forget about magic and vice versa. The big issue, I think, is that your dedicated magic user keeps ditching the rear guard to fling herself into battle. Know what I mean? I said. Oh dear, said Vice Rep B. But it would be far worse if I were used to without my offensive spells, don't you think? Where's the fun without getting a bit physical? Phrasing aside, she wasn't wrong. The nurse combined skills and magic freely, making them effective in battle. But they were unathletic and fought with poor form. Being nerds, they were always terrible at physical exertion. Along with Miss Armor Rep and Slimy, Vice Rep B didn't take a scratch. So... Maybe there was something to focus on individual technique. But even if it was impressive, it was usually sort of an achievement for a back row combatant. How did you do that anyway? The class rep asked me. I didn't sense any spell casting, but bird chunks were suddenly falling from the sky. Oh, those were just my tentacles, you know? Or rather, my magic hands. Seriously? Simply a net to catch birds. If they couldn't see it, they couldn't dodge it. I turned them into razor-sharp wire and strung them up over our heads. Aren't my tentacles the best? So stop bad-mouthing them, okay? An evil tentacle trap! They're inescapable! Jiggle jiggle? Why were the girls so freaked out over my tentacles? Why was everyone suddenly blushing and looking away? Even Miss Armor Rep hid behind the other girls. They were just my friendly magic hands. Don't you remember them from last night? As incredible as magic hands were... I still had a lot of difficulty controlling them, even with supreme thinking. They were even more of a challenge because I was moving around using teleport at high speeds in combat. I could hardly control teleport in the first place. Teleporting while using magic hands was impossible to predict, let alone control. Even I was baffled by them, and I was the one doing it. After we clear a few more dungeons, it would be a good idea to spend more time on training, I said. Overcoming weak points and learning new fighting styles, you know? A drill sergeant can whip you all into shape, you know? You mean training with Angelica-san? It's not a terrible idea. Oh no. Real combat experience was the best training, but it didn't help improve fundamentals. Fighting in groups meant that the girls didn't improve their solo skills, and it was still too dangerous for them to go at it alone in a real battle. I was the other extreme, unable to join groups and focus entirely on solo techniques. In fact, other people were only liable to get hurt if I lost control of my abilities. Ms. Armor Rep and Slimy could just dodge my attacks, but my classmates were in danger if I used any of my best techniques. Hmm, though we should certainly grind some new weapon skills. Yeah, and learning to solo could be a lifesaver. Uh, but I'm so bad with spears. Using only swords limits our options too much. We need more shield users. I can't be the only one in my party, Shield Girl said. That makes sense. We should get some proficiencies and bucklers at the least, right? I was struggling to follow the rapid-fire conversation. Was this some sort of girls-only chat skill? Eh, regardless, at this rate, I'll be left far behind my classmates in stats. And I couldn't form groups because I was a loner, so I couldn't benefit from fighting with others. I couldn't even benefit from conversing with them. It was more efficient for me to work alone, but I had to make sure that I didn't cause collateral damage. I accompanied the girls to seek out hidden rooms and treasures, but we would get in each other's way during a boss fight. Doubly so for a dungeon king. Anyway, let's keep going. Yeah! Slimy bounced in agreement. If a boss's level matched the number of the floors we were on, it wouldn't be such a big deal, but Slimy was level 100 when we fought. That meant that he was Emperor tier. It was an understatement to say that we were fortunate to make Slimy our ally. Fighting him would have been like fighting Miss Armor Rep going all out. I couldn't afford to hold back in a serious battle like that. My skills were just as much a danger to my classmates as a Dungeon King. They couldn't understand, having never seen me go all out on a final boss before. Judging from the spellstones we've found so far, I figured this boss would be level 50 or so. Which was probably weak enough that we could handle it together. But a level 100 boss? 
Something as powerful as Slimy was way too dangerous. We were lucky that Slimy had become weak from hunger. If Slimy could have mustered the energy to cast magic, we would have been screwed. Even if I had tried to protect everyone, someone could have died. Fortunately, Slimy was only trying to have us as a snack, so things were resolved pretty quickly. If he had really wanted to kill us, he might have succeeded. That was how powerful level 100 was. But little old Slimy was just playing around, you know? Wiggle, wiggle! Though Slimy was currently frolicking, wiggling, wobbling, and dancing. He could keep up with Miss Armor Rep. Not something I want as an enemy. It was possible that there were more level 100 bosses. And I didn't know what I would do if they were as cute as Slimy. I turned to the girls. If the Dungeon King happens to be level 100, you need to retreat. Even if something happens to me, you have to run. I'm serious. The girls glared at me, their eyes shining with tears. But it was what it was. I knew they were worried, but the risk was too great. That's probably for the best, Class Rift replied. Since our group has so many weaknesses. Boing, boing. Shield Girl was my exact opposite. Whereas I'll die in the single hit, she could take a hundred. On the other hand, I could dish out more than one hundred blows without getting hit. Also, an enemy I could one-shot would take her a hundred blows. On top of that, I attacked a hundred times faster. I'm a weakling. There's no changing that. However, my opponents were just as fragile. The first to hit wins. Okay, we promise to retreat. But don't do anything too reckless. You too, Angelica and Slimy. Don't worry. We'll be fine, said Angelica. Jiggle, jiggle. Using magic entanglement to imbue dimensional slash into life or death, I could render an enemy's defenses, vitality, and resistances meaningless. All I needed to do was land the first blow. First to arrive, last to survive. This reduces the various down to luck and skill. Against the level 100 Dungeon King, I will have to bring everything I had. It was fine though, because the Dungeon Emperor, before she quit her job, was so powerful that an ordinary level 100 Dungeon King was below her notice. She was unbeatable, consumed by darkness. She could have destroyed the entire world. When we fought in the abyss of the ultimate dungeon, she didn't use more than 10% of her power. No, even 5% was too high an estimate. He didn't even need more than 1% of her strays to wipe the floor with me every day. Even now, Miss Armour had probably harbored all that power inside her. That pure, perfect strength, swallowed up in the darkness. Never mind destroying the world. Her power easily surpassed the gods. I knew for a fact that she could wreck that miserable old geezer from that white place. <sighs> if only I could summon him. Level 100 Dungeon Kings were potential emperors. They needed to be killed, but it was incredibly dangerous. I had the best chance of killing them, but I also had the greatest chance of getting killed. And we couldn't just let Dungeon sit there either. That's why I keep going. That and the money. Day 52, late morning. Three heads aren't necessarily better than two. A dungeon. Once my classmates reached levels in the mid-90s, they were much lower to gain new levels. It probably took a staggering amount of experience to go from 99 to 100, but reaching that level would almost certainly make one exponent. But reaching that level would almost certainly make one exponentially more powerful. Monsters kept out at level 100, but humans could hit levels even higher than that. By that point, a person could probably take on a whole Dungeon King head on. If so, they didn't need to take huge risks. They could become far more powerful, stronger than any monster. Loose formation, the class rep commanded. Surround the enemy! Roger! Jiggle! For me, level didn't mean anything. I didn't use my stats to fight in the first place. And I certainly had no hope of reaching level 100 in my lifetime. I had wiped out all the monsters in the forest. Even killing a goblin emperor was only enough to let me reach level 10. The problem was not only how long it would take, but how many monsters I would have to kill. If slaying all the monsters in the forest only got me to level 10, I doubted that there were enough monsters in the entire world to allow me to reach level 100, even if I vanquished every last one of them myself. That's the last of them! We killed ours too! Let's gather the spellstones! Okay! Clearing the deepest part of the ultimate dungeon and conquering dungeons non-stop ever since was still not enough to reach level 20. There was simply no way enough experience points existed to reach level 100. If that many monsters were around in the first place, then this world would have been overrun long ago. If it's a beast type, we can handle it. Dog beasts with pack tactics, huh? <laughs> That's better than birds, I'll tell you that. 
<laughs> Flying is so unfair. Wiggle, wiggle. Ms. Umarip and Slimy would probably reach level 100 one day. Ms. Umarip was immortal, and who could possibly even guess how long Slimy would live? But that possibility was closed off to me. I was only human after all. I swear I am. Look at my stats. It says so right there. Why are you talking to yourself and checking your own stats over and over? Um, I get bored when the secret room sucks so much, so I tend to monologue more. Does that make sense? Boing! I had no idea why we were brought to this world, but maybe there was a reason. Back in that white room, the decrepit old man had said something about compatible wavelength and the aggregate of our soul. I don't know what he meant by wavelength, but if that meant that he needed to summon 43 people, we were in trouble. There were only 30 of us left, and one was useless. Nearly a third of us had died, leaving only 69.76744186% of us to carry on. I thought it essential that my 29 remaining classmates reach level 100. I had no way of knowing if that would be enough to save humanity, but to make up for the loss of so many lives, we needed to become as capable as possible. Watch out! A bear! The class rape called. The bears are already trying to eat me! By strip shouted, her voice panicky. The warning's a little late! I couldn't say for certain, but I felt like there was a reason we were brought to this world. If that was the case, I could not assume that any of us were optional. I could never reach a high enough level to really help, so that was why I had to face the final boss alone. I was a glass cannon side character, only relevant in the beginning of a story. Shield Girl smashed into a bear with her shield. Don't just mumble to yourself, Haruka kun Help us! The bear reared back and roared. And for the life of me, it sounded like it was asking a question. If we were summoned with a purpose, then it likely had something to do with dungeons. Only one kind of monster could be found on any given floor of a dungeon. With so few distractions, figuring out how to defeat them was effortless. He's ignoring us! He's ignoring the bears too! If we did nothing, if we let a level 100 monster lord rise up from the dungeons and let an army of fiends, it would be too late. The world would be doomed. We were lucky that we could fight monsters on one floor at a time, one dungeon at a time. We couldn't let them get out. Ah, he keeps mumbling to himself while beating up any thorn bears that happen to get too close. He looks serious, but I can't shake the feeling that he's daydreaming. To keep as many people safe as possible, I had to deal with the Dungeon King myself. The risk of losing any of my classmates was too high, and their chances of victory were remote. They needed to retreat. He's still talking to himself while evading attacks? I'm almost starting to root for the bears. They're the underdogs. No matter how hard they try, he's defeating them without even paying attention. The girls chanted, Let's go, bears! Let's go! As if they were at a sporting event. Slimy bounced along with their chant. Though I was weak, my epic luck made me harder to kill. And my collection of rare skills increased my chances of success. High risk, high reward. We were likely brought to the frontier because it was the most dangerous region of this world. What with the monster's riddled forest, the ultimate dungeon, and the potential for an all-out war. Two villages had already been destroyed by the horde of rampaging monsters from that forest. Right now, those threats weren't a problem. We needed to clean up the remaining dungeons to make the frontier safe. Unchecked, the flood of monsters from these remaining dungeons could devastate the duchy and weaken the frontier's military enough that the kingdom would see an opportunity to invade. Then we have a war on top of a deluge of monsters. No matter how many times I explained it, no one seemed to understand. This was the brutal logic of this world. It just was. <sighs> even the very last bear was ignored and then squashed. I can't even make out what he's saying. Mm, no matter how I thought about it, the whole summon to an alternate world premise just truly, truly sucked. This wasn't some sort of story where heroes got summoned to another world to fight and struggle, but ultimately got to live in peace. Such a thing might be fun to read about, but this world wasn't so easy. Why is he crying? What's wrong with him? Vice Rep A pondered. He's clearly not in any danger. Maybe he's feeling remorse for what he did to those poor bears. Vice Rep B said. I want to be worried about him, but he's making me worry instead. What's wrong, haruka -kun? You're not going to die! Why are they yelling? I'm not dead. I think. This wouldn't last forever. Once the girls were level 100, I'll be taking the easy road. I promise you that. Huh? Oh, I was just thinking that these old bones just want to retire, I said. Oh, don't worry. I'll keep us safe till you're all over level 100. Then it's some well-earned rest, you know what I mean? 
Why are you planning to retire in the middle of a dungeon? Hey, at least I had plans. We're worried about you finding the Dungeon King alone. And all you can think about is early retirement? The class rep asked. Um, well, the most dangerous boss I faced was definitely Ms. Armor Rept, followed by Slimy. I survived, didn't I? I said. Anything stronger than those two, and I would have been noped out. Anyway, I think all the Dungeon Kings are starting to stay home and shirk their responsibilities. Sure, there was some risk, but not compared to what I had gone through so far. The fact that I had survived this long was solid proof that there was nothing left that could kill me. Uh, compared to what I've faced before, a level 100 Dungeon King wasn't a threat, I said. The two most dangerous entities in this world are standing right beside me, you know? The third most powerful monster isn't even a concern. It should just take a consolation prize and call it a day. What is he even talking about? A consolation prize? Is that what you call massacring bears? Well, it's worse consideration, you know? It probably would not be that easy. The two most powerful beings in this world were considerably weakened after resetting to level 1. Though I had become more powerful since then, even if only a little. <sighs> Forget it, the class rep said sighing. Let's focus on the 49th floor. Right! The girls wiped out the level 49 armor chameleons. The monsters tried to camouflage themselves, but the girls used their incredible presence sensing to hunt down every last one of them. So they can definitely sense me too. Remember your promise, the class rep said. We'll retreat if you say so. Just make sure you don't do anything too reckless. If you do, we'll take your allowance away and give it all to Slimy and Angelica. Oh, come on. Are you saying that of the three of us, I'm the one who can't be trusted with money? How can you even compare me to those two avatars of greed and gluttony? Wiggle wiggle? Sure, I was the avatar of lust and sloth, but I wasn't a spendthrift. Furthermore, I'm the hardest working slacker in the world. To add insult to injury, the girls confiscated any money I made off of them when they bought my goods. I'm not even a paid freelancer at this point. We descended to the 50th floor. I had a bad feeling about this. What waited us ahead is a level 100 boss, Cerberus, the hellhound that guarded the gates of Hades. This monster from the deepest depths of hell was just a cute pupper with one more head than the little brother's Orthrus. I remembered the little Orthrus had tried to cover his two snouts with its paws. I hit the height though. His big brother Cerberus also tried to cover his snout with its four paws, but could only recover but could only cover two of them out of three. So the middle head, and then the rest soon died in agony too. Well, so much for the bad feeling. It was already dead. Uh, retreat? I said. Why will we need to retreat now? The class rep said. You killed the beast! That was so tragic! The poor doggy tried to cover its poor middle nose! How strong is that vinegar? Is it safe for cooking? Uh, my sinus is on fire! Jiggle, jiggle! The whole floor reeked of vinegar. My eyes watered and my nose burned. Mucus ran from my nose to no avail. <sighs> Time to go. Even Slimy, who didn't have a nose or eyes, seemed miserable. I was so worried that we would have to fight something on Slimy's level, but the poor dog died with a whimper. He was in so much pain. I'm going to hear that agonizing whine in my sleep tonight. Cerberus was a level 100 Dungeon King, but it was just a dog, so dealing with it was easy enough. It was ridiculously terrifyingly powerful, but I didn't even break a sweat. Slimy was thus far the only exceptional Dungeon King. He was cute and wiggly after all, like jelly. What the hell was that? You were screaming, RETREAT! While spraying vinegar everywhere. I have never expected to see the guard dog of Hades yowl in anguish like that. My jiggly friend had no weaknesses. On top of his incredible stats, he was immune to all types of damage. I couldn't find any way of defeating him. This overgrown puppy was all bark and no bite in comparison. All you needed was a little vinegar. After all that spooky atmosphere and the big dramatic entrance, Cerberus only got a chance to yelp. Is it just me or did the Guardian of the Underworld not seem like the embodiment of internal wrath at all? The Dungeon King was an enormous all-rounder with perfect resistance, Herculean strength, god speed, leap and evasion, and infernal magic. Not that we got to see any of that in action. We would have gotten wiped out if we tried to fight, said class rep. I only saw the stats for a moment, but they were insane. There was no way we could have won, so telling us to retreat was the right call at the time. Yeah, the idea was fine, but the person suggesting it is always wrong. Huh? I couldn't win that kind of fight either, I said. 
What did you expect me to do? Additionally, the three-headed dog had slash resistance, magic evasion, physical evasion, infernal flame, arctic frost, hyper revival, vorpal fangs, and many more. I barely had time to read the full skill list. Yeah, but all that yelping? How could we retreat while that was happening? It was so pitiful, the class rep said. All I can remember is how pathetic it looked trying to cover its snout. It died before it got the chance to act, but the girls wouldn't have had the chance against something so powerful. Telling them to retreat was the right call, so I didn't do anything wrong. The level wall before level 100 is probably way bigger than any of the others, you know, I said. Just to get through its damage resistance, you would need to have the stats of a level 100 adventurer, right? I don't think people below that level can do anything to a level 100 dungeon boss. Didn't you just kill it? That poor doggy died crying his little heart out. Three heads yelping. I can still hear it. I was pretty good at dealing with dogs and bugs. Vinegar and insecticide solved most of my problems. It always worked in my world after all. Still, this vinegar was something else. It was as harsh as tear gas. We all still had runny noses. Wiggle wiggle. Slimy jiggled in disappointment as he sampled the meal that left for him. He was clearly not a fan of pickled Cerberus. Was it too sour? Slimy puddled pitifully, somehow becoming even more oozy than usual. Well, good work, I guess. Not that much work was done or anything. Ms. Amarep nodded. Slimy jiggled. Because of Hyper Revival, we had to kill it as quickly as possible. I had lobbed a vinegar bomb. Then Ms. Amarep, Slimy, and I leapt up and simultaneously cut off the beast's head. The vinegar was already hard to stomach from a distance. It became suffocating my asthma up close. Ugh, my eyes burn like hell. Who made this vicious vinegar? I decided to make more vinegar bombs. It was too dangerous to sell in a general store, but I could make tons of money at a weapon store. Why are you going to sell something so monstrous? The class rep said. What? But Cerberus was the monster! I protested. Yet again, you show no remorse for your crimes. The level 99 Minotaur from the Ultimate Dungeon had higher stats. But Cerberus had a far better skill set. It was overwhelming, more powerful in comparison. I had kind of wanted the class trip to hijack some of those skills, but it was still too dangerous. She would have died instantly if she had been so much as grazed by one of the nails on the beast's paws as it flung out to protect its nose. It would have shredded the class trip to bits, and I don't think people grow back. For that very reason, I knew I had made the right call. I couldn't let the girls fight on their own. It was too dangerous. The class didn't even have the forethought to keep vinegar on hand. Ugh, so unprepared. I don't want to admit it, but you were right, haruka -kun, the class rep said. I know that I couldn't have been that monster. Even if I was level 100, I doubt that I could have won. Next time we'll listen and retreat. So long as you keep your side of the promise, haruka -kun. Yeah, you can't do anything reckless. From now on, the 50th floor was off limits to any of my classmates. Though the meatheads would probably forget what floor they were on and end up there. Could they even count to 50? That might be a problem. Their idiocy, that is. Taking a peek from a safe vantage point on the stairs up, I saw that the Cerberus had become a spellstone. No one volunteered to grab it. The girls kept insisting that it was the responsibility of the person who sprayed vinegar everywhere. I went back out to retrieve the spellstone. Ugh, it reeks. I can't breathe. My eyes are burning. And whose fault is that? Came a chorus of voices. The spellstone was enormous and crystal clear, obviously high grade. The boss dropped some treasure too. Legendary beast leather armor, speed plus 50%, vitality plus 30%, slash immunity, magic evasion, physical evasion, incarnate. Jackpot! I didn't know what incarnate did, but it sounded awesome! It sounded so cool that I'm pretty sure I would never get the chance to use it. That happened with any other cool skills or items I found so far. Alas. This one wasn't going to be any different. The air was doing a number on my sinuses again, so I wanted to retreat back to the stairs immediately. But naturally, there was a secret room on this floor. Lucky me. Even the secret room was tainted with a stench of vinegar. With blurry eyes and a runny nose, I entered and opened the treasure chest. It contained a commander ring, command, leadership, total effect sharing. The class rep definitely needed this. Command and leadership were good skills, but total effect sharing had to be incredibly rare. I suspected that he shared all the buffs of the leader to all the members of the group. In other words, all my classmates would have the class rep cheat skills, strengthening the entire party. Did he mean that all my classmates would suddenly gain the effects of alpha male and super horny? Would my classmates turn into a bunch of mega perverts? 
<laughs> I chuckled. Class rep, calm down. She's sprouting horns. Wiggle, wiggle. What was that chill just now? Unfortunately, it probably didn't share the effects of special skills like hijack. What a pity. That probably excluded monster skills like Alpha Mount and Super Horny too. I brought the items back before they started to stink too much of vinegar. Ugh. My eyes stung. Ah! Why was everyone mad at me? Whatever. After some negotiations, we agreed that I could keep the legendary beast leather armor. I forgave them three rings worth of debt each. We had agreed to a payment plan where I could forgive debts in exchange of dungeon loot. Forgiving 30 rings worth of debt sounds extreme, but it's worth it for such an amazing item. Two rare types of evasion! I was also curious about Incarnate. Inhabiting another body didn't sound especially great or anything, but it's worth a try, right? Of course, everyone unanimously voted that the class trip should have the commander ring. I couldn't command anyone, and I definitely didn't want to inflict my unfortunate skills on the rest of the class. Body manipulation meant that your body moved as soon as you thought about it. And if you weren't careful using walking mastery, you would trip on your own feet. Suddenly gaining those skills mid-battle would be a disaster. Seriously. Day 52. Lunch. Make friends with the goddess of greed. Don't underestimate their negotiating power. A dungeon. Escaping from the offensive orders of the dungeon. We enjoyed a picnic outside. As expected, the dungeon had little to offer a discerning real estate investor. But the loot was incredible. And the final boss at Spellstone was quite a high grade. Unfortunately... High quality spellstones were typically too valuable to sell. I'll have to exchange them at the guild. Using a spellstone battery would be good too, but I needed money. <sighs> Lunch is ready! It's still in development, but you're all fortunate enough to be the guinea pigs for my latest experiment. Fresh pasta! You know? Napolitan style. Uh, not like Naples, but it's some sort of like handmade pasta Napolitan. Sort of, uh, I didn't have regular wheat flour and the noodles turned out to be like udon noodles. So some might claim that it, this is Udon Napolitan. Well, it's definitely noodles. Oh, I'm in. Whether it's pasta Napolitan or Udon Napolitan, I'm starved. Looks great. Mm, it reminds me of home. Jiggle, jiggle. I had managed to rustle up some kind of coarse ground flour. Maybe durum flour? Maybe not. Either way, it was no good for bread, so I decided to make some noodles with it. And they turned out okay. They were more like udon than spaghetti, but the results still seemed pretty appetizing. Mmm, it's great! I want seconds! Me too! I've been strangely hungry ever since getting here. The food has been weirdly delicious too! They ordered seconds, so I sauteed some more freshly boiled pasta in a mixture of tomatoes, mushrooms, bird meat, ketchup, and pepper. It's just an experiment I made with some flour I got from the general store, I said. I heard that durum wheat doesn't make good bread, so I tried making pasta with it. Since it's more like udon, maybe I'll make some yucky udon next time. Ooh, he made cream sauce too! I can't believe we're eating pasta napolitan! Seconds! Yay! By strips, he squeaked. The noodles were a bit dry and crunchy, but I was pretty sure that was a problem with the quality of the flour, not my eating. Next time, I would add eggs. Mmm, it's so good! This is real pasta! Napolitan and I reunited at last! Will I ever see the shores of Napple? Can you make carbonara next time? Yes, please! I love pasta pepperoncino too, but carbonara definitely comes first! Jiggle jiggle! The cream sauce was actually a basic bechamel sauce made with flour and milk. I could never have recreated this nostalgic dish the girls craved if I cared about authenticity after all. Unfortunately, carbonara is probably impossible right now, I said. Eggs are so precious and I have yet to track down any cheese or cream. Oh well. The class rep said. The Napolitan is amazing. Boing, boing! Country Living contained a description of various production methods for dairy products. We just needed more livestock to set up a dairy farm. But that was still way off. There is such harmony of flavors between mushroom and pasta. You can't go wrong with the mushrooms in this world, right? I never cared for mushrooms back in Japan. But these here are delicious! Why did the girls like mushrooms so much? They asked me to include them in every meal I cooked. Were they becoming addicts? To be fair, they're pretty delicious. Thanks for the food! That was so good! Now it's cleanup time! Let's do it! Jiggle! I was glad that everyone was safe, but now I knew for sure that it was too risky for them to fight Dungeon Kings until they were at least level 100. Anything from the 50th floor onward was too dangerous. A mid-boss at the 50th floor was something the three parties working together could probably take on. 
All 29 of my classmates, we need to work together to defeat a level 50 Dungeon King. But a level 100 Dungeon King? That was way beyond their limits. Even if they somehow won such a battle, there was no way they would get out on skate. If they could learn to work as a perfect team, they might have a higher chance, but they would still risk someone dying. Next up, yesterday's Jellyfish Dungeon. We'll take care of it, I said. Go help the other groups reach the 49th floor, okay? But promise you won't go to the 50th floor. I'm serious. Don't push yourselves too hard. Okay, I get it. You shouldn't push yourself either. Stay safe. You promised. Yeah, you promised that we will have hamburger steak tonight. Tickle! When did I promise that? The power of woman terrified me at times. As suspected of the friends of the goddess of greed, I thought. One must never underestimate the negotiating a cumin. They even handed me even more clothing orders. See you later, they called. Wiggle, wiggle. Uh, they were insatiable. Now they were requesting that I make them M65 military jackets. Why were they trying to go modern military in a fantasy world? When we first reached the town, my classmates were all excited about wearing loose rope belted tunics. They actually looked setting appropriate. Lately, however, there were outfits that would have looked more at home on the streets of modern Japan. I drew the line I copied in the Louis Vuitton monogram. LV is only short for level in this world. What else did they ask for? Nylon? I can't do that. I'll need to dig an oil well and build an oil refinery. What's next, an internal combustion engine? This is the awe-inspiring power of these girls, these goddesses of greed. Well, I remember seeing how to make a similar material using alchemy before. Something like a resin coating. Alright, shall we get down to business? You too, Slimy. Don't wander off on your own, okay? Let's go. Jiggle, jiggle. Nod, nod. Huh, come on, Miss Armor Rep. You can use people words. Lately, she had become too lazy to bother vocalizing, instead relying on gestures alone. The only time she's exercised her vocabulary anymore was to scold me in the morning. As usual, I didn't get the chance to fight, but we made our way down to the 50th floor. <sighs> I have absolutely nothing to do when we go to dungeons. This level reset slime was freaking unstoppable. Slimey must have taken an interest in how I use magic hands. He shot tentacles from his round blobbly body and duplicated my wire cutter attack. Aww, so cute, yet so strong. I just came up with that technique and you ripped it off already? No, you didn't just copy me, you were doing it better! Why am I even here? Even though Slimey had a great aptitude for magic and incredible defenses, he preferred melee. He had a particularly large appetite for devouring monsters. It barely deserved mention, as commonplace as it was, but Ms. Armor Rep, clad in her shining silver white armor, was a deadly dance through her foes. She had such an aggressive fighting style, yet she was untouchable. Rather, her aggressive fighting style was so overpowering that she literally sliced through her enemies. Will no one show me the least bit of compassion and leave some monsters for me to fight? No? Wiggle, wiggle. Servitude was probably normally something monster tamers used to send their thralls to fight in the front lines while they hung in the back and used spells and support magic from the rear. Hmm, was I supposed to fight like a monster tamer? <sighs> it's so boring just to sit here and do nothing. My frontline monsters exterminate everything before I get a chance. I'm just grumbling alone in the back. I have no friends and no foes. Yeah, I wasn't a monster tamer. No one listened to me. Honestly, I was in no position to criticize how the girls fought because I didn't have any strategy at all. How could I when my skills made no sense? I have weapons suited for the front lines, but my magic is better suited for long range combat. I ended up using my magic to teleport and entangle my attacks. Then my skills are only suited for some super fast stealth character. What am I supposed to do with those skills? I was some sort of sneaky guerrilla tactics frontline wizard. That was technically a fighting style? A magic imbued blitz tactic stealthy melee sorcerer doesn't make any sense! It makes as much sense as an intimidating hammer wielding arc sage! Jiggle jiggle. Uh, all I knew was I was useless on a team. My fighting style made cooperative strategies impossible. No one could command me, and I couldn't coordinate it with anyone. I could only charge in all by myself. It earned me the Sword Master title after all. We were three... creatures? No, wait! I was a human! So we were a trio, but we weren't remotely coordinated. I certainly couldn't function in a team. After all, only one of us was a tank. Slimy. Ms. Amarep and I relied purely on evasion. Ms. Amarep killed enemies too fast to even try defense. 
Meanwhile, the so-called tank frolicked and bounced all over the place. Ugh, you were supposed to be our new tank, I moaned. Tanks aren't supposed to be that fast! I can't keep up! The slime wiggled from side to side. Since we all relied on speed, there was no point to us trying defensive formations. Our only strategy was charge! Our only style was fast! I had been up on my high horse criticizing the girls for not mixing offense and defense. All I could do was offense. There wasn't anything flexible about my tactics, just pure aggression. Hmm, I guess I only think about strategy after killing a monster, huh? Miss Armorep nodded. Slimy jiggled. For now, all I could do was throw myself into battle. <sighs> Charge! More beast types. Level 51 metal horned elands. They were basically cows that thought they were antelopes. Antelopes with eyes and souls of cows. They seemed rather intent on impaling us with their metal horns. The herd stampede towards us in a cow-like fashion. With their incredible jumping power, they bounced into the sky, lowered their horns toward us, and came crashing back down. The sharp points of their horns rained down like spears. While they were still airborne, I leapt up and whacked them right on their vulnerable backsides. They plummeted right down into Slimy's ravening maw, a full course of falling meatballs for the hungry slime below. Miss Armorep sliced any remaining metal horn elands that landed, though she made sure to launch them towards Slimy. Munch, crunch, munch! The inlands seemed to satisfy Slimy. They were basically beef, after all. Slimy jumped with joy. Perhaps he absorbed leap from the metal horn elands when he ate them. The more Slimy ate, the stronger he became. At this point, he was bursting with power. We continued to the 52nd floor, where a coordinated strike awaited us. A storm of fire bullets rained down on us. A nice little snack for Slimy, who gobbled him down. Wiggle gobble! Huh? That wasn't enough? Ah, give the slime another round. You're doing me a huge favor covering the expense like this. Miss Armour skillfully deflected stray fire bullets back towards Slimy. Aw, she's so considerate. The level 52 magic mandrels responsible for the firestorm were next on the menu. They were swallowed whole by my gigantic jelly-like friend. I've never thought about it before, but mandrels do kind of look like mages, right? Like wild hedge wizards, you know? Even though they're just monkeys. With their magic gobbled up, they had no chance, no matter how numerous they were. Slimy had just reached level 10, so Inferno magic could have been a problem, but basic fire magic was a joke. In the future, I will have to be careful about Slimy's diet. Slimy could end up eating something dangerous if I didn't pay attention. Wiggle wiggle? If it looked tasty, Slimy ate it. If it didn't, Miss Amara killed it. No matter what, I did nothing. I found a pair of gauntlets on the 53rd floor and checked their status. Sturdy gauntlets. Power plus 30%, defense plus 30%, attack bonus. On the 57th floor, we encountered level 57 phantom lords. Slimy didn't seem to like their flavor, so we chopped them up. Turned out that Slimy could cut ghosts. Slimy probably preferred to eat... Slimy probably prefers to eat beasts. Though I do recall him devouring those creepy puppets. Put me in, coach! I shouted. Not that you're not doing great, but I'm right here! Regardless, Ines found the following. Arcane chainmail. Magic resistance, large. Physical resistance, medium. Defense bonus. Hmm, I could use these myself, but putting them for auction would be better. Sure, I kind of wanted them, but there were no point to improving my defenses. The attack bonus was nice, but the mention of blade it made it a bit redundant. Better that, I auctioned it off to buff my classmates instead. On the other hand, all the girls were flat broke. They kept spending all their money on clothes. The more I overcharged them, the more they ordered. Day 52, afternoon. Running around screaming, This is the power of Hammond! Isn't going to make vibration any more effective, you know? A dungeon. The 60th floor seemed to be the last. It wasn't as deep as the ultimate dungeon, but the Dungeon King was certainly to be at least level 60. Smaller dungeons weren't a high priority because they weren't likely to overflow with monsters. It made sense that there were plenty of deeper dungeons around, but the number that had more than 50 floors still surprised me. Were they still growing? I'm getting a pretty bad feeling about the lower floors. Let's be careful, okay? Nod, nod. Jiggle, jiggle. One of the small dungeons was mainly dangerous because it appeared too close to a village. But I solved that problem with a little flooding. The rest were all medium depth and were getting through them slowly but surely. From the 50th floor onward, direct combat was out of the question. So these floors were too dangerous for the girls. The nerds and the meatheads should avoid them too, but I wasn't worried. They would run for the hills at the first sign of trouble. That's the right move, of course, I thought. The girls could surely benefit from better instincts. Cowardice was the better part of valor, after all. They should learn that from the guys. 
so long as they didn't turn into nerds or meatheads themselves. Anything but that. We climbed down to the 60th floor and faced a level 60 sand giant. It was a giant made of sand, obviously. It didn't know how to do anything but throw a tantrum with its giant body. I guess an enemy like this, I probably could have brought the girls along. No, there definitely would have been casualties. Seriously. I slashed the bumbling sand giant with dimensional blade and used spells to burn it, douse it in water, freeze it, electrocute it, and so on. I even tried crushing it with holding and weight. Finally, I concluded my flurry of attacks with a furious life or death. Uh, this is taking a while, isn't it? Mizoma ripped storm of slashes and Slimy's flurries of blows only dispersed it into a cloud of sand that quickly reformed. Even Slimy couldn't eat that much sand. Plus, it wouldn't taste very good. The monster didn't have immortality. We just haven't delivered a killing blow. Boing boing? Using Jupiter Eye, I tried to find the giant's core with no luck. There weren't any secret rooms or unusual features on this floor either. It was just a sand monster. I couldn't even sense the flow of magic. I could find no way to kill it. Hmm, what's going on? We need to stop charging in and think of a plan, I said. If we only faced the giant, we could have retreated, trapping the monster inside by collapsing the stairs. Unfortunately, sand soldiers kept endlessly spawning and attacking us. No matter how many we stabbed, crushed, or burned, more took their place. They were mindless and weak, little more than puppets, but they couldn't be killed. But that was exactly the problem. With no idea how to kill it, we faced an ever-growing army of sand puppets led by a giant giant commander. Even if we tried to flee, the soldiers would pursue us. If they made it to the surface, that would spell doom for the frontier. Nothing sounded quite as apocalyptic as the frontier overwhelmed by unkillable sand monsters. We couldn't afford to let an infinitely spawning army leave the dungeon. Retreat was no longer an option, as we were surrounded by a wall of sand. You didn't see any rooms related to this puzzle, right? This is a puzzle, yeah? Nod, nod, wiggle, wiggle. This was the worst case scenario. Even if I led a suicidal charge to break through the sand one we escaped, the monster would be able to follow us. Slimy and Miss Armoreb unleashed the onslaught of attacks on their foes, scattering sand, only for the sand to then reconstitute into new monsters. They had no cores, they were nothing but animated sand. I couldn't sense any source of magic that controlled them either. I didn't understand how they worked, so I couldn't discern any weaknesses. We could only continue to kill the sand warriors as they spawned. There has to be something else. Trying to flush the sand away with water magic doesn't work. And I can't burn the sand either. Uh, slicing through them with dimensional slash doesn't work either. They just reform. Vibration only causes them to lose their formation for a moment, you know? Looking at the exhausting list of skills in my status screen, I found nothing useful. Had to figure something out. The situation was getting worse and there was nothing I could do. We were totally screwed. And the only thing left to do was a desperate gamble. <sighs> I'm going to try something out, okay? But I probably won't be able to move all the while I do it. Can you take care of the things until then, maybe? I had no idea if my plan would work, but this dungeon could overflow sooner than expected. And I couldn't let that happen. If the sand giant escaped, there would be no stopping it. Jiggle! Nod. <sighs> Ms. Armor Rip, I know you can talk! I get that it's hard to talk while wearing a helmet, but still! Both the former dungeon emperor and the former dungeon king approve of my plan. That had to count for something. The sand monster could respond as much as they wanted. It didn't matter. Nothing that these immortal foes did could change the fact that two of the most ludicrous, powerful creatures agreed with me. I only wish that they would actually speak. Sitting down in the middle of the sandstorm of endless soldiers, I focused. I concentrated. I used insentience and supreme thinking. Nothing more. Only two possibilities came to mind. First, if the monsters wasn't animated by magic, then it was some sort of magnetism. However, using lightning magic didn't cause any sort of reaction and I couldn't feel any electromagnetic force releasing the tension in my soldiers or improve my blood flow. That left only one possibility. By far, the worst one. Every single grain of sand contained a tiny fragment of a core inside. Nine infinite shards of one core. If I didn't destroy every single grain simultaneously, the monster wouldn't die. It couldn't be killed. This was all I could come up with. In that case, my efforts were wasted. We could cut sand all we wanted, and it could easily reform into a new core. There was simply no way to destroy every single grain of sand. They didn't melt when I used fire magic after all. Is there any other way? There was nothing I could do. There were no options left. I had to kick reason to the curb and make them myself. Despite my misgivings, I had an inkling of an idea. A faint glimmer of hope. It seemed ridiculous. Reading through the grimoire of magic confirmed my suspicions. Vibration magic did not exist in this world. Yet my classmates were able to learn vibration magic. Even the meatheads managed to learn it, despite their idiocy. If they could learn it, 
Then villagers, goblins, and even fish could learn vibration magic. A type of magic that wasn't supposed to exist. Much to my horror, they somehow managed. It was something that didn't exist, but even the meatheads figured it out. As shocking as it was, even the meatheads had a little bit of modern knowledge bouncing around the emptiness of their head. This is honestly the most unbelievable part of all of this. They could learn vibration magic because on some level, they knew that vibrations were a physical phenomenon. They could recreate it, physical vibrations, ripples, because they understood it. After learning the basics, both the meatheads and the nerds ran around shouting, THIS IS THE POWER OF Herman!" as they practiced vibration magic. In the meantime, I was getting scolded. I had wanted to join in. They looked like they were having so much fun. Vibration didn't work anything like Hammond, but it gave me an idea. Fire magic existed in this world, as did ice, inferno, and freezing magic. But heat magic didn't. I could use that skill because I understood how heat worked. Just like I could use vibration magic because I understood the concept of vibrations. Following from that, heat magic was actually a variant of vibration magic. Even if I could produce heat throughout the electromagnetic interactions of lightning magic, I wouldn't gain the heat magic skill. Thinking back, I realized that packing became holding, and from them, I had learned magic manipulation and magic entanglement. Similarly, weight became gravity, a type of gravity manipulation. In turn, I developed airwalk and dash based on those forms of magic. The same thing happened with movement. It became teleport, in principle. Both were a form of spatial manipulation. Understanding that enabled me to learn rapid movement and overclock. The endless flash and silver gleam. The endless rampage of the sand giants attacks battering against us. It all stopped. Oh man, this is really going to work! There's no way it can, you know? Maybe? So what could I do with heat magic then? What kind of new manipulation could I achieve? Since it's related to vibration, then what am I really doing when I use heat? I'm vibrating the molecules themselves, I said. Because I understood the principle of gravity in space, I was able to learn gravity and teleport magic. Magic that was unknown in this world. I could use heat magic because I knew that heat was a byproduct of particles vibrating. That could only mean that heat allowed me to manipulate particles directly. If so, I should be able to raise or lower the frequency of particle vibration. Which in turn, means that I could freely control the movements of atoms. Ultimately, I should be able to trigger nuclear decay. Focus. I had to ignore their storm of sand soldiers completely. Focus. Endlessly shifting grains of sand whipped at us, congealing and reforming into fresh soldiers. Slimy and Mizarmorite were protecting me the entire time. I simply needed to focus. Atoms would emit radiation when they collapsed. Radioactive decay, atomic fission, whatever you call it. It was a potential nuke. That's too terrifying to use. Choosing not to use that power was fine, but being unable to use it? That was a mistake. Refusing to learn how to use a weapon that an enemy might use against us was the height of madness. To deter others, I had to use this power myself. Besides, if the sand giant got out of here, the frontier would have been done for. At that point, we needed to seal off the entire border. By comparison, a nuclear detonation deep underground was a much better option. A lot of people could die, but their realm would survive, and the survivors could escape. That was the worst case scenario. But it made this strategy a last resort. Surely we aren't that desperate, I thought. I should keep calm. Boing! Jiggle! Boing! My two companions had things under control for now. They wouldn't let anything happen. Any happening had no chance of happening. I didn't need to rush too much, but I couldn't slack either. Those two would keep fighting with everything they had until the final whistle blew. They would give me as much time as needed to figure out how to end this. Though the fragments of the core were only fragments, I was sure that I could disintegrate them. I used holding magic to hold the sand composing the sand giant, and with heat and vibration, I raised temperatures and made atoms vibrate. Their molasses would have been great, but the worst could still happen. Decay leading to nuclear fission. I emptied my mind with insentience and focused with supreme thinking. I began to use magic controlling vibration in a state of pure concentration, sitting perfectly still without even lifting a finger. I was completely safe. The maelstrom of monstrous sand couldn't reach me, not through the flashes of silver. No matter where I looked, I saw the after images of Miss Armor Rep as her sword flashed relentlessly through the sandstorm. She really has no equal, huh? She couldn't die. You couldn't kill her. And that was that. She did what she could to repel the onslaught of sand. She created an eye in the storm, a place of calm for me. With slow, painstakingly precision, I made the atoms of the sand giant vibrate. I didn't rush. I patiently awaited the results of my labor. Here in my safe zone. 
I certainly wasn't going to die. Not until the nuclear meltdown, at least. In my focused state, I lost track of time. Is this a side effect of insentience? There was no correlation between the speed of my thoughts and the passage of time. The raging sandstorm continued. My zone rep blasted the sand apart as soon as it coalesced with her own storm of silvery slashes, scattering her foes into a swirls of sand. An immortal, eternal enemy meant nothing for her. She would have been content to continue this duel for eternity. The sand giant picked a fight with the wrong folk. Those two would never stop fighting. They formed a perfect team of unstoppable offense and impenetrable defense. They drew a proverbial line in the sand and created an absolute territory. Oh, that reminds me. I have to make some knee-high socks for her. Let her try them on and do my best. This battle was almost over. The particles were beginning to collapse as I worked to maintain control. The storm began to weaken and slow. I maintained an extremely minute stability, preventing any critical reactions. Soon, we were surrounded by a perfectly ordinary desert. <sighs> okay, looks like the dungeon's dead. So we're good here, right? I'm pretty sure it's integrated at all, but and nothing seems to be moving, so... <sighs> I'm starving. Let's get out of here. What time is it anyway? Oh, good golly, I was ravenous. I felt like it was way past dinner time. Maybe I used way too much MP. I wanted to eat, but still had to make hamburger steak. Uh, I couldn't believe all I got from my hard work was more work. I couldn't even enjoy a well-earned meal without making the hamburger steak first. Isn't that the strangest thing of all? Back at the inn, everyone is waiting for me to get back so I can make their dinner. I mean, I'll make it. I need the money. But even so, you know? Wiggle, wiggle. The girls probably cruised through a ton of dungeons today. If I didn't rip them off good tonight, my wallet was going to be the one disintegrating. Day 52. Night. When you get caught in traps, it's too late because they're traps. A dungeon. I defeated the ultimate dungeon, the most sinister of dungeons. I exterminated all the terrifying monsters from the evil forest, and I averted a war by sailing off the frontier. Now as I gallivanted around, Dealing with the remaining dungeons, I figured that things were making steady progress. I assumed that the greatest threats facing this world were under control. What a fool I was. I figured that if I got the frontier under control, while I was still weak, everyone else would become strong in the meantime. If I allowed my classmates to join me on the 60th floor of that dungeon, someone would have died. Potentially, everyone. If I had to worry about protecting them, this fantasy world was the worst, as it always had been. <sighs> Uh, I'm tired and my head hurts. Jiggle, jiggle. I was able to get out alive because I was protected by the former dungeon emperor and the former dungeon king. They wouldn't have been able to protect everyone. They were able to protect me because I was only one person. That was dangerous, I thought. I couldn't think of a way to deal with it that was less drastic than a nuclear reaction. If any other party joined me, every last person would have bit it. That monster, started Ms. Rep. It has to be rare. If there were a lot of them, the frontier would have been desolate waste a long time ago. Wiggle, wiggle. I was convinced that my classmates shouldn't be allowed to explore beyond the 49th floor. They would have to wait until they reached level 100. That should make them exponentially more powerful, but a level 100 Dungeon King would still be dangerous. There could still be more unique bosses like the Sand Giant. Uh, this world is an impossible game. I had no way to overcome these problems. I could only come up with boss fight strategies after having faced them firsthand. Uh, I'm too hungry to think about this. Is hunger a status element? I think I got it. I chewed a strip of jerky and tossed a couple to Slimy. I had bought up the general store entire stock, so I had plenty to share. I was just broke. If Slimy likes them, I'll keep buying them. If I had run out of MP, the atomic vibration would have gone awire. I still had my seemingly infinite supply of MP from the battery in my bag, but if it had run out... We would have been on the verge of complete disaster. I had to use an unbelievable amount of magic to keep the reactions locked down. That meant that if my MP had fully depleted, everything would have spun out of control immediately. Uh, let's see this technique away. Uh, it's too dangerous. Turning to Mizama Rep, I said, Thanks. How are you a big gift? We'll be close our food again, okay? Actually, what time is it? Are any stores still open? Maybe? Jiggle, jiggle. She deserved a real reward. Having someone sit down unmoving in the middle of a floor with an endless respawning horde of monsters had to be annoying. But she didn't let a single one get past. If it were me, I would have kicked them, then I would stomp all over them. So yeah, she deserved a reward. Whoa, it even turned into a spellstone. <laughs> That's great. 
I was worried that it would turn into a sea of teeny tiny spell stones. I even made a shovel just in case, you know? If a teenage boy was seen playing in the sand with a shovel, he would have definitely caused a public disturbance. Well, I would have definitely reported him to the cops, you know? The level 60 Dungeon King left behind a massive crystal clear spell stone. Isn't this thing just a giant grain of sand? I figured that it was too valuable to sell, but I decided to incorporate it into my MP battery. I could have used the money, especially considering I spent everything I had earlier today, but it wasn't possible. Besides, I needed to hold on to more spell stones so I could make more magic items. My classmates could have been in serious danger if I didn't keep making them equipment. With their current gear, this row would have definitely, DEFINITELY killed them without a doubt. Oh, did the boss drop some loot too? The sand giant didn't carry any equipment since it was just a pile of sand. Where did the naked giant keep whatever this was? I didn't want to find out. Another nudist, huh? Good thing the nudist girl wasn't here. It would have turned into a battle of the exhibitionists! Although I did have the feeling that in an exhibitionist battle, nudist girl would have won. Maybe I should have brought her. Was this the power of nudism? Huh, the loot was some sort of massive gemstone. I suspected that the avatar of avarice standing next to me would have wanted this. Let's see. Treasure of the Monster Core. Monster Core creation and manipulation. Why would I want to create more monsters? Isn't that counterproductive? We're going all the way to these dungeons to destroy them. Ugh, I'm so hungry. My mind's all a jumble. Jambalaya? I'll make that tomorrow. I put in so much effort making ketchup. It would be a waste not to use it for some jambalaya. I don't have shrimp, but jambalaya it is. Uh, it was time to go home. I wasn't the only hungry one. All my classmates was probably hangry without their hamburger steak. I'm back. Let's eat, I said. I'm starved, you know. I got impatient so I started shaping patties on the way back. I even fried them up as I walked through town. Fresh hamburger steak! Woohoo! Welcome back! Bon appetit! My classmates shouted. As I expected, they sat in the dining hall, stomachs growling awaiting my arrival. Oh yay! This was worth waiting for! <laughs> no kidding! They lined up with plates, waiting for me to serve them. Even Poster Girl joined the line, plate in hand. I couldn't believe an employee of the inn was making one of the guests work. Stalker Girl joined the line too, as if she was my classmate. <laughs> I gotta keep feeding them. That's the only way to pay off my bills. <laughs> keep eating everybody! Chiku chiku? Everyone ate their hamburger steak. I was busy frying up more patties, so I decided to make a few regular hamburgers too. Much to my chagrin, each hamburger was thrown out from under me. Hamburgers! I miss burgers so much! Who says I can't have hamburgers and hamburgers taken the same meal? Receipts from the big spenders piled up, but my precious hamburgers vanished. I want bread and white rice. I could cook more hamburger steaks. Hurry up! If you don't make them fast, we need to eat them with rice or bread. Oh, huh? Is that how that works? Oh yes. Vice Fred B said with unexpected intensity, Mushroom burgers are to die for. If a restaurant sold these, they have a line going out the door. Ah, oh, no more lines. I'm starving and stop taking my burgers. Hey, morons. How many times are you going to get back in line? I shouted. You're acting for seconds once a minute. With five of you meatheads, that's a burger every 12 seconds. Mm, these burgers on, dude. Mm, give me another one. The main meathead said grinning like an idiot. I started charging them extra for the third burger, but literally they wouldn't stop coming. The line never shortened, and the receipts kept stacking up. Shit, did I sell the last burger? I made over 300 burgers and I didn't get to eat a single one. I worked so hard mincing meat and onions and climbed out of the dungeon shaping patterns as I walked to town, frying them as I approached the inn and I got nothing? Are you serious? <laughs> Whoops, my bad bro. Thanks for the grub. They were good too. They were too good. <laughs> Not my fault. I was fresh out of meat, so I fried some fish for myself. It was delicious, but it wasn't the same. Simon liked the burgers so much that he wolfed down 30 by himself. He earned them, to be fair, but I couldn't believe that 300 hamburger steaks was too few. My classmates sunk into their burgers-induced food comas. I had plenty of money again, but my feelings about it were very mixed feelings. I wanted to go bathe with Slimy, but Poster Girl and Stalker Girl went first, and they took Slimy with them. I was literally a loner. <sighs> I took a hot loner bath in my loner room, then returned to my loner purgatory of my sidekicks. 
purgatory was supposed to be the place where sinners atoned for their deeds before they could enter heaven. So why was I in this hell even though I was completely innocent? If I'm barred from heaven, I'll have to make my own paradise, I declared. Knee socks it is. Knit fabrics, that's what we needed. Knit fabrics had wonderful elasticity, but manufacturing them took forever. Good thing I could summon magic hands to act as high-speed, high-precision knitting machines. Huh, to think I would encounter knee socks in a fantasy world. This is the first time encountering them at all, you know? Hmm, come to think of it. Should I say, nice to meet you, knee socks? Hmm? Of course, I've seen girls wear them before, but a teenage boy couldn't just stare at a girl's thigh without coming across as a massive pervert. So yeah, this was my first time touching knee socks. There's still something pervy about a teenage boy needing a pair of knee socks. Pervy and sad. As I inflicted emotional damage on myself, I practiced by making a school track jacket first. All my classmates had them, and Ms. Umberbert was a little jealous. She probably feels left out at the girls' meeting, but I doubt that a school tracksuit would look good on someone as tall and gorgeous as Miss Greedy Bombshell. I gave her the finished jacket, and she was so thrilled she changed into it right away. She went to the girls' meeting still wearing it. I had to admit that my doubts were unfounded. It looked amazing on her, and she was overjoyed. Plus, there was something a bit sexy to that look. After finishing one pair of knee socks, I got into a groove and started mass-producing them. Soon enough, Sockins joins the production queue. What kind of fantasy world are we in again? There was something unseemly about a teenage boy sitting alone in a bedroom with piles and piles of knee socks and stocking floating around him. Definitely looked like a creep. This is a trap! How do I keep getting caught? The trap ring and my trap sense skills are both useless! It's too late now! I'm finished! Light shone through a stocking like a dagger stabbing my reputation to death. I'm still gonna get Ms. Amaru to wear them though. How could I resist her knee socks? Well, this was kind of a mess. I only meant to make one pair of knee socks, and I ended up mass-producing stockings in a variety of patterns. I tried switching up the thread colors as an experiment, and I ended up with all kinds of patterns. Checks, stripes, chain, even argyle. That one wasn't easy. So, it has come to this. I'm a simple teenage boy with simple needs, after all. Besides, they hardly use any material, so they're eco-friendly. Anyway, I merely wanted Ms. Armour to try a pair on, and I ended up starting a damn stocking factory. A spiral of magic hands worked in the air, weaving fishnet stockings all around me in a perverse orbit. I feel like I should repent, but I had no regrets! Day 52. Night. If they're worried about my influence, then they gotta start by carrying their own weight. The White Loser Inn. Interlude. Girls meeting. We couldn't settle on whether we should take a day off tomorrow because there was a serious problem. Unkillable monsters. Harga couldn't discover them. If Angelica couldn't defeat them, then we had no hope even if we pass level 100. It's like the Sphinx back in the Ultimate Dungeon, except without any weaknesses. We can never beat something like that. Never-ending monsters? Now that's traumatic. I'm traumatized. Angelica sliced through the mortal Sphinx in a single stroke, but she couldn't do anything about this? Even the former Dungeon Emperor couldn't defeat it. She didn't suffer a single scratch, but she couldn't win either. Haruka could mention it briefly while he grilled burgers, saying that the Dungeon King on the 60th floor was really tough but it was far worse than I imagined. So why was he talking about how lucky they were? Can we really call that luck? It was a miracle that we're alive right now. If we went with him, we would have been dead right now, no doubt about it. According to him, it was just luck. Should we all bow down before his epic luck? If we did that, I had the feeling we'll end up enslaved. Maybe we dodged a bullet there. 50th floor and over is off limits, huh? Yep, not until we get stronger. If we gone down with him, we would have all died. And Haruka couldn't too. We had to take his advice seriously. We were too weak. It was pure coincidence. A miracle, really. We decided to take a break from that dungeon after the 50th floor to go clear a different dungeon, where we would end up meeting Slimy. Also, where Haruka couldn't find a book that gave him the knowledge he needed to defeat the Sand Giant because of how strong Slimy was as an ally, nobody died. It worked out this time, but the whole situation was a nightmare. If Haruka couldn't hadn't suddenly gotten worried, we all would have died. I couldn't believe we let Haruka couldn't miss Amarep and Slimy march into that disaster. None of us were level 100 yet, but even if we were, there were still monsters out there that we couldn't defeat. And we were still unsure just how strong we would become at level 100. If we didn't get strong enough, then Haruka couldn't have to keep fighting by himself. The only thing we could do now was to keep leveling up, but a knocking at the door interrupted my thoughts. Come on in, I called. It was Angelica. Now the girls' only meeting could truly begin. 
She needed to give us more details about the fight with the sand giant. After all, nothing Haruka-kun had said made any sense. His terrible explanation. It didn't die, so I just started shaking it. Well, not like vibrations, if you know what I mean, but like particle physics. If the particles accelerated too fast, we all would have died, you know? Excessive atomic agitation and radical motion are kind of dangerous, you know? We had long ago given up on listening to him. It was impossible to follow. Besides, we wanted to ask her about other sorts of radical motions. They sounded dangerous, especially to the innocent maidens. When I saw her, I said, Hey, we match! Angelica-san was wearing a school track jacket like ours. Our jackets were a little different from hers. Hers looked shinier and the material had a slightly different texture. Maybe because it was brand new. She hadn't borrowed one from anyone, which only could mean Haruka could made it. Oh my god, you look so good! Even in our school jacket? It goes great with your blonde hair and blue eyes! Everyone still had their school clothes, and a lot of girls wore the jackets at night because they were comfortable. Of course, she had felt a little left out. I should have realized sooner. She had to have felt like she wasn't truly one of us, so Haruka could made her one. She could finally feel like a member of the team. But when did he learn how to make track jackets? Oh, your legs are so long! You have such a narrow waist too! And your neck is so slender and your face is perfect! <laughs> Not fair! According to Angelica-san, Haruka-kun was busy making something else. Could he have figured out how to knit recently? No, his tentacles, <clears throat> his creepy magic hands, had to be doing most of the work. For some reason, Haruka-kun and his tentacles were boon companions. His best friends, so close that they were one. Why is he trying to master how to use tentacles? Long tubes, he knit, said Angelica. Do you mean tights? I asked. Or like high socks, Shimizaki-san said. Fukunuki-san smirked and said, He just skipped over making short socks, huh? Does he mean he got like a new product that's about to drop? What could it be? And when will it go on sale? We couldn't help ourselves, even though we were all broke. Of course, we had no money because of one particular ruthless merchant. They were black, long, like this? Angelica's son gestured. Hmm, hmm, so not just tights. She seemed to describe both long socks and short tights. She was indicating that whatever they were, her legs were longer. Wait, up to the thighs? I knew it! He's guilty, that dirty dog! Knee socks! Thigh highs, of course! That explained everything. Without a doubt, haruka -kun wanted Angelica to wear something new tonight. He's making a bunch of knee socks? I want some! I only have them in black! Let's put in orders right away! More orders! I want knee socks! Everyone wanted to buy them. Even though they weren't just broke, they were swimming in debt. Angelica continued to gesture and hotly explain. He's making lace too? Some sort of sketchy knit similar to our jackets? Like a stocking and snitch! They were thin. Show skin, said Angelica. A stretchy lacy knit made from a material similar to our jackets. And they were like socks? Something sheer. He's making stockings! There was only one truth, and only one culprit. Guilty, 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 preemptively guilty! Can you even make stockings without silk or nylon? He's probably testing it out right now. I'd just be happy to have tights! I'm buying some, I don't care how much debt I rack up! He was too embarrassed to take our orders for underwear, but he went ahead and made knee socks. Haruka-kun, don't you realize now you're going to get orders for stockings? You sealed your own fate! Angelica-san left, heading towards Haruka-kun's room to try out the new product. Some time had passed since. He probably couldn't resist after she put them on. That much was for certain. It was still uncertain whether he wanted to see her try them on or take them off. Either way, she wasn't coming back any time. There she was. Oh, you're back already? <sighs> I knew it was knee socks. Angelica came in carrying a large bundle of knee socks. They were already in mass production phase. Angelica's son changed into a new outfit. A mini dress with stockings. Hang on. He made patterned stockings? Oh, that's so cute! I love the patterns. The dress is cute too. And sexy. Time to get a few more orders. Uh, how do I choose? There's too many options. I want them all. There were plenty of knee socks and stockings for us to try on. Angelica-san handed something to Vice Rep A. Were those fishnets? The fabric's not as stretchy as I'm used to, so I'll have to be careful putting them on, Vice Rep A said. Hey, they're prismatic. If they can handle channeling MP, they're probably more durable than they look. They fit perfectly. They're kind of risque, aren't they? No kidding, those denim shorts are deadly! 
Lion Strap Hay had to change into a pair of Daisy Dukes and fishnet stockings that went up to the mid thigh. She looked like a dancer or something, but there was no way she could wear that in public. Why were they sized so perfectly for her? He made fishnet stockings? Oh, she looks so mature. It's literally lingerie. We don't lounge around with bare legs before, but even though we were now showing less skin, we look way more indecent. Especially Angelica Sun with her mini dress and patterned stockings, and Vice Rep A with the aforementioned formation denim shorts and fishnets, they look downright smutty. Oh my god, a see through stripe pattern? That's so hot! You two look like idols! Lay stockings look so gorgeous and elegant, but I can't deny their eroticism! The compliments kept pouring in, and we all admired the fabrics used, but the socks definitely seem a bit too mature for us. My first time wearing knee socks, and it's in a fantasy world! Oh, they look great! I'll be too shy to wear these back in Japan. Yeah, but we could get away with it here. There's no one around who could judge us. None of us could have gotten away with wearing this stuff in the real world. But we had no reason to feel bashful in this one. No one would care. Oh, this is the best. When we were summoned to this world, we tried to forget about fashion and wearing nice clothes. We all assumed that we would just get used to the rustic, itchy clothes of this world. Now, not only did we have modern fashions, but we could wear stockings and knee-high socks if we chose. I used to reminisce about the clothes from the real world. How I wish I could wear something one more time. The things I never got to try on. But those feelings were gone now. Thank you, Angelica-san. O okay. We thanked her, the kind spy on our side, who relayed all of our wants and regrets to Haruka-kun. Stuck in a fantasy world, we would try to forget the past, our dreams and hopes from Japan. But now, we could be happy. Sure, we looked like we were about to go do a photo shoot for a men's magazine, but... But this was a no guys allowed fashion show just for us. We had assumed we will never in our entire lives get the chance to wear lingerie or sexy adult clothing. The having those experience was just a half remembered dream from another world. Even so, every piece of clothing we had was somehow scandalous. He said that we could have three samples per person? Yes. How could I even choose? There's only one solution! Let's try on everything! I remember thinking about what kind of clothing I would wear when I became an adult. When we were thrown into a medieval fantasy land, we were prepared to abandon those dreams only for them to come true in a remote inn and in another world. That was why we were so excited. The moments we thought we lost forever had reappeared before our very eyes. It's a trap! Trying anything on just makes me want all of it! Three isn't nearly enough! Angelica even agreed to lend us her dresses and saucy outfits leading to further chaos. With no sense of property, we freely swept dresses and outfits. This scene was a secret only meant for pure-hearted maidens. If anyone had seen us, they wouldn't need to be taken care of permanently. I'm so tired, but so happy. No kidding! We kept trying on different outfits late into the night, gossiping and trading clothes. When we finally settled on what we wanted, every last one of us was utterly exhausted and content. Even so, we couldn't wear these clothes in public. They were way too revealing. That didn't stop me from ordering more, though. This whole dojo was racked with poverty, the struggle for survival. Fashion was unknown here, until now. The frontier knew peace for the first time. Life became easier, people had enough to get by. The town became wealthy and shops displayed cute clothing and accessories in their windows. Things that the people of this town could never have dreamed of buying had now become accessible. The townsfolk couldn't make sense of the situation. The concepts of fashion didn't exist here. Everyone lived their lives only thinking about surviving to the next dawn. Something so unfamiliar as luxuries baffled them. The local women cared about their appearances in their own way, but this was too radical a change. They were left behind. They didn't know what to do with all these styles they couldn't have even dreamed of. It left them in a state of stunned perplexity. Haruka couldn't introduce modern fashion to a medieval countryside. They had hundreds of years catching up to do. On our days off, we were the center of attention in town. Although we were the only ordinary modern teenagers, not particularly wealthy or stylish, we were the very height of fashion in a town like this. Of course, Shimizaki-san and her friends made us look far more impressive. They were all tall and beautiful with attractive faces, long limbs, and great sense of style. There were magazine models back in our world. Those girls were each an expert in their own right. We had become better friends since arriving here, and they acted as stylists for us, going so far as coordinate our outfits every morning. So yeah, we stood out a little. We could even be called influencers. According to the guild receptionist, people looked up to us, and anything we wore became trendy. The women of Omoi scrimped and saved in order to dress like us. Every day, they worked hard and built up savings so that they could buy the clothes of their dreams. Our every outfit and fashion choice was an object of scrutiny. That was why we would absolutely not wear fishnet stockings in public. Haruka-kun with his first nuclear experiments had become not just a destroyer of worlds, 
but a destroyer of public decency. Day 52, night. Why are my skulls trying to hide and deceive me? And why do I have to figure out how they work in order to reveal them? The white leaves are in. This is mere speculation, but I had a distinct suspicion that I was going to get scalded. Knee socks might have been pushing it. Stockings were a smidge over the line, but pattern stockings were too much. Fishnet ties guaranteed my doom. Although it might have been too late for me, my reputation was doomed when I decided to stay up all night making fishnet stockings. Well, I already made them. So might as well sell them. I'm sure they'll sell. I'm not sure when the girls will wear them, but they've already ordered plenty of sexy dresses. Considering how many revealing clothes I sold to date, sexy stockings and fishnet tights were surely to fly off the shelves. Nonetheless, I would still definitely get an earful about my priorities. Ms. Emmerich came over to tell me that they wanted samples. So I just went ahead and gave her stockings and knee socks, including a pair of fishnet tights I made especially for Vice Rep A. I didn't make them on purpose, I swear. Unfortunately, nothing damaged the reputation of a teenage boy quite like staying up all night to make lingerie. My appeal was subatomic by now. That was why I engaged in smokescreen tactics. The best place to hide a leaf is in a forest, after all. So long as I made a mountain of clothes, I could claim that it was only inevitable that I made some socks, stockings, and fishnet tights. Pure happenstance, nothing more. They'll still lecture me, but at least I had a credible excuse. Even though I knew that the girls would get mad at me, the stockings and socks still serve a legitimate purpose. In the bedroom, obviously. I went through all the trouble of prototyping knits for Ms. Amarup's tracksuit, so I wanted to make some skirts. Something stretchy with a flowy silhouette would look good, so I tried making long flared skirts. Yeah, it seemed stylish. I also made a long tight skirt with a slit for Miss Armor Rep. Now we're talking. I can't wait to see her wearing this, then taking it off. But she's gotta put it on first. We all know this would happen. <laughs> I'm so predictable. But I made some mini skirts too. It was inevitable. I'm a teenage boy. What do you expect? I also made some dresses and hoodies. The dresses would have to be Miss Armor Rep's exclusive, since they were a bit risque. Honestly, I made them that way on purpose, so that they would reveal all her curves. It had a row of buttons down the front. If some of the buttons were left unfastened, it gave the dress a slit. And if they were all unfastened, things would get exciting. I could already feel myself getting scolded for this. The girls only meeting seemed like it would go on for a long while. They were deciding whether or not to take the day off tomorrow. Apparently, the guys had no say in the matter. The nerves were oblivious and the meatheads were stupid. So it seemed like the right call. Even so, the class rep consulted Ms. Amara during dinner, but didn't seem the point in consulting me. She even asked for Slimy's opinion. In response, Slimy jiggled. Was that a yes or a no? I can just delay the general store lady's order. There's literally no end to them. I caught a glimpse with Jupiter eye. There was literally an order for a house! Huh? Why is a general store lady ordering a house? Who requisitions a house at a general store? Oh, I'll deliver a house. I'll deliver right in the middle of her store! I had some spare time, and it had been a while since I checked. Surely I leveled up by now. Okay. Here we go. Status. Name, Haruka. Race, human. Level, 21. Job, unknown. HP, 378. MP, 429. Vitality, 336. Power, 339. Speed, 431. Dexterity, 418. Min, 428. Intelligence, 459. Luck, max, above limit. SP, 2932. Combat skills. Peerless Cane Mastery, level 8. Avoid, level 6. Magic Entanglement, level 6. Life or Death, level 9. Rapid Movement, level 9. Bubble, level 6. Eye Mastery, level 1. Diamond Fist, level 3. Magic. Decay, level 2. Teleport, level 7. Gravity, level 6. Holding, level 6. Four Element Sorcery, level 6. Wood, level 8. Lightning, level 9. Ice, level 9. Alchemy, level 4. Void, level 2. Skills, General Health level 9, Sensitivity level 9, Body Manipulation level 8, Walking Mastery level 7, Servitude level 9, Uncover level 5, Magic Control level 8, Present Concealment level 8, Stealth level 9, Hiding level Max, and Sentience level 7, Physical Proof level 2, MP Absorption level 5, Revival level 5, Supreme Thinking level 6, Dash level 8, Airwalk level 7, Overclock level 9, Jupiter Eye level 4, Super Horny level 8, Alpha Male level 8. Titles, Shadow Level 8, Nice Level 8, Loner Level 8, Bane Sorcerer Level 4, Sword Master Level 3, Alchemist Level 4, Abilities, Corporate Proactiveness Level 8, Master of None Level 9, Blockhead Level 9, Equipment, Wooden Staff, Question Mark, Clothes Set, Question Mark, Leather Glove, Question Mark, Leather Boots, Question Mark, Cloak, Question Mark, Jupiter Eye, Ring of Destitute, Item Bag, Monster Blazer Power plus 44%, Speed plus 33%, Vitality plus 24%, Black Hat. Ho! Oh, I've actually leveled up twice as I last checked. This also happened when I finally reached level 10. My level increased multiple times. Maybe I had to fulfill a level up condition every 10 levels? If so, there was probably some unfulfilled condition preventing my classmates from reaching level 100. 
The biggest change was the appearance of Decay Level 2. It probably appeared because I finally understood the principle of underlying both heat magic and vibration magic. As further proof, I now knew void magic. As I suspected, now that I knew the basics of teleport, I gained that skill. Why do I have to deduce how my skills work to gain new skills? <sighs> this fantasy world surpasses my imagination. Reading my status was completely unreliable. Why are my skills trying to trick me? Why do I need to figure out how they work in order to even see them? I've never heard of skills that trick their users like this. They just show up because I know they have to exist. I see right through you, sneaky skills. A fantasy world where your own skills mocked you and hid from you from your own status screen? It was too fantastical. Magic control was up to level 8, which was two levels up from last time I checked. It was a promoted skill too. That was incredible fast growth for a promoted skill. Likely it leveled up when I used teleport, gravity, holding, and decay against a cyan giant. I had to keep using magic control to prevent a nuclear meltdown. So it gained a ludicrous amount of experience. Similarly, in Sentience, the promoted version of Focus was already level 7. Two levels more compared to last time. I had to use an incredible amount of concentration to rein in the magic. I was getting through dangerous situations by sheer luck as usual, but I'd still be screwed if I lost control of Teleport or Decay. There would be no excuse accidentally teleporting inside of a solid wall or accidentally setting off a nuke. Well, I guess if I somehow misuse gravity, I might create a black hole and destroy the entire planet. <sighs> I'm better off not thinking about that. This is a fantasy world, I'm sure I'll be fine. If I was in a science fiction setting, then that would have been a real concern. But this wasn't a scientific, rational world, so I didn't care. In this situation, if I think about it, I'm liable to make it happen. Better not. Super Horny and Alpha Male had both shot up to level 8. To be fair, Revival gave me limited stamina and I used those skills consistently. Speaking of Revival... Speaking of Revival, it also went up two levels. Makes sense. Though I never gotten injured, Revival had no problems leveling up. This was proof that it really held me out at night. Oh well. I could understand any of it anyway. I had never understood anything even once by looking at my status since I got here. I didn't understand the conditions for improving skills, except for Super Horny and Alpha Male. Moving on, I checked the endless list of orders from the general store. I'll just pretend I didn't see that order for a house. I mean, how was I supposed to put a house inside the store? Actually, that sounded like a challenge. I don't think building houses can be called a side gig. It's definitely not a crafting skill. I need to teach the general store lady the definitions of general store and side job once and for all, I thought. She probably thought of running a general store just meant coming up with a list of goods and handing me an order sheet. She acted like writing urgent on an order form was the magic word to make everything happen instantly. This time, she had written urgent on every single one. <sighs> I can't believe she made an urgent order for mushroom burgers. Everyone ate all the burgers I made. Does she expect me to start over from scratch? Besides, how were three burgers per person not enough? They even ate the burgers I was saving for myself. I can't tell you how agonizing it was to watch the tears of nostalgic joy run down their cheeks while they ate my burger. Though, I did make a lot of money, I guess. Those burgers produce a perfect sorrowful recollection, a nostalgia for the earth. I would have to make them again. Supreme Thinking was still investigating the treasure of the monster core for me, and it couldn't figure anything out either. So, is this the treasure of the monster core meant for fighting monsters that could split their core up like in the last dungeon? That doesn't make any damn sense. That doesn't make any damn sense. I couldn't have used it without defeating the sand giant first. Regardless, I wanted to at least figure out the use of the treasure. I figured that it was a one of a kind item, but if it wasn't, I would like to come up with some countermeasures. When would the girls decide whether or not tomorrow is a day off? If they don't finish their meeting tonight, who's to say what's going on tomorrow? I would hate it if my day off was only announced after the day was over. Day 52, night. I need work to earn money, so I'll never be free from my side job. Interlude, the Duke's Palace. Send a messenger to the inn at dawn. Figure out when the boy is free and bring him here. Act with politeness and discretion. Dungeons were getting cleared one after another according to the guild's daily reports. Moreover, these dungeons reached the middle and lower strata and had a greater risk of overflowing. There was only one possibility. That boy and his comrades were involved. Normally, I would not permit anyone to intervene as we were only getting their way, but I was in desperate need of that lad's assistance. It paid me to ask for help, but our resources could not keep up with the pace of development, especially gold, which was only a few days away from total depletion. On the other hand, we had far more lumber than we could use. We were clear-cutting the forest of monsters at an incredible rate. We were well ahead of schedule. There were even reports of demonic scythes carving a swath of carnage through the woods, felling monsters and trees in equal measure. That lad conquered dungeons every day, and cleared land from the forest. Furthermore, 
He built a pseudo dungeon to protect the frontier from invaders. Though he was certainly busy, I hoped that he would help us excavate some tunnels to accord with his development proposal. The plans for iron mines even specified excavation, one million eel per hour, and he provided a special invoice form for the job. Indeed, tis a good bargain, I murmured. In his proposal, he estimated that it would only require three hours to finish the work, for a total cost of three million eel. Typically, miners and quarry workers set the rates per annum, not by the hour. An attendant leaned over and informed me, Our supplies won't arrive in time. We must ask for the boy's help. He was right. We needed to burn the boy once more. We could never afford to repay his generosity. That lone lad carried the burden of responsibility previously carried by generations of Duke in the frontier. How utterly shameful that I should ask more of him. Such conduct spits in the face of decency. Though I only had ever repaid the boy for all his services to the frontier with worthless words of gratitude, I needed him once again. I didn't know how I could ask him. My lord, are you not overthinking? I could not improve the lives of my people on my own. Yet they had finally found happiness. Fortune had at last smiled at my poor duchy. My most fervent wish was that I could improve the lives of at least one more person. I wanted nothing more to hear the ringing of laughter of the townsfolk as I laid contented lives. Did that make me a selfish duke? Without a doubt. Nonetheless, I would do everything in my power to achieve that goal. Unfortunately... There were too many things that only the boy could achieve. I intended to burden him with even more responsibilities, though he owed us nothing. Though the suffering of the frontier needn't have meant anything to him. Uh, I have no means to repay him, yet I will insist on using him to bring joy to my realm. Can you not see that I have shown no regard for his happiness? Um, well, the boy visits the guild to complain that he doesn't have a job, and he insists that his services are not expensive, my lord. His proposals were sure to guide the duchy into the Golden Age. Recently, he brought us stacks of instructive texts on arts of agriculture and medicine. The sluggishness of our own progress must have weighed heavy on his heart. How much responsibility could he bear alone? How much suffering? Yet, this was the only way. We were helpless without him. Duke Meropapa, a message from the guild has arrived. Shall I bring her in? It was our young receptionist from the guild, and her next words chilled me to my marrow. Two more dungeons have reportedly perished, she said. We'll continue to report tomorrow. There was an issue with the dungeon king of one of them. Please look at this, sir. An undying sand giant. This was a problem. It was a monster that couldn't be slain. That could summon an endless army of sand soldiers. This, no. Summon my military commanders at once! There is no need to panic, sir. It was destroyed. You can see it in the report. I couldn't kill it, so I disintegrated it, you know? Normally you can't kill it, so keep your eyes peeled. There is no mistake. The monster was unkillable. The interpreter confirmed it as much. It was a monster that only the boy could defeat. To date, no one else had discovered a means. Once more, the boy dealt with a threat to the frontier. It pained me to even contemplate how many burdens we inflicted on him. The receptionist, who knew the boy well, resolutely continued her statement. If the boy says he wants to work, his request is sincere. He simply doesn't have any money. The boy cannot hold on to a single ear for more than a day. He would appreciate the offer of work. How could he have not have money? Even a single dungeon king, conquering one single dungeon, should have given him immeasurable wealth. Defeating dungeons that reached the middle strata day after day should have made him wealthy beyond imagining. After defeating the ultimate dungeon, the boy should have been rich enough to buy the entire duchy out from under me. Though he spread wealth and goods across the frontier, the boy lacked money? Did he simply donate all his wealth to retrofy our economy? Omo had been transformed. The good cheer echoing through the steer served as veritable symbol of our prosperity. Indeed, the woman of our humble burg, now dressed in finery that put the very capital of the kingdom to shame. Through the general store, financed and rebuilt by the lad, spread the wealth and good cheer to our town, despaired for. It was the beating heart of the frontier economy. Buying the specialized produce of poor rural villages, enabling them to prosper, and providing a heretofore unimagined variety of affordable trade goods to the people of Omoy. It brought what couldn't be sold and sold goods at a price anyone could afford. That trading company had the miraculous effect of spreading wealth to all. Though that boy blessed our land in prosperity, he is destitute. This is an unforgivable sin. How could someone responsible for such immeasurable wealth be bankrupt? 
Please make no mistake, the receptionist said. He earns an unmeasurable fortune every day and spends it all before the sun sets. Invariably, he is penniless by nightfall. Though any other person would think it too much money to spend, he somehow manages. By all accounts, the boy is hopeless in this regard. At least, so I have heard from his interpreters. Though this frontier was poor, we had great tracts of land, and the region was dotted with numerous small villages and hamlets. Providing supplies for all of them were required outrageous sum of money. Don't tell me he spends his entire fortune on improving our duchy. I cannot ignore that money and trade have begun to circulate throughout the realm. One of the boy's proposals pertained to this matter. He called it an economic stimulus package. Is this what it is? Has he single-handedly funded this stimulus package? I could not make heads nor tails of this strange science. Economics. He produced a pamphlet meant to explain the matter, but it was challenging to say the least. According to the bureaucrats of commerce, they understand the principles of economics, but they do not know what it actually is. His explanation was merely, eh, sell stuff to make money and buy more stuff, you know? If you can't sell, you can't buy. If you can't make more junk to sell, you won't be able to buy anything. And then you're poor. It's just trading, you know? I suspect that this is the definition of economics. If you can't sell, you become poor, I thought. Was that why the boy traded with all the villages? Was that the birth of local industry? Those boys and girls, barely 30 in number, brought all of this to us with their wealth. Our realm was reborn because of their sacrifices, and they continue to live in the depths of poverty. If this was truly the case, my shame could know no boundaries. No matter how many taxes we gathered, we could never pay them back. Even if we were to collect a massive hoard of wealth from every village in the land, it would be a trifling and pitiful recompense. All the absurdity. They shouldered a grave responsibility without thanks. A responsibility that grew with each passing day. Even if we tried to pay them back, they would only bless us with all the more with their favor. If I may, you may have possibly misapprehended his motivations, the receptionist said. That boy is simply living his life as he pleases. He found poverty and suffering to be a source of irritation, so he proved our lots and our town flourished. Though our town was happy, the rest of the duchy continued to suffer, so he decided to improve their lives as well. There's no deeper meaning to that boy's actions. According to his interpreters, he claims, Ah, I'm not a fan of misery, poverty, and tragedy. So I'm getting rid of them, you know? Nothing more than that. Wiping out misery, poverty, and tragedy is sure to make the world a happier place. Hence, there's no more meaning to his actions. It's a waste of time to think about that boy. Having said her peace, the guild receptionist departed. Could he truly have improved the lives of the frontier folk for no reason? Was it that simple? I could hardly conceive that someone would do all of this just because they were annoyed by the troubles of others. But even if his actions weren't motivated by any higher ideal, he still made the frontier a better place for all. That was meaningful, and it was still worthy of praise. Even if he did not seek any compensation, I had an obligation as the Duke of Omoy to show him true and proper gratitude. Though it was unasked for, unsought, I will give him my thanks. Day 53. Morning. Is there really a point to signing a contract with some people whose name you don't even remember? The white loser in. Ah, knee socks with stripes? What's even the point? Nerd A shouted. I kicked them in the shin. Striped knee socks need a matching pair of striped panties. Nerd B felt the justice of my foot as well. <laughs> knee socks need to be paired with animal ears for a true- Ah! I didn't even let Nerd C finish before smacking him. <laughs> you degenerates! Everyone knows that knee socks look best on little girls! With a series of violent thumps, I showed Nerd D no mercy. He needs to be on a registry. Uh, the nerds were annoying me the first thing in the morning. They keep geeking out about knee socks and debating each other's bad opinions. I should burn them all. I've been kicking their asses all morning, but the message wasn't getting through. Ugh, why are you obsessing over knee socks? Are you going to wear them? Don't think I won't call the cops on you. I don't want to wear them. I'm just saying, stripes are superior. Was seeing all the girls wearing knee socks too much for their fragile nerd brains? To be fair, same as Amarip in a pair of thigh-high stockings last night shook me to my very core. And I eagerly returned the favor. Eh, she told me off the next morning. Ah, I get it. Some things are simply too marvelous to ignore. You know? 
I mean, we're all high school boys, right? Although, I doubt we'll ever get to graduate at this rate. Chigo, chigo. <sighs> the nurse kept pestering me. The girls kept lecturing me. And the media kept nagging me to make them some tracksuits. Why did my refreshing, invigorating mornings always devolve into chaos? It had to have been a very refreshing night. I was invigorated by Ms. Amara's absolute territory all night long. Bro, made me a tracksuit with a badass leopard logo. Leopards are cool, Meathead A said. I'm not going to make a brand name knockoff. That's not my style, you know? You're already wearing a Puma track jacket. What would you want to fake? Aw, oh, don't tell me. Do you mean leopard print? Are you trying to look like the world's lamest delinquent? What are you going to do in a fantasy world? Hang out in front of a convenience store at night? You're not going to find any convenience store around here. Oh, how do you know the difference between Pumas, Leopards, and Panthers? Isn't Puma your favorite brand? Maybe a leopard should bite your head off. How about that? I'll have to persuade a Puma to chew on a head that stupid. There's no way it is he tastes good. Oh, why do it is like tracksuits so much? One of them said that his favorite brand was the one with four stripes. Oh, the moron can't even count. Another claimed that he was sponsored by that one brand that used the old school family crest with a bunch of diamonds. Did he think that the Takeda clan was a sports company? Please don't tell me that you think the Takeda clan was anything to do with tracksuits. Do you seriously think Takeda Shingen came back from the dead to run an Italian sportswear brand? Who would ever sign a sportsmanship deal with someone as idiotic as you? I turned back to the first meet and it continued. And you! There isn't a brand that uses a pigeon for a logo either! How did you confuse a rooster with a pigeon? Why can't any of you remember the names of the company sponsoring you? You're all claiming you got brand loyalty, but you've been perfectly happy wearing tracksuits with counterfeit logos! Oh, they were so persistent that I said that I would make tracksuits for them with super dumb branding. Seriously, when other groups gave themselves names, they decided that the dumbasses sounded cool and went with that. Oh, as ridiculously stupid as you are, you've convinced me. Wiggle wiggle. Of course, I wouldn't make the nerds any knee socks. No matter how many times I kicked them, booted them, or walloped them, they came running back, bellowing about strip knee socks at the top of their lungs. This is a safety hazard. A nerd hazard. I guess I have no choice but to scorch them. Even zombies are more reasonable. But stripe these socks! Come on! There was no escaping the lectures either. Today was supposed to be a day off, but the lectures never rested. They were available for any school in session 24-7. That was the kind of work ethic needed for my side gigs. You need to make clothes that have a positive influence on the women of Omoy. Yes, everyone is working so hard to buy the clothes you make. You need to make clothes that are both cute and wholesome. Like Stripe Nisa! Uh, Nerd A was silent with a glare. N never mind. <clears throat> never mind. The girls wouldn't permit me to sell my new product. But they had already bought everything I already made. I didn't see the problem. Apparently, fishnet stockings weren't wholesome. What would have become of this town if all the women started trapezing around in fishnets and denim short shorts? It's indecent. They're far too lewd. Banned. Personally, I'd be thrilled if all the women started wearing fishnet tights, but I couldn't say that out loud. Uh, as I was enduring my lecture, Miss Amarab handed me a list of orders. Uh, 20 pairs of fishnets and more than 100 orders for stockings with sexy patterns. They bought up all the knee socks I made and still dared to scold me? The only logical explanation for this was that my approval rating had become so minuscule that it collapsed into non-existence. However, I had prepared a secret plan, a strategy to overcome this desperate situation. I would never be so foolish as to face a lecture without a plan. I didn't suffer through daily scoldings for nothing. If I may respond to these accusations, I did not go out of my way to make provocative apparel. This is simply stereotyping me as a teenage boy. <clears throat> Consider the evidence, you know? I have made many styles of garments, and you can only point to a few instances where they could be considered indecent. The knee-high socks and tights were purely incidental. I've explained this over 60 times by now. I am, and have always been, an innocent high school boy. And I deny all accusations! As I professed my innocence, I unveiled my newest clothing line, the Excuse series, all made of stretch fabrics. I left all the erotics outfits out. A knit bodycon dress with matching stockings. Ooh, I'm a genius. <gasps> stretch fabrics? Ooh, they're so cute! Definitely chic! 
That's what I'm saying. With my newly developed jersey knit fabric, I present to you a new line of skirts and dresses. Pre-orders limited to three items per person. As an early bird special, I'll let you take two samples garments free. See, I'm not the bad guy here. Nothing ever comes from you all fighting over who gets what first. But it was always seemed to prove my innocence. So, first come, first serve. I guess. I convinced them that they were getting a good deal by giving them a couple freebies. A flawless sales strategy. I calculated that they'll each try to buy five garments minimum. Hands off! That's mine! No, I saw the flare skirt first! We were meant for each other! It's my destiny! My chosen one, my soulmate, my everything! Mine, mine, mine! Please, please, please! Can I have just that one? I look great in hoodies starting from today. No mini skirts? Huh? Did someone just run off with one? No fair! She was using a skill! I'm not letting that miniskirt get away! Ah! Jiggle, jiggle. <laughs> I was free to go. Innocent of all my crimes! <laughs> whoa, 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 whoa! Jersey's a stretch fabric. You might not want to pull on it so much. Try not to use skills either, okay? Let's not turn this into a bloodbath. I'm looking at you, book club president, with your illusions. You know they can see it with present sensing. Uh, watch out. Someone's using ground shrink to swipe that skirt. <laughs> Upon further reflection, I was confident that the girls would have found a way to slay the sand giant. That is if the sand giant was holding the last cute knit dress in stock. The battlefield right now was borderline apocalyptic. They actually hid secret techniques from each other to gain an edge at the next bargain sale. Whoa! I just saw someone use Incinerate! Why did you use that in the dungeon? Why now? Here are some more additional orders! The class rep yelled, shoving some sets of paper in my face. Three per person is totally unfair! I can't choose! This is cruelty against teenage girls! Boing boing. They started chanting in protest in the middle of the dining hall. Should I start handing out placards? At this rate, I was going to be overwhelmed by marches with signs like, Mini skirts are a maiden's right! And we deserve striped knee socks. I mean, if they felt that strongly. An elegant young lady I recognized suddenly caught my notice. Um, pardon me, she said. I'm begging you. Why don't you please listen to me? Oh, I do so hate to be ignored. I feel like I'm about to burst into tears. I've been here from the very beginning, but no one's listening to me. No matter how I raise my voice. Oh, and I would love to have a miniskirt as well. Whoa, it's the Duke's daughter. She was apparently trying to get my attention this entire time, but she couldn't be heard over the protests. Her eyes were dewy with tears, but if she thought that would help her in the girls' bargain war, she was sorely mistaken. She was in over her head. Even the sand giant wouldn't last for more than two minutes. As I have been saying, my father, the, the Duke, would like to request your assistance in excavating an iron mine. We are prepared to offer you full mining rights in exchange for digging the shafts. Father would personally give you an official request. When would be a good time for you? Soon it would be better. The same goes for the miniskirt, of course. Oh, and I adore these long socks! Unsurprisingly, the frontier faced an iron shortage. Since all regular imports had stopped, naturally the most cumbersome material to transport would run out fast. Stalker Girl had told me that smuggling large quantities of iron or cattle was impossible. Without raw materials, industrial development would slow down. And I would never get a chance to quit my side gigs. I had to fix this quick. Every night, it felt like my side job said, You've activated my trap card! The moment I entered my room, my side job was unbeatable in this world. Hmm, if that's all, I'll take care of it today. I've got nothing else going on since it's my day off. Besides, I need to gather some metal myself, I said. Oh, Mary Mary, can you tell your father, Mary Dad, that he doesn't need to personally deliver his request? He's a bit of a windbag, if you know what I mean. He spent so much time apologizing, but did he do wrong? He can come over if he wants to stand in for me when I get scolded. I'll be happy to have him do so. It's 20 people's worth of lectures. Ugh. Glancing through the plan, it didn't seem like too much work. Digging wouldn't take very long, and I wanted to dig around that area myself. There might be something buried deep, maybe even mithril. If I held the mining rights, then I'll happily snap up any mithril I found. I would become a mithril magnet in no time. Ahem. He hasn't done anything wrong, so I think he will forego the lecture. We would be very grateful if you could somehow do all this work today. Are, are you sure it's possible? Won't preparations take time? I am, of course, 
completely confident that you don't remember my name. I am Marielle, not Mary Mary. Though you are still somehow unaware of this, I would like to remind you that we're in the city of Omoy. Incidentally, my father's name Merrill Papa, not Mary Dad. Again, for the sake of clarity, my name is Mary L. Why is Mary Mary the only thing that you can remember? I promise you, if you call me Mary Mary one more time, I will weep. Today was fine with me. I'll be finished by the afternoon, and Miss Amara could hang out with the other girls in the meantime. Were they planning on going shopping again? After crushing the dungeon, the girls were already getting crushed, financially. They were trapped in a dead spiral even though they easily made 50,000 EO a day, equivalent to 100,000 yen. Wasn't their goal to make 250 EO per month? They spent that much yesterday and today on clothing alone. Considering that everything today they bought was prismatic, it was actually a reasonable price. Besides, they were just going to confiscate all my profits and leave me with nothing more than some loose pocket change. Again. Day 53. Morning. Apparently, it's not easy to mine in a fantasy world if you turn the tunnel into a water slide. The white loser in. Miss Ormrep and the girls did indeed decide to go shopping. She got all dressed up and I handed her a healthy wad of spending money so she could enjoy her day to the fullest. Meanwhile, Slimy was going to go on a picnic with the stock girl and poster girl. They had packed a small amount of food, so Slimy was certain to enjoy his picnic. The nurse toddled off to the armor to try their hands at some smithing. I didn't expect much, but I gave them plenty of ingots to work with. They had cultivated encyclopedic knowledge of blacksmithing in fantasy worlds, and the gray beard who ran the place was a legitimate smith. The nurse was just so clumsy. They sucked at all handicrafts, despite their obvious talents at building model kits. Additionally, additionally, they were hopeless at fine arts, but they could also design anime characters well enough to get the manga artists on board. Somehow, I was confident that they could build a steam engine, even though if they had no hope of forging a simple nail. That was a paradox of nerd enthusiasm. Not that I cared, but the meatheads went off for a run in their new tracksuits. They were far too stupid for me to understand their plans. If I did, they'll make me an idiot myself. Whatever it was, it was almost certainly moronic. <clears throat> Correction, no almost about it. This was unassignable truth. The last time they took a day off, they got into a goblin wrestling match. As it turned out, they got along with the goblins since they were more or less on the same mental level. The meatheads felt totally comfortable around them. If you put a track jacket on a goblin, you wouldn't even be able to tell the difference. I stood before a precipice cliff. All of the mountains in the region were like this, jagged and imposing. Hmm, should I start digging here and make my way to the village? Or should I start at the other end? I don't recommend moving into a mine shaft, though. You can do as you please, but are you sure about this? Also, why would anyone move into a mine shaft? Do you understand the purpose of a mine? Asked Mary Mary. Hmm, starting from here seemed like the right move. Considering all the options, connecting the mining village to the cliffs near the town was the best one. Hmm, well, uh, I'm basically picking the location with the most iron, but, but that also means the mine will stink of rust and the walls will develop this nasty reddish-brown patina. Are you sure you will want to move in? Are you running away from home? You would never be a shut-in if you run away, you know? I still don't understand how you came to the conclusion that I would have any desire to live in a mine! Channeling my magic, I sense plenty of iron in this direction. By the way, since you're a noble and all, is it a good idea for you to have come out here all the way through the monster forest? If you ask me, going merry merry into a mound isn't exactly ladylike, you know? Because my timetable was so urgent, she joined me at the base of the cliffs. But I kind of felt that the duke's daughter shouldn't be hanging around an iron mine. Did I come through a forest? If memory serves, and it does, the forest disappeared before I could even step foot in it. Did you not notice those giant evil sights that flew ahead of us and mowed down not just the monsters, but the trees as well? Where did they come from? And why would I marry Mary in the mountain? Are you going to marry Mary through stone? Do I look like a pickaxe to you? My name is Mary L, so stop saying Mary Mary. I'll drown the world with my tears if you don't stop. Thanks to my death size. We now had a road going straight to town. Starting from here would be faster after all. In the proposal, they only requested that I completed the first stage, but it would be faster to complete all five stages of the planned mine at once. This was more efficient than traveling to a remote mining village, excavating from that end and stopping early. Why did they split their plans into five stages anyhow? I could easily do them all now. <sighs> Let's begin. Okay. My MP was fully recovered, but the MP battery in my item bag wasn't fully recharged, so I decided to dig slowly. Carving out the whole tunnel in one go would have been faster, 
but the MP cost became prohibitive. I could serve my MP better if I only dug through the stones right in front of me as I advanced. I figured that I should prioritize the battery, just in case anything unexpected happened. I wasn't in a rush after all. Raising my hand in front of me, I began to form the tunnel with magic. I used holding to shape the tunnel and earth to dig. Normally, a vaulted tunnel would have been stable enough, but this was a mine, so I reinforced the walls and ceiling with stone pillars and crossbeams. Mary Mary stared, picking her jaw off the floor. She said, H How did the tunnel appear out of nowhere? What happened? This was sheer cliff mere moments ago! I was right. Nobles had no business in a mine. Uh, I dug the tunnel? You hired me to do that, you know. Why are you so surprised when I did what you asked? Oh, I think I understand. This tunnel is too plain for someone has your refined taste. Should I add a slide? That might be fun. A slide going through a mine? I bet people will pay just to see that. Hmm, I couldn't believe that I didn't think of that myself. I should have expected such brilliance from a noble, turning the mine into a tourist attraction. Uh, the only flaw in the plan was that the slide would become steeper as we mine deeper into the earth. And that would make it harder to transport the iron ore out. Eureka! I needed a hydraulic system to transport the ore anyway, so I could turn it into a water slide. Would you please listen? If you add a, if you add a slide in the tunnel, miners could slip and fall. This will lead to injuries and even death. Now is no time for tomfoolery. Your behavior will make the miners cry and I will cry too. Huh, the young lady was saying something to me, apparently. So you, were miners not allowed to use slides? I abandoned my plans for a water slide and continued to dig. Certainly, it would have been pretty difficult to manage a water slide and a mining operation at the same time. People having fun on the water slide will only get in the way of the miners. And though the miners would be able to enjoy the slide as well, no one would be left to do any work. The tunnel was progressing better than expected. It was just a regular old boring tunnel after all. There was no one around, but Mary Mary looked pleased with her stretched miniskirt. Still, I suspected that wearing a miniskirt in a mine was unwise. <sighs> what a shame. Despite this world being full of beautiful women, miniskirts were unknown. I merely wanted to correct this injustice and spread the good word of miniskirts. Yet, my classmates lectured me about propriety. No matter what I did, they always turned me into a villain. I've had to profess my innocence at least 75 times per day. Maybe I should start my own protests. Ah, uh, this is so boring. It's just a normal tunnel. This is like asking a carpenter to make endless corridors. Hmm, actually, a carpenter making a never-ending corridor sounds more fun. I'll switch places with him in an instant. I could make a hallway that went straight to town. Hmm. For some reason, my magic carved through iron faster than stone, so our progress was swift. Apparently, my magic had different effects on different materials. Ha! <laughs> There's a vein of iron over there. Can you mark the location on the wall with some chalk? Although, it might be copper. I'm not sure what copper looks like. Just say that it's copper-esque, okay? Maybe it smells like copper, you know? Oh, don't forget to say that it's only sort of similar to copper. Or all look the same to me. Well, I'm certainly glad that you can find loads of ore so easily, but your descriptions of anything that's not iron leave something to be desired. Kind of silvery, but don't blame me if it's not silver, okay? It's almost as obnoxious to write as, I've got a hunch this is copper. Doesn't it have a whiff of copper? If it's not copper, it's sure similar to copper, I guess. You don't have to make excuses. No one will care if you make a mistake. I am spending more time writing down your justifications than I am drawing the map. This map is indecipherable. The walls of the tunnel were covered in chalk scrawls. It kind of made us look unprofessional. Uh, if I turned to the right, I could advance straight towards the mining village. As I delved, I searched through the earth with Jupiter Eye, navigated using map, and found loads of ore with area analyzed. I used the same techniques when I did renovations. I added supporting arches in the parts of the shaft near the rich veins of ore so miners would have more room to dig. The tunnel would slide through the centers of some loads, making it especially easy to mine. We'll need an iron workers. I had given Mr. Mary that some blueprints, so hopefully he was building one. In the meantime, I could process the ore with my alchemy. I wonder what the nerds were up to. It wouldn't surprise me if they already had built a blast furnace trying to forge a sword. On the other hand, I'd be shocked if they actually did make a sword. The nerds were supernaturally uncoordinated. When they arrived in this world, they managed to set up a home base with tents and a steak wall. They even built chairs, but they couldn't figure out how to make a table. Anyway, I was almost done with the tunnel. 
As I neared my goal, I detected some sort of magical response from some of the deeper loads. I get mining rights as my payment, right? Do you mind if I mine here? I got to get 50%, yes? Are, are you listening to me? There was a massive iron load below us, and underneath, something flowing with magical power, almost certainly mithril. My prize. I had been searching for mithril this entire time. Although I wanted to upgrade the equipment of all my classmates with mithril, I didn't have enough. The spot I was standing on was the most likely candidate for a vein of mithril. I probably wouldn't gather enough mithril if I only kept 10% of what I mined. I needed to stick to my guns and aim for a 50% share or I wouldn't have enough for upgrades. I was willing to go no lower than 30, no, 25%. I might be able to scrape by with only a 20% split, but that was my limit. Mary Mary said, I am trying my best to answer you. In your proposal, you stated that you were willing to settle for 50% of any ore you mined, but father informed me that you can keep 100% of your own labor and that he does not wish to take any more from you, so it's all yours. Additionally, he declared that you have permission to mine whenever and wherever you please. The administrators of those regions agreed to these terms, so there won't be any issues. Ha! Huh, no negotiations needed! <laughs> you nuts! Why did I spend so much time coming up with this excellent negotiation strategy if your father is going to be so generous? Ah, <sighs> I swear. None of the officials in this region have any business acumen. Someone needs to beat some sense into them. And I've got just a stick for the job. I wanted to highball them with a 50% offer, but their plan was to let me keep everything I mined. What were they thinking? What if I decided to mine all the ore to myself? They have nothing left. Those bureaucrats were going to get an earful from me. Iron was absolutely essential to the development of the region, and the Duke naivety would doom the frontier. Father's A's warned me that you would angrily refuse his generosity. In that case, take as much as you need and we'll mine whatever you leave behind. Hmm. At least Mr. Mary that has some competent people around him. Apparently, his most trusted attendant has served the family for generations. So he must have evolved some good sense through overcoming all the other hardships they had faced. The meatheads had to be jealous. In contrast, they were devolving as soon as they faced trials and tribulations. Okay. Uh, sounds good to me. I only wanted the mithril anyway. I didn't really need iron, nor did I have any use for copper and silver. The frontier, on the other hand, needed as much iron as they could get. Right below us, there was a massive load of iron, and a small vein of what was possibly mithril. This was a win-win scenario. Also, um, I'm about to introduce some new mining techniques that will completely revolutionize the craft. Tell the administrator not to flood the markets and cause an economic crisis. Supply needs to increase slowly and steadily, okay? What are you talking about? Mining techniques! You just simply smacking the water and another section of tunnel pops out! I'd get the metro I was looking for and as much as I wanted. And with a free tunnel, the frontier would get a massive quantity of iron ore. The Duke would better be off leaving decision making to his advisors, I thought. Well, there was no point comparing the sorts of people who excelled in times of peace with those who excelled in times of war. Perhaps both were necessary? Advisor skills in the arts of diplomacy and management, and a duke who could stand bravely against adversity. Negotiations with the kingdom weren't making much progress. Both sides were wasting time bickering about terms instead of agreeing to any compromises. The kingdom was getting impatient since they no longer had a source of spellstones. Meanwhile, we needed to make the frontier self-sufficient, so we could stand as equals at the negotiation table. The only risk was assassination, but with Stalker Girl's clan on our side, we could finally play the game of espionage. We had the advantage there, our military lacked mites, but I considered spycraft to be another dimension of warfare. We had folks like the meatheads to handle boots on the ground stuff, but nothing could substitute for a good spy. Even if they sent assassins, our spy could easily discover and capture them, neutralizing the threat. If the assassin happened to be a beautiful woman, they could send her right over to my room. Fighting off beautiful women at the end was basically all I did anymore, so I could handle it. I train in the art every single day. In fact, I was going to print out advertisements targeting beautiful assassins. Would 500 copies be enough? Excuse me? Why won't you listen to me? Why must you ignore me? If you won't pay attention, I will weep onto this ton of food with your tears. You will get that water slot you wanted. Day 53, late morning. Using cute clothes as economic stimulus is just fine, but please refrain from shaking the foundations. The tunnel. Finally, I confirmed with the soldiers who accompanied Mary Mary that work progressed smoothly. I wish that they sent a civil administrator along with them, though Mary Mary understood the current plan. 
she didn't have a good grasp of the future direction of the project. If I remember correctly, you need at least 100 crates of iron every year, yes? 640 kilos per box works out to 64,000 kilograms or 64 metric tons per year. I have around 600 crates or 6 years worth of iron in my bag and half the load still remains. Should I mind that too? Do you have somewhere to store it? I have about 400 tons, which means the rest of the load is probably the same amount. What do you think? I excavated about half of the load and stored it in my item bag. In order to clear the way to potential mithril below, I had to make out half of it anyway. I couldn't mine the remaining half, but it needed to be stored somewhere. It was likely too heavy to store in a warehouse. I could probably just hold on to it for them too. Six years worth? Are, are you saying that you have enough iron to last us for six years? You need a place to store 400 tons of iron? 600 crates? What? Even if it is six years worth, you'll find yourself wanting more. It's hard to imagine now, but the more iron you mine, the more uses you'll find for it. And the more demand there will be. Practically, this is only enough iron for three years. Since the frontier is still developing, demand will increase over time. And increased production capacity will drive that demand. If an ironworks is built, it might not even last an entire year. That's the point of the development plan after all. Why did the soldiers look so troubled? Did they not have anywhere to store the iron? I thought my explanation was fairly simple. <sighs> if you need a warehouse, I can build it for you gratis. Hopefully it doesn't sink into the ground when we store all the iron though. I knew what I was talking about. I had experience in these matters. No matter how overprepared I was, I never prepared enough. I gathered my data from 20 randomly selected teenage girls. <clears throat> for example, when I made 60 pairs of stockings for 20 girls, I received 100 extra orders. The same phenomena was observed with knee socks and even fishnet tights. They were prismatic, so they were long-lasting and durable. It was almost impossible to wear them out, but the girls still demanded to have four pairs each. They would do the same if I released an entirely new design. No matter how much of a margin I leave, I always ended up with more work orders. Today was a day off from the dungeon raiding, but not from my side hustle. This is a priority message! Relay that we somehow might need even more iron! At once! said the soldiers before sprinting off. Perhaps they could have made use of a water slide after all. Since so they didn't have anywhere to store the iron, I decided to leave the rest of the load untouched. I kept 30 tons for myself, and if it wasn't enough, I could just return later. The loads near the town were entirely untouched, so I could easily grab hundreds of tons in a single day if need be. In the meantime, I extracted the ore that I suspected to be mithril by using holding to grasp the load and gravity to haul it out of the earth. There was no way I would try something as risky as teleport. Then I used alchemy to remove the impurities from the ore. Ah, there it is. It looked like mithril to me. The color was similar, though a bit muddled. Appraisal said it was just metal, so it's likely it had some impurities remaining. Still, it was a big find. The way magic seeped into the metal was unique, and it could handle any MP I poured in. The more magic I added, the more radiant it became. This moon white metal was definitely mithril. <laughs> it's mining time! There was no such thing as too much mithril. Even after I upgraded all of our equipment, I would still discover more uses for it. Forging items with refined mithril from the start would surely produce higher quality items. At the moment, I wasn't skilled enough to do that. I suspected that the skills attached to better gear would use too much MP at this point. For a group as large as ours, I needed a staggering amount of mithril to create and upgrade equipment to the point where it couldn't be improved anymore. I doubted that we will ever see the day that all 30 of us were kitted out a full set of perfect equipment. Even if I mine all the mithril here, it probably wouldn't be enough. <sighs> There's no end to the hustle. Okay, I'm done. You're all depleted. I'm kinda hungry now. So, I'm going to go, maybe. Are you talking to the vein ore? When did you become so boon companions? It is indeed almost time for lunch, but why did you mine multiple years worth of iron before midday? If Iron really was my friend, I wouldn't have the loner title. Now I'm about to cry! Still, I felt a closeness to Mr. Lode here, as it was buried deep on the ground, and had possibly met my long-lost Miss Sex Appeal. A friend of my charisma was a friend of mine, though I had yet to encounter my sex appeal. I couldn't quite call something I've never met a friend, right? Our friendship was impossible, especially now that the Lode was depleted. 
Besides, a teenage boy whose only friend was a bunch of minerals underground was simply depressing. Mary Mary continued. You still refuse to listen to me! Why are you talking to the crowd? Why did you just laugh now? And why did it sound so pathetic? Next, I needed to connect the mine shaft to the mining village. I already found the shaft they started with area analyzed, so all I had to do was connect them, and I would be finished. Next stop, Jambalaya! The protests and lectures had interrupted my peaceful breakfast. It was impossible to enjoy my meal under those circumstances. The knee socks process almost turned into a riot, and a teenage boy was at serious risk of being wrong side of history at that sort of protest. If they had protested fishnet tights, I would have ended up with way more additional orders. Alright, almost there. I slowed down my rate of renovation. I mean, <clears throat> tunneling. Not knowing how sturdy the tunnel on the other side was, I didn't want to shake its foundation unnecessarily. Indeed, Mary Mary kept stepping her feet and that caused the ground to shake quite a bit. Though my tunnel was structurally sound, so we were quite safe. Her miniskirt and knee socks also caused some tremolous activity. Her bodyguards didn't know where to look. All connected. Probably. I'll go ahead and reinforce the structure so I don't have to redo all my work. My days off are so endangered that I need to do what I can to protect them. Seriously. I am once again asking you to speak to me and not to the mine shaft. Are you prepared for my wailing and gnashing of teeth? Are you prepared for the river of tears that I will give you the water slide you always dreamed of? Now she wanted the water slide? All this time she did nothing but criticize the idea. It would likely upset the miners too. How could a water slide in a mine shaft not be a problem? Now that the tunnels were joined, once I reinforced the last stretch of tunnel and exited at the mining village, my work would be done. I was paid with mining rights instead of money, and Mithra was far more valuable anyway. Not that I wanted to sell it, of course. It was far too useful to sell. While Mary Mary went over to the village chief, I checked out the local village shop. Hey, old man, you got any local specialties? Any surpluses? What? You only sell iron? Is that what you eat? It's bad for your teeth, you know. Chopping down on the ingot will mess them up, but good. What kind of damn fool we are? The proprietor said. You need some sand stuff in your melon, boy. Don't you see anything but rocks in this locality? Only because we have too many of ours. Care to take a gander, boy? Oh, nothing to eat. The mountains were quite far from the forest and the river, so the people didn't have much in way of arable land. More importantly, this had been bugging me ever since I've gotten to this world, but I'll say it again. Yet another middle-aged man! The encounter rate for old guys here was way too damn high. Almost everyone I met was some old man. Why couldn't there be more typically secondary world fantasy tropes like encounters with a beautiful woman? <sighs> Normally in this situation, the shop assistant would be a girl next door cutie, and the village chief would be some elegant woman, and I would probably get a random encounter with some hot villager too. Instead, it's a bunch of white middle-aged losers! This town is full of them! Is that what the village specializes in? No one is that! Hey, we ain't selling no man here! He said. Don't care if you don't need him because I don't got him! Mary Mary returned and we gave the village chief a tour of the tunnel as we headed back to town. Why did they need a tour? It's just a hole in the ground. The tunnel, the snow-capped mountains they cut through, the gorgeous scenery, the complete lack of specialty goods, the profusion of old men. I didn't need any of this stuff. I did discover something worthwhile in the village. The item in question was sold as a decorative rock, and I bought out the entire stock. These rocks contained large quantities of mithril and other rare metals. None of the furnaces in the village could smelt them, so they just regarded them as strange decorations instead of valuable materials they actually were. Since the furnace couldn't melt them, the earth must have had an extremely high melting point. Therefore, I expected the base metal to be particularly resilient. I arranged a contract to purchase the mystery metals, so I will receive more in the future. I paid in wheat, vegetable oil, buckets, crates, and whatever cash I had. So I had some exotic metals, but I was completely broke. I'd have to ask the class rep for my allowance when I returned to town. At the moment, I couldn't afford to buy food or pay for the inn. He don't do his mind chef in a single day. In point and fact, we had only asked him this morning, and he finished before midday. The entire time, he disregarded everything I had to say. Impossible. I had collected my cut of profits from the general store and the guild just this morning. And it was already gone. I spent some money on my open contracts for wholesale orders of rice, soy sauce, cloth, and thread, and various other odds and ends I ordered on a whim. Now I bought up the rare metals. These were just essentials. I'm kind of concerned that my daily necessities were getting so expensive. If the class rep didn't confiscate most of my money before I spent it, 
I will never be able to afford rent. She didn't realize that I'll be bribing the poster girl with sweets to overlook my bills. The girls would give me a payment for their debt every morning, but the class rep confiscated that money right after. Then, Miss Summer Rep, Slimy, and I lined up to receive our daily allowance. That allowance plus the dividends I received from the general store and the army made me rich every morning. And every night, I was destined for the poorhouse. No one seemed to acknowledge this, but I was technically Miss Summer Rep and Slimy's boss, and it would look suspect if I took their money. I wanted an additional order of pocket money. Unfortunately, if I asked for this, they would counter with a demand that I would make more things for them. Then they would vote on the matter, and I will always lose. Every time I got a bigger allowance, I ended up having to do more work, and the girls were buried in more debt, and any payments they made on it were immediately confiscated. So, every time I asked for money, I was pulled deeper in an endless cycle of poverty. This tunnel is all brand new? Asked the villager. Yes, as you can see, but he ignored me the entire time, I informed him that we didn't have enough miners for a shaft this deep, but he paid no heed. Recently, the girls harangued me for going broke after paying wholesales on a ton of eggs. But without eggs, my meals would be worse, and the eggs in this world were spectacular. Maintaining modern living standards in a medieval economy was costly. I needed to make enough investments to create surpluses of food and supplies. Though the frontier was getting more wealth from trading spellstones and mushrooms with merchants from the kingdom, the circulation of money couldn't keep up with the speed of economic development. That being said, if the frontier issued its own currency, that would introduce an exchange rate, which would make trading more difficult. That could wait for when the frontier declared independence from the kingdom. My only option. I've got to take all the kingdom's money. Why is he talking to himself as he expands the mine shaft? He just does that. There is simply nothing we can do about it. Believe me, I've tried everything, and he ignored it all. What? According to Mary Mary. The frontier was now more economically developed than the capital, which meant that my little college industry was more productive than all the industry in the capital. I could make a killing selling all my manufactured goods in the capital, and once I got all their money, I put an end to the cash shortage facing the frontier. Although, if the kingdom issued more currency and caused massive inflation, that would doom the whole economy. You can't expect a teenager to determine an entire nation's monetary policy. It's absurd! Maybe what's-his-face could have done it if he still was alive. If we had somehow become friends, all of these problems with weapon developments, manufacturing, and economic junk would have gotten solved. But he chose to kill his classmates instead. Then I killed him. It seemed like 30 high school students couldn't solve a shortage of currency on their own. The five meatheads and four nerds were counted in that number after all. <clears throat> we're almost through the tunnel. So do you mind if I split? Mr. Mary Dad spends too much time apologizing, bowing, and rambling. And I'd rather not have to deal with someone with such a guilty conscience, you know? Can I just drop off the iron off or the warehouse and bounce? That would be helpful, as we lack the means to transport 900 tons of iron ore with ease. Don't you worry about meeting with my father. Although he isn't expressing guilt, you are confused. Those are not apologies, but effective shows of gratitude. He's trying to give you his thanks, don't you see? <sighs> now that I've finished my job, I went back to town. Still no money, though. I'll have to negotiate with the class rep. Hello? Did you hear anything I said? Day question mark. Kingdom of Doriel. Interlude. The Royal Castle. The Royal Guard departed from the castle, heading out of the capital. The impossible order to suppress the rebellion in the Duchy of Olmoy had arrived. At the very least, I would have liked to receive a decree from his royal mastery. This was the first time that the Royal Guard had left the castle, much less the capital. They followed orders that weren't backed by a royal decree. <sighs> Alas, no other division could handle this matter. It was paramount that we would meet with Duke Omoy. We're in the middle of a crisis. Broker a peace treaty with the frontier at once. The first brigade is stranded. The task is suited for the royal guard, the elites. So commands his royal majesty. The first brigade couldn't move after their defeat on the frontier. The second brigade moved in to secure their rescue. That was not in itself enough to cause our present crisis. However, suspicions had grown over the movements of the third brigade. The royal guard that answered only to his majesty. Even the church was somehow involved. If it truly is a royal decree, I will obey without question, I said. Please grant me an audience with his royal majesty. Our kingdom is falling apart. Raising a fuss would only cause greater panic. It is for that reason that I must see the king. Please, I beg of you. Nothing made sense anymore. The situation was now dire. Why was I kept in the dark? Why were they getting in my way? If you don't obey the emergency edict, 
we will have no choice but disband and reorganize the Royal Guard. The Royal Guard must maintain a strategic independence. We shall fervently guarantee that you will. But you must take the front as soon as you can. His Royal Majesty is counting on you. Understood, I said. Just like that, I was cut off from the castle and from the royal capital. With no understanding of the present circumstances, if the Spellstone embargo continued, the kingdom would dissolve. We had incurred far too many debt to the other nations. If tensions with the church escalated any further, we would have no allies to call upon. These would be the last days of our kingdom. The crisis would not end, even if the current king was deposed. Invasions were brutal, yet we had no other recourse. Our diplomats had already gone to the frontier. No one knew what caused this. Indeed, the nobility's misunderstanding of the frontier would be our downfall. <sighs> what should we do, my lady? First, contact the Adventurers Guild. If our sources are correct, there is only one way into the frontier from Nalagi, a dungeon. This would not be a war. There would be no invasion. If we had to conquer a dungeon to discover the truth, we would need the help of the Adventurers Guild. But, but the frontier... You need not continue. I understand your concerns as well as anyone. I apologize, my lady. The kingdom and the frontier, despite our differences, we should have been united by a shared will. But the kingdom had betrayed the frontier a dozen times over. If war broke out, it would cost us more than some spilled blood. Far more. Day 53. Lunch. I'll give the nerds some credit if they actually made a steam engine by whacking some metal rods together. Omoy City. I witnessed a terrifying scene. So shocking I was rendered speechless. Please, make it go away, I thought. The nurse spoke in turn. Oh, it's Haraka-kun. Ah, good timing. We can't get it out of the armory. Yeah, it's too big. And heavy. Do you mind putting it in your item bag? Just drop it off at the river. It really was too big and too heavy. It was larger than the entrance to the forge. How did you end up building a steamboat when you were trying to make a sword? Making chairs when you meant to make a table is one thing, but why would a sword need a steam engine? No amount of screw-ups while making a sword could possibly result in steamboats. It's impossible! It's absurd that you somehow did this by hitting a heated iron billet with a hammer. You must have done this on purpose. I just don't understand why you even bothered. We can power everything with magic. We don't need steam. The steamboat took up all the space in the workshop. It was too big to fit through the doors. Uh, let's just leave it there. The old man said, Oh, no you don't. This contraption's in the way. Duke Omoy commissioned me for some work, and I can't do it with your iron dingity taking up space. You gotta get it out of here. It was a mid-sized wooden paddle steamer with an iron cladding and reinforcement. They somehow put together a boat without knowing how to build a table. Maybe they had planned on making another chair and it ended up like this. I was sure that the steam engine was also made of iron, for if it was made of wood, I would be impressed. Why didn't you stop the nerds, old man? I asked. Were you helping them? Oh, I bet you were. The ironclad was too well put together for him not to have helped. I mean, look at those finishes. The curved hull would have leaked like a sieve if he wasn't there to help. The old man was looking away, pretending he didn't hear me, but his guilt was obvious. After bringing the boat to the river and waiting for the nerds to board, I obviously bombarded them with a meteor shower. Though I had been conserving my MP all day, I burned through all of it in one go with that spell. The damn boat didn't sink. They added a barrier enchantment to the boat. The sorcerer had tried making protective enchantments and barriers before, but it made equipment too heavy for any practical use. So he put it on the damn boat? They had known I would lob meteors at the boat all along. Should I disintegrate their atoms instead? When I flew into the air to rain down my meters, I spotted the meatheads playing tag with a bunch of kobolds in the forest. I'll just pretend I didn't see that. Those idiots were more suited to the life in the monster forest than to civilization. I bet their jobs had changed to barbarian by this point. But that just might work. I had contemplated making a sort of cargo ship to ship timber and iron, but these nerds had made an ironclad battleship for some inexplicable reason. What really pissed me off was that they went out of their way to protect it from burning. Even so, I had to admit that installing a barrier device that was too large for personal use on a boat was actually a great idea. But I hated how it protected them from my attacks. Ugh, I feel so mentally drained. Isn't a day off supposed to make you feel more relaxed? Ms. Omarip and the others were probably at the general store. I had a feeling that they were eyeing up my new line of bags despite the fact that they were all bankrupt. 
What was the point of delivering my products to the general store if they were just brought straight back to the inn? I'm wasting so much effort here. Oh my gee. Yep, they were total shopping addicts. Maybe they were nostalgic for anything that reminded them of life back in the real world. So nostalgic that they chased after any reminder. They even went to war over purses. That's mine! Never! You can take it over my cold dead body! Yeah! What else was there to do? They tried to extract as much joy as they could from the cute clothes and tasty food. We lived in this world for nearly two months. Those days back in Japan were long gone. But they adjusted to their new lives here in the worst possible way. When they could only focus on surviving another day, they didn't have the time to think of the past. They wore false smiles as their nerves frayed. Now they were safe, and they could afford to remember Japan and everything they had lost. The guys had it easy in comparison. The nerds had lived their lives waiting for a chance to live in a fantasy world. This world was like a dream to them. On Earth, they were hopeless. But in this world? They finally took life seriously. The meatheads had even less trouble adjusting. They were perfectly suited to the fantasy world, especially to living in the woods. Back in Japan, they were all elite athletes. If they weren't brought to this world, they would have likely gone pro, gaining riches and fame. Yet, I knew that they didn't want to return. The meetings had found a place where they belonged, where they can enjoy death-defying throws on the battlefield, rely on instincts alone, and live every moment to the fullest. They were like a barbarian culture that had been dying to boredom in our world, only to finally find a purpose here. Although, they were likely too stupid to feel boredom, and they were always earnest and excited, you know, like morons. I didn't have anything to go back to. The only thing I missed was the bookstore. Losing access to bookstore was a bitter pill to swallow. But Ms. Amaret made up for it, since I was the one who brought her out of the darkness. I wanted to make sure her life was a good one. In Japan, I had no attachments, no one I cared about. Nothing I wanted to care for, nothing that I couldn't live without. I prefer this world. Now I had Slimy too. I made real connection to the people of this world. The girls were different. Nothing about this world was pleasant for them. They had to give up so much when they were brought here. Take that! And that! Yeah! Or so I had assumed. No wonder they became spoiled and titled shopaholics. I did what I could to make them smile, but that didn't lessen how amazed I was that they retained their sanity. No one could have blamed the girls if any of them went mad, lashed out violently, or suffered a nervous breakdown. Somehow, no one lost it like What's-His-Face did. Because of that, 30 of us were still alive. Going crazy would have been an easy route, but they held out. Their mental fortitude had to have come from the mystical powers of friendship. And of shopping. Come on, let's negotiate. Alright, but if only you take your hands off it. No, I call dibs. I'll trade for it. Well, I haven't bought it yet, so... I had another night of crafting ahead of me. Everything that mattered to them in 16 years of life on Earth. All the familiar foods and charming fashion couldn't be forgotten in an instant. But I could try to ease the pain. They would have suffered less if they had given in to despair and that in the forest. But I didn't want that to happen. The least I could do was to help them laugh. Their smiles made the long hours of freelance worth it. Actually, is it really worth it? Oh, I saw that bag in a shop once. I always wanted that one. I wanted to apologize to the original designer of my very authentic duchy and banana handbags. Honestly, I kind of wanted one myself, but I couldn't replace my item bag. Furthermore, any fancy accessories I made clash terribly with my black cloak. I would look like an absolute dingus with a different bag. Hmm, this one's a little too big, the diminutive vice rep C complained. Yeah, none of these sizes work for you. Call the manufacturer over! I demand an apology and a discount! No, let's not complain one by one. We'll just tell him as a group when he gets here. Ah, welcome back. Those bags aren't too big. You're just too small, I thought. Most of the complaints came from the tiny animal after all. Go back to the kids section. Ooh, should I get something sporty or a cute clutch I can bring to a party? But you've never been invited to a party before. Vice Red B knowingly tapped her temple. Ah, uh, but we formed a party, haven't we? I'd neither gone to a party nor formed one. Who could I party with? Goblins? <laughs> no thanks. Maybe the meatheads would like that. Boo! I want everything! Yeah, looks like we're gonna have to go farm some more monsters! Yeah! Everyone was having fun, or at least having a lot of transactions. My classmates took so few days off because they couldn't hold on to their savings. They wanted clothes so badly that they were perfectly happy to exhaust themselves hunting monsters. Were they adjusting to this world too? They were actually well adapted, weren't they? 
Could it be that they were using shopping to cover up for mental trauma? Were they just greedy all along? Upon further consideration, they seemed to be extremely unbalanced when it came to shopping. No way, look! Another new item! I need it! I'll buy it! There's no way this is healthy. Day 53, Midday. Picnics are a new trend in town, but I suspect living in caves won't become the next trend. Omoy City. Miss Armoret was having a good time shopping at the general store with the other girls. With some timidity, she shuffled between several handkerchiefs, unable to decide. Was she going to use it to clean her armor? Hey, Miss Armor Rep. I'm back, and I'm famished. So, let's jambalaya. There's no shrimp, so I'll use mystery bird meat instead. If I add eggs, it'll basically taste like omo rice. Even I can't tell the difference, and I'm making it. It's pretty much just chicken and rice, you know? As long as I insisted that it was jambalaya, no one would catch on. Welcome back! Miss Amarep and I stopped by the inn to fetch Slimy, Poster Girl, and Stalker Girl. We were going to have an afternoon picnic, and I knew the perfect spot. Waiting for the rest of the girls would have taken a while, so I considered making some improvement to the pseudo-dungeon over there. Alternatively, I could take Slimy to my cave for the first time. The cave was pretty far, so I really couldn't do both in one day. If I went all out with teleport, hitting both was a possibility, but I didn't want to run around like an idiot on my day off. There were already way too many idiots chasing kobolds around the woods. Better to just ignore them. Poster girl said, Thanks for the food! Jiggle jiggle. It was sunny out and the view was great. It felt really like a picnic. A jambalaya picnic. It's so nice to eat in the great outdoors. Somehow, the food always tastes better this way. Wiggle. Saga girl took a bite and said, Wow, this is pretty delicious! You haven't made this omo rice in a while. Jiggle jiggle. According to the poster girl, since the area surrounding the town was now safe, picnicking was the hottest new trend. Time to develop a line of picnic goods, I thought. I can taste the profits already. Until recently, the forest abutted the town walls, so going on a picnic wasn't safe. Now that the forest was cleared, and the town folks wandered around with warlike clubs hanging from their belts, the goblins were the ones who had to worry about safety. Girls who weren't my classmates would normally be in danger if they went on a picnic, but Slimy was guaranteed to keep them safe. With Slimy here, even an orc king couldn't interrupt their picnic. If a situation was too dangerous for Slimy, not even the mightiest fortress could keep us safe. A monster that could pose a threat to Slimy would have had to come from the deepest dungeons. Those levels were typically so dangerous that I wouldn't even bother trying to remodel them. I had given up on my plans to build a public bath in the ultimate dungeon after all. It could never work, since the water will make you cold by the time you climb a hundred stories up. Additionally, the death sides were patrolling nearby, and they get a ton of level just clear-cutting so much forest. And Saka Girl had a high level of presence sensing. Even if she wasn't useful in battle, Poster Girl kind of made up for it, as she was surprisingly powerful for a commoner. The sides probably were enjoying themselves as they hunted down goblin hordes. If they kept playing with goblin and kobolds, there was a risk that they would turn into meatheads. And the nurse escaped in their ship? Uh, my surprise attack thwarted! Ah, nothing like a picnic on a day off. No kidding! Wait a minute. Why are we having picnic right next to the pseudo dungeon? Shh, 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 shh. Just pretend it's not there. I had wanted to try to make some monsters using the treasure of the monster core, but I never finished analyzing it. Strangely enough, the avatar of greed wasn't interested in the gem, but the avatar of gluttony was. So in the end, I gave it to my slime companion. I hope it tasted good. The rest of the girls wouldn't get here until around 3 o'clock, so I left some sweets and snacks for them. Sucker Girl and the Poster Girl stared ravenously at the snacks. I didn't think they could last until the others arrived. The other girls needed to hurry up. <sighs> Shall we? Ms. Amarep nodded and Slimy wiggled, indicated that they would accompany me. I told them that they could do whatever they wanted on their day off, but they wanted to stay with me. Uh, lately you started acting a lot like Slimy, Ms. Amarep. You need to start- you need to keep- you need to practice speaking more! Okay. Chico chico. <sighs> the only time she felt like talking was when she scolded me every morning. Her vocabulary, grew, her vocabulary grew richer by the day, probably from learning all the wrong words from the girls with their impassioned rants. She had supposedly gotten much better at speaking during those girls' only meetings. Whenever I asked them what they talked about in them, they said that the meetings were only for girls, as were the contents. Uh, I added some improvement to the pseudo dungeon. Then they screwly split off for a moment and snuck into the town on the other side. Jumping over the wall would have worked just fine, but I happened to run into a member of the Sucker Girls clan, and they smuggled me in. Once inside, I stopped by the Adventurers Guild, 
only to learn that since every attempt to overcome the pseudo dungeon ended in humiliating defeat, no one was even trying anymore. <laughs> I went out of my way to produce fiendish new traps, and these good for nothing adventures show no appreciation! Nod, nod, wiggle, wiggle. Given that most of these adventurers left their equipment in the pseudo dungeon, it has simply become too costly to attempt it. There was even a rumor that any couple who entered the dungeon together would soon break up. What were those couples getting up to when their clothes melted? Oh, don't go on dates in dungeons! What are you thinking? Of course, of course you'll get dumped if you bring a girl to a dungeon! The dungeon isn't the problem here! Jiggle, jiggle. The current record holder managed to jump across two of the rock platforms that hung above the corrosive lake, but slipped and fell on the third because it was covered in oil. Hmm, seems like folk in this world don't understand the genre conventions here. If you have to jump across three platforms, the third one will always have a trap, you know? Why do they fall for every trick in the book? Sammy wiggled with uncertainty. The same thing had happened with the men at arms. They gave up after losing almost all of their weapons and armor. Could a man at arms who have been disarmed still be called a man at arms? With nothing left to them but their clothes on their backs and wooden sticks, they were dressed just like me! That sucks. I don't want to be mistaken for one of these middle-aged losers. Hmm, this place is kind of empty, isn't it? Since most of the population had fled to the frontier, this town was practically deserted. Wherever I looked, I saw desolate streets lined with abandoned buildings. Since the soccer girls clan continued to help the locals migrate to the frontier, there was no slowing down the population decline. I'm not surprised that the folks want to ditch this dead end town. It's run by an orc lord and there's plenty of jobs available at their frontier. Nod, nod. Wiggle, wiggle. Most of the stores were closed, so there weren't many goods available. I bought up anything noteworthy, somehow. Despite having just received my allowance, I was flat broke again! The girls were sure to give me a tough time when I got back, but that was a problem for future me. It wasn't my fault that I could never hold on to my rent money, I swear! Slimy bored, and sh slimy bored shrank down and darted under my cloak and started rustling around. I was quite surprised when a swollen, slimy-shaped lump appeared in my tunic. Even Miss Amarep was startled. <sighs> I spent so much time making those glue traps, but they won't see any use, I sighed. It was a marvelous idea. An adventurer would spot an obvious pit trap, but if they tried to pass it by sliding along the walls, they would find themselves quite in a sticky situation. No one was up for the challenge. I also set up a trap where I painted a monster in a trick wall. If someone tried to hit the monster, the wall would just topple over the attacker. It was a nasty trap, but I liked the impact of the glue trap. Wiggle, wiggle. Slimy seemed dissatisfied with something. I pondered the possible reasons, and then it hit me. Of course, we needed a tentacle monster in this dungeon. At the moment, I was the only one who had tentacles, and if I tried to capture any female adventurers who had their clothes dissolved, it would have caused a scandal. Also, I'm not a monster, got it? Okay, let's put a real pitfall in front of the optical illusion of a pitfall. That should be pretty popular with adventurers, right? I had to make sure to inspect how the pseudo dungeon was doing when we walked through. It didn't need any maintenance. All of the new traps were functioning properly. The command golems were doing their jobs well, so I rewarded them with some extra MP. It looked like there was a group of emissaries from the kingdom visiting a nearby town. But I didn't see any need to check them out. <clears throat> that is, unless they happened to be led by a female knight. The moment I had that thought, Miss Amaret stared razor-sharp daggers at my back. <sighs> Her glares were more deadly than ever! I guess I shouldn't need more women warriors in my life. Jiggle jiggle. I couldn't discount the value of killer women. I was already surrounded by women who have said that they were going to kill me, but they were still valuable. I mean, don't kill me over shopping orders, am I right? Uh, why are teenage girls as vicious as Nubunaga? Wouldn't they rather be like Ieyasu and show some patience? Also, can you stop using Hideyoshi-style tactics on me? I'm going to start crying because of you! Miss Amaro was dragging me in the opposite direction by my hair. Alright, I get the hint! Who wouldn't be curious after hearing about a female knight? I've only met crabby old men wherever I went. Not even a single event flag for girls? If I triggered more old dudes coming my way, ooh, I swear, I'll burn them <laughs> and I'll cry. Boing, boing. Miss Summerett was patting me on the back. This world was truly overflowing with tears. All this crying was making my eyes hurt, so it was definitely time to leave. Well, it's about time, but let's just take the long way back. If we stop by a village, they might have some novel ingredients. I don't have money, but I can always barter. I've always got plenty of wheat and mushrooms. Why don't we just make mushrooms the new currency? Then I'll literally never run out. I got some nods and wiggles, so we agreed to take the long way. Still, I felt pretty awkward. Always talking to myself. I wish that Miss Amaret would at least grace me with a verbal answer. 
She wasn't even wearing her helmet this time. I think Slimy was having too much of an influence on her. You're supposed to be the senior, Miss Summer Rep. You're literally Slimy's ex boss. Also, Slimy's high speed movement was getting faster. His level hadn't gone up or anything. Was this some sort of growth spurt? Don't tell me he's gonna have a bigger appetite now. There was no escape from my sidekicks. Miss Insatiable Greed had spent all of her allowance as well. It would have definitely been cheaper for me to just make her a handkerchief than for her to buy one at the store. But I wasn't going to point that out. I knew that the girl simply wanted to enjoy the retail therapy. Besides, I had to earn my cut. One day off is just way too short. Day 53, Midday. Halloween doesn't belong in a fantasy world. Interlude, Picnic. Everyone was energetic when Haruka-kun was around. But without him, the girl seemed a little lonely. We were all getting along well and had grown closer as friends, but we were all approaching our limits. Harkin-kun was the only person who spoiled us. He persevered all by himself, fought all his battles alone, and always rescued us when we needed it. His strength, his sweetness, we yearned for it. It was the same sort of loneliness that a child experiences when their parent who shelters and spoils them goes away. We were now separated from our families, so we transferred those feelings to Harkin-kun. He protected us and pampered us without expecting anything in return. Alone. He went to work even on his day off? Didn't he say the mining's was finished? He gave us all those stockings too. That means he was probably doing his side job earlier. I think he was I think he said he was going to mine more Mithril since he used it all upgrading all our equipment. Oh, that's splendid. I wanted my rope to get Mithril upgrades. I should ask him to make some adjustments in the meantime. It's a a little too constricting in the chest area, Vice Rep B said. Oh, wow. Your life really sounds nightmarish, Vice Rep A said, rolling her eyes. Harakakun had gone to install new traps in the pseudo dungeon. It was supposed to be a day off for him, too, but he worked through it anyway. Even when we tried to do something nice for him, he ended up taking care of us instead. He never slept anymore. Maybe he never would again. He blamed it on his titles. And while there were some truths to that, he had stopped sleeping a long time ago. I knew that tonight he'll grumble about how busy and tired he was the entire night while he worked. Whenever we were in low spirits, he would always show up, flash a smile, and say something like, New merch available! Come to me, my precious money! And brighten our day. When did he stop sleeping? When did he stop sleeping? I wondered. Perhaps after he killed Tanaka-kun? Or possibly when those two villages were destroyed? He always smiled when he saw us that we were happy. He looked like he had so much fun fooling around with Kakasaki-kun, Oda-kun, and their friends. Simon and Angelica could always be found by his sides. Hopefully, time would heal him. But the more time that passed, the more he wanted to protect. Now he was trying to protect the whole duchy. Haruka-kun had spent his childhood losing family members one after another. Now he couldn't endure anyone else having to die. That's why he felt so wounded when someone was unhappy. Why he never tried to make friends. He seemed happy enough to be surrounded by us, but it meant that he worked even harder to make us smile. Haruka couldn't have killed someone because he couldn't bear to see anyone else die. He probably regrets using his old coping mechanism from back when his family passed away. He kept torturing himself while pretending that he didn't feel anything, doing everything he could to save others. It was good that Haruka couldn't have found something he wanted to protect, but there was nothing he wouldn't do to protect the things he cared about. He wouldn't hesitate a moment to throw his life away, even if time was something that could heal his emotional wounds. We didn't have enough of it. There was way too many dangers in this world. Haruka couldn't spoil us like we were his family. He projected his lost relative onto us and desperately tried to protect us. The only solution was for us to become strong enough to be able to protect him. But there was never enough time. Too much had happened in the last two months. Once he returned, I knew how it would go. He served us dinner, pretending like it was a pain, and cheer us up. To ensure that we didn't thank him, he'll make himself look like a villain, gloating about how much he ripped us off. He did everything he could to prevent us from thanking him. He hated to receive gratitude, so much that he forbade himself from accepting it. He still couldn't forgive himself for his own helplessness. Perhaps that's how he survived. He clawed his way to victory, overcoming his terrible stats and skills, and did whatever it took to avoid feeling helpless. If Haruka kun lost his life, we would fall apart. I would break. When he gets back, we must pass a resolution for more candy! Hmm, I wonder what's for dinner. Ooh, what's his next product going to be? Let's have Angelica find out for us. Why is he fine with making stockings but not underwear? We had to be able to protect him. 
That's why we needed to be stronger. We had to show him that we could. He had saved our lives over and over, despite being the weakest person in our class. That's why. That's why. Unfortunately, he's prioritizing our equipment for the time being, I said. He needs to focus on Mithril upgrades. Got it? Aw, so lame. Let's revolt! Slowly but surely, everyone was adjusting to the new normal. We hadn't given up. We were beginning to find our resolve, little by little, because Haruka can work so hard on our behalf. Soon, we would be able to survive on our own in this world, able to protect Haruka-kun. Where is he? Well, he did go all the way to Nalagi. He is fast, though. I didn't like how spoiled rotten we had become. However, some of the girls' personality has changed. They used to be so cool and reserved, but now they were bratty. Cute clothes and tasty sweets were simply too tantalizing. They could melt even the iciest hearts. <sighs> I'm back. Maybe? Ah, uh, let's eat. I bought some pumpkins on my way back. So it's a pumpkin harvest festival! A Halloween party! Trick or trident! Welcome back! We said in unison. What do you plan to do with your pumpkins? Why was our only choice between getting tricked and getting stabbed with a trident? Wait, why was he holding a trident? That would just be combat, wouldn't it? And playing girls with sweets while asking if you can trick them should get him reported to the authorities. Nothing he said made any sense, as usual. Especially not his jokes. If they could even be called that. First of all, who says maybe after I'm back? Why is he more confused about whether he's back than about holding a trident? He should have ended his last sentence with a question mark, not an exclamation point. Well, he was definitely back. Haruka couldn't run around in a panic as the girls teased him, causing a scene. Ah, he was the same as always. After our picnic, we walked to the inn together, frolicking and chattering and bouncing. The pumpkin festival began. He confessed that he bartered some mushrooms to acquire the pumpkins, which was really just his way of admitting that he was flat broke. He was supposed to pay rent with that money I gave him. I'm gonna lecture him later. Oh, pumpkin pie! Whoa! A pumpkin festival! Simmered pumpkin and simmered pumpkin! He even made pumpkin soup! It's pumpkin everything! Every face lit up with a smile. We had a wonderful time shopping together. But at one point, Vice Rep C hummed a particular song to herself as she pursued racks of clothing. It was a melancholic song about missing loved ones from far away. We recognized the tune almost immediately, a reminder of our old lives. We tried to maintain smiles, even as some wept soundlessly. Angelica probably told him about it, and he decided to put on Pumpkin Festival to cheer us up. Pumpkins were Vice Rep C's favorite food, after all. Harakukun pretended that the time it was purely coincidental. He called out, 500 Ela Slice! I need that cash money! Angelica had to have told him something, and he sought out a village that sold pumpkins. He probably wouldn't have said any thanks. He insisted on masquerading as a conniving profiteer, but I saw right through his ruse. He was always the culprit responsible. That's right, fresh simmered pumpkin! It's not a close friend of pumpkin pie, but I've got that too! I baked the pies myself, so I'm not a villain! I don't know anything about their complex pumpkin dish rivalry! I'm just an innocent chef! I deny all accusation. Okay? We couldn't resolve the relationship issue between the simmered pumpkin and the pumpkin pie, but everything tasted delicious on its own. The pumpkin chips were a huge hit, and we served on all the pumpkin soup and pumpkin cake too. Haruka couldn't complain that without cheese, cream, mirin, and vinegar, he couldn't make anything properly. Regardless, everything tasted amazing to me. Vice Repsi ate her simmered pumpkin with tears streaming down her face. Day 54, Morning I don't want to conduct my scientific experiments on animals, so I want to use monsters. But there aren't any. The white loser in. I woke up refreshed and prepared for an invigorating lecture. <sighs> Round 5 was likely too much for her. It was either that or their morning rematch. Then I got another lecture from the girls in the dining hall. Yep, they found out that I couldn't afford to pay my rent last night. They went so far to confiscate my next payment from the Adventurers Guild. I'd only miss a rent payment twice, yet they were acting like tyrants. At this rate, you can kiss your shopping sprees goodbye. Well, the class went ahead and paid my bills with it, so I shouldn't complain about her money management. However, delicious food was just as important. They ate a lot. If they ate any more pumpkin, they would have become as round as pumpkins. But I wouldn't dare say that out loud. I definitely wasn't thinking about anything. And I especially wasn't looking at everyone's stomachs. Nope. Time to escape. I mean, I'm just heading out to the dungeon. Yeah, I, I swear that was my plan all along. The class rep, the Minister of Finance, called at me whenever I overshot my budget for ingredients and crafting materials. Don't get mad at me for looking at anyone's tummy. I didn't do it. 
So, I went a little over budget, but profits and revenues are up. Point being, only a despot will criticize me for putting on a festival. Boing, boing! She probably found out that I bought up all the surplus pumpkins from that village. I was at that age where... I was at that age where I could be sorely tempted by wholesale bargains. Those pumpkins won't spoil if I keep them in my item bag. The tiny animal ordered extra pumpkin chips too. Hmm, but those are pretty calorie dense, aren't they? Wiggle wiggle? Well, we would all be bankrupt if the classroom hadn't been managing our finances. The girls went shopping far too often. How were they any different from me? Did the class rep realize that I've been ripping the girls off with what I charge for prismatic clothing? She must have spotted some suspicious numbers when she did her bookkeeping and accounting. I need to lower the price. It wasn't my fault. I had to factor in the cost of labor. The person actually manufacturing the goods deserved a high salary, didn't they? Seemed logical to me. No matter how grossly I overcharged, I still couldn't hold on to any damn eel. Raw material didn't come free, after all. Oh, I know what I'll do. I can just collect some rainy day funds on the armory. I will lean on the old man if I had to. Even if that meant holding him upside down and shaking him until the coins fell out of his pockets. At least the classroom hadn't discovered the money I made running a landscaping business with a demon size. She also didn't know that the pseudo dungeon provided some secret cash flows too. Ugh. So, I'm pretty sure that my plan for today is to go deal with the dungeon that the sports girls escaped from on the 48th floor. Apparently, they ran into monsters that wouldn't die no matter how much they were attacked. Seemed like the sports girls were also meatheads. Nod, nod. Chego, chego. Anyway, I wanted to run some experiments today. I don't like void magic, but I had no idea how to use it. In accordance with the scientific method, I would conduct a technically complex experiment where I entangled my wooden staff question mark with void and bludgeoning monsters with it. Since it and teleport were different skills, it would logically produce different effects. Imbuing myself with void sounded like a terrible idea. It would be safer to imbue my staff. Experimenting on animals was cruel, so I would experiment on monsters instead. Conducting trials was essential. I had learned my lesson about trying things without practice first after I nearly caused a nuclear meltdown. I ran through a few dungeon floors smashing baddies, but I couldn't see any difference in my attacks. I couldn't tell whether I was using entanglement properly or if it simply had no effect. This is an important experiment, okay? Nod, nod, jiggle, jiggle. That was the correct response. But would they still annihilate all the monsters before I could run into a single trial? Why did I feel like we spoke mutually unintelligible languages? They certainly understood me clearly if I mentioned food or snacks. Besides, Miss Summerrib had no problem speaking, so she definitely ignored me on purpose. This was her revenge on me for the morning or perhaps for last night. Could this actually be retribution for that time I saw her getting out of the bath? Desperate to collect data, I charged pell-mell at the monsters. I wouldn't even get a single blow if I didn't hurry. I didn't want to accidentally activate Dimension Blade, so I had to whack carefully. I hadn't felt like this since I first arrived in this world. Don't forget where you came from, as they say, I thought. I even screamed, Aah! like some sort of amateur. I'd much rather forget those early days. Zoinks! I thought I saw a g -g ghost, but it was already dead. It wasn't a ghost at all. You just killed the monster too quick for me to see what it was! Boing, boing. We reached the middle floor without taking any breaks. Slimy seemed more powerful now. Or maybe he was using a different fighting style? Did he look a little thinner? Hmm. I had never seen Miss Amaret fight seriously, so I didn't have any idea how powerful she truly was. That was to be expected, but now I didn't understand Slimy's capabilities either. It wasn't merely that Slimy bounced into action with erratic movements and unpredictable fighting style. I thought he was evolving. I couldn't even begin to fathom how powerful Slimy might be. He was an emperor tier monster without a doubt. I'm not gathering enough data because of you! You won't let me hit any monster myself! It seemed like Miss Amaret and Slimy were competing to see who could fight better. They were both trying way too hard. We arrived to the 48th floor. From here on out, we were trespassing unknown territory. The real mid-stage. This was a place for real battle, not experiments. Or not. With a flash of silver, a supernatural phenomenon slaughtered all the monsters as soon as I saw them. Good work. But what about me? I shifted in a cool battle stance, but all the monsters are gone. You killed all of them. What am I supposed to do with my pose? It's not cool at all anymore. Jiggle, jiggle. Shrug, shrug. <sighs> These two had no sympathy for me. They simply didn't have the aesthetic sensibility of edgy 12-year-old tryhards. The pointlessness of a pose was what made it cool. Now the, the now-defeated monsters were a gluttony race. In their last moments, they met something even hungrier than them. Slimy wolfed them down. Did they taste any good? Well, 
You two are really energetic today, aren't you? What was going on? Were they worried about me? After the battle with the sand giant, I suffered from a spate of dizziness, vertigo, and noseblades, and a desire to make hamburger steaks. Is that why they're trying so hard? They didn't need to worry. I wasn't planning on making hamburger steaks today. Oh, speaking of which, what should I make for dinner tonight? I thought. I wanted to check if eggs were back in stock when I returned to town. I had found a dual robe, intelligence plus 50%, dual cast, on the 44th floor and an anklet of magic defense, magic resistance bonus, medium, on this floor. Hmm, not bad at all. When I saw the dual robe, I felt like I hit the jackpot. The 50% buff was awesome in itself, but not as awesome as dual cast. It likely worked similarly to my old parallel magic technique. A skill that doubled any spellcast was ideal for spellcasters. It would increase MP costs, but being able to cast a spell at two different targets simultaneously or double the strength of any spell I cast was worth it. I had a sudden premonition. Last night, I upgraded Vice Red B's robe with Mithril. She said it was too tight in the bust, so I adjusted the fit. I had to make new measurements. It was pretty hard, if you know what I mean. <sighs> After all, there was so much swaying and jiggling, I couldn't focus. I was criticized harshly afterwards. Uh... Seriously, what timing? The dual robe almost certainly hemorrhaged a ridiculous amount of MP. Although parallel casting was a devastating rapid-fire technique, it was not an efficient use of MP. Bombarding enemies with spells caused a tremendous amount, and for unknown reasons, Vice Red B had more MP than any of my classmates. Though I had never seen her cast a single spell before, she wasn't that with the most MP. Did she store all that extra MP in her chest? That's why she has such a colossal... talent? <coughs> uh, phew! Nothing was as relaxing as the glare Miss Armor Rip gave me. Should I give this rope to Vice Rip B? Nod, nod, jiggle, jiggle. Also, in a recurring nightmare for her, Miss Armor Rip was the recipient for another reckless attack in the dead of night. Although she did get her thorough revenge this morning, the anklet of magic defense was a decent item, more or less. But that wasn't what interested me. The concept itself was spectacular. Look, you can equip gear on your ankles. I haven't even considered this possibility. Wiggle, wiggle? I've never seen anyone wear anklets in this world, but now I unearthed this wonderful treasure. The discovery was unprecedented, and it wasn't just because of my predictions. It had, me it had mediocre stats, though. Oh well, I would just have to make my own. Not because I had a fetish, there was just an extra accessory slot. I could hardly contain my desires to take Miss Amara's clothes off and have her wear nothing but an anklet. And that would just be the beginning. She was doing the dagger thing at me again. Well, more places... Well, more places to wear equipment will benefit all of us, right? This proves that girls have two more equipment slots that we haven't even considered. Wiggle wiggle? I prefer when girls wear an anklet only on one leg, but both legs could be equipped. That was huge if true. I have to mass produce these right away. It is for the safety of my classmates, I swear. It will make them all more effective in combat, but most importantly, it will make Miss Summer even more effective in bed. As a teenage boy, I swear that I'll- Oh! Oh! Ow! Oh, oh, damn! Ow! Oh. Boing, boing! Well, she was mad at me again. I don't want the nerds and meatheads finding out these exist, though. Maybe I could make a special model just for them that comes attached to an iron ball and chain. That would look great on them. Since those nerds like striped clothes so much, I can make striped uniforms for them to go with their shackles. I basked in the harsh radiance of her glare. My words dissipated and my soul was at ease. We reached the 49th floor. Since I was only level 21, this was seriously dangerous territory. And when my companions least expected it, I would charge in and- Oh, come on, Slimey! Wait for me! You started the race early! Didn't I just tell you that we had to take this floor slowly? You're using high-speed movement techniques! Jiggle, jiggle, jiggle! Why did my thralls ignore everything I said? Even my demon size ignored me. I only had them to clear the forest, but they somehow kept gaining levels. They were definitely hunting monsters for experience. Why won't any of you listen to me? Do you think I want to talk to myself? You only pay attention to me when I announce dinner! Boing boing! I used magic entanglement and charged in only to find that a level 49 dark panther had literally vanished in the darkness. Did they possess a skill that allowed them to do that? But they vanished in a much more permanent sense. I maintained my badass action pose, hoping that there was just one survivor for me to fight. But they were gone. Why do panthers with the ability to hide in the shadows get sliced apart and eaten so easily? This is the second floor in a row where I did nothing but strike a cool pose, you know? This scent is pretty hard to maintain. My- Oh! 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 oh, 
Oh, my leg is cranking up. Oh, oh, oh damn it. Ah. Wiggle, wiggle. Miss Summer up and slimy massaged the knots of my leg. And we proceeded to the 50th floor. <sighs> I wanted to return the favor, but it's hard to massage someone in full plate. Although, maybe I could use void magic to do it. Ah, oh, Eureka! I'm a natural born genius. I have to practice this technique later tonight. I vowed to show Miss Omar about the wondrous power of the void. Ugh, she's mad again. Something inside me wavered. We were about to face a boss battle, and I knew it was going to be a tough battle. I knew it. Stay on guard. We're about to encounter a boss monster. I'm not kidding or trying to trick you this time. Be on guard. Be so on guard that you can't even believe how on guard you are. Got it? Be prepared for anything, including the things you didn't know of, you know? As the leader of the team, I had a duty and responsibility to command my followers. Even if they ignored everything I had ever said and ditched me. So take it slow. Hey, hey, I, I'm still talking. Why are you leaving? I have something important to tell you. Just because you donned your helmet doesn't mean you can ignore me. Are you listening to me? Pay attention to me! They weren't wait All right, time to go. They weren't waiting for me anyway. Day 54, late morning. The monsters went extinct before I could even take a picture. A dungeon, 50th floor. Ugh, I can't break this torture any longer. This is hopeless. These thoughts raced through my mind as I looked at the horse. The horse belonged to a mid-boss, a level 50 Dulahan. The headless knight had been sliced into pieces, and those pieces being diced even smaller pieces. It dropped its severed head, which slimy promptly ate. Jiggle, jiggle. Meanwhile, the horse and I stared at each other. Both distraught at the situation, but for very different reasons. Damn it! Slimy just ate the horse! I thought you let me at least fight a damn horse! Greed and gluttony, you merciless pair! Why can't you just give me a break? Slimy ate the horse the moment I posed again! You did that on purpose, didn't you? Boing, boing, boing! I was definitely being bullied, but if we went to an anti-bullying resource center, Slimy would just eat the counselors. I was certain that they would bully people concerned with preventing bullying. Well, good work. Ugh, I'm tired. Specifically tired of not getting to do anything but complain about how tired I am. So I might as well complain in the form of a song. Dungeon Karaoke is about to begin. I will sing a passionate ballad about certain people kill stealing and the universe conspiring to ruin my sex appeal, baby. Maybe not. Do -re -mi, baby. Uh, I try to make it sound a bit operatic. Slimy brought the spell stone and loot over to me. Brought might be a too nice of a word. Slimy wobbled over and horked over the treasures. Mmm, leftovers? Was Slimy a picky eater? Well, I was glad that he didn't eat them. Oh, and it went without saying that they paid no attention to my song. The Dulahan had dropped some armor, but Miss Summerbrit wasn't interested. Apparently, she wasn't impressed by the equipment of the 50th floor, as if it was beneath her. Didn't she used to be a Dulahan? She worked three different jobs at the same time, so it seems she felt no attachment to being a Dulahan. She also felt no mercy for me, the way she pretended not to have heard my singing. I'm going to cry! This dungeon seems deeper, I think. Well, the deeper we go, the better treasure, but also the longer this will take, you know? Wiggle, wiggle. I couldn't find a single good piece of real estate anywhere. I had to pay my rent yesterday, and the guild payment was confiscated. I got all my money from the general store at least, but... It didn't amount to much. The road to wealth was long and difficult. Jiggle jiggle. While Slimy offered me some timely life advice, we advanced to the next floor. Miss Amara continued to ignore me. Was she upset about something? Why? Well, there were plenty of reasons to be upset with me. So much so that determining the specific reason was like trying to find a grain of sand in the desert. If I had to guess, she was probably still a bit mortified by the fishnet body stockings. <sighs> I'm not fondly recalling anything. Please put your sword down. Wait, we're in a dungeon. Keep your sword. Just don't stab me, okay? This is why teleport keeps leveling up so fast. Teleportation had become my most reliable method of evading attacks. I would have appreciated some advanced warning before she tried to skewer me. Although, I wouldn't be particularly happy if she said, I'm going to stab you right before stabbing me. Regardless, I was still completely innocent of all thought crimes. 
The memories were just seared into my mind. I wasn't trying to remember it. The memory just happened. I'm innocent, I tell you. Jupiter Eye was an incredible skill. It could even store images. It seemed that a rematch after five rounds of fishnet action was too much for her, but my actions were fully justified. After the fifth round, I had nothing to do besides my side gig for the rest of the night, but I could see her naked back and it had tried to tempt me to come back to bed. I stayed strong, wrestling with my desire the entire night. Until the duvet slipped, and I saw the curves of her butt wrapped in fishnet. I'm just a teen boy! Don't ask me to do the impossible! At that point, I reconciled with my worldly desires, and we reached a mutual understanding, and charged in together. The sight was simply too wonderful. Her voluptuous curves, the fishnets tight enough to accentuate the soft roundness of her- OW! Oh! oh! Can you give me a warning at least? I was trying to concentrate! Oh, that was close. Her sword almost stabbed me. I'll just stab her back tonight. So went our cycle of lust and revenge, which played out in full every night. I'm telling you, I'm not remembering anything. I was just watching a video replay. Ouch! She knocked me around like a ragdoll. As self-conscious as she was, Miss Summer was certainly enthusiastic about the idea last night. If I said that out loud, she probably would cut me in half. I could already sense her taking aim at my back. <laughs> the most dangerous part of dungeon calling was your allies! Using area analyze and map, we made easy progress through the dungeon. Listening to the conversation at the end made getting lost in a dungeon sound kind of fun though. They talked about running into dead ends or getting confused by a dungeon with forking paths. Now that I thought about it, Slimey and Miss Amara never got lost either. They always moved as if they had a map as well. I wouldn't be surprised if they had the skill. The demon size also navigated the forest like they knew exact location of my cave. Did my map skill get shared with all of them? I was still unsure how I got the sword master skill. I didn't know the first thing about sword fighting. Yet, I was apparently a sword master. Technically, I slice through things all the time, but I'm not using a sword. It's a stick. A certain silver white servant of mine has the sword goddess skill and the true blade title. Did some of her skills flow into me? I had assumed that servitude only shared experience points between us, but if my servants could use map skill, that meant information was shared too. Hmm, did that apply to all skills? Huh? Wiggle, wiggle. I had no way to verify my theory. Reflecting on it, I noticed that the Mean Girls were the first to learn presence detection and enemy tracking. However, everyone learned vibration magic at the same time. The girls must have had a lot of knots in their shoulders. Their necks didn't seem stiff, but they leveled their vibration at an absurdly quick rate. Hmm, why was that? Jiggle jiggle! Every time I asked them, they just yelled at me. There were too many things I didn't understand and not trying to figure those things out always caused me trouble. For example, my skills had a history of hiding, lying to me, then appearing in my skills list unannounced. My skills wouldn't appear unless I began to suspect, investigate, and solve their mysteries. Could there be a rule in this fantasy world such as you have to search for and uncover your own skills? Boing boing? However... However, all my skills were suspicious. I didn't have a single respectable upstanding skill to my name. The predecessor of body manipulation was a skill called calisthenics. That stupid skill name tricked me into doing radio program exercises routines every damn morning. Still, it was good exercise. Then there was general health. Still stuck at level 9. That one was super suspect. I had fallen to the lowest level of the ultimate dungeon and fought countless times against vicious monsters. Though I technically didn't actually fight. Regardless, I stayed healthy the entire time, and even when I went up against monsters that inflicted high-level status ailments, I remained hell and hearty. Even when What's-His-Face used insta-kill attacks with 100% success rate, I survived with no ill effects. Indeed, I was the only person to never get poisoned so far. Well, I was super weak, so if any of those attacks landed, I would have died. Still, I walked right through the poisonous dust of the level 97 Venom Moth, and the secretions of the level 96 venom crawlers with no ill effect. Wasn't I a little too healthy? Did all my calisthenics really help that much? How could exercise make me immune to poison? Uh, I'm bored! All my skills were so suspicious that I wonder if this was a plot by Agatha Christie. Or perhaps even Ellery Queen. That geezer who claimed he was the god There's something about how you need to understand the skill to fully master it. I had to understand the meaning and the path of a skill. And only then would I know the souls that became the mysterious skills. 
I didn't want to get to know the source of my skills. I was too busy falling down holes and averting nuclear disasters. I didn't have time for meaning. Uh, when did I ever get to fight any monsters in dungeons? That's what you expect when you hear someone's going into a dungeon. When I get there, there are already spellstones. Something's wrong here. There was definitely something wrong with the dungeon crawling without the opportunity to fight monsters. A dungeon without pulse quickening battle is just a cave putting on airs. No matter how deeply lost on thoughts I become, I never get in any trouble. I just walk serenely through a pleasant and peaceful dungeon. Am I writing an advertisement? Who's selling dungeon properties? Why didn't anyone inform me? Am I banned from touring the properties? Is this my punishment for renovating without permission? I made it to the 55th floor without encountering a single monster. There was no boss on this floor either. In the ultimate dungeon, there was a boss every 5 floors starting from the 75th floor. I seem to recall that the boss floors were a lot easier to deal with. Hmm, maybe boss fights were some kind of bonus? This dungeon probably didn't have 100 floors. It didn't have the same atmosphere of dread as the ultimate dungeon. And it probably didn't have a cute girl on the lowest level either. The extra pair of fishnet sockets I prepared was for nothing. Ah, oh, come to think of it. You were a skeleton when we met. Hmm. I need to make sure any skeletons I encounter aren't hot girls before I kill them. Though, I don't think I can trust any skeleton that claims to be a cutie. They might be trying to trick me. It's easy to say that you were cute when you were alive, if you don't have flesh. I can't trust them even if they show me a picture. It could be photoshopped. Jiggle jiggle. I wouldn't let myself get fooled by a skeleton selfie. There were nothing but bones. Eh, anyway. The skeletons were already pulverized into bone meal before they even showed me a picture. It was wrong for me to think I could meet a monster in a dungeon. Such is a loner life in another world. Day 54. Late morning. Angry Slimy's a cutie, but Ms. Armor Rep got that booty. A dungeon. 59th floor. The dungeon was deeper than I expected. I wanted to invite Slimy over to my cave after we finished lunch, but it looked like the dungeon expedition was going to take too long for that. When I was ever going to get an opportunity to go back to my cave home? I'm keeping it secret for now, but I've developed a soap that can be used for a bubble bath in a hot tub. I spent some moments imagining a certain curvaceous figure in smooth skins veiled by bubbles. Oh shit! I felt the bloodthirsty aura nearby, but there's no monsters around! My classmates could handle these floors. The monsters are strong, but not too strong. And they tend to be direct attackers. Did I make a mistake? Maybe Slimy and the Sand Giant were unique encounters. Nod, nod, jiggle, jiggle. This dungeon seemed to be on the easy side. Ms. Amarip and Slimy soundlessly agreed. Why was Ms. Amarip sounding more and more like Slimy? They were practically the same character at this point. What if she started to jiggle? Well, she already does that every night. Though, it was more spectacular than any mere jiggle can describe. Ms. Amarip raised her sword toward me, so I rushed ahead. She was probably just preparing to fight monsters, even though her sword was pointing right at my neck. Still, what a waste of experience, I sighed. The vanishing and reappearing Dulahan was dangerous, but the girls could have handled it. The Dark Panthers, on the other hand, would have been way more trouble. That is, unless someone casted light magic to erase the shadows. That they were just big cats. Maybe I was being overprotective? Slimy was an unusual specimen, and the Sand Giant used the power of the treasure of the Monster Core. Three parties working together could have easily reached the 60th floor. But the monsters from the 50th floor onward were like another difficulty tier high. They needed to fight trash mobs to grind for experience points. Even the slightest risk of danger was off the table. If there was even the possibility of death, they had to escape to the end and shut themselves in their rooms. That was the best response. Speaking of the best response, I wouldn't be surprised if I got sex moves as a skill. Though, she would scold me if that skill got shared. Oh, look. Jiggle jiggle? The treasure chests in hidden rooms often had great treasures, but they didn't restock on separate visits. At the least, it probably took a while for treasures to repopulate. Dungeons that were more than 50 floors deep were likely to overflow with monsters. If the Dark Panthers on floor 49 got out of the dungeon at night, it would be incredibly dangerous to fight them. <sighs> well, I still haven't gotten to fight, but at least I've got energy. But if I have too much of that tonight, I'm gonna get beat up. This world is so unfair. I found a cloak on the 57th floor and inspected it. The mantle of the void, evasion, medium, physical and magic absorption, storage. I really wanted to keep it. It was able to store items and it was an inky black with a deep crimson lining. Maybe it was reversible. It looked cool and Ms. Omarette could totally pull it off. 
so I think she wanted it. Oh, that explained why she was sulking. She hadn't plundered any treasure in a while. Naturally, she was so upset that she kept trying to stab me. I knew it wasn't my fault. I decided that I would offer the mantle to her tonight. Yeah, this cloak would look great on you. Plus, it has pockets. It's also reversible, so you get double the fashion. The fabric feels so luxurious and expensive, too. Hold on. I felt the fabric of the cloak I was wearing and realized that it was made from the cheapest possible sackcloth. Is this a classicist fantasy world? I suppose that it was a feudal society with aristocrats and serfs, after all. Mizoma Rep encouraged me to keep the equipment, but if I fused the mantle into my cloak, it would still look like a cheap black cloak. What a waste of luxury materials that would have been. I begrudgingly had to admit that the cheap cloak suited me better. I ponder why that could be. What was the world trying to say about me? Hmm. Is this world trying to tell me something? Well, that's how it was back in the old world, but am I getting this by my cloak? Miss Summerick dramatically switched her new cloak and stored all her extra swords in it. And now she was showing it off in front of Slimy. <laughs> how childish. I could take your used storage cloak, the one with item storage, evasion, magic defense, slash endurance, stab endurance, and bludgeoning resistance, but I think we're better off auctioning it off to my classmates. There was never enough equipment to go around for 30 people. Too many items would typically become a burden, but that was never a problem for me because I had to fuse extra equipment into my basic gear. Besides, I had a decent evasion bonus for my fairy ring. Just today, I evaded 17 attempts on my life. Of course, none of those attacks came from monsters. Just living a normal life is the most dangerous path for me, isn't it? Jiggle jiggle. There was no faster and deadlier attack in this world than one caused by embarrassment. That wasn't a joke. We arrived on the 60th floor, but it still wasn't the final one. Huh. This dungeon sure is deep. A sudden bolt of lightning. The world flashed white. I couldn't move out of the way in time, even with future sight, so I swung my staff instead. When we entered the room, an enormous muscular bull wreathed in sparks charged at us. It had a long, curving horns and a thick red-black hide. As it stampeded, lightning crackled from its horns. Miss Armorep lopped off its feet, Slimy stopped it in its tracks, and I brained it with a stick until it died. Whew, I saw the trajectory of the attack, and my staff can absorb magic attacks, so all I needed to do was attack, you know? Most problems in this world can be solved by hitting them with a stick over and over and over and over again, until they're not a problem anymore. Just don't stop whacking. It's that simple, really. Oh, the level 60 Thunderbolt bull isn't moving anymore. Ah, <sighs> the poor thing is moving so miserably as it gets eaten. Uh, yikes. Jiggle, jiggle. Miss Armour liked her brand new mantle. You just wanted a new cloak so that you could flap it behind you, didn't you? You're just showboating now. Wiggle, wiggle. Miss Armour flourished her new cloak to make herself look impressive. She even struck a pose. That was a tough cow, but it vanished with a moo into Slimy's maw. Slimy looked like he enjoyed the taste. Fine with me. Saves me on food expenses. Then Slimy regurgitated the spells as an item drop. Where does a bull keep its loot anyway? Wiggle wiggle? It was a precious gem. Thunder beast stone. Shock. Thunderbolt. Large. Magic absorption. Is this a kidney stone? Was the bull sick or something? It looked like a legendary god beast, but it was just trying to pass a kidney stone? Ugh, get well soon, bull. It was too late for that, unfortunately. There was no getting better after getting eaten. Jiggle, jiggle! Huh? You want it? Do you know where it has been? It's pretty dirty. I don't want you to get sick. Well, I don't think slimes get sick. Hmm, so go ahead. Can you really still eat? Wiggle, wiggle. Since the slime's body was completely amorphous, I didn't have to worry about the stone getting stuck and giving him indigestion. Slimey seemed healthy enough. So I could give him the stone, but would a thunder beast stone turn Slimy into a beast? A slime beast? I thought, there's no way I'll bring one of those back to the inn. There were too many things I didn't know. At least, Slimy swallowed the stone with a look of satisfaction. Back when we met, your body was yellow and covered in lightning. So maybe this will come in handy? It was magic absorption, so maybe that can replace some of your food. Still, Slimy always went for delicious food. So maybe he treated stones and food differently? He could freely control his size, growing larger or smaller. The girls always look at Slimy with a hint of jealousy. Mostly because of how much he could eat. <sighs> I definitely would not say that where they could hear me. I can't think of no act more terrifying. Oh, <sighs> This dungeon is full of awesome finds. I'm gonna be rich. Am I going to return to my big shot lifestyle? It's all gonna sell. I'm definitely going to run another auction. 
Jiggle, jiggle. The loot was good, and the secret room's treasure chest had gems. I would have renovated the first floor and lived here until it ripened to a full hundred floors if the first floor didn't have such an awkward layout. On the 63rd floor, I found the morning start of altered weight. Weight alteration. Power plus 30%. Attack bonus. I finally found a new type of weapon. A spiked mace. My classmates had a lot of swords, but no morning star. Plus, a frequent high bidder, the shield girl, would probably want it. I could expect a big return off this one. <laughs> Did I just hit the jackpot? I'm going to be rich. I'll give out some suits when I get back. The noble is obliged of a wealthy man. Wiggle wiggle. Soon, I could make pudding. The problem was the egg supply. I needed to make some major investments in poultry. But first, the lovely Miss Pudding. No more pudding off pudding. Besides, I wanted Miss Armorba to have some jiggling pudding. And then we could jiggle all night long. Whoa, 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 wait, 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 no, not the morning star. It's that easy to dodge. You set it to maximum weight too? You hit the ground once and now it cracks are spreading. It looks like a spider web. I'll, I'll look just like that if you hit me. <clears throat> Lecture omitted. In short, she was annoyed with me. But <sighs> I was inspired. Spider webs. Stockings and tights with spider web patterns. Maybe... I could make a spiderweb pattern fishnet body sock and then- Oof! Oh. No, I asked you not to use the morning star! It's hard to dodge, okay? I'm sorry! She was seriously pissed again. How did she know what I was thinking? Oh no, I thought. Were my thoughts being shared? Everything I fantasized about? No wonder she was pissed. Those were filthy. From now on, I vowed to never again think of a dirty thought. My summer red face was bright red. Sharing 18 plus content with an eternal servant 17 year old would get me in trouble. Not that I seriously plan on stopping. <laughs> no way. Day 54, afternoon. We were headed there anyway, so even though I'm fleeing there, just pretend I'm heading there. A dungeon. 68th floor. After all that suffering, I wish I could have at least gotten a smooch when I left for work. The wounds in my heart didn't fade, but at least I could poke Slimey and watch him quiver. I really wanted to make Miss Amaret quiver, but her murderous glare fled the entire floor whenever I thought like that. Well, that's interesting, I guess. Jiggle jiggle. The deeper we went, the more amazing things were supposed to get, so I had big hopes. Uh, my expectations are too high. I've never been to Tokyo Dome, so I don't know how many Tokyo Domes worth of an anticipation I felt. But it has to be more amazing than one Tokyo Dome, right? Suffice it to say, my expectations are as big as a Tokyo Dome. Tokyo Dome is big, right? Like I said, I've never been! Jiggle jiggle. I couldn't help but complain right now. On the 68th floor, we faced some formidable foes. Uh, no. Perhaps the archetype of formidable foes, level 68 doppelgangers. They look just like Miss Homerep, so they had the same strengths as her, which meant they were more formidable than anything I had ever faced. Multiple Miss Homerep doppelgangers should be totally invincible, right? We'll never win! What? She just shredded them like they were confetti? I guess the mass production units really don't compare to the OG Miss Amarep, you know? I couldn't lie, seeing all those doppelgangers made me excited in more ways than one. At the same time, Slimer was enjoying an afternoon snack. Oh, those poor doppelgangers. They tried their best with mimes, you know? But they were trying and failing to duplicate Slimy's amorphous form, only to get devoured. Though they tried to capture the essence of Slimy, they only became Slimy's munchies. They didn't even get their chance. Were they tasty at least? Meanwhile, I was surrounded. The doppelgangers chanted, Screw you, screw you, screw you, screw you, screw you, screw you, screw you. <laughs> they were supposed to look exactly like me, but for some reason, they became monsters with fiendish demon eyes that reflected the very depths of hell itself. But <laughs> that's not what I look like. If a guy like that was walking around the street... He'll make the pedestrians freeze with a glance. That's ridiculous. My eyes are nothing like that. This is just mean. No human's eyes are like that, right? That's an exaggeration, right? <laughs> I would never be able to make friends with eyes like those. Not like I have any friends. Huh? But, but, that's because I'm a loner. Okay? Wait, wait. No, this can't be. No, this can't be. Please say it's so. I smashed them up. 
For some reason, someone came over and started petting me on the back. Even Slimy came over, ready to console me. Did they prepare for this? All right, I'll accept it. Ah, that was a real nightmare. But the treasure chest had the S-Tuck of corrosion. Power, speed, dexterity, plus 30%. Equipment, corrosion. An item with 30% boost was excellent. But equipment corrosion seemed like a pretty dubious ability. Uh, most monsters are the nudist girl's comrades in arms. So they tend to wear nothing, right? Although the nudist girl does wear equipment. She just finds excuses to take it all off. I don't get it either. Wiggle wiggle. The fact that it was in a stock was even more baffling. It was a thin blade designed for stabbing. An anti-personnel weapon that could pierce armor but couldn't be used to block or cut. Speaking of anti-personnel, where are the nerds? They were always asking to get stabbed, you know? We worked so hard to get this sword. Let's not waste the opportunity, right? Jiggle jiggle. If the effect was close disintegration, I would have been all in. But the only times I fought other people, they were all ugly middle-aged men. It would suck if I accidentally used close disintegration on a bunch of geezers. Mama would have been destroyed by that sight. Fighting naked old dudes? Why was the fantasy world swarming with so many old guys? What if I had been teleported to a fantasy world where everyone was a hairy old man? I wouldn't even bother saving anyone from monsters. That could destroy everything for all I cared. That would be totally fine with me. Actually, maybe I should do it myself. <sighs> I can't stand this. What was with those vicious, hideous, horrible, sinister eyes? No one has eyes like that. If so, they need an eye patch. One for each eye, or better yet, a blindfold. Dungeons were supposed to be physically dangerous. But the only damage I took was to my mind, my feelings, and my reputation. Uh, blindfold. Blindfolded in the bedroom. Hmm. Now that's an idea. Nope, no, nope, not saying anything. So don't stab me. The morning star on your right hand and the stock on your left? I can't dodge that. I literally can't. So please, don't. I'm being serious. Please don't. I tried to apologize. She had to accept that. Why was I so good at making mistakes? Because that's all I ever did. Mistakes, misunderstanding, mishaps, missteps. They were all my specialties, you know? As I dodged the attempts on my life, trying to blank out any images of blindfold play from my mind, we went down to the 69th floor. One could say I was actually running away, but we were going to go there anyway. It was our destination after all. I was just getting a head start. I couldn't stop though. There would be trouble if I did. The mental images weren't my fault. The fishnet body sucking that Ms. Umarit wore last night was too fresh in my mind. It was a danger to teen boys. Throwing a blindfold and I don't stand a chance. It was a too powerful combination. <clears throat> Extreme violence and convalence excised. I expected a stab, but she went for a full morning start to my face. Ah, oh, that hurt a lot. I went flying even though it barely grazed me. I nullified the attack with my left spear shield gauntlet too. Come to think of it, all the items I got from the ultimate dungeon were meant to deal with you! It made perfect sense. If I went through the dungeon the normal way, I would have gotten the spear shield gauntlet before I fought Miss Armor up on the final floor. Well, we'll be fighting again tonight, that was for sure. Every night was a new encounter. Bring it on! And no, I won't think of anything. Let's just keep walking, okay? I'm finally going to fight some monsters after all. Probably. Imbue an attack with one breath. I entangled my weapon with magic and slashed while stepping forward. My classic life or death attack was the only thing that actually worked. Level 70 monsters couldn't otherwise die in one hit. Sure, it was what I always used, but I literally didn't have another choice. Although, now that I was over level 20, I could use the weapon technique slash something. What was it called? Weapon techniques only activate when you say their name, so... If you don't know the name, you can't activate it, so, uh, I guess I can't do anything else, you know? I can use weapon techniques, but I actually can't? I just tend to forget names, which means I can't, I think, wiggle wiggle. In conclusion, no weapon techniques. When a weapon technique was activated, it moved the body in accordance with that skill. In other words, the users couldn't do any other movements while using them, and for a split second, they froze. The wind-up before powerful weapon techniques made me especially vulnerable, as any attack just then would instantly kill me. I couldn't use weapon techniques because I would die. They were absolutely not worth my time. So I stepped forward to dodge an attack. In the same moment, I brought down my staff, 
finishing the cut as my left foot touched the ground. That's all I could do. I had to kill my foes before they killed me. I advanced, swinging my staff with each step. A step followed by another, and every step ended a life, smoothing out unnecessary motions, grinding down the enemy, until every movement was precise. I had to keep going. If I stopped, I would have died. <sighs> I think we're done. Maybe? These level 69 monsters had scary high stats. They were in the 700s. Twice as fast, twice as strong. And twice as sturdy as me. That's insane. Wiggle, wiggle. All things being equal, monsters were more powerful than humans who had the same exact stats. Humans are weak on a basic level. Also, screw fighting flame cougars. There's no such thing as a fight between a human and a cougar. That's just called being attacked by a cougar. And we're not even on an even playing field here. They've got double the stats that I do. And they're on fire! I can't stand up to that. If they were burning with twice the soothing cuteness of regular cats. I'll like that though. Please? I'll put up some ads, maybe. Jiggle jiggle. Why did I suspect that no one would answer an ad for an emotional support monster? So far, the only therapeutic monster I found was Slimy. Every other monster I got to know was a rock, a scythe, or a mean girl. I don't think rocks or scythes would be particularly therapeutic. A high school boy contentedly stroking a scythe would look nothing short of deranged. While Miss Amaret wasn't a therapy monster, she did have some certain soothing qualities. Especially her- um, <coughs> Nope! I wasn't thinking anything! <coughs> now, let's us perceive! Wave stick. It needn't be said that the monsters on these lower floors were tough. The level 69 flame cougars have phenomenal speed and agility, and powerful sub of musculature that they use to attack with deadly fangs and claws. I was kind of jealous of their paws. <sighs> They're tough, but they were nothing compared to the person spinning the morning star at high speeds while glaring back at me. Is she swinging it more aggressively now? Could she be hoping for some- Nope, nope, nope! That's not what I mean. I'm not thinking anything. Nope, no, no, nope. That's not what I mean. I'm not thinking anything. Well, maybe a little bit. Maybe some lotion could be fun with the fishnet body stockings. Besides, I already made a blindfold about five minutes ago. Jiggle, jiggle! Understood, Slimy. I'll be right there. My deepest apologies. Now Slimy was mad at me. Where did my sweet emotional support monster go? Hmm, maybe I should try petting rocks next time. How soothing would a pet rock be? Hmm. Day 54. Morning. The general store lady's youth ended ages ago. Nope, I wasn't saying anything. Interlude. The white loser in. He got away. I knew he was spending money again. He couldn't hide anything so long as Angelica was around. More importantly, we were staying at the same inn, so of course we would find out he hadn't paid his rent. <sighs> How could he spend the money that I specifically set aside for the inn's fees? Well, you know... The other girls chorused. Yes, we all know. He found a village that had nothing but pumpkins. Every other crop had died from disease, so he bought every pumpkin they had. He even signed a future contract in a fantasy world with people he'd never had met before. In exchange, he gave them a massive amount of wheat, medical mushrooms, and foodstuffs. He also gave them every last eel he had on hand. Then, he agreed to buy pumpkin harvest for years in advance. He returned to the inn without a single eel to his name. I know why, but come on! He needs to take a rest. Now he just has more work. Well, that's kind of our fault for putting in more orders. He should work slower. He's pulling all-nighters every night. Right? How many villages has he done this with? Easily in the double digits, if I had to guess. I couldn't really be angry with him. After all, that village had nothing but pumpkins. It was as poor as the potato village from last time, but they also had no access to medicine. He did the exact same thing with the cabbage hamlet. None of these towns traded with each other, and as a result, they were all mired in poverty. So Haraka-kun bought from all of them and flooded their village with wealth. Was that he was bringing in ridiculous profits? The general store lady bought up a massive amount of goods from him, and now those goods were starting to circulate throughout the duchy. He just fritted away those profits immediately. The duke's concerns were well-founded. Haraka-kun was trying to make the whole frontier wealthy by himself, yet he remained poor. He owed the end money, even as he stayed here every night. I knew he didn't like that I managed his money for him, but it was necessary. How could someone earn millions of EO in a single day without being able to afford to pay his 10,000 EO in rent? He even got a great discount for the three of them together! The repeat offender was back to his old ways. That's why I confiscated his money time and again. 
He always worked so hard, but he never had cash. At first, I only collected 20% of everyone's spellstone profit to pay for room and board and other basic necessities. But Haraka couldn't advise her at B and C it went bankrupt on the very first day. So I started collecting 30% of their income. The next day, Haraka couldn't advise her at B went bankrupt again. So I kept 40%. You never guess what happened next. Of course, he spent all his money and I increased the tax rate another 10%. Ever since then, Haraka kun came back flat broke. I confiscated his money whenever I discovered another revenue stream that he didn't disclose. But he kept making the same mistake every single day. Is he seriously bribing the poster girl with candy instead of paying his bills? We split up food costs equally, but seconds cost extra, and desserts were sold separately. He also sold clothes, weapons, armors, and accessories. It was safe to say that most of the money that the girl saved went straight to Haruka-kun, especially given that any money spent at the general store found its way back to him eventually. You boys never offered to buy us desserts, Shimizaki-san pouted. <laughs> we can't even afford to buy all those desserts, replied Oda-kun. Like, girls have an extra stomach just for desserts. The guys were ripped off even worse. According to Saga Girl, Haruka-kun sold stripped knee socks to the nurse at 10 times the market rate. Seriously, Oda-kun? Haruka-kun raked in staggering amounts of money daily, even considering only the money made from the dungeons. He made more than all of us, at least several million eel every single day. Factor in the auctions, he probably made 10 times that amount, but he remained poor instead. Like clockwork, he went bankrupt before the day's end, and I paid his rent every morning with some of the money from the savings I confiscated. Apparently, he sometimes paid his rent by bartering. How was he able to pay for a room with buckets? No matter what, he spends any money he makes. He probably has other revenue streams that we don't even know about. Yeah, have you seen the armory? It's way bigger than it used to be. The once destitute frontier was growing. There was no logical way it could have changed its fortune so fast. Yet, it had. Taking a closer look at my account book, pretty much all of our money goes straight to Haruka-kun. Well, he's totally monopolizing the markets for food and fashion. Makes sense when you think about it. To put it plainly, he made an incredible amount of money. Every day, he went further into more dangerous dungeons than anyone in this world ever had before. Yet it was somehow never enough for him. And despite his progenital habits, he had probably never bought a single thing for himself. Do we actually need to pay what we owe him? No way, he'll just burn through all that money in a day. Whenever someone felt melancholy, he made them a delicious meal. He gave away all his money to the villages in need. When someone was homesick, he whipped up a new line of clothes. If we ever tried to properly compensate him, that money went straight down the drain. If the village he bought the fabric from got in trouble, he'll invest all his fortune without a second thought, right? Seriously. How can you make so much money and yet be so poor? There would always be more for him to do. The frontier was too large and too populous for him to be able to help everyone. Even if people got significantly wealthier, the wealth wouldn't reach the furthest corners of the frontier. One person couldn't bear that burden alone. It was impossible. It would destroy him. Well, we need to keep placing orders so he can make money. But then he'll just keep working and never rest. And he'll spend it anyway. Definitely. He would always spend any money we gave him, rent money included. At least, it seemed like he would never run out of food, and he could always go back to the cave if we couldn't afford the inn. That was probably what he was thinking. He had no attachment to money. He just had things he wanted to have, food he wanted to eat, and didn't think twice about the cost. Scolding him about it wouldn't change anything. He's also giving Angelica and Slimy a healthy allowance. They spent their entire lives until now trapped in a dungeon, right? He probably was off finding some poor village, someone crying somewhere and doing the same thing. No matter how much money it cost, he would do this until there was no more crying people around in the world. Do you think he's going to avoid sleeping until the whole frontier is rich? That's terrible for his health. Definitely not good. But he won't listen, no matter what we tell him. Whenever we tried to explain this to him, he always rambled about how he was innocent of all crimes and stopped listening. We knew that he wasn't a bad guy. Of course we did. He thought he could act like a villain, saying things like, I just ripped you guys off! Or, Watch out, losers! Rich guy walking! But we knew better. Obviously, he wasn't a bad person. He rescued us over and over and made us all happy. So why did he ignore his own needs? Why? We were fine. It didn't matter how many clothes we bought from him 
or how much of his delicious food we ate. We didn't mind paying him for it. We could spend the money we earned in the dungeons as we leveled up. It was an investment for us adventurers, because leveling up helped us make more money. So really, we were fi- spending too much. Examination of accounts omitted. Haraka-kun had hardly leveled up, and still hasn't registered as an adventurer with the guild. After all his rescue- after all his risky battles, he finally reached level 20. Now he could register if he wanted, but he still couldn't form a party, so he couldn't accept any requests. Technically, he didn't even have a permit to enter the dungeons yet. He didn't even have a single cent left on his massive profits from defeating monsters in the dungeons and the forests, and hardly any results in terms of leveling up either. He continued to clear-cut the monster's forest for the sake of the frontier. He just happened to collect all the valuable mushrooms of the forest when he did this. But soon, there would be nothing left and still no savings. Why doesn't he accept our help? Oh, he claims that he's worried about getting the sugar baby title. He might actually get that one. As a whole, we girls didn't have a concrete objective. The only reason we faced danger in the dungeons and continued to level up was simply to make more money and become even stronger. We wanted to be able to protect haruka and the others. That's all we wanted, to get stronger, make money, and protect each other. No different from when we stayed in the cave. We didn't care if haruka got the sugar baby title, we still wanted to protect him. We wanted to be able to repay him for everything. But we still had a long way to go. If we really wanted to protect him, we needed to transcend level 100. Even that didn't compare to how long it would take before the entire duchy was wealthy. The duke and his family worked as hard as they could to achieve that dream. They didn't want haruka to shoulder any more burdens. Yet, no one could keep up with him. Nothing could compete with haruka speed, his massive budgets, or his ever-expanding production capacity. Hmm, a way to make him sleep, Vice Red B said. Should I whack him on the back of his head? Knock him out! The entire government and economy of the duchy couldn't keep up with his cottage industries and mass spending. He left him in the dust, whether he meant it or not. Orakun said that Harakun is basically a one-man nation. Indeed, said the book club president. His military power, production capacity, and economic activity is way beyond that of any individual. The nurse didn't seem concerned at all by that. They spent too much time building a boat. I wonder what they're up to. Kakasaki-kun's group spent their whole day grinding for experience, didn't they? <laughs> you can't try to catch up with Haruka-kun. Kakasaki-kun had told us. You gotta dive straight for the knees and tackle him. Make him trip. Guess they really can't catch up with Haruka-kun. They say that leveling up isn't making a difference. Some of the girls were trying to learn how to craft using magic and alchemy. But the best they managed so far was a handkerchief. Mass production was little more than wishful thinking at this point. Even so, there was a textile workshop, or maybe I should say factory in this very inn. A certain someone went ahead and kickstarted an industrial revolution. Having a combat job makes it harder, doesn't it? With practice, we should be able to overcome the crafting penalties. Let's just give it our best. Yeah! We wanted to help haruka so we practiced cooking and sewing. But I doubted that we could ever possibly help a grand sorcerer with a tentacle-powered factory. Haruka Kun and the general store lady made a dangerous combination. They were far too much alike. The duke told us this story. Long ago, there lived a sickly girl in Omoi, with her weak constitution and poor family. She spent most of her days confined to bed, but a group of adventurers brought her mushrooms that saved her life. Her family couldn't afford to buy those mushrooms at any price, but those adventurers gave her the mushrooms in exchange for a promise, that she could pay them back when she could. The girl convalesced and did everything she could to make sure she could pay her debt. Despite the pain she was in, she trained her frail body and sought out knowledge like she was possessed. She became an adventurer, saying that she would pay her debt forward and save others in turn. The girl joined the party of adventurers who saved her, and quickly distinguished herself. She risked her life to gather mushrooms in the monster forest and gave them to the needy. One day, every single member of her party died. She was the lone survivor. Another party of adventurers found her at the edge of the forest and rescued her. She was unconscious, on the verge of death. In order to save the girl's life, in order to save the girl's life, the adventurers went to all of the people who had received mushrooms from her in the past. They gathered up what mushrooms they still had and gave them to her. The girl survived and eventually woke. But by that point, all of the people who brought her those mushrooms had died. The townsfolk had used a few remaining mushrooms in their possessions to save her life. Her body never fully recovered. And during endless agonies, she trained her body until she could walk again. And immediately began a dangerous merchant venture, as if she was possessed. The girl sold all of her equipment to scrape together enough money to open a small shop and began selling. Despite her injuries, 
She began to train to go into the forest again, though all her friends tried to stop her. She gathered her equipment and made her preparations. By that time, she wasn't a young girl anymore. She couldn't stand that though she had been saved so many times, she had yet to save anyone else. She couldn't forgive herself. One day, a black-haired boy came to her shop, a boy with a bag full of mushrooms. He had more mushrooms with him than she had ever seen in her life. She spent all her wealth to buy those mushrooms, enough mushrooms to save every last person in the realm. The boy said, If you give these away, that's it. But if you sell them for profit, I can grant you a hundredfold more mushrooms. The boy did not lie. As long as she gave him her profits, he returned with more mushrooms. No matter how much he sold, there were always more mushrooms. The girl, now a woman, sold her equipment one last time. She had no need for it. Finally able to help others, finally able to repay those old debts, she was free from her obligation. To this day, she works herself half to death in order to help the poor. She always tells them with a smile, You can pay me back later. That woman still lives here, running the general store. That's why they were such a dangerous combination. They were too similar. Neither of them can stand not being able to help out others. They weren't satisfied if even one person wasn't smiling. The proprietor was likely destitute. I didn't need to ask her to know. She ran the largest trading operation in the frontier, but she lived like a pauper. After all, she kept the tap open with haraka -kun to order food every single day. And as for the duke, his behavior was just as suspicious. Though he was a duke, he always acted with the utmost humility. He was the sort of person to say things like, I swear it, even if it should cost my life, and I shall repay this gracious act, even if it's the last thing I do, and actually mean them. Past dukes from his noble Nilish had tended to die fighting monsters. I realized that he was also too much like haraka -kun. But that was why the people who served Duke Omoy would never abandon him. And why everyone in town stopped to talk to the general store lady on the street. That was why we had to get stronger. We had to protect haraka -kun, to stay by his side. He would continue to spoil us, but we would stick by his side no matter what. And eventually, we would surpass him. When that day came... We would finally protect him and support him. We made this promise to Angelica son. She also swore to protect him. So today, we went to a dungeon, made money, bought clothes from Haraka kun and had him cook us some delicious food. We would press forward until the day came when Haraka kun could become a full-time house husband. If we could become strong enough to protect him, Haraka kun wouldn't need to fight anymore. Until then, we accumulated more and more debt. We were worried that if our debt grew too large, he would use servitude on us. Every night, the girls checked to make sure it hadn't showed up in our stats. Still, I couldn't deny that I was a little jealous. Angelica and Slimy seemed so happy all the time. We needed to snap out of our childish daydream of getting spoiled by haraka all the time and actually get stronger. That was the real dream. Day 54. Evening. I don't know who it is, but there appears to be a legitimate magic user in here. The white loser in. The lowest floor of the dungeon carried the risk of death. I had to make that clear during the dinner meeting. They needed to understand the terror I felt. <laughs> Miss Armor Rep nearly killed me! She used the Morning Star! I kept running away, dodging, teleporting all over the place! The dungeon king happened to be nearby and they got caught in the crossfire! Miss Armor Rep wielding a Morning Star dealt incredible collateral damage! For some reason, I was met with a barrage of glares? Huh? So why you two bickered? The Dungeon King happened to walk by and get tangled up in your quarrel? Are you surprised that the Dungeon King happened to be nearby? It's supposed to be on that floor. That's not a coincidence. Uh, no, I'm telling you the boss just walked right into the pointy end of the Morning Star. Then it was killed, you know? I didn't get a chance to use appraisal before it got turned into a spellstone. Traditionally, the Morning Star symbolized the dawn, but in this case, it only meant lights out. Why were they still glaring at me? I'm pretty concerned that your lover's spat was so deadly that it killed a dungeon king in an instant. He said it tragically perished. That means he, he killed it. That's like the whole point of entering a dungeon. Don't tell me you two went in just to have an argument. I wasn't sure why, but the severity of these flat looks felt apocalyptic. Well, I did put my life on the line fighting, didn't I? I had to use instantaneous movement to get out of the way of the spike ball hurling towards me. It wasn't easy. That's my story, and I'm sticking to it. And since I'm sticking to it, it's exactly what happened. I'm not kidding. 
they should have understood that teleport was a risky skill to use. If I had made one wrong move, I could have died. I was going to get scolded twice over for this. You're telling us that there was a dungeon king on the 70th floor, but it tragically perished in an unfortunate accident. You're not sure why? The class rep asked. That's exactly what you said. You two went from the 50th floor to the 70th floor and one day and happened to kill the final boss? Please, help me understand. You're saying the dungeon died because of a stupid couple kept playing with a spiky metal ball? <sighs> I can't believe this is happening again. Well, they did do what they were supposed to. <sighs> I can see it now. The dungeon king probably said something along the lines of Prepare to die, puny humans! And then he died, unprepared. This is the most likely scenario, no? It didn't even get to introduce itself! Said the tiny animal with tears welling up. We cleared a dungeon with 70 floors, defeating one dungeon king and two mid-bosses, in addition to the monsters that lurked in each floor. If the monsters flooded out of the dungeon, it would have wrecked the frontier before the monster's threat could be quelled. Hordes of monsters emerged from the forest on occasions, but those were small-scale events. The one led by the Orc King was an unprecedented disaster. They didn't need to know that there was once a goblin emperor in the deepest reaches of that forest. <sighs> a dungeon overflow in comparison was an exceedingly rare event. When they happened, they could wipe entire regions off the map. The ultimate dungeon would have destroyed the entire continent if it overflowed. The pair of dungeon rulers besides me nodded and jiggled along, as if they were innocent in all of this. I made a mental note not to remind anyone of their former professions. I've got no clue what kind of boss it was, but uh, it dropped a rare Trent Staff MP plus 30% elemental affinity bonus medium magic control bonus. It's an item for spellcasters, you know? The ones with magic staves and pointy hats. This monster seemed to have some common sense. It probably wanted to cast spells instead of swinging its magic staff around like a hammer, you know? <coughs> For a level 70 item drop, the rare trend staff was decent. Though it wasn't as good as my elder end staff. Ah, uh, a spellcaster didn't survive getting smacked with a morning star even at level 70? She wasn't even trying to hit the boss. She was aiming for Haruka-kun. And she's awful at whistling. <laughs> this staff was going to make me rich. The Elder End staff was far superior, but this would sell for so much just because it was looted dropped from a final boss. Why were they all focused on Angelica-san? Did she forget how to talk? With the way she swung that spiked ball, even a final boss built like a tank wouldn't have survived. Incidentally, I didn't stand a chance either. Not tonight or any night. Now then, gather round, ye hapless rubes! Come hither, teenage riffraffs! Who wants some pudding? Consider this an act of noblest oblige from a temporarily embarrassed millionaire, a one time blessing, my dear friends, because the second pudding cup goes for a thousand eel! It's a secret, but if you buy extra pudding, I'll get rich. So, Please do! I had made 180 servings of pudding just to be on the safe side. And I made 10 giga puddings for Slimy, who wiggled just like a pudding. Oh, she's so cute! Pudding! We're not a mass of hapless roots, we have names! When would you remember them? Jiggle, jiggle! If I wasn't mistaken, Slimy was hitting it off with his first giga pudding. They connected on a deeper level than I ever imagined. Slimy, are you turning yellow with the caramelized top layer? Did you absorb the doppelganger's mimes and skills? Wiggle, wiggle. I watched two giant puddings jiggle back and forth beside each other. I don't think there's any reason to mimic a giga pudding though. The girls might try to eat you, you know? The mean girls especially. They bite. Jiggle, jiggle? The girls loved the pudding. Though the eggs and milks were of dubious origins, their mixture produced a pudding that charmed them all. They were already asking for thirds. This is better than the pudding back on Earth. Mmm, it's so rich and decadent. The ingredients from another world produce such a harmonious blend. Mmm, it's rich, but not heavy. Pudding-licious! The Stargirl girl shouted. Mmm, it's a delight on the tongue, Vice Red Beast said. And it jiggles with every so much charm. Jiggle, jiggle! <laughs> I had made so much money. Thank you, noblest oblige. Sweets had an insanely high profit margins, almost as high as their calorie count. Everyone knew that, and they were just going to make a fuss about burning all those calories off later. Thanks for the food! Thanks! Hey, get the hell out of my way! 
If you don't get out of this line, I'll crush you. Poor Pudding. Jiggle, jiggle. After ruthlessly profiteering with Pudding, I arranged an auction to scam them of the rest of their money. More products? Whoa, look at those effects. Wow. Everyone fought for their place in line to apply for loans from the class rep. But when I tried to join the line, they all yelled at me. This is discrimination. As expected, Shield Girl had the winning bid on the Morning Star of Altered Weight. She was becoming a weapons collector or something. The girls also found some items in the dungeon, and they put those into the auction. Whenever they got new gear, they put their old equipment straight into the auction as well. There were 30 people out there scavenging dungeons every day, and still, no one had encountered a pheromone ring or anything like that? Why was that? Naturally, all of the items I brought sold. The S-Talk fetched a high price. However, I was most glad to get the Morningstar out of Miss Amarep's hands. That thing was dangerous. Why was Miss Amarep so good at using it even though she was a true blade? I was relieved that the shield girl brought it. Who would have thought that having loot dots in a dungeon would be so dangerous? If you got rid of high school boys' horny imagination, the only thing left would be a student handbook. Thinking about sexy stuff in a dungeon was definitely safer than that spiked metal ball. That was the one ultimate weapon that I couldn't let her have at any cost. After Slimy and I finished bathing, I went straight to crafting. I would make anklet plans tonight, starting with one for Miss Amarep. I had to hurry. This would be the ultimate weapon for tonight's rematch. The styling is the most important part, but I still want it to be useful. Seems like a spellstone anklet would make for a safe compromise. I wanted to make a design that accentuated her lovely ankles, so I began to construct prototypes. Hmm, a chain would be practical, but considering the effects, maybe a spiral anklet would work best? Maybe I can make different versions. Casual designs and dungeoneering designs? I need at least one design as a late night reward for all my hard work, you know? I definitely need some of that late night reward tonight. Increasing the variety too much will only summon a greater milestone of orders. My side job was like a dinghy caught in an ocean storm. A storm so massive that people just assumed the boat went under. The catalog of orders for the general story is as thick as an encyclopedia at this point. How did she manage to write this many orders in a single day? I'll take another day just to read them all. By the time I'm finished reading, it'll be too late to work on anything. <sighs> of course, the first page is dedicated to mushroom skewers. She even marked it as an urgent order. Did she make a custom stamp just for the lunch orders? If she has time for that, she should try working instead! I quickly lined up the prototypes. To start, I made a hundred different styles of anklets. The one with a chime attached looked nice, but the one with three looked just as good. I also liked the chain anklet and the one with the T-strap. These all turned out great! Tch. Every time I make one, I imagine a pair of sexy legs wearing it. So shapely and tempting. It would have been easier to imagine new designs after Miss Amaret tried them on, but I couldn't possibly concentrate on that work if she did that. I'll become too fixated on trying to do something else. Something incredible. <laughs> These anklets are wonderful! Jiggle jiggle? Oops, sorry Slimy. Was I talking out loud? When did I start talking? Was it licking it all over? Or when I said, yeah, just like that? Oh no, please don't tell me I actually said, you love it when I... Out loud? Yeah, that was definitely not allowed. Day 54, evening. It's pretty tough on a teenage boy to have to imagine the girl's bath every single day, you know. Interlude, the white loser in, back garden. Illuminated by the faint light of the night sky, a figure clad in platinum armor shone against the encroaching darkness. In the total stillness, she suddenly regarded her surroundings. We had her outflanked, all the blind spots covered. Yet, it wasn't enough. As soon as our formation broke, she defeated us. Six strikes! Ah! Six sword style! Yeah! An opening! Wait, never mind! Flame jail! Wait, what? Dodge this! Dodge this! And this! Ah! This last battle cry was interrupted by the sound of a jiggle. What was that? Was Slimy hiding among us? It sounded like two things jiggling, though. One of the nerds roared. Oh, no, 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 wait, 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 wait. Oh, shit, oh, shit, oh, shit, oh, shit. Oh, yeah? See if you can survive my most powerful... Huh? You did? The athlete's words were interrupted by a thump, and he let out a plaintive... <laughs> Super speed! Wait, she's still faster! The boys were also trying their best, but they needed to learn how to work together. They sent an endless stream of attacks at her, but not a single one of them landed. 
Now it's my turn. Ground shrink! Huh? Ah! Five losses in a row. She cleaned our cloths. With each passing day, it took a little longer, but that was our only measure of improvement. She was still far beyond our reach. All right, that's enough for today. Let's go wash off, okay? Ah, uh, agreed. I'm exhausted. The magic user had also exhausted their MP. Angelica wiped the floor with us. Even fighting as a group, we couldn't keep up, and our individual abilities were useless, too. We couldn't maintain our coordination under a relentless barrage of attacks. Was there something wrong with our strategy? We couldn't win by playing defense, but when we tried to charge in, nothing worked. She was just trying to provoke us, isn't she? Yes, and we completely fell for her trap. And I was feeling so good about myself today. Yep, she was literally messing with you. Yep. It sucks to lose, but it was good for us. Even sacrificing some of our defense, we couldn't make up for it through offense. Our formation simply scattered too easily. Our strength lost to her speed. Angelica son, what did we do wrong? Why did we fall apart? Jumping in, getting in each other's way. Hesitate after attacks. Retreat faster. Shimizake's group did great. Angelica son explained with a series of gestures. Ah, uh, she waited for a moment when we swapped positions. Ah, she waited for the moment when we swapped positions. Aside from Shimizaki san's group, we all slowed down when we repositioned. Attacks. Qu quantity better than strength. Really? Our coordinated attacks had an uneven rhythm. Angelica san knocked us out one by one when there was a pause. If we couldn't get in enough attacks, we were done for. We didn't have enough people or attacks, so we couldn't hold out against her overwhelming speed. We needed some sort of skill or weapon to compensate. She targeted two groups in particular, Horakun's group and the book club. Those teams were the connective tissue of the formations, the Midgard. The book club in particular was in charge of running interference, and if we put them on the front lines, there would be no one to slow Angelica down. We hesitated too much. Horakun's group excelled at weaving attacks together in perfect combos, but Angelica targeted them in the middle of a such combo. In an instant, she attacked and interrupted their attacks. Ah, uh, we still had a gap in our combo? I thought we had it perfect! When she affects our timing even a little bit, it results in a misfire. So that's how she obliterated us. Ah, this is impossible, the nurse complained. Those of us who were still conscious carrying those who weren't. Kasaka-kun's team were the only ones smiling after they took a beating. Was that the kind of thing they were into? <laughs> we need a bigger weapon, dude, Kasaka-kun said. But bro, in order to pull off our skills, we need to pump more iron! She's too strong! Honestly... They were probably desperate for an opponent who was better than them. They craved a challenge. I hope that's what they crave. I was just making a joke, right? I can understand our attacks not working, but how did she dodge everything? She didn't just dodge. She counterattacked at the same time. That's way worse than just blocking. She was totally baiting us. Vice Rep C had tried to whirl into the fray with her two throwing axes and dual short daggers, but it only ended up in disappointment. She got knocked out as Evangelica predicted her every move. Step in. Attack. Don't falter, Angelica said. Everyone, at the same time. We needed to learn how to fight without relying on our skills, the way that Haruka-kun and Angelica did. Kakusaki-kun's group at least understood the basics, but they still fell back on using their weapon techniques in a pinch. Meanwhile, Oraka-kun's group exclusively relied on their skills and techniques, but they put no thought into how they fought. It was a pretty magnificent example of giving up. The sport girls did an impressive job of keeping their attack and defense up, but they were too slow to retreat. That was probably where our timing went wrong. To make it work, either the student council would have to advance early, or Shimizaki-san's crew would have to swap with others. But that put Shield Girl in a precarious position. Should I also get a shield? I wonder if I could get a skill to use shields. When Oraka-kun's group fought, they sent their guardian to create defensive barriers. Then the group launched their counterattack, but weaker weapon techniques had no effect on Angelica and they grew increasingly frustrated that she struck whenever they tried to use one of their more serious skills. Nevertheless, they were trying to come up with attack chains that wouldn't even have any openings for Angelica to exploit. See? The quad barrier doesn't last, said the Guardian. Can we add two more layers? Hmm. But even if we did, she could still break through. Eh, this battle can't be decided based on speed. We'll never win. Good work, everyone. We dispersed, the girls heading to the bath. We needed to discuss strategy during our girls-only meetings. The guys were all so specialized that it was up to the girls to form strategies to encompass them all. They 
the all, the only all rounders we had were the student council and Shimizaki san's enslaved group. And according to Angelica, Shimizaki san's group was the only one with a passing grade. The rest of us needed to improve or change our strategy. I can go in the front, I suggested. Who would give commands then? Yeah, you're a president! I don't think most class presidents are expected to command battles. Besides, schools doesn't even exist anymore. It's true that we don't have a proper chain of command. We can't split up. That would just cause confusion. Definitely. We talked it over in the bath. We shared ways to improve our fighting, new strategies for the battle, and methods for better cooperation. All this so that we could become stronger and fulfill our reason for being here. We decided on a new formation and worked out how all the different teams would work together. Each new tactic that we learned, every approach we came up with, built on a bedrock of functioning strategy. Eventually, the topic drifted to a more usual subject of girl talk. He did what? Five? Five rounds? And then on top of that? He did what with his teeth? We had to stop. At this rate, there will be no survivors. A third of the girls are already sunk beneath the waters. We need to retreat to our rooms. We didn't have enough MP to project magic manipulation, and we would drown before we could recover. I mean, of course we had to ask her about it, but still. With the combination of her gestures and expressions, it felt a little too vivid. Her descriptions, genuine and awkward as they were, conveyed her feelings perfectly. She talked about it like it was something wild and terrifying, how she felt like she would lose her mind, yet she did so with an irrepressible smile. The lady doth protest too much, as they say. The real problem was that she got too involved in the telling, her expressions became dreamy and distant, and the descriptions become far more detailed. As soon as she finished talking, she got dressed and ran off to his room. Everyone else collapsed, exhausted. She was a sex goddess. Haruka-kun had made something truly terrifying for such a deity. A fish net body stocking. There is no way I'll buy that. No way. Day question mark. Omoi. Interlude. The Duke's Palace. What in the world was happening in the kingdom? They refused to let go of my duchy. And it was unclear whether they even understood the message I had sent. Now the Nalagi, which had served as Omoi's warden, had fallen. The situation was changing rapidly. Any news from the kingdom? No, my lord. Any official messengers we send are attacked and forced to retreat. Hmm. Perhaps we should challenge the royal guard directly and cut through their forces. How would an act of aggression aid our cause, sire? They might be trying to provoke us. After cutting ourselves from the rest of the kingdom, we needed to travel as far as Nelligi to gather information. Why did the royal family sever all contact? Why would they not even acknowledge our envoys? Just because we have been blessed with an era of prosperity does not change the danger of our circumstances. Most likely, the kingdom already marches on us. Impossible. They wouldn't do that without a word. If only we could establish contact with the eastern houses, we could grasp the truth of the situation. Negotiations have fallen apart, and the other duchies ignored our inquiries in the name of self-protection. This could not continue. That wasn't an option. We must consider the possibility that the king intends to keep us in the dark. I could not believe that the kingdom would go such lengths. The frontier only ever had to fend off the threat of monsters, and the thought of the kingdom and the other noble houses attacking us was unthinkable. If the kingdom had become so corrupt, then I, in my capacity as the Duke of the Frontier, would choose my people over the kingdom. Indeed, for I could never betray our greatest benefactor in any case. The Shino clan delivered an intelligence report. Knowing as little as we do, we must assume the worst. Ignoring the movements of the military is no longer an option. I never would imagine that the 1st Brigade would advance upon the frontier, much less the 2nd Brigade, given their focus on defense. If it's only the 3rd Brigade, surely we could let them be. We must not be careful not- We must be careful not to underestimate them, my lord. The science of the other noble houses gather in mass. The 3rd Brigade, known as the Royal Guard was little more than a symbolic post for children as nobles. As such, it was hard to credit reports that they were involved in matters of national security. Yet, I could not ignore the largest armies of the king that were on the move. What is the king planning? Day 55. Morning. Middle-aged men who lose their jobs are treated just as poorly in this world too. The white loser in. I got a summons. I was just going to tag along with some random party today, and I wouldn't get to do anything anyway. All the other groups were around the 30th floor of their dungeons, so they weren't in any real danger. There was nothing for me to do on those levels, so I definitely didn't need to be there. On the other hand, maybe they were planning to collect all the spells and treasures for themselves. 
They'll definitely use their newfound wealth to bully this high school boy with humongous orders. These big spenders were using their orders as a form of abuse. Did they find out how much I had been overcharging? The impoverished high school girls were on the verge of striking it rich, but not for long. Before the night was through, I would bankrupt them all. Good thing I finished mass-producing anklets last night. Time to oppress the masses and take all their money. Jiggle, jiggle. I traveled swiftly to the pseudo-dungeon with my two companions, though I had suggested that the dungeon dropout do a goal with my classmates, just in case. They wanted to stick with me. I was just here the day before yesterday to buy groceries from the town on the other side. What's the problem? By now, they should have been sold out of all the goods. That being the case, I wonder why Mary Dad had decided to meet me here. I wasn't concerned about the old man seeing my travel companions, as I simply pretended that I had enslaved a totally normal slime and skeleton. I didn't want to cause a scene. <clears throat> Even so, Miss Amorbet sometimes went out in the casual clothes on her days off, so there was a chance that someone saw her around town and noticed that she wasn't a skeleton anymore. Was there a census form I needed to fill out in case my skeleton thwall turned into a mysterious sort of human? Eh, come to think of it, I haven't registered with any official organization, so I wouldn't need to update anyone's info. Yes, I'm in the clear. I didn't break any rules. Wiggle, wiggle. I noticed that I tended to get favorable treatment anyway. Adventurers didn't have to pay taxes because the guild withheld the taxes from any spell zones trading. I wasn't an adventurer, but I received the payment that declared me tax exempt. The Adventures Guild kept 10% of any spellstone sales, but the money I made from the general store and the armory wasn't taxed. Since Miss Amaret was technically my slave, she didn't need to pay any taxes either. Whoa, hang on. Does this mean that the mean girls are also tax exempt? They're so mean, you know. They'll even bite. Jiggle, jiggle. If Miss Amaret was to get registered with the local government, she could just claim to have been human all along, after all. Besides, I feel like someone would have yelled at me if I showed up in town and said, This jiggly one is a dungeon king, and the voluptuous one is a dungeon emperor. Yeah, I don't need to tell anyone that. The gatekeepers never said anything either. In fact, they even pestled me a bit, so I had nothing to worry about. I didn't do anything wrong. If anyone says anything, I can just blame the gatekeepers. Haraka-kun, I apologize for making you come all the way here. I must say this before we continue. My name is Meropapa Sim Omoi, the Duke of Omoi. It is not Mr. Mary Dad or anything of the sort. Do you understand? You may call me Mero Papa if you wish, but please, try to remember that much at least. Also, the name of the city where you currently reside is Omoi. We have plenty of signs everywhere. I even ordered larger ones. Did you see them? I couldn't believe I had to hang out with Mr. Mary Dad. Yet another geezer I had to endure. Isn't the ratio of middle-aged men to everyone else in this world terrifying? I was sure that if I took a census, the population would be 80% old men. This had to be the case, because four out of every five people I met was a middle-aged man. Was there some problem with the birth rates or aging in this society? Did they all spawn from the same location? There was probably some sort of graybeard king relaxing on the lower floors of the dungeon somewhere. I couldn't expect any decent loot though. I'll tur it'll turn out to be something like a ring of the old man stank or something. I couldn't blame my sex appeal if I decided to hide till it out of here and never be seen again. <clears throat> Pardon me, Haruka kun Are you listening? It is I. Mero Papa, Sim Omoi! Uh, right. So, you called me to a meeting, so I came? Do you want me to destroy your neighbors? Should I just take care of the whole kingdom for you? If it involves destroying old man, sign me up! Um, how do you want me to deal with them? I can burn them? Um, I'm, I'm pretty sure I can pulverize them. Don't ask me to disintegrate their clothes, though. I, I, I'm not into that. A den of old men was far more terrifying than any dungeon. No matter how dangerous the ultimate dungeon was, the dungeon emperor was a beautiful girl, which made it worth my time. The only way dealing with a hive of middle-aged men was to burn it to the ground and salt the earth. Like the old proverb, let sleeping old dudes die. <clears throat> if you would please refrain from tormenting the middle-aged men, I would appreciate it. Even my own soldiers fear you. Additionally, I would ask you to stop staring at me when you wax poetic about burning old men and crushing them into a fine powder. We're not here to destroy our neighbors either. Please don't casually destroy the entire kingdom. Apparently, I was wrong? So... Why did he call me out here then? The class rep always insisted that the Duke of the Frontier was just trying to thank me and express his gratitude to the savior of his city. Whoever that was. Was that why he rambled so much whenever I ran into him? Even now, he was waving his hand into my face and calling out, Hey, Haruka! Haruka-kun! Did he just lose his job? Downsizing? Oh, how sad. So was he a comrade in unemployment now? No, I didn't need or want any old man comrades. Only moment, Only moments ago, I was planning to destroy them! 
Welcome, and apologies for calling you here so suddenly, said an attendant. Please, come this way. Looked like the attendant hadn't gone laid off. He was the only person I'd seen with any actual work around here. He was the only person I'd seen doing any actual work around here. What? I believe I was the one who called Haruka-kun, Mary Dad said. You won't just leave your liege behind, will you? If my attendants saw this, they would weep, so please stop. Aren't you one of my attendants as well? Yeah, that old man was totally unemployed. Even his former attendant ignored him. This world is full of monsters, but that seemed quaint compared to the front social relationship. After all, beating a monster was far more wholesome. If you want to keep things wholesome, don't ban murder scenes in manga and video games. Ban them in drama first. Imagine a detective series where a maid prevented a murder instead of a merely becoming a witness. Doesn't that sound grand? Hmm. Maids are the best. Jiggle, jiggle. Please, have a seat. And where am I to sit? I am your lord. They didn't even provide a seat for him after he lost his job. He didn't even get a little spot by the window. Mr. Merida needed to learn some sort of trade. Hmm. Maybe he could take over some side jobs. Apparently, the envoy of the kingdom had gone to the neighboring domains to gather adventurers from across all the realm in order to attempt to breach the pseudo-dungeon without sitting down at the negotiation table. Here is all the information that we have. As long as we had the pseudo-dungeon, any negotiations would be overwhelmingly in our favor. At this rate, the kingdom would never be able to get the conditions they wanted out of the deal. However, if they wanted to just get rid of the pseudo-dungeon, they could just use their military might to put pressure on the frontier. The kingdom needed to conquer the pseudo-dungeon before they could launch an invasion. The adventurers guild from the kingdom had assembled elite soldiers. They're serious about this. A conventional army was ill-suited to fight in a dungeon. A large force that had to navigate a cramped labyrinth was easy pickings. Adventurers could improvise and thus had a much easier time in dungeons. The army specialized in fighting people, and the adventurers specialized in fighting monsters after all. They had totally different skill sets. Why did I... A person with no skill set at all got thrown straight to the lowest floor of the ultimate dungeon. My first dungeon battle was a final boss fight. You're too soft on your soldiers. Just throw them down the hole. Well, I don't think most soldiers could climb back up after falling a hundred story hole. Still, it's totally unfair that I was the only one who had to learn like that. It's no great loss since they're middle aged men so just keep tossing them into the pit until the great beard king gets crushed. Well, my dungeon here was fake so it didn't have multiple floors. Or a Greybeard King, for that matter. I definitely didn't want to enslave the Greybeard King. <clears throat> Pardon me, but are you listening? I know that you never do, but could you at least try to remember my name? Could you at least give me somewhere to sit? Why is everyone sitting except for your duke? I won't leave any time soon, so could you bring me a chair? It's a little depressing to be the only one standing up. High-ranking adventurers and soldiers throughout the kingdom were gathered on the old side of the pseudo-dungeon. Look, it's faster to burn than to defend, I said. Especially if you're talking about geezers. We're talking about negotiations, not firebombing! I was confident that scoring the land with fire was the most efficient solution to their problems. But I was apparently not allowed. These old men need to stop glaring at me before I burn their eyes out. No one wanted that. Well, they're certainly not going to overcome the pseudo-dungeon, I said. It's not a dungeon, so they can't kill it. Neither adventurers nor soldiers can get through it, you know? The aftermath would be incredibly graphic. I had no interest in seeing a bunch of old man nudity. Burning still sounded like the most tempting strategy. But they're hand-picked! The cream of the crop! Not a single civilian remained in the city across the pass. I couldn't be sure until I got my report from Stargirl Girls Clan, but the city seemed to lack even the most basic essentials. All the shops had closed, and the whole city was on the precipice of ruin. I thoroughly cleaned out whatever stock remained after all. It was good as uninhabitable for some time now. The Stucker Girls kind of smuggled people into the frontier, bought up all the goods from both the city and the neighboring towns, and even obstructed long-distance trade. The bureaucrats and soldiers had all fled. It was no longer a city. I'm telling you, no one would get through. The kingdom was on the losing side of the war of attrition. Having no other recourse, they decided to challenge the pseudo-dungeon for the first time. They were really going to go in there without any planning. I almost felt sorry for them. I got more than a little overboard with those traps. If I raised a neighboring city, attacked the duke, and killed the soldiers, I would have broken so many laws, and that would have made protecting the domain more difficult. So I did none of those things. There weren't any laws against destabilizing the economy, after all. It caused the residents some difficulty, but I managed to destroy the city without killing its duke or any of its soldiers. To demand negotiations when we have such an overwhelming advantage may be selfish, but we must consider this matter from the kingdom's perspective. Would the adventurers survive in that dungeon? Well, it was all a matter of time anyway. Destroying that city was easy. 
all their income was based on tariffs and the frontier spellstones trade. When an economy began to spiral toward death, the people who felt it most were the poorest and the most in need. To solve this problem, we moved those people to the frontier, solving the frontier's labor shortage at the same time. The whole point is that they can get out alive and try to challenge it all over again, but they're not even going to try to learn how my traps work? Do you have any idea how much effort I put into them? They keep getting stuck in the same dang spot! Jiggle jiggle. Even high-ranking adventurers couldn't make it through, especially since none of these idiots could think. Just to be sure, I added another false exit. Any adventurers who went through it would fall down a chute where a slide would just deposit them back at the entrance to the dungeon. A few rounds that would break their hearts long before they broke mine. With their spirits crushed, they might give up on adventuring and becoming unemployed. You, ha you guys have no idea how heartbreaking being called a need is, I said. It's heartbreaking overdrive here. They will learn my pain. I'll make sure of it. I even waxed the slide again, so it's extremely slick. After I waxed it, my summer rep and Slimey liked riding the slide so much that they did it 16 times. We ended up staying out pretty late. I was surprised to hear an attendant shout, You're right! He's not listening to a word we're saying! Day 55, morning. You gotta put in the work after understanding the fantasy world gestures. Interlude, the pseudo dungeon. I had my orders. Destroy the dungeon that blocks the way to the frontier. Then, deliver an ultimatum to the duke. The kingdom was running out of time. But the kingdom underestimated the frontier and its ruler. If I couldn't start negotiations with this, the kingdom would collapse. I had to meet the duke, and in order to do that, I had to destroy this dungeon. Ready to go? Yes, my lady. I led a group of dungeon experts, a core of A-ranked adventurers, leading the way with numerous B-ranked adventurers filling out support and auxiliary roles to investigate this mysterious dungeon. However, what awaited us was no fierce battle, no mere fight to the death. This was no laughing matter. At the kingdom's behest, I had summoned all the high-ranking adventurers that I could. They flocked to us when they saw the reward. That was just how pressing this mission was, a job that would determine the survival of the kingdom. We could spare no expense in conquering this dungeon. And yet, these cream of the crop elites, stop it, I can't laugh! And they were trying their best to serve the kingdom in the <laughs> <laughs> oh! A narrow path spanned a deep chasm, like the mountain path itself. It twisted and turned at many points. No large army could pass through here. They would simply get knocked out by the boulders launched from the walls of the chasm. It was my duty to destroy this dungeon and pass through to Omoy. That was all. One adventurer dodged the treacherous rocks, dancing nimbly forward, before slipping and falling into the pit. Another leapt over the slick path and gripped the boulder overhead which detached from the ceiling and fell with the adventurer. Anyone who tried to rescue a comrade was pelted with stones the moment they stopped. If they didn't pay attention, stones from above would occasionally fall on their heads. It had nothing to do with the skills of one's sword's arm, or the might of one's magic. The adventurer just slipped and fell over and over. One adventurer buffed himself and took a running leap to the far precipice and promptly crashed into a, some unseen mechanism, tumbling over head over heels into the dark. The rumbling of running water echoed from the chasm below. So there was no real risk to the adventurers' lives. Their splashes were punctured with agonizing cries. Oh, my clothes are melting! How many adventurers did I lose just trying to cross the narrow passage and deactivate the rock launcher? In the room beyond, giant spider monsters lay in the weight on the ceiling. I gathered a group of spellcasters to strike the monsters down, only for the ceiling to collapse and bury our vanguard. No one sustained any serious injuries but their equipment was damaged beyond repair, and they couldn't continue any further. Only then did I realize that the spider monsters were merely paintings. They weren't even real. The passage continued from there. Trying to leap over any obvious pitfalls, the adventurers smacked straight into the wall before falling back into the pit. What they had taken for the continuation of the passage was only a painting of a tunnel on the wall. Every last adventure who attempted it fell in. What the hell is this? Uh, I've never encountered a dungeon like this before. Our objective was to avoid fighting any of the golems in this place and cross the passageway. But simple corridors were far more terrifying than those golems. As if it was not terrifying enough, more than half of our remaining adventurers had lost their weapons, equipment, and even their clothes. These semi-nude adventurers could no longer be considered a credible fighting force. We couldn't fight the dungeon king like this. It was impossible. Indeed, all the female adventurers fled the dungeon immediately after they lost their clothes. Mm, kind of a shame. 
they were able to safely escape. Retreat is no longer an option, but if we continue, we risk utter defeat. Let the adventurers escape, and we will remain to face the Dungeon King ourselves. Take weapons and equipment from the youngest members of our crew and send them away, I commanded. I don't want to waste lives. At once, my lady. Without weapons or armor, they wouldn't be accused of desertion, as they could no longer fight. Are, are you sure? Th that means... As long as I'm here, we have a chance. If I don't return, assume that our forces was wiped out. The kingdom faced destruction. The Duke of Olmoy would not forgive the kingdom, not after what the aristocrat families had done to the frontier for generations. This was only natural. I won't make it there even to apologize, eh? These nobles deserve whatever happened to them. For generations, our kingdom commanded the frontier to die on our behalf. We should have helped them, but instead we bled them dry and made them suffer. Even were we to apologize, it would not be accepted, and rightly so. However, these noble-born scum wouldn't risk anything for the greater good of the kingdom. Even if it meant the realm would perish, the end of our kingdom was nigh. Shall we give it a shot? Yes, my lady. I advanced with a small group, but we encountered no monsters, only traps. We hadn't even found any stairs leading to lower levels. It appeared to be a unique sort of dungeon made only of corridors. The dungeon king was likely somewhere further ahead. Only eight of us remained. I was not vainglorious enough to believe that I could conquer this dungeon with so few adventurers, but if I didn't force my way through these traps to face the dungeon king at the center, I would never be able to look at my fallen comrades in the eyes. Now, there were only five of us. Despite advancing with the utmost caution, the soldiers who opened the door vanished with a scream. The door handle was itself a trap. Unable to remove his hand from the door, the soldier screamed as the door dragged him into a pit below. I was the last one standing, but my luck had run out. My arms and legs were glued to the floor. There I was, kneeling in all fours and unable to move. I was trapped like a wild animal, unable to advance, to fight, to retreat, or even to stand. I awaited my grim fate. I couldn't even draw my sword from its scabbard. I felt my armor begin to corrode and disintegrate. Suddenly, the rocky wall shifted with a tremendous shudder. Countless stone humanoid figures pulled free from the walls. Stone golems. In my wretched circumstances, I couldn't fight them, and my death will have no glory, only humiliation. I was at least happy that I would not have to witness the fall of the kingdom. The stone golems approached me, surrounded me, and lifted the slab floor I was attached to. I gasped. I felt a floating sensation. I thought the stone golems would slam me into the rocky ground. But instead they carried me peacefully above their heads. They marched me onward as the floor beneath me swayed in their grip. Was I to become a human sacrifice to the sinister dungeon king? Was I about to be eaten by monsters without even a chance to fight back? There was no point in trying to make any plans. Swaying from side to side, the golems marched me down a long corridor. This had to have been some sort of ritual. At the end of the tunnel, I saw a bright light. Our destination? The stone golems lifted me up into the light, still frozen in this humiliating posture. For a moment, the light dazzled me. If I was going to die not by the stroke of a sword, but by the fangs of a beast, I at least wanted to go out with a furious glare. I was outside. I could see fortress walls in the distance, and an army that could put the forces of the kingdom to shame approached. Leading it was the Duke of Olmoy, who had come to be known as a legendary hero of the frontier. His people called him the Frontier King. His foes feared him, as if he were a god of war, known as a swordman without equal. It was the living legend, Meropapasim Omoy. Everyone's gaze turned to me. I realized that I was half naked, covered only with a few scraps of cloth, all that remained of my equipment. I was lifted high into the air with my hands and knees glued to a slab of rock. Ah! Day 55, Evening She's still upset even after I fed her treats and told her it's fine about a hundred times. The pseudo-dungeon exit. I had never seen a glare like that before. Her eyes were like windows into an endless dark abyss. Those, I, those were eyes that understood the truth. That I wasn't the bad guy here. Of course, maybe I went a little overboard with the clothes dissolving thing, but that was the nerd's idea. Blame them. They wanted to add tentacles too. Good thing those never got activated. When we realized that the victims would be old men 9 times out of 10, we weakened the corrosive effect until it left the victims only half naked. It wasn't like she was totally exposed, 
Only almost totally exposed? Eh. This was just barely allowable on late night television programs. Her eyes were dead inside. Mm-hmm. Maybe the stone golems were a little too enthusiastic with their lifting. Those eyes looked like all hope had been extinguished. Um, are you okay? Well, you look so not okay that even the possibility of okay must seem like an absurd joke, but you're okay, right? Yeah? Yeah. Nobody saw anything important after all. She cowered behind Miss Armorep, who gave her some clothes. She looked at me, but her eyes were hollow voids. Please forgive me. I'm sorry. Please spare me your wrath. I only ask for some clemency. I beg for your pardon. Spare me! I only ask that you do not lay your grasping hands on me. I beg of you, please. Forgive me. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. She's totally broken. Um, <clears throat> just to recap, I didn't do anything wrong, but I had a premonition that I was about to endure a 20 person, 48 hour long relay races of lectures. Mm, about 46 hours and 52 minutes of that lecture should go to the nurse. Since it was their fault, I deserve no more than seven minutes of lecture. If the math didn't add up, the remainder should go to the meatheads, who insisted on the golden palanquin ending. See? I didn't do anything wrong. <clears throat> A certain individual from the lowest floor of the great ultimate dungeon glared at me while that girl hid behind her. The girl should have been more worried about that dungeon emperor, since I was just normal, run-of-the-mill teenager. Even if she patted you on the back to console you, she was definitely more terrifying than me. I was totally normal and not scary at all. Um, we're not going to do anything to you, so don't worry. You'll be okay, you know? It was just a malfunction. Well, the chat worked perfectly, but I'm sure there was some sort of malfunction. This was all a big misunderstanding. That chat should have had a 120% chance of catching an old man. Since by my calculations, they were 250% of the fantasy world's population. So right, uh, it was totally a misidentification. A true malfunction that should not have happened. So I didn't do anything wrong, right? Right, exactly, I did it. Everyone always blames me for everything. But I'm the most innocent, friendly teenage boy in the world. Everything is okay. You're not going to be mean to me? Of course not. The old men are the real villains here. It was that gray beard king's fault. I was sure of it. The more I thought about it, the more sure I was. <laughs> I've never been mean a day in my life. If anything, I'm the one who always gets bullied. The meanest thing I've ever done was scorch a few nerd scouts, but they deserved it after the horror psychological trap they put me and you through. <clears throat> uh, want some candy? She took the candy and ate it. Yes, problem solved. Giving away sweets seemed to resolve most social situations. The trick was to repeatedly insist that everything was fine while they ate candy. Works every time. It looked alarming from the outside, I had to admit, but it worked. I hadn't yet figured out what was fine, but it was all definitely fine. She looked happy with her treats. Jiggle jiggle. The girl looked to about the girl looked to be about the same age as Miss Amorep. Maybe a little older? Many people in this world were blonde, but her hair was more of a platinum blonde. She was beautiful despite her black hole eyes and the way she ravenously consumed the candy. I gave her one more piece of candy, hoping that it would spark some life into those soulless voids. Jiggle jiggle. Suddenly an old man approached. The culprit? I, off I offer you my humblest apologies, said Mr. Mary that in a rambling way. If only you had sent a messenger, I would have personally come to welcome you to the Duchy of Omoi. For it is a true honor to meet you. I am Mero Papa Sim Omoi, and I am most humbled to make your acquaintance, your royal highness, Princess Shali Ceres. The girl was some sort of princess, huh? Hmm, so my dungeon just stripped the princess half-naked and hoisted her up and down on a slab of rock? Oh, the nerves were destined for the gallows without a doubt. After what they did, there was no way out but the noose. No other option. I came here on a military mission as the commander of the Royal Guard, she responded. I have been defeated and captured, so you can skip the pleasantries. Having failed in my mission as an envoy, I am unworthy of your humility and your grace. Please raise your head, Duke Omoy. It is good to see you once again. So, they also knew each other? This conversation was going nowhere, fast. They still hadn't decided on who should be apologizing. 
Maybe I can head back to town then. The pseudo dungeon probably collected tons of equipment, so I could probably get quite a bit of coin if I sold it. Mm. The armory in town was well stocked, but those weapons were too crappy for my classmates. A lot of the equipment was destroyed by the pseudo dungeon, but given how many attempts had been made, I was sure that there was plenty I could pawn. Actually, should I start charging admission for the pseudo dungeon? I could even give prizes to any who could successfully navigate it. How did it take me so long to think of that? <clears throat> um, so you're the first person to make it through the pseudo dungeon? So that means you win a prize! Do you want a year's worth of scrub brushes? Oh, uh, do you want more sweets since you like them? I couldn't give her a year's supply though. Sweet consumption around here is practically infinite, and the manufacturer only makes them as a side hustle, so he's always working overtime. Don't you feel bad for me? It's profitable, but I'm always sad, you know? Besides, profits keep mysteriously disappearing, and I have to work even more! Also, eating nothing but candy for a year will make you fat, and I don't want to be blamed for that. That's why I recommend the scrub brushes. She preferred sweets, even though scrub brushes were so popular in town. Ugh. She needed to have a scrub brush if she wanted to be trendy. Although, I didn't want them either. Mr. Mary that addressed me. Pardon me, haruka -kun. I do not wish for any scrub brushes myself, but please realize that you are addressing a princess. Perhaps if you could. That is to say, would you try to find it within yourself? Even the smallest sliver of decorum. Don't trouble yourself too much about it, but I thought I would share the suggestion with you. I merely thought that if you try to speak a bit more politely that, uh, uh, it's impossible, isn't it? Whoopsies. Was that a little rude? In my defense, when had manners ever gotten me anywhere? Never once in my life had I used fuzzy etiquette and prim politeness. Hmm, since I never thought to use politeness, maybe all those unused manners had piled up. At this point, I had so much politeness in my system that I only needed to use a small fraction of it to outpolite anyone around here. <laughs> I've got this. <coughs> I must apologize most humbly for my bruquest of my manner, as I gave you those candies without realizing that I was in the august presence of the royal princess. Perhaps would you like me to play a trick on you? After all, I give you a treat, and the polite thing to do is to give you a trick. Ah, you see, this is a custom from my homeland. I am a traveler from a faraway land. Allow me to profusely express the honor I feel having now met you, royal girl. <clears throat> oh, my apologies. I am sure you will prefer that I call you by your name. Princess Shilly Shally, if I recall correctly. No tricks, no tricks, please. Please forgive me, spare me, don't hurt me, don't touch me, forgive me. Don't lay your hands on me, forgive me. Don't do anything untoward with my body, please, I beg of you. No tricks, I'm sorry, I'm sorry, spare me. The light instantly vanished from her eyes, leaving a vast emptiness cavern of darkness. Should I peek into the abyss? Jiggle, jiggle. Huh, Simon was against it. haruka -kun. what I mean is... If I could make one suggestion, perhaps I was too rash in suggesting that you should try to demonstrate the barest minimum of civility for the first time in your life. Your usual cryptic utterances are far less off-putting. Apparently, I was too polite now? <laughs> I was so humble and self-effacing that it came across as a threat to public order. <sighs> the old man's attendant cordoned me off by myself. The dungeon doers shook their heads as if embarrassed by something. Why did I, a human, get exiled, while well, those two got to be with everyone else? Now everyone else was ruining my day. The royal girl, <clears throat> uh, Shilly Shally, was a princess, but also a general. And she was once a student of Mr. Mary Dad. So that's how they knew each other. After the time that Mary Dad got attacked by bandits, his attendants had to restrain him from pursuing the thieves and fighting them himself. He was going to go wild and charge the bandits instead of commanding his guards. That was no person to learn from. Besides, charging in recklessly was my strategy. Tossing the half-naked princess stuck to a slab of rock up and down in the air was thankfully overlooked. If there had been tentacles involved, things would have been much worse. The nurse certainly deserved some light strangling and perhaps some scorched heads as a refreshing follow-up. They were the real villains. Uh, <clears throat> 
why don't we go to the castle and sit down instead of just standing around and chatting? I mean, we're dealing with a princess here. Isn't it an absolute breach of etiquette to not offer her a seat? This is the real entrance over here. Uh, the, the other one's a trap. Why did everyone insist on talking outside when there was literally a castle right there? Does that mean we have permission to enter, Aruka-kun? Duke Omoe, why are you asking his permission? Asked the princess. That's your castle, is it not? We entered the castle. The way to town was through the castle anyway, and it would be time for dinner soon. The way to the Great Hall is over there. If you went this way, you'll find yourself outside the castle again. I didn't feel like making a map, so feel free to explore as much as you want. Watch out, watch out! That for, for that trap! Mm, mm. That one dissolves all of your clothes! Are you... I'm sorry! Please don't hurt me! Forgive me! Please! Don't dissolve all my clothes! I'm sorry! I'm sorry! Jiggle, jiggle. I got yelled at simply for trying to give directions? Why? I don't get it! Day 55. Night. If it's a sexy female spy, they can't get mad at me for dissolving all their clothes or letting the tentacles loose on her. The pseudo dungeon fortress. I tried to go home after showing them the great hall, but the attendant stopped me. Uh, isn't my job done? No one else is getting out of the pseudo dungeon. No matter how much you get your hopes up, you won't see any naked old dudes. Are you actually hoping for that? I thought that this attendant was the only reasonable person behind me, but it turned out that he was the worst of all. I gotta run. This place isn't safe. Your Highness, Princess Shali Saris, this is ostensibly the Great Hall. But I feel that I need to apologize for bringing you to such a squalid... Uh, <clears throat> but that is not the case. It has plenty of charms in its own way. I have no problems with this Great Hall. It is indeed quite spectacular. Thank you, Haruka-kun. It could not be any better. I would never dare to complain about such a lovely Great Hall. I'm not upset. If you have complaints, I can do some renovations for you. I said... What are a duke and princess so scared about anyway? Put in your request. I'll take them. Were there any traps you were hoping for? It was a bit haphazard, I had to admit. If an enemy spy broke into the castle, this was where you would end up. I wanted to spy-proof the place, especially if the spy happened to be a sexy female spy. And in the case of a sexy female spy, no one could complain about all her equipment and clothing getting dissolved. I could even possibly unleash the tentacles. As for guys, a pitfall was all I needed. A pit deep enough that they never returned. You're going to install more traps? Melt my clothes again? Please forgive me. I'm sorry. Don't hurt me. Don't melt my clothes. Don't hurt me. Don't touch me. Have mercy. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. Mrs. Armor Rep's death stare was palpable. A murderous glare. Jiggle, jiggle. Even Slimy scolded me. I was just asking for input on my designs, and I ended up scaring the princess? Even my own servants are getting on my case now. Are you against renovations this much? Is the princess dad set on new construction? This was new construction. I literally just built the place. It was as newly constructed as a new construction could get. I didn't know what the issue was, but it certainly wasn't me. Because I didn't do anything wrong. I asked previously, but this spectacular castle is yours, Duke Omoy, is it not? Why are you asking this stranger from far away? You speak to him in such a casual manner, but is this the boy known as Lord Haruka? The, the one they say is a creepy pervert? Oh, pardon me. Don't do anything improper to me. Forgive me. I'm sorry. Have mercy. Whoa, 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 hang on. You're acting like that's an apology, but that still treat me like a pervert. After all, I did to help you out. Miss Amaret brought clothes for you. As time he formed a wall around you so nobody could see you. The dress is a little skimpy, but don't worry about that. It just happened to be on hand. You know? Well, it's a pretty hot dress, and I was saving it for some improper activities, if you know what I mean. The kind that lasts all night long. <sighs> all night. But that's a secret. Oh, I'm, I'm just burning up thinking about it, like I'm having a fever. Aha! I knew you put me in a dress like this so you could do improper things all night long. Please spare me. Don't touch me. Forgive me. Have mercy. I'm sorry. Miss Amaret patted the princess on the back and gave me a fearsome glare. Well, I was trying to be honest. Eh? Miss Amaret was playing the perfect silver white knight role. Mr. Mary that sighed with exasperation. Couldn't he do something to clear up these false allegations? If anyone saw this scene, they would conclude that I was a black-hearted villain. 
I would get the scolding of a lifetime, no matter how innocent I actually was. Look, I don't actually want this nameless castle on a nameless land. That's why I'm gifting it to the nameless figure known only as Mr. Mary Dad. This is a gift he can't refuse, you know? Because it's useful? If it had a name, it would be even more useful. Hmm, maybe I should let Mary Mary have the castle and I can name it Mary Mary Castle. Hmm, but that sounds a bit too merry. Like a Mary Mary Castle taken over by merry men. How about I give it to her mom and name it Mary Murray Castle? Hmm, yeah, that sounds strong. Anyone who tried to invade it would totally get murdered, you know? With that kind of reputation, it's impregnable. I bet it could even handle a lover's quarrel. The castle was the second layer of protection after the pseudo-dungeon. If you made it through here, you reach unguarded frontier territory. Harakakun, no more! I lose all my lover's quarrels anyway. Can you not gift a personal castle to my wife? I'll have to send the army to apologize to her, and we will still all die. Please don't. And though I shouldn't have to remind you, I do have a name, as does my wife. Why do you only remember Murray and Mary? What about my name? I have one too, don't I? The princess said that Mr. Mary Dad was known as a legendary knight, but he didn't sound so legendary if he always lost against his wife. Unless he became so strong in the first place simply to stand a chance when they quarreled. I can relate to that. Oh yeah, now that we're here, I kind of just remember that there's nowhere to sit in the great hall. Yeah, let's go over to the conference room. There are seats there. Also, I don't know why I can't go home yet. But if I can't, can I at least we decide what to do for dinner? If I don't figure it out soon, Slimy's gonna get grumpy, you know? It's okay, Slimy. We sat down in the conference room and they started their discussions. I didn't know why talking was so complicated in the fantasy world. Maybe the grammar of the language here was weird or something. For some reason, nobody understood half the things I said. Unless the class rep interpreted for me. What? This place? I figured that if the Great Hall was an open and inviting space meant to impress people, the conference room next door should be a place to intimidate people. In negotiations, words are weapons. So, the conference room needed an intense atmosphere. Something that stunned people into silence. Carefully, place columns, a high ceiling, a round table dead center, made people feel like they were surrounded and insignificant. Intimidation via architecture. It was a work of art in my opinion, even if nobody else would acknowledge it. I had to praise it myself because no one else would praise me. So, thanks for coming such a long way and all that jazz. Sit back and relax, and so on and uh, so forth. You don't need to stand. Sit. Seriously, can you sit down? Please? I mean, it's my first time here, too. Sure, I designed it, but there was a world of difference between a blueprint and the finished product. It was like a stone cell, twisted into shape using ludicrous amounts of magic provided by MP batteries, so I guess it's a little rough. And at long last, the meeting, the discussion, and the information exchange, the apologizing, the lecturing, or whatever the hell we're going to do, began in earnest. <clears throat> to summarize, the noble families in the center of the kingdom still believed that they could threaten the frontier into submission. They didn't even grant the princess a meeting and order her to go to the frontier and try to fight. She knew the mission was doomed, but was willing to die in the attempt. How idiotic. Idiots everywhere. This fantasy world was full of nothing but old men and other sorts of idiots. Why did she obey orders even though she knew they couldn't be accomplished? I couldn't understand if she were trying to protect something. But launching an invasion that couldn't be won was totally pointless. There was literally no benefit to risking her life on their orders. Even the meatheads weren't this stupid. Even they weren't stupid enough to willingly die for no reason. Though, they'll still die in battle if they weren't paying attention. Were they stupid enough they wouldn't even notice that they died? Huh. Haruka-kun, you're making the princess cry. Perhaps you could forgive her for whatever offense she has caused. Indeed. I feel a fair bit frightened when you stare so murderously like that. The princess was trying to protect the frontier by willfully losing with an army of elite soldiers. She was trying to stop the war using her own life as a sacrifice. So please, stop calling her names, Haruka-kun. Duke Omoi! Mr. Mary Dad kneeled and bowed his head before the crying princess and me. I could barely contain my anger. 
By showing the idiot nobles that the hand-picked elites were doomed to failure, she wanted to prove that victory was impossible. They were all imbeciles. If you're going to fight until the whole force is destroyed, then fight those idiot nobles, I thought. Going to the frontier just to die in some half-cocked grand gesture only hurt the kingdom. Those beatheads would have done the exact same thing. It was the right thing to do, but that didn't change how stupid it was. Alright, no need to apologize and all that. I won't do anything, I swear. Don't worry about me, I'm just fuming. Equal parts amazed and horrified at all this stupidity, you know? I don't intend to do anything at all, okay? What's the point? There is no point in doing anything about a person who wants to die. If you wanted to live, I could do all sorts of things. I could try to rescue you, offer you help, give you candy and so on. But if you want to die so bad, then I'm out of here. I don't care. And I just want to go home. No matter how foolish it was, I had no choice, the princess protested. There was no other way. If the noble family started fighting amongst themselves, it would tear the kingdom apart. This was the only thing I could try to do to protect the kingdom. What would you have had me do? What option am I not seeing? I wasn't willingly marching to my death. I had no choice. The princess held her sword, resolute and proud. Did she expect me to stop her? Actually, why did Ms. Armor Rip hand the half-naked, heedful princess a sword while Slimy jiggled in support? She launched an attack strong enough to bully an innocent teenage boy in a meltdown. Well, I get where you're coming from. Because the Mead has also don't understand anything unless it had to do with swords. If you kill Mr. Mary, Dad, you fulfill your duty to the kingdom. And there'll be one less geezer running around in this world. Mmm, okay, I'm on your side. <clears throat> Lord Haruka, I would appreciate it if you don't encourage her. Indeed, if someone could stop her, that would be most appreciated. The blade, like the knight, was strong, sharp, and following an unwavering course. It was a powerful thrust. With her high stats and powerful skills, she wasn't aiming for Mary Dan after all. She took aim at me. Stepping aside, I pinned her arms behind her back. The princess struggled to free her arms. Uh, unable to fight! Unable to resist, humiliated, half-naked, and he hoed Just kill me already! Jiggle, jiggle. She had a heart of a warrior, the pride of a knight, and the dignity of a noble. And she wore a skimpy dress that spoke to a teenage boy's innermost desires. Yes, I can deal with this development and the curves. Who told you that fighting the nobles would tear the kingdom apart? Just overpower them and there you go, problem solved! Surely if you're strong enough, you can handle them. It's just so stupid to throw your life away. Death is the end. You can't do anything if you're dead. Do you get it yet? Well, unless you came back as a spooky ghost. I totally lost my cool. And though I was shouting and flailing like a maniac, she couldn't hit me. Of course, someone willing to throw their life away could never hope to hit me. I tried to lead her attacks toward Mary Dan, but he dodged them as well. Stay back, lad. I am not to be used as a shield. Please, don't involve me in your fights. Princess, tell me what you truly desire. Don't give in to despair. But using you as a shield would help solve problems of an aging populace, wouldn't it? The speed of her attacks increased, as well as her intensity. Mr. Meridad almost looked like he was performing a strange dance as he dodged the sharpened steel edge. Please stop, both of you! I cannot accept this and refrain from using my body to block attacks. I'll pay you to leave me be. Ha <laughs> ha, cha-ching, bonus. You got it, boss. Can't kill the man that pays you, as the saying goes. She's trying to kill you, Harakakun. And that's a rather baffling way to address me. Stop toying with me, the princess snarled. Why? Why can I hit this milling brat? She couldn't fight monsters, lacked the might to overthrow the nobles. She wasn't as strong as she seemed, after all. A high level only counted for so much in the world of magic and monsters. She's just a tragic idiot. Could it be? Maybe she really was one of the meatheads. How? Why can't I win? She put more force behind her strikes. Though her eyes were wet with tears, a fire kindled within. Was she free of the terrible pseudo-dungeon trauma? Either way, she's definitely a meathead. The psychological trauma she experienced in the pseudo-dungeon must have been quite bad. What with her being unable to hold her horses before going in and slimy dodging her right after. Hmm, I can't take my eyes off her dress. Princess, 
We have given up on all hope, just waiting for the day that the Duchy would vanish from this world. Yet, we finally realized that we couldn't allow that to happen. Princess, have you looked at the level of this boy? The Royal Guard was willing to fight to the death by my side! I would not let their death be in vain, and yet, how? Look, if having a low level guaranteed death, I'll be in deep shit. But there's no rule for that. If there was, that'd just suck, you know? If an enemy could hit hard enough to kill me, I'd dodge their attacks, and if they had overwhelming defenses, I'd find their weaknesses. That was the obvious way to fight. Letting levels be the deciding factor was just stupid. And I can't stop obsessing over the way she looks in that bewitching dress! The princess was more powerful than I expected. I didn't know how much training and experience backed up her exhausting onslaught of attacks, but it wasn't enough. How? Why? Why would you fight back? She shouted as I dodged her every stroke. She had dedicated her sword to fight on the frontier long ago. Her aim was true, never faltering, but it would never reach me. The endless slaughter in the heart of the monster forest. The horrors I faced in the depths of the ultimate dungeon. I was not the type of person to give into despair. <laughs> if I attack you, then I just look like a teenage boy who beat up a half-naked heave-ho girl with a wooden stick. That wrecked my approval ratings. I can't let that happen. Only a single blow would have been enough to kill me. Her strength eclipsed mine completely. But anyone who fell into the trap of only thinking about levels would eventually break. I will show her the arrogance of a boy who didn't believe in any of it. Don't mock me! Don't act like you understand my reason for coming here! You're not some omnipotent god! Om om omnipotent? Is that what this place was called? Oh my! Mr. Mary Dad shouted. That was the closest you've gotten! But can we please focus on the matter at hand? The kingdom was rotten. Worms had eaten away at its core. Enemies both within and without. At some point, the princess must have given up on hope. Lost faith that her kingdom could survive. Just like the frontier. At some point, they even gave up on fighting for their future. Parrying my blow, her graceful steps drifted back. Her eyes opened wide. She understood. She learned the true meaning of terror. The terror of not being able to kill something because they refused to give up. Regardless of skills, levels, and even chance itself. Tch, but why? Why? She realized that her sword could never reach me. Her dreams so close to being within reach would never come to fruition. Death was only an excuse. I could see in the force of her stare that she would gladly die if it meant she could kill me. So, this is your true power, said Mr. Mary Dad. I heard that even Marielle couldn't lay a finger on you. But to think you were this mighty. Even with her overwhelming level advantage, she couldn't hit me. The most powerful skills in the world wouldn't help. The fear she felt... It was the fear that there was nothing she could do to close the gap between us. The terror of fighting something that couldn't be killed. You are well trained, said Mary Dad, addressing the princess. You are strong, but nothing more. Wiggle, wiggle. The princess believed that she only needed to be strong enough to make her wishes come true. But that was just a mask for a weakness, a road to despair. Strength was strength, nothing more. As a sword fighter, she should have understood... The terror of death was ephemeral, fleeting. There was a gulf of difference between skill and talent. She should have known the dead did not feel fear or anything at all. With a high-pitched whine, her sword shattered, and I held my staff pointing at the base of her neck. Quietly, I asked, Do you want to die? It was a cruel question. She probably didn't have anything left to say. Today, she saw what came after death. Nothingness. Running away from it wouldn't change anything for her. Ah, yikes. That was risky. The skimpy dress was too distracting. Ah, my eyes kept wandering in all wrong directions, and I almost got stabbed a dozen of times. It was a sexy trap. Hmm, sounds like a new business venture for me. I, I want to live. I want to fight for my kingdom. For my people. Huh? She didn't want to die? In that case, she deserves more sweets. Naturally, the dead didn't eat sweets. Some things are just out of your control, I said. If you can't do anything, you can't do anything, you know? Who cares about what happens to the useless kingdom run by useless nobles? They refuse to change and that's on them. They're already done for. If they didn't want the kingdom to tear itself apart, they shouldn't have done things that would lead to that, you know? There's no point in dying in vain for a lost cause, you know? 
how would you have saved them anyway? Pointless self-sacrifice? You'd be better off killing them rather than dying. Death is pretty final. And you won't be able to eat any more candy. <laughs> oh, speaking of, here you go. More sweets. Good food was reason enough to live. Dying for the sake of the future? Or to carve your name into the annals of history? Those were bullshit reasons. These are called sweet potatoes. And according to Soccer Girl, they're amazing. Saga Girl was also about to die, but she didn't. And now she eats candy every single day. If she died, she couldn't do that, right? So, try to live, okay? Throwing your life away for the sake of the kingdom? <laughs> Why bother? Death is the final punctuation on life. Well, for the most part. There are a few cases of people coming back to life. The person standing by my side and nodding her head in agreement was a notable exception. She used to be a cute skeleton before she came back to life. Now she lived her life to the fullest, every single day. That was a great example to live by. She refused to lay down and die even after death. I mean, seriously, who actually would want to die? The frontier was full of people who never gave up, who kept fighting to survive. There was really no point in dying so easily. Day 55, Evening If in the far future, the fantasy world becomes fully modernized, Teenage boys won't be able to concentrate in class either. The pseudo-dungeon fortress. The former dungeon emperor, Miss Amarep, patted the sobbing prisons on the back and tried to cheer her up while I threw dinner together. The scene was pure chaos. The loose ends had nothing to do with me. If they needed something, they would call me. I wasn't even a citizen of this kingdom. Hmm, no one even told me his name. Mr. Meridad said, Please, let me deal with the remaining issues, Haruka. My army might seem unreliable to you. But I am a noble of this kingdom, and this is my responsibility. As the Duke of Omoi, it is my duty to set things right, not the princesses. This is what it means to be a ruler. I may be an incompetent leader who could not save my people or bring them prosperity, but you must let me deal with the nobles myself. I beg this of you. Honestly, he didn't even need to tell me that. I was only here because he asked for my help. I didn't want to be involved. And it took such a long time to say anything. I just came to do some maintenance on the pseudo-dungeon. I didn't have anything to do with the future or the kingdom. I didn't even know where this kingdom was. If I got dragged into a war, the girls would end up fighting. That was the purpose of all their training. They were preparing to fight other humans. Unlike monsters, humans had a variety of skills and the intelligence to use them effectively. I was probably the least suited for massive battle against other people. In other words, wars. In anticipation of this, they were training for it all along. I also have felt like I owed a debt to what's-his-face. I dirtied my hands. I was on the same path he was. The nerds were preparing for a naval battle. The meat has practiced guerrilla warfare in the woods. That being so, there had to be someone pulling the strings, preparing them for war. Who I did not notice. It could only be the book club president. I had secretly made ten bags for her. I had secretly made ten bags for her, and she went and betrayed me like this? I used leather of the finest quality only to get stabbed in the back. I couldn't participate in any war. If I did, I would end up dragging my classmates into it, which meant we'll be screwed. Our future destroyed. I'll charge way more for those bags from now on. Mr. Mary did ramble on. Haruka, I know that you have great strength. Even so, I don't want to involve you in my wars. You are hopelessly ill-suited for war. I would never ask you to fight for our cause. You try to save everyone. Even complete strangers. So I would never ask to kill a stranger. Killing will only hurt you. The stronger you are, the more scars you will bear. The same goes for your companions. Their hearts are too full of kindness. War is no place for that sort of kindness. You don't belong on the battlefield. You bear our hopes and dreams for a better future. We cannot thank you enough for all you have done for the frontier. The hopes you have would wither if you shed the blood of other people. War will only corrupt your dreams. I will handle matters of war, and you will keep the dream alive. The dream that the people of the frontier almost forgot. For the sake of that dream, save the frontier, and let it see the light of day once and for all. He thought way too much, and he talked even more. But he was right. The girls weren't suited to war. The guys, on the other hand, were fine. Especially the meatheads. They were unstoppable when it came to fighting other people. No matter the scale of battle, even demons weren't as brutal as them. I would sooner live in hell than fight against them. They wouldn't care how many bodies they would have to bury if they were fighting bad guys. The nerds hated fighting, but they would. 
whining the entire time but without ever retreating. After a lifetime of getting bullied, they could only endure an endless amount of suffering if it was for someone they trusted. Once they were set on their purpose, nothing short of death would dissuade them. But the girls? They were just normal girls. They tried to appear resolute, but they still thought of their family. They still hid their tears, worried about their friends, and tried not to make others worry about them. No matter how much they pretend to be stoic, it was obvious that they were sensitive and gentle. Though the girls tried to hide it, they were fundamentally soft-hearted. It was different for us outcasts. We had nothing to go back to. The old world, the past, was dead to us. You can't just steal your resolve so easily. It wasn't anything so easy as overcoming stage fright. In the worst case scenario, the nerds and the meatheads would go to war while I stood in the frontier to keep the girls out of it. That wouldn't be so bad. They were unkillable beasts. They wouldn't fall so easily. Jiggle jiggle. Right. Gotta focus on dinner. Order up! I made some cutlet burgers. The soldiers can have some too. Better yet, I'll just set the food out in the great dining hall and they can swarm over it and struggle and feast. That's the way of old men, isn't it? First, I had to show the old men the way to the great dining hall. It was awfully inconvenient that none of them had the map skill. Princess, Mr. Mary Dad, where do you want to eat? You could just eat here, but it's a all you can eat while standing, so you can eat while looking out from the top of the castle ramparts. It's not a bad view, but it'll hurt if you happen to fall over the edge. I've bumped into a few things in my day, and falling from the castle wall would hurt even more than that. Trust me on this one. Mr. Mary Dad gave me a strange smile. I was glad, even if the smile didn't reach his eyes. This world was too grim to take seriously all the time. Even pretending to be serious was exhausting. I couldn't help but laugh. Regarding the frontier alone, a defensive strategy was more than sufficient. There was no chance anyone could both traverse the pseudo-dungeon and conquer Murray Murray Castle. It just wouldn't be worth it. Supposing that the kingdom's armor reconquered the frontier, then if they wanted spellstones, they would have to hunt monsters themselves. In that case... They could have saved themselves all the trouble by sending soldiers to help the frontier hunt monsters. They wanted to make money without having to lift a finger, but now they had to do something. Unfortunately for them, an invasion was not worth the cost. Indeed, they were thoroughly screwed, but couldn't admit it to themselves. But now, the princess had made her move, and Mr. Merida had an opportunity to respond. The kingdom certainly wasn't expecting that. I definitely didn't expect the half-naked heave ho incident to be the shot heard around the world. If such an event were to kick off a war, it would be known as a half-naked heave-ho war, right? I would feel so sorry for anyone who was referred to as a victim of the half-naked heave-ho war. The victims would not want to acknowledge their victory either. Such a terrible name. Shit. This war has to stop so that it won't get mentioned in any future history books. In a distant future that becomes so modern that it even has high school boys, they will have to learn about the half-naked heave-ho war in a history class. High school boys wouldn't even be able to concentrate in class. I thought, they're teenage boys. They would certainly have to pay attention, but for all the wrong reasons. Though, I hope they included pictures. Day 55. Night. The kingdom of somewhere and the King X have got some 180 degree, 360 degree international crisis. The white loser in. News troubled fast. Rumors troubled faster. And vague rumors fastest of all. The first one to share the news had a head start and whoever spread the word faster won. Saga Girl had completely scooped me. She broke the half-naked heave-ho news before I got back. But her version was nothing but lies. Why did you strip a princess half-naked and toss her into the air? Turn yourself in. I'll see you in jail. No, no, no. It wasn't me. The golems were just carrying her. It's not what it looks like. Look, Slimy is jiggling. He's witness. That proves my innocence. Right, Slimy? Slimy jiggles no matter what's happening. Saga Girl munched happily on the sweets she earned from selling her so-called intel. Uh, I was the one who made those. But what's this about the half-naked princess having to get down on all fours? What exactly did you do to her? I didn't do anything. You got it all wrong. She just ended up in that position. Then the golems picked her up. Miss Amarab, tell him You were there! Miss Amarab averted her eyes. My witness refused to testify, implying that I was guilty. We heard that the princess kept sobbing and repeating, Don't touch me! And while you're at it, you can explain what you meant when you told her about your all-night feverish passion. But, but, but I didn't. W well, I did say that repeatedly, but it's not what you think. I never touched her. I only pet her with candy. I'm innocent. Giving candy to pretty girls is completely innocent. Right? Right? Now that I've set the record straight, I need to calm down. I mean, I'm the one who saved her. 
which is why I'm innocent. Luckily, I spotted the princess caught in the trap with Jupiter Eye, and immediately sent Miss Amarva to give her clothes. And then I asked Lyman to form a barrier around her to keep anyone else from seeing her half naked. And since I hurried to do this fast as possible, you can ignore that the dress is a little short, right? I'm telling you, no one saw anything. Everything is fine. Found her with Jupiter Eye. So you did see her. <sighs> caught red-handed. And you're claiming that you saved her from those traps? But who set them? <sighs> ah, the smoking gun. But, but, but the nurse came up with the idea, and the meat has approved it. If I went with the original proposal, she would have been completely nude and attacked by tentacle monsters. Oracoon! The class up growled, scanning the room. They ran away! After them! Sir, yes, sir! The girls shouted. The nurse were on the run, but the girls were on pursuit. Good, I'll be glad if they were caught. I wanted to join the hunt too, but I was still getting lectured. But I clearly didn't do anything wrong as the real purse were on the lamb. The thing was, the trap would only activate when a complex set of conditions were met, and that wasn't likely to happen. You told me that I couldn't treat melting the clothes off of men and women in the same way, so I couldn't send her back to the entrance to meet a bunch of half naked old men. So the final trap, which was unlikely to trigger, happened to heave her up to the castle. It was a freak accident! The chances of that happening were way lower than winning the lottery. That particular trap getting triggered was a once in a lifetime miracle. In other words, don't blame me, Blame yourself or God. The chances of an innocent verdict in this case are way lower than winning the lottery. Guilty on all accounts! It required a precise sequence of unlikely events to occur. It was a contingency that triggered when all the men fell for every single trap except for the final one. For the victim to be the group's commander, the odds were nothing short of miraculous. Did the princess have that kind of luck? Did she trigger titillating events? In that case, I had to keep tabs on her. But from a distance. If I got wrapped up in any sort of events like that, I would never hear the end of it. They began talking about what to do regarding the current political situation. Why? We don't know anything about the kingdom at all. Why should we do anything? It's not our problem, you know? We're just travelers staying at a local inn on a long-term basis. I mean, even if King X from the kingdom of somewhere showed up and was like, Hey babes, let's party! It still wouldn't have anything to do with us. Though I'll tweak that guy's head a bit. Maybe turn it at 360 degrees. That way no one would notice anything different. The kind of king who would rather party than attend the state matters has to be stopped. So I just twist his head 180 degrees at a time. Problem solved. Now I knew who the real villain was, the party king. No, I don't know what the king is like. But don't just decide that he's some kind of party animal who needs his head twisted off. Although, if he says something gross like, hey babe, says party, he deserves to get his head twisted. The queen bee said. But no more than 180 degrees. A 360 degree twist will cause an international incident. We're supposed to be talking about the war on the horizon. Not how many degrees the king said should twist. This isn't solving anything. Ah, but a party king isn't necessarily some sort of obnoxious party, bro. We need to verify these things. Yeah, the party king might be a chill guy who's stuff like, No war, bro, skinless legs, right? Hmm, actually, let's twist his head off. Jiggle, jiggle. The party king was the true villain. We were summoned to this fantasy war in order to wreck his lame-ass parties. I suspect that if we defeat the party king, party bros will stop spawning. We just need to get to the bottom of this party dungeon and kill him. Then his party dungeon will die. The party bros will go extinct and all our problems will be solved. It sounds right if you say it like that, but this is totally incorrect. Hi, a cocoon. Don't you know the difference between a dungeon and a palace? I think he just confused the word mansion and dungeon, said Vice Rep A. Oh, is that why he keeps trying to buy a dungeon? He didn't seem to know the difference between Duke of Nalegi and an orc either. First, we need to teach him the difference between discussion and destruction, said the book club president. How could a kid who reads so many books have so much trouble with words? In any case, without more information, there's nothing we can do. We need to prioritize extracting intel from the princess figure out which nobles could be swayed to our side and which ones are the enemies, and deciding on how to deal with those enemies, there is no point in talking about it now. The treacherous book club president was clever with her words, but she was obviously trying to embroil the girls in a war. After all those bags I gave her, I still couldn't believe she betrayed me. It all made sense, but what was she thinking? Why did she predict the war I was sure couldn't happen? She had been preparing for it too. Mr. Meridad also told me to keep us uninvolved. 
so there was no reason to make a move just yet. We still had to finish off the remaining dungeons that grew past 50 floors, and develop the frontier to the point of economic independence. Even if a military clash did loom, even if a military clash did loom, my economic war could render it unnecessary. The frontier wasn't yet on the same level as the kingdom though. We needed our economy to become self-sufficient enough and our armies to become large enough to convince the kingdom that we could secede. If we could also contain the risk of dungeons overflowing, then we could start negotiations with a clear advantage. So, we discussed our plans for dungeon delving tomorrow. Hmm, I heard the piercing screams of the now captured nerds faintly in the distance. Obnoxious as always. Afterward. Thank you for sticking around for the fourth volume. Sometimes, I think to myself, what happened here? And if any of you poor souls bought and read all four volumes at once, I'm so, so sorry. Nervous sweat. Just as I was getting excited to write about the kingdom in this volume, the story ended up being about the frontier again. I guess that's only natural for a book about a shut-in. We progressed from the woods in the first volume to the city in the second, then in the third to a whole domain. And now back to the city. Oops. And now that I've finally gotten around to this volume, to overlap's general shock, I introduce the monster you've all been waiting for. Yes, I mean slimy. I'm sure plenty of you are surprised that this has made it all the way to the fourth volume. But that's no less surprising than how long we kept that story up as the number one ranked novel online. And definitely less surprising than the story getting adapted to a serialized manga. All these surprises have been so unbelievably shocking as to send me into a trembling polar state. So utterly unable to move that I'm afraid people might actually be mad at me. Those of you who read volume 3 might have an idea what's going on, but I'm not so cheap as to shortchange you with a one page afterward. Oh no, you got five pages afterward last time. But it was all my editor y -San's fault. He's the one who gave me the pages to spare. Anyway, I posted this novel on the website Shosetsu Kaninaro, lesbian novelist, without the slightest intention of becoming a novelist. At first, I practically incited a riot for not including enough sex. And now, it's in the 18 plus section of the website. Even my manga editor Shizuka-sama grinned and said to me, When did this series get so horny? This time around, I went all in. Editor y -san was very excited about the naked heave-ho. Yep, it's all up to Sako and umaru -san to decide just how spicy things get. No pressure. And in spite of all that pressure, thank you Sako and umaru -san, for the wonderful illustrations for Volume 4. He sent me multiple rough drafts asking me for my opinion, which we debated over for quite some time. But thank you again for your beautiful illustrations. We started off with Buta-sama, went over to Bibi-sama for the manga, and now we have Sako and umaru -san. It's an all-star lineup strong enough to fool you into thinking that this series has some sort of genius editor behind it. I've been told by some people that I could probably sell this series without the text, and to be honest, I think I'll probably sell more without it. Just kidding. Maybe? Thank you as well to all the editors over at Overlap and Comic Gardo. Or more like, I'm terribly sorry? <laughs> more nervous sweat. The best mochi is from the mochi shop. This is a saying that goes back to the Edo period, when families used to make their own mochi but eventually realize that a specialty sword does it best. Ask a fisherman about the ocean, a lumberjack about the forest, a pack horse driver about horses, a sake shop about sake, and a tea shop about tea. So I outsource the entire novel to a real perfect. <clears throat> Never mind. I'm sorry for making everyone else do the work. I also extend my heartfelt thanks and apologies to Oraido-sama, who had to deal with the never-before-seen typos and errors mind-boggling enough to make the entire editorial staff scream. I sent the pure white manuscript and it came out bluttered. Sorry for causing so much trouble. And while I may have gotten back a manuscript cover in bloody scars, the feedback online was even worse. My reader sent back a monumental load of errors and corrections, which then needed additional corrections after I fixed them. So I really appreciate everyone's edits and feedbacks. Eventually, I had the divine revelation that my manuscripts will be fixed without me checking for my errors myself. So now, I write in a complete state of denial. Sekuga 999-sama also made a Japanese Wikipedia page for loner life in another world. Thank you so much. It also helped me out quite a bit. It's more detailed than the novels. The web novel is way ahead of the publisher edition, so be aware of spoilers. Somewhere along the way, people around me caught of wind what I was doing. And the other day my friend came up to me like, Your book is selling in stores! Why didn't you say anything? What a strange conversation. I guess they figured my book wasn't the type to actually get placed on a bookshelf on a bookstore. Although, I'm a bit confused what other types of books there are. I suppose that I am a reader type, but not exactly the sort of person to who would write a novel. Actually, that very friend was a source of inspiration for Haruka-kun. I've written four of these so far, and every time there's no end to the thanks and apologies that I could give out. 
but until the day Wyson actually means it when they say, you wrote just the right number of pages. I suppose I'll continue to thank all of you over and over and over again. Yep, you didn't mean it this time either. Now then, will there be another volume? And will it be the right number of pages? It's a bit of a thrill and suspense separate from the actual story. But thank you once again for reading this volume. I am so happy that you have continued to stick around for the ride. Shoji Goji. Loner Life in Another World. Novel 4. Written by Shoji Goji. Read by Lermanora. Didn't she realize that it attracted a nurse to like flies to honey? I bit my tongue. At this rate, at this, at this rate, I'll get tossed into prison without a trial. She had been al she had been alone in the ultimate dungeon. Had probably given up on dreaming to. Al oh my god, I can't read. The floors below the fiftieth floor. My god, I can't fucking read. Oh come on. <coughs> Checks, stripes, chain, even argyle. Argyle? How do you say that? The stockings and socks still serve the legitimate, legim, legitimate. God damn. The stockings and socks still serve the legim, legitimate. <coughs> oh God! No matter how I raise my voice. Oh, and I would so love to have a mini skirt as well. Oh, it's the fucking daughter. Fucking hell! Damn it! I gave you the wrong voice. Fuck! <laughs> Fuck! Yet yeah, my classmates lectured me about pro propriety. Propriety, pro, property, pro, what do you, how do you say that? Day 50 more, more? It was still like a cheap black, uh, I can't read. So is that a mosquito? What the hell was that? Now I'm itchy, god damn it. I swear, I swear there's a mosquito around here because I'm itchy all over the fucking place, god damn. <sighs> uh, I felt something on my leg, god damn it. If you got rid of high school boys, she even marked it as urgent. She even marked it as an urgent. Er, she even marked it as an or. But Angelica targeted them. I beg for your pardon. Spare me. I only ask you do not lay your grasping hands on me. Oh, wait. No, she, no she's the girl. It's the girl. Shali Series. Shali Series? How do I say your name, boo? What? Nah, this is a made up name. Nah, 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 nah. You got me fucked up. That's a made up name. Shally Saris. I'm gonna call you Shally Saris. Okay. What? Uh. Whoa! Mm -hmm. I can't scream like a girl, but. Ah! <laughs> ah! Ah! <coughs> uh, I think I can get it higher. Ah! <coughs> I think that works. Ah! <laughs> uh. Ah, uh, I gotta get my man card back.